In the shadowed realms of our past, the book of Genesis stands as a colossal testament to the human saga, a narrative etched with the deepest mysteries of our existence. This documentary embarks on a critical exploration of this ancient text, dissecting the layers of myth, history and humanity that have intertwined to form the bedrock of our beliefs. As we journey through the enigmatic verses and unravel the human touch in these divine accounts, prepare for a revelation that will challenge the very core of your understanding. This documentary will lay bare the complex tapestry of Genesis, revealing the human fingerprints smudged across the surface of the sacred, and illuminating the shadows where truth and myth dance in an eternal embrace. Brace yourself for a journey of discovery that will shock, awe, and transform your perception of the world's most enduring creation story. Did Genesis chapters 1 through 3 borrow elements from much earlier Mesopotamian mythological stories? Brace yourself as we explore the linguistic, lexical, and thematic connections between these ancient myths, such as the Enuma Elish and the Genesis narrative. But let's not overlook the implications of such borrowing. Shouldn't this compel open-minded individuals to question the literal truth of these stories? Before we proceed, let's address some crucial points. The Hebrew language, as recorded in the earliest texts, dates back perhaps to the 10th century BCE, while the Mesopotamian myths etched onto clay tablets are often over 1,000 years older. Contrary to mistaken assumptions, the Hebrew Bible's creation and flood story contains Akkadian cognates from that much earlier language, not the other way around. It is essential to clarify this misconception and correct any misguided notions that suggest the other myths drew inspiration from the Bible. This factual inaccuracy needs to be rectified before we continue. Those who attempt to use Mesopotamian myths as evidence supporting the historical truth of the biblical narrative are quite frankly missing the boat, or rather missing Noah's Ark altogether. Can we genuinely believe that Utnapishtim and his wife are walking among us? bestowed with immortality by the gods? Do we truly entertain the notion that Enlil annihilated humanity simply for being too noisy? Or that Marduk fashioned the cosmos from the remains of the sea goddess Tiamat? It's a resounding no to both, of course. As someone who was a Bible fundamentalist, I understand the profound impact of blindly following ill-informed teachings. Today, reading these older texts and understanding their original context has given me a richer understanding of the meaning of these stories. I actually love these stories for what they are, and it is my goal for others to enjoy reading them in their actual historical context, and not as if they dropped out of heaven. However, as we explore the intricate web of connections between these polytheistic Mesopotamian myths and the later monotheistic Hebrew Bible, it becomes evident that the Genesis creation and flood accounts were crafted using popular mythological motifs of the time. This realization raises critical questions about the historical plausibility and the nature of scriptural inspiration. Yes, 
the Bible is undoubtedly inspired. But by these pre-existing Mesopotamian myths that served as a foundation for its storytelling. Join us on this intellectual journey, my friends. Scholars agree that most of the primeval history borrows directly or indirectly from Mesopotamian mythology, and Genesis 1 is no exception. While there is debate as to whether such borrowing was conscious and polemical, or simply due to the overall influence of the myth in the ancient Near East, the consensus is that the opening chapter of Genesis almost certainly owes its existence to the Enuma Elish. The Enuma Elish is an Akkadian story dating back to the mid to late second millennium BCE that tells of the god Marduk and his rise to power over the other gods. The story begins before heaven and earth had been created. The two water deities, Apsu and Tiamat, brought forth the gods. Shortly after their creation, however, they became noisy and bothersome to the god, Apsu, who decided to kill them. Ea, however, in his wisdom, was able to thwart Apsu's plans and fought back. Ea was aware of all, discerned their stratagem. He fashioned it. He established it. A master plan. He made it artful, his superb magic spell. He recited it and brought him to rest in the waters. He put him in deep slumber. He was fast asleep. He made Apsu sleep. He tied up Apsu. He killed him. Having killed Apsu, Ea and his spouse Damkina take over his home and give birth to mighty Marduk. His body was magnificent, fiery his glance. He was a hero at birth. He was a mighty one from the beginning. Anu creates four winds for Marduk to play with, and with them he disturbed Tiamat. He caused a wave and it roiled Tiamat. Tiamat was roiled, churning day and night, the gods finding no rest for the brunt of each wind. Tiamat plots to kill Marduk and the other gods. Mother Hubor, Tiamat, who can form everything, added countless invincible weapons gave birth to monster serpents pointed of fang. With merciless incisors, she filled their bodies with venom for blood. Fierce dragons she clad with glories, causing them to bear auras like gods, saying, whoever sees them shall collapse from weakness. Wherever their bodies make onslaught, they shall not turn back. Her commands were absolute. No one opposed them. Eleven, indeed, on this wise, she created. Her husband, Kingu, she promoted to the highest position, giving him the famous Tablet of Destinies. She proclaimed, I cast your spell. I make you the greatest in the assembly of the gods. Kingship of all the gods I put in your power. You are the greatest in the assembly of the gods kingship of all the gods I put in your power. The great god Anshar called upon Ea to go fight Tiamat, but his response was shocking. Ea went to seek out Tiamat's stratagem. He stopped horror-stricken, then turned back. He came before Anshar the sovereign. He beseeched him with entreaties, saying, My father, Tiamat has carried her actions beyond me. I sought out her course, but my spell cannot counter it. 
Her strength is enormous. She is utterly terrifying. She is reinforced with a host. None can go out against her. Her challenge was not reduced. It was so loud against me, I became afraid at her clamor. I turned back. My father, do not despair. Send another to her. Anshar then went to Anu, another senior god who gave the same response. It was only then that Marduk volunteered to take Tiamat down. Marduk then charges to battle, defeats Kingu simply by approaching, and ultimately kills the sea goddess, creating the world from her carcass. There are several possible points of contact between these two myths. Let's begin with the very first line of the book of Genesis. Along with John 3.16, many of us can probably at least start Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created. This familiar English translation has led to some interpreters suggesting that the first sentence in the Bible is of existential proof. In the beginning was God. However, the intended meaning of this first clause is not quite so simply construed as King James had commissioned. The Hebrew phrase that starts off the verse can be translated at least two, if not three different ways, and the translation is significant for reading the rest of the story. Professor David M. Carr notes of this passage. One of the first and most important interpretive and translation issues in this chapter is the question of whether Genesis 1-1 is a dependent clause introducing what follows, when God created, or an independent clause, in the beginning, God created. While there are other interpretive issues involved here, like should this be considered creation from nothing? Our only concern on this point is Genesis 1-1's potential similarity to Enuma Elish. This story opens. When the heavens above did not exist, and earth beneath had not come into being, there was Apsu, the first in order, their begetter, and Demiurge Tiamat, who gave birth to them all. Notice how the first line is part of a dependent clause. That is a clause that cannot stand alone in the sentence and is dependent on another clause. This is otherwise known as a temporal clause, describing a period before creation. If Genesis 1-1 should be translated, When God began to create, or something similar, then this should describe a situation before God began to create. The arguments are somewhat complex, and we need not go into them here. For example, Professor Robert D. Homestead wrote an article in 2008 dedicated entirely to the grammatical and syntactical features of this first phrase in Genesis 1-1 to determine whether the verse should be translated as a dependent or independent clause. Basically, there are several occurrences of this phrase in the Hebrew Bible, and they are usually translated with the word of attached to them. In the beginning of the reign of so-and-so king. This would mean that Genesis 1-1 would be translated something like, In the beginning of God creating the heavens and the earth. Or more smoothly, when God began to create the heavens and the earth. When we continue the passage in Genesis 1, if understood in this way, the text is explaining. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was... In other words, this was the state of the world when God began to create. When we compare this to other Mesopotamian creation stories, and Enuma Elish in particular, we see something similar. Professor Joseph Blankensop writes, Genesis 1 belongs to the genre of cosmogony, narratives about world origins, 
and ancient cosmogonic myths in that culture area begin by describing the way it was at the time of the first creation, only then proceeding to the creation itself. This is not only true of other ancient Near Eastern cosmogonic myths, but also in at least one other place in the Hebrew Bible, in Genesis 2. The second creation story begins by describing the state of the earth before God begins his creative act. Carr writes, The creation account that follows Genesis 1 in the Bible and likely predated it, Genesis 2, 5 to 3, 24, likewise begins with a description of the uncreated prologue to God's creation. Genesis 1 similarly begins with a statement of what creation was like before God created. It seems as though this narrative pattern of describing the pre-creation state of affairs is common not only to ancient Near Eastern compositions, but also to the Old Testament. It appears that Genesis 1 is also following this pattern, perhaps modeled after the opening line of Enuma Elish. This possibility is strengthened by the presence of the Hebrew word to home, the deep, that is found in Genesis 1-2. Professor Ludwig Kohler and Walter Baumgartner explain that the word to home likely is derived from the general Semitic, Tiham, C. So as such, it is not a loanword from Akkadian. Both Akkadian, the language of the Enuma Elish, and Hebrew, the language of the Old Testament, are Semitic languages. And the word Tahom, Hebrew, and Tiamat, the name of the Akkadian sea goddess in Enuma Elish, go back to the Semitic word Taham. In other words, this appears to be a case in which both the Hebrew and Akkadian are drawing on a similar source. But one may not be directly drawing from the other. This is an important point as we want to be precise when attempting to see connections and dependence between texts. As we noted in a previous section, one of the ways that we determine borrowing is the presence of shared language between the two texts. The more unique the language that is shared, the greater the possibility of borrowing. In this instance, one might be tempted to see a direct borrowing of Tiamat, the Akkadian sea goddess, in the word to home. But this is not necessarily the case. Both words are clearly cognates, but we may not be able to say more than that from a strictly lexical standpoint. Blankensop agrees. The to home may be related to the same Semitic root as the proto-goddess Tiamat, representing the chaotic salt waters of the ocean from whose body the earth was formed. What is noteworthy, however, is its place in the text. To reiterate the opening lines in Enuma Elish are, When the heavens above did not exist, and earth beneath had not come into being, there was Apsu, the first in order, their begetter, and Demiurge Tiamat, who gave birth to them all. Notice that following dependent temporal clauses, we see the figure Tiamat appearing in the first few lines right at the beginning of the text. In Genesis 1, we read, When God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the deep. To home. As in Enuma Elish, the cognate word for sea shows up in the opening lines following a dependent temporal clause. There is more to suggest that the Tahom is meant to be connected to one degree or another to the sea goddess Tiamat of Enuma Elish. The word shows up in many other passages in the Hebrew Bible, many of which use the term to describe a mighty, awe-inspiring, and completely out-of-reach place. However, 
it does appear to have a more nuanced meaning in certain texts, particularly in some of the Psalms. In Psalm 77, it appears that Yahweh is doing some sort of battle with a personified form of the deep. In Psalm 77, 17, we read, The waters saw you, O God. The waters saw you and trembled. Indeed, the depths, Tehomot, quaked. This psalm zeroes in on the Exodus event, but the description of the waters here has a clearly primordial nuance. Professor Frank Lothar Hosfeld explains. The cosmological insertion holds a unique place within the whole of the psalm. It is true that the emphasis on the element of water has an obvious association with the passage through the sea, the Exodus, but here it is a matter of the mythical cosmic confrontation between the superior god-king and the waters of chaos. Concerning verse 17 specifically, he writes, In verse 17, the subterranean primeval waters are in terror before the God manifested in Theophany. Here, the primeval waters are the direct opponents. It would seem that the Tehom is personified in the text as an enemy of God that needs to be conquered. Similar, but not identical language can be seen in Psalm 104, a hymn that praises Yahweh for his power in and over his creation. In verses 6 through 7, we read, You covered it, the earth, with the deep, to home, like a garment. The water stood over the mountains. They fled from your threat. From the sound of your thunder, they hurried away. There is clear poetic imagery here that personifies the deep. It flees and hurries away from the power expressed by Yahweh. However, there is a move away from depicting Tehom directly as an enemy combatant, as seen in other passages. This, in fact, appears to be the same nuance that appears in Genesis 1 verse 2. Notice what Professor Daniel Estes says about this. In Annie thought, the waters represented the forces of chaos, but throughout the Old Testament, they are under the control of the Lord. Let's sum up and tie this back to Genesis 1-2 and to home. First, passages like Psalm 77 and 104 clearly describe Yahweh working against the primordial cosmic forces to bring about creation or show forth his unmatched power. Professor Othmar Kill and Sylvia Schroer discuss various passages featuring the chaotic waters in these creative contexts and conclude, Traces of the motif of the battle against chaos can be found in many Old Testament passages. The use of traces here is at times more appropriate than others. There are certainly passages that depict the battles with the forces of chaos against Yahweh in clear, straightforward language. However, in Psalm 104 and Genesis 1, I think we are seeing only traces of the divine battle with the sea. In other words, instead of an overt description, the author of Genesis 1 seems to have gone to some lengths to downplay the significance of the power of the primordial sea. Blankensop says it this way. The author of Genesis 1, a learned priest and scribe familiar with Mesopotamian and Levantine myths of origins, has so thoroughly demythologized the different narrative elements of the creation story. For example, by substituting the to home for Tiamat, and by eliminating the use of physical material in creation, 
mud, blood, etc., that we have to work hard to detect the mythological Erefon background of his account. Although the priestly writer has constructed the creation story to downplay the mythological aspects of the battle with chaos, and therefore rendering the primary opponent powerless before Yahweh, we can still see remnants of the narrative components still present in the texts. There are obviously more points of contact between the Enuma Elish and the story in Genesis 1. Carr notes several, including the connection between Tiamat's carcass being used to create the dome over the world in Enuma Elish, and the formation of the vault of heaven in Genesis 1 from the waters. He also draws attention to heavenly signs from both Enuma Elish and Genesis 1, as well as the great sea monsters. These two may function as blind motifs. What is more important here, however, is the fact that Genesis 1 is dependent upon the Enuma Elish and potentially other ancient Near Eastern myths that incorporate the battle with primordial chaos. These myths clearly predate the biblical text, and the parallels between them and Genesis 1 are arguably too numerous and contextually effective to be mere coincidence. If someone begins to read the Old Testament for the first time, it probably won't take them long to realize that Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 4 sounds quite different from Genesis 2, 4 to 25. If they are paying close attention to the story, chapter 2 seems to tell the story of creation for a second time. John J. Collins writes, Whatever the origin of the Adam and Eve story, it stands in sharp contrast to the priestly account of creation that now forms the opening chapter of the Bible. Not only does the sequence of events differ from the first account to the second, but the writing style is quite distinct. In this section, however, we will only focus on the order of events and how they are distinct from and contradictory to one another. Let's begin with Genesis 1. If we go through the chapter, we see the following order of creative events. Day 1. Light. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God divided between the light and the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. Genesis 1. 3 to 5. Day 2. The Vault. Sky. And God made the vault, and he divided between the waters that are under the vault and the waters that are above the vault. And it was so. Genesis 1 7. Day 3. Dry land, seas, and vegetation. And God said, Let the waters be gathered together under the heavens to one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the accumulation of waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good, and God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants producing seed, fruit trees producing fruit according to its species, whose seed is in it upon the earth. And it was so. Genesis 1, 9 through 11. Day 4, Sun, Moon, and Stars. And God made the two great lights, the great light to rule the day, and the small light to rule the night, and the stars. Genesis 1, 16. Day 5, Sea Creatures and Birds. And God said, Let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly over the earth, over the surface of the vault of the heavens. Genesis 1, 20. Day 6, Land Creatures and Mankind. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their species, beasts and creeping animals, and animals of the earth according to their kind. And it was so. And God said, Let us make mankind in our image according to our likeness, 
and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and the beasts and all the earth and all the creeping things that creep upon the earth. And God created humanity in his image. In the likeness of God he created them. Male and female he created them. Genesis 1, 24, 26 to 27. The narrative in Genesis 2 is not as literarily structured as Genesis 1. Nevertheless, we can determine the sequence in which God created and organized. Event 1. Man Created Then the Lord God formed the man with dust from the ground, and he blew into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Genesis 2, 7 Event 2. God Plants a Garden And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and he set the man there whom he had formed. Genesis 2, 8 Event 3. God causes vegetation to grow. And the Lord God caused every tree that is pleasing to the eye and good for food to sprout from the ground, along with the tree of life in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 2, 9. Event 4. God puts man in the garden to work. And the Lord God took the man and settled him in the Garden of Eden to work and to tend it. Genesis 2, 15. Event 5. God creates the animals. And the Lord God formed from the ground every animal of the field and every bird of the heavens. And he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And everything that the man named each living animal, that was its name. Genesis 2, 19. Event 6. God Creates Woman And the Lord God made a woman from the rib which he took from the man, and he brought her to the man. Genesis 2, 22. When you view both sets of creative and organizing events, you quickly see that they appear rather contradictory with respect to their order. If we set them side by side, we can compare the order. While we will not point out every discrepancy between these two accounts in their canonical forms, let's highlight a few. For example, when was man created? In Genesis 1, 26-27, God creates humanity on the sixth day, the end of the creation period. Furthermore, he creates man and woman at the same time. And God created humanity in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. But what do we see in Genesis 2? Man is God's first creation in Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed the man with dust from the ground, and he blew into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. In contrast, Woman is his final creation after the garden, vegetation, and animals. And where was humanity supposed to live? In Genesis 1, 28-29, we see God's command. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over every fish of the sea, and over every bird of the heavens and over every living thing that creeps upon the ground. And God said, Look, I have given you every plant-bearing seed that is upon the surface of the earth, and every tree that has seed-bearing fruit in it is yours for food. So God commands humanity to fill the earth and to rule over all the animals that were created. In contrast, we read in Genesis 2, 15 through 17. And the Lord God took the man and settled him in the Garden of Eden to tend and guard it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, From every tree of the garden you may certainly eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you must not eat. We see that the man, and later the woman, 
do remain in the garden until they are driven out as a result of their disobedience. Genesis 3.23 It seems as though the story in Genesis 1 commands them to go into all the world while they are expected to remain in the garden in Genesis 2. With regards to animals and birds, in Genesis 1 we see that birds were created before the land animals, which were created before mankind. In Genesis 1.20 we read, And God said, Let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly over the earth, over the surface of the vault of the heavens. We then see, And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their species, beasts and creeping things, and animals of the earth after their species. And it was so. And God made the animals of the earth according to their species, and the beasts according to their species, and every creeping thing of the ground according to their kind. And God saw that it was good. Genesis 1, 24-25 This all took place on day 6, before humanity had been created. However, in Genesis 2.19, we read, And the Lord God formed from the ground every animal of the field and every bird of the heavens, and he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And everything that the man called each living creature, that was its name. Clearly, in Genesis 1, the birds and land animals are created before mankind, while in Genesis 2, they are created specifically to try and fill a specific role for the man. Again, there are many other problems that can be discussed between these two accounts, but these will suffice. It is interesting to see how some other scholars have attempted to reconcile these contradictory accounts. For example, Victor Hamilton argues that the creation of animals in Genesis 2 is not the first creation of animals, but the creation of a specific group for Adam to name that occurs after the creation of animals in Genesis 1, 24-25. Of course, this seems to fly in the face of the natural reading of the verse. And the Lord God formed from the ground every animal of the field and every bird of the heavens, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and everything that the man named each living animal, that was its name. Genesis 2.19 In short, there appear to be contradictions between the account of creation given in Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 4, A, and what we see in Genesis 2, 4, B through 25. We have focused on the contradictions and inconsistencies in the sequence of events that are given in the creation accounts. Although this is but the tip of the iceberg, however, our goal here is only to provide a specific contradiction that can be supported well by the data. The story of the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, and the snake has had a wide-reaching influence on Western culture throughout the last two millennia. But where does this story come from? Is the Eden narrative simply lifted from an ancient Mesopotamian myth? A completely independent work? Or perhaps something in between? In this section, we will provide a brief glimpse into some of the more common parts of the story that can be connected to earlier ancient Near Eastern myths and traditions to see how the story of Adam and Eve relates to earlier texts. While there are a number of aspects in the story that we could investigate at great length, I will try to focus on those portions that find greater overall agreement among scholars in the field concerning their intertextual relationships with older mythology. We will begin with the creation of man, particularly with respect to how he was created, his initial state, and his initial purpose in the garden. We will turn then to Eve, considering the order and method of her creation. Finally, our attention will turn to the theme of the lost chance at immortality that can be seen in the Tree of Life. I need to make something clear from the outset. 
The Garden of Eden story does not appear to recreate any one mythological text from the ancient Near East. In other words, there does not appear to be another Adam and Eve story where a Mesopotamian man and woman are created by the gods and they live in and are expelled from a garden because of disobedience to the gods or the like. We can contrast this to the story of the flood in Genesis 6 through 9, which finds another clear parallel in the story of Atrahasis and Tablet 11 of the Epic of Gilgamesh. What appears in Genesis 2 through 3 is most likely a newly formed myth not directly patterned on a previous story. However, that does not mean that it does not also draw on common themes and motifs, and perhaps even particular myths from the ancient Near East. Notice what Carr writes. Though Genesis 2-3 does not represent a reformulation of any one of these texts, it features a similar combination of anthropogonic and mortality themes, as that was seen in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Moreover, the Mesopotamian cosmogonic tradition drawn upon in Gilgamesh seems to be part of a broader literary world, in light of which certain features of Genesis 2-3 have particular significance, including the formation of the first human from clay, earth, his destiny to work the ground, the focus on divine wisdom, human sexuality and the lost chance at immortality for humans, the human distinction from animals by virtue of wearing clothing, and human multiplication. I will argue that the author of Genesis 2-3 borrowed directly or indirectly from earlier ancient Near Eastern mythologies, as evidenced by the close similarities and the textual and or cultural availability of these themes and motifs to the writer. A final opening word before we look at the specifics. As we argued in the previous section, both Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 through 3 appear to open their creation accounts by describing the state of affairs before the creative process began. Genesis 2, 4b through 7 reads, When Yahweh God made the earth and the heavens, before any plant of the field existed in the earth, and before any herb of the field had sprouted, because Yahweh God had not sent rain upon the earth, nor was there a man to work the ground, but a stream went up from the earth and watered the entire face of the ground. Yahweh God formed the man out of the soil of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Genesis 2, 4b-7 this type of pre-creation introduction is incredibly common in Mesopotamian literature, both in Sumerian and Akkadian texts. For example, in the Sumerian composition, Gilgamesh, Enkidu, and the Netherworld, In those days, in those distant days, in those nights, in those remote nights, in those years, in those distant years, in days of yore, when the necessary things have been brought into manifest existence, in days of yore, when the necessary things have been for the first time properly cared for, when bread had been tasted for the first time in the shrines of the land, when the ovens of the land had been made to work, when the heavens had been separated from the earth, when the earth had been delimited from the heavens, when the fame of mankind had been established, when An had taken the heavens for himself, when Enlil had taken earth for himself, when the netherworld had been given to Ereshkigal as a gift. Another example of this can be seen in a bilingual Sumerian Akkadian incantation from the mid first millennium BCE. The text opens A pure house, a house of the gods, had not yet been built in a pure place. A reed had not yet come out, a tree had not yet been created, a brick not yet laid, a brick not yet made, a house not built, a city not built, a city not built, animals not existing, Nippur not yet built, the acorn not built, Uruk not built, 
the Ayana not yet built, the Apsu not built, Eridu not built, the pure house, the house of the gods, their residence, had not yet been built. All the countries were still a sea. As you can see, these texts, and many others, contain creation themes in which the pre-existing state of reality is described, setting the stage for the creative act. This can be seen in Genesis 2 through 3. Following a similar description of the state of the preformed world, Yahweh creates the man from the soil of the ground, animating him with divine breath. This process of forming humans from earthen materials is well known from Mesopotamian sources. For example, in the story of Inki and Ninma, the story opens in the now all too familiar way. In those days, in the days when heaven and earth were created, in those nights, in the nights when heaven and earth were created. A few lines later, we see that the burden of providing for the senior gods is laid on the lesser deities. The senior gods oversaw the work, while the minor gods were bearing the toil. The gods were digging the canals and piling up the silt in Harali. The gods, crushing the clay, began complaining about this life. Inki is then encouraged to create beings that can shoulder the work for the minor deities. Inki says to his mother, My mother, the creature you planned will really come into existence. Impose on him the work of carrying baskets. You should knead clay from the top of the Abzu. The birth goddesses will nip off the clay and you shall bring the form into existence. Another Sumerian text that speaks of both heaven and earth and the creation of mankind from the earth is the song of the hoe, the farming instrument, to be clear. The text begins, Enlil, who will make the human seed of the land come forth from the earth. And not only did he hasten to separate heaven from earth, and hasten to separate earth from heaven, but in order to make it possible for humans to grow in where flesh came forth, he first suspended the axis of the world at Doranki. Concerning these lines, Gertrude Farber writes, It begins with the separation of sky from earth. After a loving description of the magnificent Ho of the god Enlil, the creation of man is described, by which the Ho strokes clay into a human-like form and then digs up the earth from which men sprout like plants. This is quite similar to the more popular Akkadian story of Atrahasis, which opens in this way. When gods were man, they did forced labor they bore drudgery. The lesser gods eventually took up arms and rebelled against their divine overlords. And Inki is again commissioned to create a human to bear the burden of manual labor. The text reads as follows. Enki made ready to speak and said to the great gods, on the first, seventh, and fifteenth days of the month, I will establish a purification, a bath. Let one god be slaughtered, then let the gods be purified in it. Let Nintu mix clay with his flesh and blood. Let that same god and man be thoroughly mixed in the clay. Let us hear the drumbeat for the rest of time. From the flesh of the god, let a spirit remain. Both the theme of the creation of mankind from some earthen substance and his purpose to serve the gods are present at least two of these texts. In Atrahasis, a divine substance is introduced into the clay in order to bring about the final human form, as we see in Genesis 2-3. through 3. 
Notice, however, that the burdensome aspect of the work the human is to perform is not present in the Eden narrative. Yahweh creates the man and places him in the garden to care for and protect it, Genesis 2.15. But this work is not cast in a negative light. Conversely, in both Inki and Ninma and Atrahasis, the gods are being relieved of their incredibly burdensome duties as this work is foisted upon the shoulders of newly formed humanity. As Dr. John J. Collins notes, in the Atrahasis story, humanity was created to do agricultural work for the gods. In Genesis, the first human being is also charged with keeping the garden of God, but the task does not appear to be onerous. This may suggest a type of inversion of the Mesopotamian tradition on the part of the writer of Genesis 2-3. One of the aspects of the Eden narrative that scholars focus on is the similarities between life before Eve and the purpose and method of her creation and themes and myths from the ancient Near East. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, Enkidu, the companion of Gilgamesh, was created and lived in the wild among the animals. However, Shamha, a prostitute, from the city of Uruk, came and copulated with Enkidu, which resulted in him losing his kinship with the animals and becoming a civilized human. He is clothed, eats bread, drinks beer, and goes to live in the city of Uruk. As you recall from earlier in this video series, this progression from innocence to becoming civilized is a positive movement. People who live in the mountains, eat raw meat, and do not know what it is like to dwell in cities are backward and displeasing to the gods in general Mesopotamian thought. A good example of this can be seen in the Sumerian debate poem, The Debate Between Sheep and Grain. The opening of the composition, surprise, surprise, contains a dependent clause and speaks of conditions prior to the creative act. When upon the hill of heaven and earth, on spawned the Anuna gods. The story continues. The people of those days did not know about eating bread. They did not know about wearing clothes. They went about with naked limbs in the land. Like sheep, they ate grass with their mouths and drank water from the ditches. When we view the Eden narrative, we see a similar movement, ultimately from innocence to civilized. Adam is created and initially interacts with the animal kingdom, specifically to find a partner that is good fit for him. However, finding no such match Yahweh resorts to creating his partner from one of the man's own ribs. Eventually, following their disobedience in the garden, they are clothed, gain wisdom and understanding, and are brought out of their state of innocence and into a type of maturity. The difference, however, is that this movement is not positive. It is only through disobedience that they become civilized. The text paints this progression towards civilization in a negative light. Although the man is not to be associated with the animal kingdom, he retains his status as innocent and childlike, which appears to be a perhaps subtle inversion of Mesopotamian thought. The method of Eve's creation is another potential point of contact between the biblical text and the ancient Near Eastern mythology. The word used to describe how Yahweh created with the rib, the text reads, And Yahweh God created a woman with the rib he had taken from the man, and he brought her to the man. The word translated created in this verse is the Hebrew verb banah, 
which usually means to build, normally the verbs for creating used in Genesis 1 and 2 through 3 are yatsar, to form, asa, to make, or bara, to create. Is the use of bana, to build, of any significance here? The verb banu in Akkadian, the cognate of banach in Hebrew, is used in context of creation. For example, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, when the gods decide to create a companion for Gilgamesh, we see the following scene. They summoned Aruru, the Great One. You, Aruru, created, literally built, the human race. Now create what Anu commanded to his, Gilgamesh's, stormy heart. Let that one be equal. Let them contend with each other, that Uruk may have peace. When Aruru heard this, she conceived within her what Anu commanded. Aruru wet her hands, she pinched off clay, she cast it down upon the step. She created, built, valiant Enkidu in the step. We see something quite similar in Enuma Elish. When Marduk heard the god's speech, he conceived a desire to accomplish clever things. He opened his mouth, addressing Ea. He counsels that which he had pondered in his heart. I will bring together blood and form bone. I will bring into being Lulu, whose name shall be Man. I will create, build, Lulu Man, on whom the toil of the gods will be laid, that they may rest. Even Atrahasis contains this verb in a similar context. Let the mother goddess create, build, a human being. Let man assume the drudgery of God. It would seem that this use of to build in the context of Mesopotamian creation accounts is rather common, but carries a somewhat nuanced meaning. Conversely, it is anything but common in the Hebrew Bible. Even evangelical professor Gordon Winham observes, Only here and in Amos 9.6 is this verb used of God's creative activity. Though in Akkadian and Ugaritic, it is the regular term for creation. Thus, the combination of the common use of the verb to build in other ancient Near Eastern creation stories coupled with its rare usage in the Old Testament, suggests that this is an echo of the Mesopotamian tradition. As you can see, although there are no known mythological traditions to which the Garden of Eden story directly corresponds, there are many connections that can be seen between the Eden narrative and ancient Near Eastern mythologies. Let's look at one last connection in the story of the garden. There is another point of connection between the Mesopotamian traditions and the Eden narrative, the theme of loss at the chance of immortality. As in the previous sections, we will not be able to cover all known occurrences of this theme in ancient Near Eastern literature, but there are some well-known myths that are often compared to the biblical story. The two stories that show up most frequently are the Epic of Gilgamesh, along with the less well-known Adapa and the South Wind. In each story, the protagonist is within arm's reach of a form of immortality, only to lose it, either through deception or theft. Beginning with the Epic of Gilgamesh in Tablet 11, Gilgamesh finally makes his way to Utnapishtim, the survivor of the worldwide flood. As Utnapishtim has become immortal, Gilgamesh hopes to learn the secret to eternal life. Utnapishtim then recounts in full his dramatic story of the flood and how the gods granted him and his wife eternal life but place them far away, separated from humanity. At the mouth of the rivers. Then comes the kicker, at least for Gilgamesh. Now then, 
who will convene the gods for your sake, that you may find eternal life you seek? A perfect storm of events, forgive the pun, had led to Itnipishtim being granted eternal life. How would Gilgamesh convene the gods to have them agree to do the same for him? He couldn't. However, as a type of consolation prize, Utnapishtim agrees to tell him about a secret plant that grows under the water, which will rejuvenate the one that consumes it. Hooray! Off goes Gilgamesh, tying rocks to his feet that drag him down under the water, where he finds the plant. Now you might expect to see him consuming the plant the moment his head clears the water, but no. Gilgamesh said to him, to Ur Shinabi, the boatman. Ur Shinabi, this plant is a cure for heartache, whereby a man can regain his vitality. I will take it to ramparted Uruk. I will have an old man eat some, and so test the plant. You can probably guess what happens on his journey back to his home city, Uruk. At twenty double leagues they took a bite to eat, at thirty double leagues they made their camp. Gilgamesh saw a pond whose water was cool. He went down into it to bathe in the water. A snake caught the scent of the plant. Stealthily it came up and carried the plant away. On its way back, it shed its skin. Oh my. In short, Gilgamesh literally has in his hand the plant that would give him youth as evidenced by the snake shedding its skin, but loses it. In this case, to a snake. This screams Garden of Eden loud and clear. The Mesopotamian story known as the Adapa and the South Wind also contains a story in which the main character has a shot at immortality but misses the opportunity. The myth has both Sumerian and Akkadian versions. Its composition goes back at least to the early 2nd millennium BCE, but was copied well into the 1st millennium BCE. The story tells of Adapa, a wise man who serves the god of Ea, who has bestowed upon him this wisdom. Adapa takes it upon himself to prepare the offerings for Ea each day, which includes fish. While on the water one day fishing for these offerings, the south wind blows hard and capsizes Adapa's boat. After struggling in the water all that day, Adapa angrily curses the south wind, because Ea has granted Adapa magical powers. The wing of the south wind is broken, and the wind does not blow for seven days. This eventually comes to the attention of Anu in heaven, who learns of Adapa's actions and summons him to heaven. Ea advises Adapa to be wary of what Anu might do. When you come before Anu, if they proffer you food of death, do not eat. If they proffer you water of death, do not drink. If they proffer you a garment, put it on. If they proffer you oil, anoint yourself. Ea warns that if Anu gives him food and drink, it will be the food and drink of death. As it turns out, this is not true. The food and drink would have bestowed upon Adapa eternal life. Notice Anu's words. Why did Ea disclose to a human being something bad of heaven and earth, the ability to do this kind of magic, and give him such a stout heart? Since he, Ea, has so treated him, Adapa, what for our part shall we do for him? Bring him food of life, let him eat. They brought him food of life, he did not eat. They brought him water of life, he did not drink. Anu stared and burst out laughing at him. Come now, Adapa, why did you not eat and drink? Won't you live? Alas for the wretched peoples. 
Leaving aside why Ea might have tricked Dapa into passing up the chance at immortality, the salient point for our purposes is that Adapa had a shot at eternal life but was tricked into passing it up. If you're interested in a critical examination on why Inki, Ea, and Yahweh would lie to Adapa in the Mesopotamian story and Adam in the biblical one, the description will have the video just for you. With these stories in our minds, let's turn back to the Eden narrative. Yahweh commands the man and the woman not to partake of the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When they eat, they gain a certain level of knowledge and understanding, becoming more civilized, and this leads to a new circumstance for Yahweh to deal with. And Yahweh God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now, lest he stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever, so Yahweh God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And he drove out the man, and he stationed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword that rotates to guard the path of the tree of life. Genesis 3, 22-24 Another missed opportunity. Here, the man and the woman have gained wisdom and understanding, but this has resulted in them being cut off from the tree of life, which had been within reach, if only for a brief period of time. What we see in the tree of life is likely quite similar in function to the plant that Gilgamesh found in the sea. It rejuvenated the individual to their youth by cutting off access to the tree. Yahweh was ensuring that they would not be able to partake of the tree of youth and would not be able to extend their lives through rejuvenation. Professor Joseph Blinkensop writes, Analogy between this plant of Gilgamesh and the tree of life, the fruit of which grants immunity from death, suggests that the proto-parents had not eaten its fruit because, being still young, they did not yet need rejuvenation. When taken together, the theme of the loss at the chance of immortality is clear in each of these stories. Given the presence of other points of comparison between these earlier myths and the story of Adam and Eve, the fact that there was a snake that was instrumental in the loss of access to the life-giving plant in the Epic of Gilgamesh, as well as in the Eden narrative, the biblical story here is quite likely dependent on the Mesopotamian traditions. Again, I owe a huge thanks to Dr. Joshua Bowen, who is an expert in Assyriology and Hebrew Bible studies, for his invaluable insights into the intricate details you watched in this video. The man is a linguistic genius, again, fluent in Sumerian, Akkadian, Aramaic, Hebrew. He has a book on how to read Sumerian and more and he's up to date with the latest scholarship in the field. His book, The Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament, is an absolute goldmine of information on this subject and much more. If you're serious about diving deeper, you can find it on Audible or grab a hardback copy. The link is also in the description. We trust you found the examination of how the biblical author skillfully repurposed earlier mythologies to craft their own unique narratives of creation and the great flood to be a fascinating endeavor. The Biblical Creation Story Featuring Adam and Eve as the first humans to ever have existed. Several people believe this story to be literally historically true as if it actually happened. But I want to take us into the mythological 
background and let you decide at the end whether you think that it makes more sense this is literal history or mythological symbolism. The story of Adam and Eve from the book of Genesis in the Hebrew Bible has several parallels and similarities with earlier Sumerian stories. Sumer was an ancient civilization in Mesopotamia, modern-day southern Iraq, that thrived around 4000 to 2000 BCE. Here are a couple of Sumerian stories that are often cited as influences on the Adam and Eve narrative. We've all heard of the Epic of Gilgamesh. It's an ancient Mesopotamian epic that predates the biblical account of Adam and Eve. It tells the story of Gilgamesh, a legendary king, and his search for immortality. In the epic, there's a character named Enkidu, who's created by the gods to be a wild man living in harmony with animals. Sound familiar? Enkidu is seduced by a temple prostitute and gains knowledge and civilization, similar to the way Adam and Eve acquire knowledge in the Garden of Eden. The other one is the Atrahasis epic. It's an ancient Mesopotamian myth that predates the biblical account of Adam and Eve. It describes the creation of humans by the gods and their subsequent disobedience, leading to a flood intended to wipe out humanity. In this myth, the gods create humans to be their servants and provide them with all their needs. However, the humans multiply and become too noisy. Disturbing the gods. This prompts the gods to send a flood of water to destroy humanity. But one man named Atrahasis is warned in a dream and builds an ark to save himself, his family, and animals little too much like Noah. The position that Adam and Eve are considered mythological figures rather than historical individuals is a consensus among scholarship. But there are several reasons it's a consensus and why scholars lean interpreting Adam and Eve as mythological rather than literal historical figures. Here are some key points. Scientific understanding. Many scientific discoveries, such as evolutionary biology and paleontology, have provided evidence that conflicts with a literal interpretation of the biblical story of Adam and Eve. The theory of evolution suggests that humans evolved over a long period of time through natural selection, rather than being descended from a single pair of ancestors. There's also cultural contexts. Scholars often examine religious texts within their cultural and historical contexts. The story of Adam and Eve should be understood as a creation myth that emerged from ancient Near Eastern cultures where similar myths and archetypes were prevalent. This suggestion that the story may have been shaped by the cultural and literary conventions of its time makes the most sense. Symbolic and allegorical interpretation. Several scholars argue that the story of Adam and Eve should be interpreted symbolically or allegorically rather than literally. They see it as a narrative meant to convey deeper truths, moral lessons, or theological concepts rather than a historical account. In this view, Adam and Eve represent archetypal figures that symbolize Universal human experiences, such as the fallibility of humanity or the relationship between humans and God. And then there's textual analysis. Critical analysis of the biblical text, such as examining its literary style 
and inconsistencies can also lead scholars to question the historicity of Adam and Eve. They may find elements of symbolism, repetition, or variations in different accounts of creation within the Bible, which suggests that the story is more complex than a straightforward historical record. You know, the Sumerian myths involving Ninhursag, Inki, and also known as Ea, and Ninti have been suggested as influences on the biblical story of Adam and Eve. While it may be difficult to establish direct causal relationships between all of these myths and the Bible, there are some very vivid parallels and shared motifs that scholars have identified. Here are a few points of comparison. Ninhursag and the creation of humans. In Sumerian mythology, Ninhursag is a prominent goddess associated with fertility, childbirth, and the creation of humanity. She's even sometimes depicted as the mother of all gods and humans. In some Sumerian texts, Ninhursag is involved in the creation of the first human beings from clay. This theme of humans being created from the earth or clay is also present in the biblical story of Adam, whose name is derived from the Hebrew word for earth or red earth. Inki, Ea and the forbidden fruit. Inki, a god associated with wisdom, magic, and fresh water, plays a significant role in Sumerian mythology. In some versions of the myth, Inki is involved in providing knowledge and nourishment to humanity, including the gift of agriculture and the cultivation of fruits. The biblical story of Adam and Eve features a tree of knowledge from which they eat forbidden fruit that grants them knowledge of good and evil. This connection has led many scholars to propose a possible influence of Inki myth on the biblical narrative. Ninti and Hilling Ninti is a Sumerian goddess associated with healing and life-giving her name literally means Lady of Life in Sumerian mythology. Ninti is depicted as healing various ailments and relieving suffering. There is a linguistic connection between the name Ninti and the Hebrew word for woman, Isha, which is derived from the Hebrew root word meaning life. Some scholars have speculated that this linguistic connection might suggest an influence on the naming of Eve, who is described as the mother of all living in the Bible. Here's some interesting similarities that have led some scholars to propose the influence of the Sumerian goddess Ninti on the character of Eve. Ninti, a prominent figure in Sumerian mythology, is associated with life-giving and maternal qualities, making her a potential source of inspiration for the biblical concept of Eve as the mother of all living. Ninti, whose name translates to Lady of Life, is often depicted as a goddess of healing and fertility. Her role as life giver and nurturer aligns with the biblical portrayal of Eve as the mother of humanity. The association of Ninti with life and her title as the Lady of Life suggests her role in sustaining and propagating existence, reflecting an underlying motif that resonates with the concept of Eve's significance as the progenitor of all humankind. Furthermore, an intriguing linguistic connection between Ninti and the Hebrew word for rib adds an interesting layer of interpretation. You see, in the Sumerian language, the word T has been suggested to mean rib, and Ninti's epithet, Lady of the Rib, could be seen as a playful pun. 
This linguistic link may have influenced the later biblical narrative of Eve being created from Adam's rib. The association between the rib and the creation of a female figure may have been influenced by the symbolic significance of Ninti's title, possibly serving as a basis for the biblical depiction of Eve's origins. These parallels between Ninti and Eve are intriguing, and the potential influence of Ninti on the portrayal of Eve offers an intriguing avenue for exploring the cross-cultural connections and shared themes in ancient Near Eastern mythology. You know, Adam and Eve, the iconic duo of biblical lore, bear names, their names that pack a punch of thematic significance, making it abundantly clear they are more than just quote unquote historical figures. Adam, derived from the Hebrew word for earth or ground, immediately grounds us in the metaphorical realm. His name serves as a gentle reminder that he represents the quintessential human, intimately connected to the earthly realm from which he supposedly emerged. On the other hand, we have Eve, whose name derives from the Hebrew word for life. Talk about a self-explanatory moniker. By being named life, she epitomizes the vibrant force that animates existence. It's as if the authors of the tale cheekedly wink at us, letting us know that these characters are larger-than-life archetypes, personifications of profound ideas rather than flesh-and-blood individuals plucked from history's tapestry. With names so laden with thematic significance, it becomes crystal clear that Adam and Eve belong to the realm of mythology and symbol rather than the realm of historical record. When explaining the potential Sumerian influences, such as the goddess Ninti, the Lady of Life, and the nuanced connections between rib and creation, it becomes clear that the story of Adam and Eve draws upon pre-existing mythological motifs. These intertextual connections further support the view that the biblical narrative is not meant to be read as a literal historical account. While some individuals may desperately cling to a literal interpretation of the Adam and Eve story, it is important to approach religious text with a nuanced understanding that incorporates cultural, historical, and literary contexts, recognizing the symbolic and mythological dimensions of the Adam and Eve narrative allowing for a richer and more nuanced interpretation, highlighting its enduring relevance as a timeless exploration of human existence, morality, and our relationship with the natural world. I want to highlight, along with the mythological, this mischievous serpent in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. It's a character that has puzzled scholars and theologians for ages. While there may not be a direct one-to-one -one correspondence, the influence of the Mesopotamian figure Ningish Zida on this cunning creature is worth exploring. Ningish Zida, with this divine serpentine, attributes and association with knowledge and fertility saunters into the spotlight as a potential muse for this biblical serpent. Just as Ningish Zida guards the sacred tree of life, the serpent in Genesis becomes the sly custodian of the forbidden tree, tantalizing Adam and Eve with the allure of divine wisdom. Perhaps the biblical authors with a touch of poetic license and a nod to Mesopotamian mythology wove Ningish Zida's symbolic role 
as a bringer of knowledge and temptation into their own story of hum human fallibility. So let us tip our hats to the influence of Ningish Zeta, the slithering inspiration behind the serpent's cunning charm in the Garden of Eden, reminding us that even in the realm of myth and theology, serpents hold a special place in the tapestry of human imagination. The Adam and Eve story in the Bible has intriguing connections to several mythological motifs and ancient Near Eastern narratives, suggesting that mythological origins and influences are there. While the precise origins and influences are subject to scholarly debate and interpretation, several mythological elements can be identified. Another potential mythological influence is the Mesopotamian creation myths, as we highlighted at the beginning. The Enuma Elish and the Atrahasis epic, for example. They share common themes with the Adam and Eve story, such as the creation of humanity, the forming of humans from clay or earth, and the existence of a sacred garden or paradise. These motifs suggest a shared cultural and mythological background in the ancient Near East. The Sumerian myth of Inki and Ninhursag, as well as the sacred marriage narrative, involves themes of divine creation, the birth of humanity, and the conferral of knowledge and wisdom. The parallels between these Sumerian myths and aspects of the Adam and Eve story, such as the creation of humans and the presence of forbidden knowledge, indicate a strong presence of mythological connection. We also have Canaanite and Phoenician mythologies, which may provide additional mythological context for understanding the Adam and Eve story. The relationship between the chief god El and his consort Asherah in the Canaanite mythology has been compared to the biblical portrayal of Adam and Eve as the first couple. The presence of divine beings, creation accounts, and moral lessons in these mythologies further highlight the mythological origins and influences that may have shaped the biblical narrative. It is important to approach these mythological connections with care, recognizing that the Adam and Eve story is a distinct narrative within the Hebrew Bible. The biblical authors likely drew upon and reinterpreted existing mythological motifs within their own religious and theological framework adapting them to convey their unique message about the nature of humanity, morality, and our relationship with the divine. By exploring these mythological origins and influences, we gain insights into the broader cultural and religious context in which the Adam and Eve story emerge. In a family reunion like no other, the biblical tale of Cain and Abel unfolds with the sibling rivalry that would make even the Kardashians raise an eyebrow. Meet Cain, the eldest son of Adam and Eve, who harbors an inviolable green monster within. And then there's Abel, the charming younger brother, with an impressive knack for offering sacrifices that please the divine bigwig upstairs. Things start innocently enough, with Cain tending to the fields like a diligent farmer, while Abel prefers the company of fluffy sheep. As tradition dictates, they both offer sacrifices to the big man upstairs, but here's where the drama kicks in. Abel, the brown noser extraordinaire, offers up his finest lambs, hand-picked and primed for divine satisfaction. 
God, always a sucker for a juicy lamb chop, accepts Abel's offering with enthusiasm and a heavenly thumbs up. Now enter Cain, who's been sweating it out in the fields, probably sporting some serious farmer's tan. He decides to put his best foot forward and offers up some humble fruits and veggies from his harvest. But alas, God takes a pass on this veggie platter, and Cain's ego takes a serious blow. No divine fireworks for him. As resentment festers within Cain's soul, he invites his brother for a friendly stroll in the fields. But friendly turns out to be the last word anyone would use to describe this outing. Seething with jealousy and anger, Cain unleashes his inner hulk and clubs Abel to death, much to everyone's dismay. Divine justice swoops in, and God confronts Cain with a question that's all too familiar to siblings caught red-handed. Where is your brother? Feeling cornered, Cain unleashes the world's very first epic dodge, replying with the infamous phrase, Am I my brother's keeper? Smooth move, Cain. Smooth move. God, in no mood for this tomfoolery, curses Cain to be a wanderer, forever bearing the mark of his murderous deed. The guilt-ridden wanderer sets out on a solitary journey, with only his own thoughts and a lifetime of regret for company. In the shadows of ancient manuscripts and the whispers of time, there lies a tale that delves into the depths of human nature. Sibling rivalry and the haunting specter of fratricide. Welcome, dear seekers of knowledge, to the enigmatic realm of the Cain and Abel myth. A story woven into the tapestry of the Bible, shrouded in mystery and bearing the marks of its intricate cultural tapestry. Dating the origins of the Cain and Abel story is an intricate dance, as scholars navigate the labyrinthine corridors of textual analysis and historical context. While the exact date of its composition remains elusive, it is believed to be a relatively late addition to the biblical narrative, emerging amidst the swirling sands of ancient Near Eastern civilizations. Ah, the dating game of ancient myths, where scholars don their detective hats and embark on a quest for the elusive truth. In the case of Cain and Abel, our scholarly companions have traced its origins to a rather intriguing period, the Babylonian exile approximately 600 BCE, a time when the Israelites found themselves in the land of hanging gardens and mythical wonders. Picture this, it's the 6th century BCE, and the Israelites, like involuntary tourists, have been whisked away to the captivating realm of Babylon. Surrounded by the exotic allure of foreign gods and cultural exchanges. They found themselves crafting narratives that reflected their collective experiences. But dear wanderers, the story of Cain and Abel was no overnight creation. Scholars propose that it would underwent a gradual process of development and refinement, with various sources and traditions weaving together like a patchwork quilt. As the sands of time continued to shift, the final redactions of the Cain and Abel story took place during the Persian or Hellenistic period. Yes, my witty friends, the Hellenistic period is the era when the Greek influence permeated the Eastern lands, 
infusing them with a dash of intellectual intrigue. So imagine scribes perched in their dusty chambers, adding those finishing touches to the biblical narrative. Perhaps they scribbled with quills while pondering the fascinating philosophical ideas of their Hellenistic neighbors, striving to find a delicate balance between ancient traditions and the influences of the wider world. This mingling of Babylonian exile and Hellenistic musings gave birth to the layered tale we now know as the Cain and Abel myth. It became a reflection of the Israelites' complex journey, a concoction of cultural borrowings, and a narrative that resonated with timeless themes of sibling rivalry, divine favorism, and the consequence of unchecked emotions. So as we delve into the enigmatic depths of the Cain and Abel myth, let us raise our scholarly glasses to the Babylonian exile and the Hellenistic period. Those transformative chapters that shaped the final composition of this ancient tell, with wit and intellect, let us navigate the labyrinthine corridors of history, unraveling the layers of its creation and savoring the intellectual delights it offers. Drawing inspiration from a long lineage of fratricide myths that echo through the corridors of time, the story of Cain and Abel stands as a testament to the enduring fascination with the complex dynamics between brothers. As if peering through a distorted mirror, one can glimpse the influences of surrounding ancient Near Eastern myths, where tales of sibling strife and violence existed long before the ink of Genesis dried. The narrative unfolds with Cain and Abel, two sons of Adam and Eve, offering their sacrifices to the divine. However, like the bitter venom of a serpent's bite, jealousy courses through Cain's veins as his own offering is spurned. Fueled by envy, a chilling act transpires an act that would forever etch Cain's name into the annals of infamy. This haunting tell explores themes of divine favoritism, the consequences of unchecked emotions, and the depths to which human jealousy can descend. Its placement within the biblical narrative serves as a mirror reflecting the complexities of family bonds, highlighting the frailty of human nature and the everlasting shadows cast by fratricidal strife. The origin myths which influence the Cain and Abel story have the deepest roots to human storytelling, which surely cross into the prehistory period before ancient Sumer and Egypt. 6000 BCE, due to sibling rivalry being something all humans have commonly experienced. You can say Cain and Abel represent the first human's downward spiral after the epic fall of their parents Adam and Eve. In a sense, they represent all humans who hold hate towards their siblings. Many of the ancient mythic antecedents which later influenced the tale of Adam and Eve represent gods and not mere mortals, but in the storytelling of their time, even the gods could die as men. So much of our focus will show the oldest myths in the world which influenced the Cain and Abel story directly or indirectly. These Israelites, under Babylon's captivity in the 6th century BCE, would have heard of the most ancient of myths found in ancient Sumer, 
retold in the later Atrahasi's epic and Epic of Gilgamesh, which rework the oldest gods of their ancestors from 6000 BCE. They would have been aware of the Egyptian tales of old, which place Osiris and Seth as the original brotherly betrayal story around 4300 BCE. One of the oldest Greek myths of Perseus and Acrisius would have spread like wildfire during Alexander the Great's conquest of Hellenism. Around the 4th century BCE, the Romans' tale of Romulus and Remus was probably written. You will find common thematic connections to the Cain and Abel story, and whether these connections are genealogical or culturally impactful, it changes nothing pertaining to the Cain and Abel story being myth. Even in some Canaanite texts and inscriptions, Baal and Yahweh are mentioned together around 1000 BCE, possibly as brothers or divine allies. These references indicate a complex interplay between different religious systems and the assimilation of deities into the evolving Israelite religious framework. Though the debate is up in the air of exact details, it wouldn't be a shock to me if Baal and Yahweh were brothers in the Canaanite mythology, and one brother killed the other out of anger in a version of their myth similar to the myth of Seth killing Osiris. So let us begin with the mythic antecedents that most scholars think directly influenced the Adam and Eve myth from Mesopotamia. Remember, the Israelites most likely wrote these myths originally during their exile in Babylon, where scholars see a reversal of the rise of civilization in Genesis. While the Mesopotamian myths praise the ziggurat as the highest status of humanity, this was humanity being at the height with the gods. In the epic playground of Mesopotamian mythology, let me regale you with the curious tale of Inki and Ninhursag. Picture it. A divine sibling squabble of cosmic proportions, complete with killer plants and a connection to the biblical Cain and Abel story. It's a mythological soap opera you won't want to miss. First, meet Enki, the mischievous trickster god like Loki from Norse mythology, who enjoys stirring up trouble with a twinkle in his eye. Then there's Ninhursag, his sister and goddess of fertility with a penchant for creating life and overseeing all things green and leafy. In a moment of sibling rivalry, Ninhursag plants eight remarkable seeds each sprouting into unique and marvelous vegetation. With pride radiating from her leafy creations, she presents them to Inki, expecting a pat on the back and a round of applause. But alas, Inki, the eternal prankster, decides to take sibling rivalry to a whole new level. He cunningly plots against Ninhursag's precious plants and one by one snuffs out their existence. Eight innocent plants mowed down by the hand of a playful deity. The divine version of planticide, if you will. Now, let's make the connection to the biblical Cain and Abel story. In the tale of Cain and Abel, Cain offers a humble harvest of fruits and vegetables to the big guy upstairs. While Abel's sacrificial lambs are showered with divine approval, just like Inky's nefarious act, God rejects Cain's offering and accepts Abel's, leaving Cain feeling like his organic efforts were simply veggie fodder. 
The parallel lies in the rejection of the plant-based offerings in both stories, whether it's eight marvelous plants or a humble basket of fruits, the divine preference seems to lean towards animal sacrifices. In both cases, the protagonists experience a mixture of rejection, jealousy, and simmering resentment. So there you have it, a witty connection between the Inki and Ninhursag myth and the Cain and Abel story. Sibling rivalries, divine favoritism, and rejected plant offerings. These myths serve as reminders that even in the realm of gods, family drama and vegetable vendettas can leave their mark through ancient narratives. Another notable parallel that has been examined is the curse of the earth in the Sumerian myth of Enlil and Ninlil. In this myth, Enlil, the Sumerian god of wind and storms, impregnates Ninlil, a goddess associated with grain and fertility. However, Enlil is subsequently cursed by the other gods and banished to the underworld for his actions. The curse extends to the earth, rendering it barren and infertile. While the parallel may not be exact, as it involves a divine curse rather than a personal one, the theme of the earth being cursed as a consequence of wrongdoing resonates with the biblical account of Cain. In the biblical narrative, Cain commits the grievous act of fratricide, killing his brother Abel out of jealousy. As a consequence, God curses the ground, making it unproductive and causing Cain to become a wanderer. But that's not the only potential influence on the Cain and Abel story. Let us delve into the Adapa myth. In this Mesopotamian tell, Adapa, a mortal endowed with great wisdom and knowledge, finds himself embroiled in a fateful encounter with divine beings. Through a series of trials and encounters, Adapa grapples with the dichotomy of mortal limitations and divine aspirations, ultimately making a choice that seals his destiny. Here we witness themes of human ambition, the yearning for immortality, and the delicate balance between mortals and the divine. Now let's shift your gaze to the biblical account of Cain and Abel, a tale etched into the sacred text of ancient Israel. This narrative explores the tumultuous relationship between two brothers culminating in a tragic act of fratricide. Jealousy, divine favoritism, and the consequences of unchecked emotions form the core of this story painting a vivid portrait of the complexities inherent in human interactions. Drawing these threads together, we discern intriguing parallels between the Adapa myth and the Cain and Abel narrative. Both tales delve into the fundamental human experience of grappling with existential dilemmas, the longing for divine recognition, and the disruptive forces of jealousy and rivalry within familial relationships. Moreover, they highlight the eternal quest for understanding the intricate dynamics between mortals and the divine realm. Another ancient five to 6,000 year old myth that bears similarities to the story of Cain and Abel. One such myth comes from ancient Sumer Predating the biblical account, it involves the story of Damuzid and his sister Geshtinana. In Sumerian mythology, Damuzid was a shepherd, while Geshtinana was associated with vegetation and fertility. The story goes that Damuzid was favored by the gods for his offerings and success as a shepherd. 
which led to his sister's jealousy. In a tragic turn of events, Geshtinana's envy got the better of her, and she orchestrated her brother's death. In some versions, she conspired with demons or deceived Damuzid into a situation where he was captured and killed. The myth of Damuzid and Geshtinana shares similarities with the story of Cain and Abel, particularly in the terms of sibling rivalry, jealousy, and the act of one sibling causing the death of the other. It explores themes of divine favoritism, the consequences of envy, and the intricate dynamics of familial relationships. It's fascinating to see how these myths, spanning various cultures and time periods, reflect similar motifs and narratives. They highlight the timeless themes of human nature, the complexities of sibling dynamics, and the consequences of destructive emotions resonating across generations and cultures. Gather around, mortals, for a tale straight out of Pharaoh's playbook, where sibling rivalry reaches godly proportions and divine drama reigns supreme. Prepare yourselves for the mythic showdown of Osiris and Seth, a tale that dances in the sands of Egypt and shares uncanny connections with the biblical saga of Cain and Abel. Picture Osiris the majestic ruler of the Nile, beloved by his subjects and oozing charisma like a fashionable pharaoh. Alongside him is Seth, the wild and unpredictable brother, with a penchant for chaos and a dash of jealousy. In the annals of sibling dynamics, this duo takes the cake. One fateful day, Seth's green-eyed monster gets the better of him, and he cunningly hatches a plot against his illustrious brother. With a mixture of deceit and brute force, Seth slays Osiris, sending shockwaves through the divine realm. It's a divine murder mystery with a twist, where brotherly love gives way to a turbulent tale of power and revenge. Now let's draw the parallels to the biblical story of Cain and Abel. In both narratives, we witness a brotherly clash that leads to the untimely demise of one sibling. Cain, driven by envy, takes Abel's life in a fit of rage, forever branding the tale as a cautionary tale of fratricidal fury. The connection lies not only in the fratricide, but also in the themes of jealousy and divine judgment. In both stories, the perpetrators face consequences for their deeds, be it the divine curse placed upon Cain, or the subsequent divine retribution Seth endures for his heinous act. It's a cosmic game of cause and effect, where divine justice intervenes in the face of family betrayal. So as we venture through the mythical tapestry of Osiris and Seth, we find a profound connection to the Cain and Abel narrative. Sibling rivalries, acts of violence, and divine repercussions serve as universal reminders that the complexities of family dynamics transcend time and culture. Remember, dear mortals, whether in the arid sands of Egypt or the fertile lands of biblical tales, the human condition and its complexities remain a timeless source of intrigue, lessons, and the occasional witty mythological parallel. Okay now, history buffs and myth enthusiast, for a legendary tale that takes us to the mighty city of Rome 
and back to the biblical saga of Cain and Abel. Let me regale you with the story of Romulus and Remus, the feisty twins who sprang from divine lineage, fought like gladiators, and left a mark on both Roman and biblical lore. Imagine the ancient landscape of Italy, where the river Tiber whispered secrets to the gods and destiny was written into the stars. Inter Romulus and Remus, born to Rhea, Silvia, and the mischievous deity Mars. These brothers were as different as gladiatorial combat and a Roman chariot race, and their destinies clashed like swords on the battlefield. In a cruel twist of fate, Romulus and Remus were abandoned as infants, left to the mercy of the wild and ferocious nature surrounding them. Miraculously, they were saved by the nurturing paws of a she-wolf, who became their foster mother. Talk about an unconventional family dynamic. As the brothers matured, the gods whispered in their ears, filling their minds with dreams of grandeur and a yearning for dominion. They set out to establish a city and became co-founders of Rome. But alas, power struggles ensued and sibling rivalry ignited like a Roman candle. In an explosive moment of heated disagreement, Romulus, ever the Alpha Twin, dealt the fatal blow to Remus leaving him sprawled on the ground like a fallen gladiator. It was a fratricidal act that echoed the biblical tale of Cain and Abel, where sibling envy led to bloodshed and forever imprinted upon our collective consciousness. Now let's connect the threads to the Cain and Abel narrative. In both stories, we witness the destructive force of jealousy and the tragic consequences that arise from sibling strife, whether it's Cain's jealous wrath or Romulus's fatal blow, the blood of brothers strains the pages of ancient myth and biblical legend. But the connection doesn't end there. The themes of founding cities and establishing civilizations also intertwine. Both Cain and Romulus take the reins of destiny, founding cities that bear their names, Cain with the city of Enoch and Romulus with the eternal city of Rome. The tales carry echoes of ambition, ambition that can lead to the glory or the tarnishings of souls. So dear friends, as we tread the ancient roads of Rome, and delve into the depths of myth, we discover the intertwined threads of Cain and Abel and Romulus and Remus. Sibling rivalries, fatal blows, and the consequences of unchecked emotions transcend time and culture, reminding us of the complexities of human nature again. Remember, whether in the halls of Rome or the pages of sacred texts, these ancient stories continue to captivate and intrigue, offering lessons, lauder, and a touch of mythological wit. Prepare to have your mind blown. The tale of Noah's cataclysmic global flood is undeniably iconic, etching itself into the record of history and captivating readers across the globe. But here's the real kicker. It turns out that Noah's heroic adventure is not as original as we might think. 
Brace yourself for a jaw-dropping revelation as this video unfurls the shocking truth. The Biblical Flood, starring our beloved hero Noah, is essentially a cunning makeover of ancient Mesopotamian mythology. Yes, you heard it right. Genesis chapters 1 through 11, and even more tantalizing details scattered throughout the book, draw heavily from pre existing myths and legends. This begs the question what does it mean if Noah's story is merely a Johnny come lately shamelessly borrowing from older sources to spin the Genesis narrative? Shouldn't we pause and reflect? on the historical accuracy of what we are reading? Could it be that Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Enoch and Noah are nothing more than fictional figures molded from the much earlier myths they so craftily repurposed? Now hold on to your seats, because this mind-blowing video not only provides undeniable evidence of Genesis dependence on Mesopotamian tales, but it also delves into the intricate web of literary intertextuality and narrative motifs that tie these stories together. It's time to embrace the truth. These accounts are not factual records, but rather captivating stories, woven with the fabric of mythology and legend. So the next time someone tries to convince you that the Bible predates these Mesopotamian myths, or that it stands independently without borrowing their narrative threads, unleash this video upon them. It's a compelling expose that will leave even the staunchest defenders of biblical historicity in awe. The Origins of Noah's Flood Picture this, a God who just a few chapters earlier created everything, including man fashioned in his divine image, resembling him and his celestial counsel. All was splendidly good until those pesky humans went and messed it all up by nibbling on forbidden godly fruit. Let's not forget that it was the same God who planted a talking snake in the garden to tempt these unsuspecting mortals into unlocking their eyes and gaining godlike knowledge of good and evil. Instead of taking responsibility for placing the temptation in their path, God, like any loving parent, promptly evicted his own creation from the primordial paradise that suspiciously resembles a Babylonian utopia. Now Adam and Eve are left to toil and struggle, scraping out a living and experiencing excruciating pain during childbirth. But hold on tight, because it gets even worse. The first children of these first parents end up on an ancient version of unsolved mysteries, with Cain committing fratricide and bumping off his only brother, Abel. And you won't believe the reason behind this murder spree. Apparently, Cain offered God a humble basket of fruits, while Abel dazzled the divine taste buds with a mouth-watering filet mignon. And just like a doting parent, God rejected the fruit salad and devoured Abel's juicy barbecue. It's almost reminiscent of the time Prometheus pulled a fast one on Zeus, who demanded that humans sacrifice a portion of each animal to the gods. Prometheus decided to wrap bones in succulent fat, cleverly hiding the filet mignon inside the animal's hide. When Zeus made his choice, he unwittingly selected the fatty deception, resulting in his wrath and the subsequent punishment of mankind and Prometheus. Ah, the good times. Back to our twisted family saga, Cain is cursed and banished from the land, eventually setting down, finding a wife, and naming his child Enoch 
a child with multiple parentage, as it turns out. You see, the genealogies in Genesis 4 and Genesis 5 are nothing more than fabricated traditions cleverly inserted into the Bible. It's like having two contradictory creation accounts in Genesis 1 and 2, where a priestly scribe tried his best to merge them into one cohesive tale. The same game is at play with these genealogies leading up to Noah's flood, the cataclysmic event that wiped out this once very good creation. Thanks to this priestly scribe or scribes, many later traditions try to explain the lineage of Cain versus Seth. Now, if you're as curious as I am about why the seemingly good God would obliterate mankind and still be regarded as benevolent by the biblical authors, then stay tuned. This video will not only reveal the true origins of Noah's flood story, but also debunk the flood-related conspiracy theories and misinformation that run rampant on the internet. So forget tuning into Joe Rogan for ill-informed flood discussions, and join us as we present the facts straight from the mouths of experts specializing in ancient Sumer, Old Babylon, Assyria, New Babylon, the ancient Near East, and of course, the Bible. Mesopotamian Precursors it should come as no surprise to us that the story of a god destroying the world with a flood was not new to the book of Genesis. More than a thousand years before the story found its way into the Bible, it was etched into clay tablets in ancient Mesopotamia, in the Sumerian and Akkadian languages. The earliest cuneiform texts that contain the Mesopotamian flood story date to the early 2nd millennium BCE, a time known as the Old Babylonian Period, roughly 2000 to 1600 BCE. We will begin with the Sumerian version of the story, excavated from the ancient Sumerian city of Nippur, the story begins with creation, where the gods An, Enlil, Inki, and Ninhursag created humanity and the animals in order that they might do work to provide for the gods. Let them build many cities so that I can refresh myself in their shade. Let them lay the bricks of many cities in pure places. Let them establish places of divination in pure places. And when the fire quenching is arranged, the divine rites and exalted powers are perfected and the earth is irrigated. I will establish well-being there. After a fragmentary section, the story continues describing how kingship descended from heaven to earth and the cities were built in Sumer. These sacred cities were assigned to individual gods. Inki was to lead Eridu, Sud was over Shirupak, and the sun god Utu was placed in charge of Sippar. The land had been established, the right to rule had been granted by the gods, and the sacred temples had been built in the cities for the benefit of their gods. All was right with the world, but it was not to last. The text again becomes fragmentary, but we can see that something eventually went wrong. The gods convened and determined that they would send a flood over all the earth in order to destroy their creation. An, Enlil, Inki, and Ninhursag made all the gods of heaven and earth take an oath by invoking An and Enlil, but Inki quietly dissented, having taken the oath not to reveal these plans to humanity. 
he could not simply warn the people. Instead, through his cunning, he descended to earth and found Ziud Sudra, the one of long life, who would ultimately survive the flood. Inki could not simply warn Ziud Sudra. Instead, he spoke to a wall that Ziud Sudra was standing near. Side wall standing at my left side. Side wall, I will speak words to you. Take heed of my words. Pay attention to my instructions. A flood will sweep over. A decision that the seed of mankind is to be destroyed has been made. The verdict, the word of the divine assembly cannot be revoked. The order announced by An and Enlil cannot be overturned. Inki then explains to Ziud Sudra what he is to do to survive. Although the text is broken in the section that describes the instructions and the building of the boat, when the story picks back up, we see the flood had finally happened. All the windstorms and gales arose together, and the flood swept over. After the flood had swept over the land, and waves and windstorms had rocked the huge boat for seven days and seven nights, Utu, the sun god, came out, illuminating heaven and earth. Ziud Sudra could drill an opening in the huge boat, and the hero Utu entered the huge boat with his rays. Ziud Sudra, the king, prostrated himself before Utu. The king sacrificed oxen and offered innumerable sheep. In the final section of the story, the gods determine what to do with Ziud Sudra, as they had not expected anyone to survive the flood. More and more animals disembarked onto the earth. Ziud Sudra, the king, prostrated himself before An and Enlil. An and Enlil treated Ziud Sudra kindly. They granted him life like a god. They brought down to him eternal life. At the same time, because of preserving the animals and the seed of humankind, they settled Ziud Sudra, the king, in an overseas country in the land of Bilmun, where the sun rises. We now turn our attention to the famous Akkadian story of Atrahasis, part of the old Babylonian flood tradition from Mesopotamia. The story opens with the lesser gods doing the work of forced labor, work that would later be placed upon mankind. When gods were men, they did forced labor. They bore drudgery. Great indeed was the drudgery of the gods. They forced labor was heavy the misery too much. The great gods Anu, Enlil, and Inki divided up the world, An taking the sky as his home, Enlil taking the earth, and Inki dwelling in the Apsu, the freshwater sphere under the earth. The lesser gods toiled and labored, eventually rebelling against the great gods. Eventually, the great gods decided to create humanity by killing the lesser god who started the rebellion and mixing him with clay to create humans, who would then bear the load of serving the gods. Humanity begins to reproduce. Twelve hundred years had not gone by. The land had grown numerous. The peoples had increased. The land was bellowing like a bull. The god was disturbed with their uproar. Enlil heard their clamor. He said to the great gods, 
The clamor of humankind has become burdensome to me. I am losing sleep to their uproar. Enlil devises a plan to get some sleep, decimate humanity. He first attempts to send a plague, but Inki, just as in the Sumerian Flood story, tells a human by the name of Atrahasis, exceedingly wise, how to save everyone from the plague, and humanity continues to make noise. After another 1200 years, the noise continues to increase, and Enlil devises another plan. Cut off provisions for the peoples. Let plant life be too scantly for their hunger. Let Adad, the storm god, withdraw his reign. Below, let the flood not come up from the depths. Again, Inki advises Atrahasis who rescues humanity. Finally, Enlil decides to send a flood, but not before Inki swears an oath that he will not make known the plan of the gods to humanity. As in the Sumerian story, Inki uses his cunning to circumvent his oath. Wall, listen to me. Read, Wall. Pay attention to my words. Flee house, build boat, forsake possessions, and save life. The boat that you build, cover her with tarpaulins. Roof her over like the depths, so that the sun will not see inside her. Let her be roofed over fore and aft. The gear should be very firm. The pitch should be very firm. Make her strong. Atrahasis goes to people in his city and gets them to help him construct the boat. And he gathers animals and other provisions. When the time for the flood actually came, he was ready. The outlook of the weather changed. Adad began to roar in the clouds. The god they heard his clamor. He brought pitch to fill his door. By the time he had bolted his door, Adad was roaring in the clouds. The winds were furious as he set forth. He cut the mooring rope. He released the boat. The storm that brought the flood was so terrible, so violent, that even the gods themselves were afraid. The gods became afraid of the clamor of the deluge. They took refuge in heaven. They crouched outside. Anu became afraid of the clamor of the deluge. It was terrifying the gods. Furthermore, they realized that without humanity to serve them, they were unable to eat and drink, for humans provided their daily provisions. They immediately regretted their decision to annihilate humanity. There is a break in the text, but when it picks back up, it appears that the flood has subsided and Atrahasis has offered sacrifices to the gods. The gods sniffed the savor. They were gathered like flies around the offering. After they had eaten the offering, Nintu arose to rail against all of them. Where has Anu come to, the chief decision maker? Has Inlil drawn nigh the incense? They who irrationally brought about the flood and relegated the peoples to catastrophe. The end of the story is again fragmentary, but Inlil finds out that Atrahasis has survived. The warrior Enlil saw the vessel and was filled with anger at the Igigi gods. All we great Anuna gods resolved together on an oath. Where did life escape? How did a man survive the catastrophe? Anu made ready to speak and said to the warrior Enlil, Who could do this but Inki?
The final Mesopotamian story that we will cover that preserves the flood story is the Epic of Gilgamesh. Another text that goes back to the old Babylonian period. Although the flood story is contained in Tablet 11 of the Epic, we should briefly explain the events leading up to the telling of the story. Gilgamesh, who was two-thirds divine, was an unruly king of the city of Uruk. The people of Uruk ask the gods to help, and they create Enkidu, who has commonality with the animal kingdom and lives in the steep outside the city. He is eventually made human and brought to meet Gilgamesh, and together they go on grand adventures in order to make a name for themselves. Ultimately, however, Enlil becomes displeased with some of their actions, and Enkidu is condemned to die. After mourning the loss of his friend, Gilgamesh feels his own mortality and sets off to find eternal life. This ultimately leads him to the end of the world, across the Sea of Death, where he finds Utnapishtim, meaning I found life. A man who had gained immortality. When Gilgamesh asked Utnapishtim how he was able to find eternal life, he told him the story of how he survived the flood. Utnapishtim described how the gods determined to send a flood to destroy humanity. Their father Anu swore an oath, and their counselor, the hero Enlil, their chamberlain, the god Ninurta, and their sheriff, the god Enugi. Princely Ea swore with them also, repeating their words to a fence made of reed. O fence of reed, O wall of brick, hear this, O fence, pay heed, O wall, O man of Sherupak, son of Ubartutu, demolish the house and build a boat. Abandon wealth and seek survival. Spurn property, save life. Take on board the boat all living things seed. Utinapishtim builds the boat and gathers the animals and all his provisions. The flood came and the gods became terrified at the storm and regretted sending the flood. Even the gods took fright at the deluge. They fret and went up to the heaven of Anu, lying like dogs curled up in the open. The goddess cried out like a woman in childbirth. Belet Eli wailed, whose voice is so sweet. The olden times have turned to clay, because I spoke evil in the gods' assembly and declare a war to destroy my people. It is I who give birth. These people are mine. And now, like fish, they fill the ocean. The storm eventually relented, and the boat ran aground on Mount Nimush. The seventh day when it came, I brought out a dove. I let it loose. Off went the dove, but then it returned. There was no place to land. So back it came to me. I brought out a swallow, I let it loose. Oft went the swallow, but then it returned. There was no place to land, so back it came to me. I brought out a raven, I let it loose. Off it went, the raven. It saw the waters receding, finding food, bowing and bobbing. It did not come back to me. Utnapishtim disembarks offers sacrifices, and the gods gather around the sacrifice. Enlil discovers that humans have sacrificed. Then at once Enlil arrived. He saw the boat. He was seized with anger, filled with rage at the divine Igigi. From where escaped this living being? No man was meant to survive the destruction. After it is revealed how they survived, Enlil grants Utnapishtim 
and his wife a special gift. In the past, Utnapishti was a mortal man, but now he and his wife shall become like us, gods. Utnapishti shall dwell far away, where the rivers flow forth. So far away they took me, and settled me where the rivers flow forth. The Flood Story in the Bible The biblical flood story follows the same pattern as what we have seen thus far in the Mesopotamian traditions, with a few important distinctions that we will cover later. Genesis 6 opens with human beings greatly multiplying, just as we have seen in other stories. However, divine beings come down and procreate with human women. In this context, the story describes humanity as being incredibly wicked, leading to Yahweh regretting that he had even created them. He then resolves to destroy all humans save for Noah and his family. He instructs Noah on how to build a boat and to gather animals to bring aboard. Yahweh sends the flood and destroys all life on earth, save for those on the boat. After the flood waters recede, Noah sends out his birds to see if the waters had gone down far enough for land to come back into view. After forty days, Noah opened a window he had made in the ark and sent out a raven. And it kept flying back and forth until the water had dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove to see if the water had receded from the surface of the ground. But the dove could find nowhere to perch, because there was water over all the surface of the earth. So it returned to Noah in the ark. He reached out his hand and took the dove and brought it back to himself in the ark. He waited seven more days and again sent out the dove from the ark. When the dove returned to him in the evening, there in its beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. Then Noah knew that the water had receded from the earth. Noah and his family ultimately disembark and offer sacrifices to Yahweh, who smells the sacrifice and is pleased. The Flood Narrative in Enoch The Book of Enoch also describes the Flood in an expanded form of what we see in the Book of Genesis. When the sons of men had multiplied, in those days beautiful and comely daughters were born to them, and the watchers, the sons of heaven, saw them and desired them. And they said to one another, Come. Let us choose for ourselves wives from the daughters of men, and let us beget children for ourselves. When these angelic beings begun to mate with the human women, they taught them sorcery, charms, cutting of roots and plants, along with a host of divination practices. When we come to the flood story, Noah realizes that destruction is on the horizon. He travels to the ends of the earth and finds his great-grandfather Enoch. To find out what is happening, Enoch replies, A command has gone forth from the presence of the Lord against the inhabitants of the earth, that their end is accomplished, for they have learned all the secrets of the angels and all the violence of the satans and all their powers the hidden secrets and all the powers of those who practice sorcery and the powers of brightly colored garments and the powers of those who cast molten images for all the earth. Leaving no question as to the reason for the flood, the text reads, Because of their iniquity, their judgment has been accomplished and will not be withheld in my presence. Because of the sorceries that they have searched out and learned, the earth will be destroyed and those who dwell on it, and these will never have a place of refuge forever. 
for they have shown them what is hidden, and they are judged. But as for you, my son, the Lord of Spirits knows that you are pure and blameless of this reproach concerning the mysteries. God eventually tells Noah, Your lot has come up to me, a lot without blame, a lot of love and uprightness. And now the angels are making a wooden vessel. And when the angels have completed that task, I will put my hand upon it and protect it. And from it will come the seed of life and a change will take place so that the earth will not remain desolate. The story is not told in the same detail, but the destruction of the world by the flood with Noah being saved in a boat remains the same. Points of Contact Let's look at some of the specific lexical connections that can be seen in the Genesis flood story, starting with Genesis 6.14. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make the ark into compartments and cover it inside and out with pitch. The Hebrew word kofer, pitch, that appears in this verse is highly suggestive of dependence of the biblical flood story on the Mesopotamian accounts. This word appears only here in Genesis 6.14. It shows up nowhere else in the Bible. Conversely, its Akkadian cognate, Kupru, is very common and it shows up in a wide variety of contexts, including, you guessed it, the flood stories in both Atrahasis and the Epic of Gilgamesh. In Atrahasis, Ea gives these instructions for building the Ark. Roof it over like the depths, so that the sun will not see inside her. Let her be roofed over fore and aft. The gear should be very firm. The pitch, kapru, should be firm. Make her strong. Similarly, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, we see the building of the Ark in progress. At the first glimmer of dawn, the land was assembling at the gate of Atrahasis. The carpenter carried his adze. The reed cutter carried his stone. The shipwright carried his broad axe. The young men, the old men, brought the coiled palm fiber. The wealthy carried pitch, kupru. In short, in both Atrahasis and the Epic of Gilgamesh, in the sections describing the building of the Ark, this very common word, kupru, pitch, bitumen, is used to describe how the Ark is supposed to be sealed. In Genesis 6.14, we see the same Semitic word, kofer, in the exact same context. But moreover, this is the only place where the word appears in the Old Testament. Furthermore, there is another word for pitch, hemar, that appears elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible three times, Genesis 11.3, 14.10, and Exodus 2.3. This means that Hebrew already had a perfectly suitable word that referred to a substance that was used to seal the outside of something to make it watertight, and yet the author of this story opted for an entirely foreign cognate in its place. Another interesting word is used in Genesis 8-2. The headwaters of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped up, Sakar, and the rain from heaven was held back. This word, Sakar, is another of these rare words appearing in the Hebrew Bible only twice. Here, and in Psalm 63, 12. However, its Akkadian cognate, Sekeru, is very common. And as you might expect, it occurs in contexts that speak of the stopping up of the waters in one version of Atrahasis. Adad, the storm god, above made his rain scarce 
below the river was blocked up, Sekeru, and did not raise the flood from the abyss. The fields diminished their yields. The immediate contexts in these two flood narratives are not the same. Atrahasis is speaking of stopping up the waters to keep the crops from growing, while Genesis 8 speaks of stopping up the waters to end the flood itself. Nevertheless, the fact that this very rare word is used in common between both texts to describe the same scenario seems more than a simple coincidence. Before we conclude this section, let's look at one final point of contact in the flood account, the story of Noah sending out the dove. As you recall, from the introduction to this chapter, there is a clear parallel to this portion of the story in the Epic of Gilgamesh. I brought out a dove and set it free. The dove soared off in search of food. No landing place appeared to it, so it came back. I brought out a swallow and set it free. The swallow soared off in search of food. No landing place appeared to it, so it came back to me. I brought out a raven and set it free. The raven soared off and saw the ebbing of the waters. It ate, scratched, and bobbed its head, so it did not come back. While there are clear parallels between imagery here and in Genesis 8, there appears to be a more precise connection with verse 9a and tablet 11, line 150. These lines read, But the dove did not find a perch for the sole of its foot, and it returned to him to the ark. Genesis 8, verse 9. No perch was available for it, and it came back to me. Gilgamesh, tablet 11, verse 150. If there is a direct textual dependence of the biblical text on the Epic of Gilgamesh, then the later author would have translated the Akkadian line into Hebrew. Lo and behold, here, there is a strong conceptual similarity between these two lines. What's the point? There is an overall point to the story of the flood in Genesis. If you recall from Genesis 1, following their creation, humanity was charged to multiply and spread out through the earth. This command shows up again at the end of the flood account, and is ultimately resolved by force in Genesis 11. As we discussed above, this is part of a long literary movement throughout the primeval history used to make a series of theological points. In this case, the priority of Yahweh's commission for humanity to multiply and fill the earth is in view. However, beginning in Genesis chapters 2 and 3, humanity crosses the boundary established between humans and deities by partaking of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, becoming wise and godlike. Yahweh sends them out of the garden, and over time, humanity becomes numerous on the earth, and they again cross the boundary between deities and humans, Genesis 6, 1-4. In the flood, Yahweh essentially hits the reset button, returning the world to its pre-creation watery chaotic state. For example, in Genesis 7, Verses 11 through 23, we read of the water above the sky returning and the water under the earth coming back up. When compared to Genesis 1, verses 1 through 2, you see that the text is telling of an uncreation and a return to the pre creation state. The result of the flood is a new beginning with Noah and his family culminating with the reiteration of God's command in Genesis 1.28 to go and fill the earth. As we noted above, humanity fails to obey this directive, but instead joins together, 
to again attempt to cross the boundary between human and divine, by Cain building a city, and after the flood, Noah's descendants build a tower to reach heaven. This arc within the narrative strongly suggests that the primeval history is acting as an intentional inversion to Mesopotamian thought and traditions, particularly with respect to civilization. It should come as no surprise, therefore, that scholars see the flood story with all its points of apparent intertextuality as a counter narrative to the Mesopotamian flood stories. It has been argued by scholars that one of the ways that the Genesis flood story responds to the Mesopotamian flood narratives is by contrasting the actions of the deities involved. Consider the story of Atrahasis. The flood is brought upon humanity, and the text reads, The goddess saw it, weeping, the midwife of the gods, the wise mammy. Let the day grow dark, let it turn back to gloom. In the assembly of the gods, how did I agree with them on annihilation? She continues. Where has Anu gone to? The chief decision maker whose sons the gods heeded his command. He who irrationally brought about the flood and relegated the peoples to catastrophe. We even see the gods commanded annihilation. Enlil committed the evil deeds against the peoples. Similarly, the Epic of Gilgamesh reads, The gods should come to the incense offering, but Enlil should not come to the incense offering because he brought on the flood without thinking and marked my people for destruction. When you view the story of Atrahasis as a whole, you see that one of the main points of the narrative is to explain why so many humans die in birth or why some women cannot conceive. This contrasts sharply with what we have argued the Genesis narrative is emphasizing, as the focus is on the command, Be fruitful and multiply. More than this counter to the population reduction theme in the Mesopotamian tradition, it is likely that the Genesis flood account contrasts Yahweh's justification for sending the flood over against that which is seen in Atrahasis and the Epic of Gilgamesh. If Enlil and the other gods were considered lacking in judgment, and even evil in bringing the flood, what about Yahweh? The text does not leave us to wonder. And Yahweh saw the wickedness of humanity in the land was great, and every intention of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil all the time. And Yahweh was sorry that he had made humanity on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Genesis 6, 5-6 through six. Was Yahweh capricious and hasty in his destruction of the earth? Absolutely not. Far from the evil action of Enlil, Yahweh was morally bound to bring about the flood. At least that is how the authors who penned this myth tried to paint their god in this myth. It doesn't seem as bad, especially if one sees this god as just another ancient Near Eastern deity with limitations on what the humans were going to do from the start. How's that for a mind-blowing revelation? It seems that those clever biblical authors took the earlier flood traditions, which had been cherished stories in the ancient Near East for countless generations, and flipped the script to create their own flood myth. I owe a huge thanks to Dr. Joshua Bowen, an expert in Assyriology and Hebrew Bible studies, for his invaluable insights into the intricate details of this video. 
The man is a linguistic genius, practically fluent in Sumerian, Akkadian, Aramaic, Hebrew, and more. And he's up to date with the latest scholarship in the field. His book, The Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament, is an absolute goldmine of information on these topics and beyond. If you're serious about diving deeper, you can find it on Audible or grab a hardback copy. The link is in the description. Hello, myth seekers. Ever wondered why Noah, after surviving a flood, decided to curse his son Ham? Or what cheeky deed Ham might have committed against dear old dad? And hold on to your togas, because things are about to get even spicier as we delve into the uh, rather intimate relationship Lot shared with his daughters. But wait, there's more. Prepare to be blown away as we unravel how these biblical tales are not just kissing cousins with Mesopotamian myths, but might also be winking at the Greek gods, their spicy family dramas, and yes, even the snip-snip tale of Oranos. So brace yourselves, because we're about to embark on a myth-busting journey of epic proportions, exposing the genealogic of these ancient stories. Let's dive in. Curse of Ham, Family Drama In the book of Genesis, the curse of Ham is described as a curse which was imposed upon Ham's son, Canaan, by the patriarch Noah. It occurs in the context of Noah's drunkenness, and it is provoked by a shameful act which was perpetrated by Noah's son, Ham, who saw the nakedness of his father. The exact nature of Ham's transgression and the reason Noah cursed Canaan when Ham had sinned has been debated for over 2,000 years. The story's original purpose may have been to justify the biblical subjection of the Canaanites to the Israelites, but in later centuries the narrative was interpreted by some Christians, Muslims, and Jews as an explanation for black skin, as well as a justification for slavery of black people. Similarly, some in the Latter-day Saint movement used the curse of Ham to prevent the ordination of black men to its priesthood. Nevertheless, most Christians, Muslims, and Jews now disagree with such interpretations, because in the biblical text, Ham himself is not cursed, and race or skin color is never mentioned. While Genesis 9 never says that Ham was black, he became associated with black skin through folk etymology, deriving his name from a similar but actually unconnected word meaning darker brown. This isn't the focus of today's episode, but it's worth noting for those still peddling this nonsense. Let's get past the ridiculous, racist nonsense of the past and move forward with better understanding. Genesis chapter 9, verses 20 to 27. Noah began to be a man of the soil and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders and walked backwards and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan 
be his servant. I just want to highlight how crazy it is that Canaan gets cursed for his father Ham's deeds. This really sounds like a horrific way of repaying justice for one man's wrongs, especially taking it out on your grandson because of what your son did to you. We should all see that this isn't something we should ever do to our own children. Agreed? Good. Now let's move on. The mystery of Ham's misdeed and what did he do? Scholars have long puzzled over Ham's wrongdoing in the biblical narrative. They've narrowed it down to several interpretations. Voyeurism. Many believe Ham's act of seeing his father Noah naked wasn't grave enough to merit the harsh curse that followed. However, in Genesis 9.23, Shem and Japheth cover their father, suggesting they took the act of seeing someone's nakedness quite literally. Historical context supports this in some ways. In ancient Babylonia, looking at someone's private parts was a significant taboo. There's also a suggestion that Ham did more than just see. He may have spoken about his father's vulnerable state in public, leading to humiliation. Ancient texts like the Targum Ungelis and the Cave of Treasures imply that Ham's ridicule, not just his act of seeing, angered Noah. Paternal incest. Historically, some wondered if seeing someone's nakedness was a euphemism for a sexual act, as hinted in Leviticus 20 verse 17. This interpretation deepens with suggestions from ancient texts, like the Babylonian Talmud, proposing Ham might have physically harmed or even had a sexual encounter with Noah. Some Greek Bible translations and parallels drawn from Greek and Hittite myths support this theory. Maternal incest. A modern perspective championed by scholars like Bergsma and Han theorizes Ham had relations with his mother. Leviticus 20 verse 11 gives weight to this interpretation. The emphasis on Canaan's curse rather than Ham's could be seen as evidence that Canaan was the result of this forbidden relationship. In summary, while Ham's exact misdeed remains debated, scholars continue to explore and interpret its meaning, drawing from both ancient texts and modern insights. Violation of Religious Tradition Devorah DeMont highlights that the Book of Jubilees presents Noah's actions from planting to drinking wine in alignment with the Torah's guidelines. As a result, Noah's intoxication seems less concerning and Ham's error becomes even more significant. DeMont points out that the details of Noah's actions in Jubilees 7, 1 through 6 are consistent with specific interpretations from the Second Temple Judaism period regarding Leviticus 19, 23 through 25 and Numbers 29, 1 through 6. In this perspective, Ham's misdeed isn't just an act of disrespect toward his father, but also a breach of religious festival practices. Grave familial offense. The medieval scholar Rashi delves into the nature of Ham's transgression against Noah. He references varied rabbinic views. Some suggest Ham castrated Noah, while others believe Ham had a homosexual encounter with him. Rashi draws from the Sanhedrin 70a, emphasizing that those who think Ham was involved with his father sexually also agree with the castration theory. Rashi further contemplates Ham's motive. He suggests Ham reasoned that since the first man, Adam, had two sons and one killed the other over inheritance, Noah, with three sons, shouldn't desire a fourth due to potential conflicts. Interpretation of Ham's wrongdoing ranged from religious disrespect to severe familial offenses, reflecting diverse scholarly perspectives. In this episode, I'm going to give you a strong case for why the castration incest model makes the most sense. But first, I need to reveal some necessary information that might help us discover why this model makes the most sense. Let's go ahead with the biblical context and point out that in the book of Genesis, you have Noah and Lot suspiciously sharing some shocking elements that might help us before we see the Greek connections. Genesis 19, 23 through 38. By the time Lot reached Zoar, the sun had risen over the land, 
Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, destroying all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land. But Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the plain, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land like smoke from a furnace. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham, and he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot had lived, Lot and his daughters. Lot and his two daughters left Zoar and settled in the mountains, for he was afraid to stay in Zoar. He and his two daughters lived in a cave. One day the older daughter said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is no man around here to give us children as is the custom all over the earth. Let's get our father to drink wine and then sleep with him and preserve our family line through our father. That night, they got their father to drink wine and the older daughter went in and slept with him. He was not aware of it when she lay down or when she got up. The next day, the older daughter said to the younger, last night I slept with my father. Let's get him to drink wine again tonight, and you go in and sleep with him, so we can preserve our family line through our father. So they got their father to drink wine that night also, and the younger daughter went in and slept with him. Again, he was not aware of it when she lay down or when she got up. So both of Lot's daughters became pregnant by their father. The older daughter had a son, and she named him Moab. He is the father of the Moabites of today. The younger daughter also had a son, and she named him Ben-Ami. He is the father of the Ammonites of today. Here is a comparison between Genesis 9 with Noah and Genesis 19 with Lot. Noah had a world cataclysm by water. Lot had a world cataclysm by fire. Survivor of this cataclysm, Noah survives. Lot, survivor of this cataclysm. Noah, he drank wine and got drunk. Lot, he drank wine and got drunk. Noah, his offspring saw his nakedness, literally. Lot, his offspring saw his nakedness, literally. And in this case, it's explicitly sexual. Noah, he woke and knew what his youngest son did to him. Lot, he woke and did not know what his daughters did with him. Noah, national genealogies mentioned after this catastrophe from his seed, the table of nations. Lot, national genealogies mentioned after this catastrophe from his seed, concluding with Ammonites and Moabites similar to the Table of Nations. We could go on to mention that whatever happened to Noah after Ham saw his nakedness had implications to his offspring. Whatever happened in Noah's tent, the result was not a pregnant person as with Lot his two daughters both get pregnant and birth the fathers of nations similar to the table of nations list mentioned after this Jerry Springer scene earlier in Genesis. You can now see how just biblically one could see why a sexual deed makes the most sense just by comparison in the same book, Genesis. Strange detail to note. Did Lot and his daughters really grab a bottle of wine before God nuked Sodom? Does this detail make any literal historical sense? Another strange detail by this author is trying to make Lot look innocent for having sex with his two daughters. A day or two earlier, Lot was offering his two virgin daughters to the raging mob that wanted to sexually take his angelic guests for a ride. Wouldn't Lot have questions of how his two daughters are now birthing 
two sons when they were virgins before they left and thought no one else was left on earth? If you think this is real history, you've been hoodwinked. It's time to wake up and ask real questions. Lot cannot remain completely innocent in this narrative. He needs to know something's up. Next, we will turn to the Greek world for answers, ignored by 99% of critical scholars. They either ignore it because they honestly have never seriously considered these comparisons due to their models of these portions of the Bible being older than this Greek connection. In a nutshell, most of the scholars are working off a model of comparing Genesis exclusively to Mesopotamian mythology using the documentary hypothesis. If something doesn't match the Mesopotamian world, they are quick to posit it as unique creation by the biblical author. The search for mythical antecedents stop there. Why? Often it is because these academics prefer to stay with consensus on this issue. But MythVision wants to explore all options. We are changing the understanding of the Bible for the world to see. Thanks to scholars who are pushing the boundaries, such as Thomas L. Thompson, Nils Peter Lemke, Russell Gamirkin, Philip Vadenbaum, and several others willing to challenge the status quo. I hope that more people will see that we're even challenging those who hold to the documentary or supplementary hypothesis. That is our goal, is to stretch the boundaries and break free of the limitations on what we can explore as long as there's sufficient and good reason to explore that path. Greek mythology describes various great floods throughout ancient history. Differing sources refer to the flood of Ajages, the flood of Deucalion, and the flood of Dardanus, though often with similar or even contradictory details. Like most flood myths, these stories often involve themes of divine retribution, the savior of a culture hero, and the birth of a nation or nations. In addition to these floods, Greek mythology also says the world was periodically destroyed by fire, such as in the myth of Phaeton. In Plato's Timaeus, there have been and there will be many and diverse destructions of mankind, of which the greatest are by fire and water, and lesser ones by countless other means. For in truth, the story that is told in your country as well as ours, how once upon a time Phaeton, son of Helios, yoked his father's chariot and because he was unable to drive it along the course taken by his father, burned up all that was upon the earth and himself perished by a thunderbolt. That story, as it is told, has the fashion of a legend, but the truth of it lies in the occurrence of a shifting of the bodies in the heavens which move around the earth and the destruction of the things on the earth by fierce fire, which recur at long intervals. At such times all they that dwell on the mountains and in the high and dry places suffer destruction more than those who dwell near to rivers and or the seas. And in our case, the Nile, our savior in other ways, saves us also at such times from this calamity by rising high. And when on the other hand, the gods purge the earth with a flood of waters, all the herdsmen and shepherds that are in the mountains are saved. But those in the cities of your land are swept into the sea by the streams. Whereas in our country neither then nor at any other time does the water pour down over the fields from above. On the contrary, it all tends naturally to well up from below. Hence it is for these reasons that what is here preserved is reckoned to be most ancient. The truth being that in every place there is, there is excessive heat or cold, to prevent it there always exists some human stock, now more, now less in number. And if any event has occurred that is noble or great in any way conspicuous, whether it be in your country or in ours or in some other place of which we know by report, all such events are recorded from of old and preserved here in our temples, whereas your people and the others are but newly equipped every time with letters and all sorts are civilized states required, and when, after the usual interval of years, like a plague, the flood from heaven comes sweeping down afresh upon your people. It leaves none of you but the unlettered and uncultured, so that you become young as ever, with no knowledge of all that happened in old times, in this land, or in your own. I want you to notice that Plato, along with several of the other myths that have both water and fire, 
destructions or cataclysms, world shattering events that go by fire and water. He says those in the high places, they are in a good spot when it comes to floods because flood rises. And those who are near water see uh, rivers. Mankind's always been next to these kind of bodies of water, which is why we have a common theme of flood myths. Not because there's some real historical universal flood that all of these stories stem from, but because that is how humans are. We tell stories. And if you live near water, water rises, floods happen, you're going to end up having stories about flood accounts. It's going to be built into the ritual and cultural fabric of your society. But in the Bible, notice you have a flood with Noah and you have a fire destruction with Lot, as we've already seen the comparisons between the two, with the sexual acts, with the getting drunk, with the generations and the national genealogies, the whole nine, there's no reason to not see these linked together. And there is no Mesopotamian myth that compares with these both fire and water destructions in them. Here is a summary of an extensive article written by Guy Darshan out of the University of Chicago, which is extremely relevant to this Genesis scene. Comparing Greek and Biblical genealogies and flood narratives. Greek myths in the Bible both speak of a significant flood. While there are unique elements in the Biblical stories, such as Noah's vineyard planting post-flood, and a detailed lineage of his descendants, these are not present in Mesopotamian flood accounts. Instead, scholars believe these were quote-unquote original biblical additions because they aren't present in the Mesopotamian stories. But I ask, why not look to the Greek world? The Mesopotamian flood hero Utnapishtim, unlike Noah, does not live among people after the flood, but with the gods. Early Greek writings between the 7th to 5th centuries BCE show similarities to the biblical version. Upon discovering ancient Greek texts like the Catalog of Women, scholars found closer parallels between Greek and biblical genealogies. Early 20th century researchers identified similarities between biblical genealogies and those in the Greek traditions. Specifically, Genesis 10 delineates how various nations descended from Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. This account describes how regions like Asia Minor, Egypt, Nubia, and the Syrian expanse had roots tracing back to these sons and thus to Noah. Another part of Genesis depicts the ancestry of regions like Babylonia, Egypt, Canaan, and the Arabian areas. This way of organizing world populations by lineage and region is unique to biblical literature, with no close parallels in the ancient Near Eastern text. As Claus Westerman contends, quote, The table of nations is unique and has no parallel either inside or outside the Old Testament. But that isn't the case, according to Guy Darshan. The Greek genealogical traditions provide an interesting comparison. Just as the biblical table of nations traces nations back to Noah, the Greek accounts trace many Mediterranean nations back to figures from Argive myths, like Pharaonus and his descendants. They include places like Egypt, Libya, Lycia, Crete, and Phoenicia in their genealogies. In both Biblical and Greek traditions, there's a pattern of tracing ethnic groups back to a pivotal figure related to a flood narrative. In the Bible, it's Noah. In Greek tradition, it's Deucalion, the Greek flood hero. Both are said to have three sons, leading to a large portion of their respective world's nations and tribes. Greek writings from around the 6th century BCE, like those of logographers Hecateus of Miletus and Acusilus of Argos, showcase these genealogies. They typically start with a flood narrative, often mentioning Deucalion, and then detail the origin of the Greeks and other nations. Although our understanding of the full early Greek flood narratives is limited due to fragmentary sources, the concept of a deluge and the ancestry that follows is firmly established in both traditions. 
The details and focuses may differ, but both ancient cultures sought to understand and categorize their worlds through a lens of lineage and pivotal ancestral figures. Greek genealogies, like that of Acusilus of Argos, often begin with significant events such as floods. Furthermore, in Greek tales, Deucalion survives a flood, landing on Mount Parnassus after making a sacrifice to Zeus, he and his partner, Pyrrha, throw stones that morph into people, symbolizing repopulation. By the 5th century BCE, Deucalion's story and his connection to prominent Greek figures were well established. Unlike the Mesopotamian flood tales, both Greek and Biblical stories focus on descendants post-flood. An interesting divergence is the Biblical account of Noah planting the first vineyard after the flood, a narrative absent in Mesopotamian versions. This story appears to be uniquely intertwined in both Greek and Biblical narratives, suggesting a shared cultural emphasis on wine and civilization. In essence, both Biblical and Greek accounts merge flood stories with the discovery of wine. They outline the establishment of civilizations post-flood, connecting the event with the planting of the first vineyard or the advent of wine. In summary of the article by Guy Darshan, Greek and Biblical post-flood stories often share structural and thematic similarities, emphasizing genealogies that trace back to the flood's main hero and his descendants. While it's unclear if Greek writers were familiar with the Hebrew Bible or vice versa, according to Guy Darshan, their flood narratives seem to have evolved in parallel. Both narratives draw from Mesopotamian sources, but also introduce distinctive elements, weaving traditions that blend regional content into older genealogical structures. Both Greek and Israelite traditions highlight genealogies that present the flood's protagonist as the origin of humanity, marking civilization's dawn. The detailed development of these genealogies aim to define the identity of nations or ethnic groups, a prevalent trend in Eastern Mediterranean during the early 1st millennium BCE. Overall, while the flood story's roots lie in Mesopotamia, unique elements are exclusive to the Hebrew Bible and Greek writings. Both traditions embed these tales within genealogical lists that detail early human history and the origins of various nations. These accounts offer a rich, picture of ancient narratives and help shed light on the beginnings of humanity and civilization. Inspired by the Greeks Now that we see the Greeks were the head honchos doing these kind of genealogies and that the biblical accounts look very similar, we will now turn to Philip Vazgebom's work, Argonauts of the Desert to take a look into the Greek antecedents to the Noah story. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, lowest of slaves shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed by the Lord my God be Shem, and let Canaan be his slave. May God make space for Japheth, and let him live in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his slave. Genesis 9, 24 through 27. Philip Vajenbaum believes that the prophecy about Japheth, considered the forefather of the Greeks, mirrors the Greeks' arrival in the Near East during the Hellenistic period. Additionally, this tale shares striking parallels with the story from Hesiod's Theogony. In it, Oronos, the sky god, and Gaia, the earth goddess, were close but Oronos wouldn't let their offspring be born. To relieve her pain, Gaia tasked her youngest son, Kronos, to confront Oronos. Armed with a special sickle from his mother, Kronos cut off Oronos' genitals and threw them into the sea. From the ensuing foam, the goddess Aphrodite emerged. But afterwards she lay with heaven and bare deep swirling Oceanus, Cus and Creus, and Hyperion and Lapetus, Thea and Rhea, Themis and Mimosine, and the gold-crowned Phoebe and the lovely Tethys. After them was born Kronos the wily, youngest and most terrible of her children, and he hated his lusty sire, Hesiod Theogony, 130-40. And heaven came, bringing on night and longing for love, and he lay about earth, spreading himself full upon her. 
Then the son from his ambush stretched forth his left hand and in his right took the great long sickle with jagged teeth and swiftly lopped off his own father's members and cast them away to fall behind. Hesiod Theogony 175 to 80. But these sons whom he begot himself great heaven used to call titans, strainers in reproach. For he said that they strained and did presumptuously a fearful deed, that vengeance for it would come afterwards. Hesiod Theogony 207 to 10. Plato believed that certain stories, like the one of Kronos castrating his father, were too scandalous for the general public and should only be shared with a select group. The biblical version seems to be an adaptation of this tale where Kronos' act is replaced by Ham merely seeing his father naked. Interestingly, some Jewish interpretations suggest Ham actually castrated his father. Check out Midrash, Rabbah, and Rashi. The biblical story of Adam and Eve has parallels with Plato's concept of androgyny. Some scholars believe the biblical narrative borrows from Hesiod's myths, but is reimagined to fit Plato's ideals from the Republic. In this retelling, the figures are not gods, but long-lived humans, bridging the gap between gods and men. A key element of this adaptation is the naming of Japhet, which closely resembles the titan Lapidos from Greek mythology. Both narratives involve a youngest son committing an offensive act against his father and include a brother named Japhet. The use of the name Japhet seems intentional, possibly hinting at influence of Greek culture. The sibling oracles from the Roman period oddly mix the biblical and Greek versions of Japhet. This document suggests that the Greek gods were actually legendary humans. This humanizing approach to gods can be traced back to the philosopher Euhemerus, who presented a more logical version of Greek myths. Similarly, the Bible often presents humans in roles typically reserved for gods in Greek mythology. This shift from myth to a more human-centered narrative is evident in the Bible and is further highlighted by the Sibylline oracles. The method of euhemerism, or grounding myth in reality, has been used beyond ancient times. In fact, modern efforts to understand the Bible, like the documentary Hypothesis, can be seen as a rational approach to interpreting divine inspiration. Vadenbaum thumbprints in the name. Several names in Greek and biblical literature are strikingly similar. A prime example is the character Japhet in the Bible, Noah's son. His name is similar to the Greek titan Japhet, or Jepidos, prominently featured in Hesiod's Theogony. Scholars have long recognized this similarity, suggesting that Hesiod might have been influenced by Semitic traditions. In biblical accounts, Japhet is Noah's son. Yet in Greek narratives, like Pindar's Ninth Olympian Ode, Japhet is the father of Prometheus and Epimetheus, who are equated with the biblical figures of Noah and his wife or the Mesopotamian character Utnapishtim. It seems the biblical author knew of the Mesopotamian flood story, evident from details like Noah using birds to find land, similar to the Epic of Gilgamesh, Tablet 11. But the presence of the name Japhet also indicates the writer's familiarity with the Greek version. For instance, in the Bible, Japhet is known as the father of Ion, an ancestor of the Greeks. Interestingly, in Greek accounts, Ion is related to Deucalion and by extension, Japhet, and is seen as the forefather of the Ionian Greeks. The Bible's version simplifies the Greek genealogy, making Japhet directly related to Ion. This suggests the biblical author not only knew about the Greeks, but was also well versed in their mythical family trees. This pattern of modifying and shifting characters in genealogical scales isn't unique to Japhet. For example, the biblical figure Cain seems to be derived from the Greek Canis related to Ixion, the first murderer in humanity according to Greek sources. Another instance is the similarity between the name Er 
from the Bible and Ur, the Pamphylian from Plato's works. These name resemblance or fingerprints, as some may call them, act as clues pointing back to the original sources. For someone familiar with both Greek and biblical narratives, these hints can be enlightening. It's as if Greek classical writings serve as foundational text for the Bible, which creatively builds upon them. By leaving similar names and reshuffling genealogies, the Bible seems to be paying homage to its inspirations. This isn't a mere copy, but rather an intricate reimagining that subtle nods to its origins. This is affirmed by Bruce Loudon in an article Lapidus and Japheth, Hesiod's Theogony, 1 Iliad 15, 187, 93, and Genesis 9-1, which is linked in the description of this video along with other sources. Quote, Genesis, as it adapts the deluge from Mesopotamian sources, for the sequel transforms Hesiod's account of Cronus's castration of Uranus and the unspecified wrongdoing of his brother Lapidus, mixing it with the type of myth depicted in Iliad 15, where three brothers draw lots to determine their portions. This results in Genesis 9 through 10's mysterious depiction of Ham seeing the generals of the drunk Noah, who when awoke curses not Ham, but his son Canaan while bestowing blessings on his two other sons, Shem and Japheth, father of Javan, Greek Ion, parallel wordplay in the Theogony 16 and Genesis affirm the link. Dionysus, the wine god. Dionysus, the Greek god of wine and excess, got the virgin Ara drunk raped her and married her before she sobered up. The god of wine and ecstasy, Dionysus, was madly in love with Aura, a virgin titan goddess who liked to hunt. Desperate for her love, Dionysus used his godly power to create a wine fountain nearby Aura to slake her thirst while hunting. After gulping a lot of the wine, Aura got drunk. Then Dionysus took advantage of her while she was unconscious. But that's not all. Other gods saw the union and convinced Dionysus to marry her. So they threw a wedding for the god and unconscious bride. Upon waking, Ara was furious but helpless against the god. So she could only lament her lost virginity and the fact that she was pregnant with twins. Ara devoured the firstborn of the twins out of anger, while the secondborn was rescued by the gods. It really shouldn't come as a shock that Dionysus the god of wine from the Greek world would have something to do with the vineyard in Noah's story or the drunkenness of Lot with his daughters. Genesis through Kings does a really good job of demythologizing the Greek, Mesopotamian, Egyptian, Canaanite, Phoenician, and other myths. Plato did the same with his own Greek mythologies without the risk of being accused of the same atheistic heresies as Socrates, which was put to death or took his own life. Plato played with these mythological characters, but ultimately believed in one god. And as this series unravels, you'll see much more revealed from the Bible about Plato's thumbprints. I mean, it's no coincidence that Philo of Alexandria, Josephus, Eusebius, and others are making apologetics trying to suggest Plato borrowed from the much older Moses and his laws. We will dispel this myth bringing sober clarity for those drunk on Noah's vineyards. We don't want your nakedness to be seen through nonsensical apologetics. These authors had no choice but to suggest that Plato found inspiration for Moses instead of the accusations that it was the other way by skeptics of their ancient claims. I mean, the fact that people recognized that Plato and the Bible have so much in common that they thought one had to be inspired by the other is an admission we need to further investigate. So just mentioning Dionysus with Aura. She has sexual relationships with Dionysus. She wakes up. There's a marriage event. She's pregnant the whole nine. This looks very similar to kind of a mixture between Lot and Noah in a way. Noah finds out after waking up what his son did to him in his unconscious state. This is exactly what happens to Ara. So you really wonder about the biblical author and how clever they were in not only knowing the myth of Deucalion in the Greek world, but also seeing how this plays into a Dionysian story. 
there could be more going on than one thing, especially if this author is as well read as I think and many of these scholars think these biblical authors probably were on the Greek myths. The Bible owes Plato. Conclusion In today's scholarly exploration, we've delved into the intricate nuances of the Genesis narrative, particularly focusing on the tale of Noah's flood. We discerned the Hellenistic nuances, especially in the peculiar prophecy concerning Japheth's destined residence in Shem's tents, a poignant allusion to the Greeks and the Jews' cultural amalgamation. This offers a compelling argument for the ex eventu nature of the Genesis account, suggesting its composition in the retrospective light of the Hellenistic era. Furthermore, our study unearthed striking parallels between the audacious castration of Uranus by Kronos in Greek lore and the ambitious incident between Ham and Noah. Certain Jewish Midrashic traditions intimate at a similar audacious act, rendering this parallelism more pronounced. While the Mesopotamian mythological framework does offer some foundational constructs, particularly in our initial phases of the Origins of the Bible series, the nuances and details of Genesis find clear resonance with Greek theogonies. Notably, both traditions narrate the transgressions of a youngest son against his father and prominently feature a character named Japheth. Both Mesopotamian myths and Greek myths play a role. If you're only looking at one and not recognizing the Greek one as well, then you're not going to see what we're saying. Our forthcoming documentaries promise to shed more light on the intriguing possibility that the biblical authors might have been inspired by Plato's philosophical musings, contrary to the commonly held apologetic perspective. We aim to traverse the extensive labyrinth of biblical narratives and their corresponding global mythological counterparts. This endeavor seeks to present the hypothesis that not just the initial chapters of Genesis, but the entirety of Israel's narrative history may have been masterfully crafted, possibly during the Hellenistic Epoch. Get ready for a mind-bending journey, because this video is about to challenge even the most serious seekers of knowledge who yearn to unravel the creation accounts in Genesis. We are diving deep into Genesis 1-3, through 3, where you will find the captivating twin creation narratives of the Bible. My last video on Genesis 1-3 through 3, we showed potential mythical antecedents to the Enuma Elish, Epic of Gilgamesh, Atrahasi's Epic, Song of the Ho, and I'm talking about an instrument that is used in agricultural farming, and several other Mesopotamian connections, but there may be better parallels to the Greek world. Now hold on tight, because biblical scholars have long attributed these accounts to two different authors drawing from the well-known documentary hypothesis. In the first account, Genesis 1, we witness the awe-inspiring creation of the heavens and the earth emerging from a primordial chaos, all meticulously laid out within the span of seven days. This narrative prominently features the name Elohim, representing God in the P or priestly source. But then the plot thickens as we shift gears to Genesis 2 through 3, transporting us to the enchanting Garden of Eden. Here we encounter tales of animal and human creation 
the fabled tree of knowledge of good and evil, and the origin of sin and death. Notice how everything is initially crafted as very good in Genesis 1, only to watch and witness the entry of sin and death into the world in Genesis 2 through 3, all attributed to a deity with a different name. Isn't that intriguing? It bears a striking resemblance to Plato's creation accounts, and we'll delve into that connection together, so brace yourself. For centuries, these twin creation stories with their distinct divine names, Yahweh Elohim in Genesis 2 through 3, have been regarded as separate accounts written by different authors, possibly centuries apart, eventually intertwined by a clumsy scribe endeavoring to preserve diverse traditions in the opening chapters of our Bibles. These stories rooted in ancient Mesopotamian myths form a picture of twin creation narratives combined by the biblical editors of Genesis. But wait, are things really as they seem? In the most recent book by Russell Gamirkin, a fascinating perspective emerges. Gamirkin proposes that Genesis 1 through 3 constitutes a singular unified creation story divided into two parts, featuring not just one, but two distinct gods. The first is the supreme cosmic creator portrayed in Genesis 1, while the second is Yahweh, a lowly descendant and one of the biblical sons of God who ruled over the land of Eden. Intriguing, isn't it? This two-part creation story astonishingly finds its origins in a single Greek source, the renowned work of Plato called Timaeus, exploring the origins of the cosmos. So in this video, we will embark on a riveting exploration of Genesis 1-3, through peeling back the layers of these ancient texts and uncovering the astonishing connections to Plato's ideas. Get ready to have your mind expanded as we challenge long-held assumptions and embark on a scholarly and intellectually stimulating journey through the Genesis creation accounts. Russell Gamirkin's revolutionary approach to the origins of the biblical text is anything but conventional. While most biblical scholars focus solely on ancient Mesopotamian sources, Gamirkin takes a bold leap and looks at the Greek sources as well. Yes, you heard that right. Greek sources. Why limit ourselves, right? Here's the thing. The earliest textual evidence for the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible emerges quite late, in the 3rd century BC, after Alexander the Great's conquest during the Hellenistic era. And during this time, the Jews had access to a treasure trove of Greek literature in the illustrious library of Alexandria. So why not entertain the notion that the Bible might have been written as late as the Hellenistic era, drawing from Greek sources. Why should we turn a blind eye to the vast realm of Greek literature? It's time to expand our horizons. Over the years, I've had the privilege of interviewing some of the world's foremost experts in biblical studies, and an intriguing trend has emerged on the horizon. Archaeologist Jonathan Adler, renowned for his work on the origins of Judaism, has unearthed concrete physical evidence 
suggesting that this religion didn't truly flourish until well after the Hellenistic period, specifically during the Hasmonean dynasty and beyond. Adler makes a compelling point. There is a lack of archaeological evidence supporting the practice of the religion described in the biblical corpus by Jews or Israelites during the periods written about in this literature. In fact, he has said something like, there is zero evidence to suggest Jews were practicing this religion before the second century BCE. He's open to being challenged, but the strong evidence points in his favor, as we do find ample evidence emerging during the second century BCE after the Hasmonean dynasty. Mark my words, more scholars will increasingly embrace the idea of Hellenistic composition for the Bible in the coming years. This is my prediction. I can see the writing on the wall. So while Gamirkin examines both ancient Mesopotamian sources and relatively recent Greek sources, it's the Greek parallels that often prove to be more captivating and persuasive. And what better example to illustrate this than the biblical creation stories themselves? Consider the creation account of Genesis 1. Gamirkin notes that creation myths from ancient Mesopotamia and even many from the Greeks are of three major types. So let's go over them. One of those types are theogonies. In the world of theogonies, we encounter texts that explore the origin of gods, depicting their genealogy, birth, and divine lineage. These mythic accounts portray a multitude of divine beings interlinked by family ties, with younger gods emerging as offspring of their elder counterparts. The primary aim of a theogony is to organize and trace the intricate family relations among these gods, revealing the mosaic of divine generations. One of the earliest, most renowned and authoritative theogonies preserved in written form is Hesiod's Theogony which dates back to around 700 BCE in ancient Greece. However, the concept of anthropomorphic family groups of gods extends far beyond Greece, spanning across various civilizations in the ancient Near East. In Egypt, we witness the portrayal of gods in anthropomorphic family structures as exemplified in Plutarch's work on Isis and Osiris. Babylonia represents its own version of divine lineage in the Enuma Elish, while Assyria depicts these dynamics through the Assyrian redaction of the Enuma Elish, featuring Asher as the replacement for Marduk. The Hurrians and Hittites contribute to this rich tradition with their epic of Kumarbi, and the Phoenicians, as evidenced by Philo of Byblos, add their unique perspective. The Canaanite Ugaritic texts of Rosh Shamra, particularly in the Baal cycle, explicitly reveal similar themes of divine family connections. Notably, the Canaanite tradition of El and his 70 sons directly influences the biblical text. Here, the God of the children of Israel is often associated with either El, the ruler of the divine council, or one of El's sons. These echoes of divine familial relationships resonate throughout biblical narratives. For further exploration and detailed sources on the topics discussed in this video, I recommend referring to Gamirkin's book, it serves as a valuable resource shedding light on the origins and interconnectedness of these ancient texts.
Now let us journey into Hesiod's Theogony itself. Within its pages, we encounter gods that are not mere rulers of the heavens and the earth, but rather embody the very essence of nature. Chaos, the first god, is followed by Gaia, the earth, and Uranus, the sky. These gods are not just associated with their domains. They are believed to be inseparable from the divine manifestations of sky and earth themselves. As Hesiod's Theogony unfolds, we discover a pantheon of gods descending from Chaos and Gaia, including deities such as Hemera, day, Oribos, darkness or night, Helios, the sun, Selene, the moon, Oceanos, the world stream or ocean, Pontus, the sea, and many others. In this mythical account, theogony and cosmogony intertwine as the generation of the world becomes intertwined with the activities of the gods their companionship, and their role as parents. Natural phenomena, including the very essence of life, find explanations through the actions of these gods. While not explicitly detailed in the Theogony, the life-giving rain is understood as the heavenly spermata that impregnates Gay, the earth, bringing forth plant life after showers. Yes, you read that right. The imagery evokes the notion of the heavens and the earth engaging in a metaphorical union to bring forth life. Now you know a little bit about the enchanting world of ancient myths and theogonies, where divine generations and cosmic activities intertwine. From the genealogy of gods to the birth of the world itself, these narratives offer profound insights into the origins of existence, intertwining natural phenomena with the divine realms. Category number two are theomachies. Imagine a colossal celestial showdown where the gods themselves engage in an epic battle, a theomachy, if you will. These divine clashes often had cataclysmic consequences here on Earth. But here's the twist. When one supreme god is defeated, paving the way for another to take the throne, we enter the realm of succession myths. These are stories about gods that likely sprouted from the historical replacement of one ruling cult by another. Much like what happens when conquest or migration reshapes the power dynamics. And let me tell you, succession myths sometimes manifested as a series of ages, each marked by its own cosmic catastrophe. Take the Greeks, for example. They had the age of Oranos, where the cosmos itself burst into existence, followed by the age of Kronos, a golden era that birthed the race of humanity, the magnificent golden race. And then, brace yourselves, we have the age of Zeus, which witnessed the rise and fall of not just one, but four successive human races. We're talking about the Silver Race, the Bronze Race, the Race of Heroes, whose swan song coincided with the infamous Trojan War, and finally our current Iron Race. Talk about a tumultuous timeline. Now the shift from the age of Uranus to the age of Kronos didn't involve a full-blown theomachy. No. It was a relatively straightforward case of good old parricide, killing off of the parent. Nothing too dramatic, right? But when it comes to transitioning from the age of Kronos to the age of Zeus, oh boy, buckle up for the Titanomachy. This was a full-blown war of the Titans, a theomachy in all its glory. 
And guess what? The destruction of the Bronze Age of man orchestrated by Zeus also seemed to come with its fair share of cataclysmic upheaval. However, let's be clear, none of these Greek cosmic shakeups directly involved cosmogony itself, the creation of the universe. They were more about the divine power struggles and the changing of the guard. But hey, who needs cosmogony when you have feuding gods and awe-inspiring catastrophes to keep things interesting, right? In the mystical tapestry of the ancient Near East, we find the captivating Enuma Elish, a tell where gods clash in an awe-inspiring theomachy. Here, Marduk, the valiant deity, squares off against Tiamat, the formidable primordial dragon representing watery chaos. But this battle is no ordinary divine scuffle. It carries within it explicit elements of mythical cosmogony. Picture this, Marduk and his forces vanquish Tiamat and her formidable army. As a triumphant display of cosmic craftsmanship, Marduk skillfully cleaves Tiamat's body into two halves, with the upper part becoming the vast expanse of the sky and the lower part forming the solid earth beneath our feet. But Marduk's creative endeavors do not end there. From the blood of a slain, beheaded god, he breathes life into humanity and establishes Babylon as his glorious abode. Talk about divine multitasking. Moving forward, we encounter Barossus and his Babylonica, where he recounts Marduk's original mythological triumph, but he takes it a step further by presenting an allegorical interpretation caters to a significantly literate Greek audience. In this version, Tiamat morphs into a symbol of the primordial darkness and water that existed before our present cosmos. This sounds like Genesis 1's demythologizing narrative. Marduk, in turn, is seen as the radiant sun or the embodiment of light. And those winds? Well, they likely represent the ethereal atmosphere bridging the heavens and the earth, a poetic nod to the forces that aid Marduk in his victorious campaign. Barossus adds a touch of symbolic depth by allegorizing the creation of humans from the blood of a fallen god. This act suggests that mankind possesses a spark of divine wisdom an intimate connection to the gods themselves. A rather profound notion, wouldn't you agree? Now, it's worth mentioning that not all Akkadian theomachies ventured into the realm of cosmogony, but when they did, oh boy, the cosmos became a stage for celestial battles, divine craftsmanship, and allegorical musings on the nature of existence. The ancient Near East truly knew how to infuse their mythologies with intellectual flair. In that realm of ancient cosmogonies, the gods of Canaan have not left behind preserved narratives. However, within the Ugarit Baal cycle, a window opens to an intriguing tradition where Theomachy, the divine battle between gods, illuminates the origins of the world. In this cycle, the valiant Baal emerges victorious over Yam, the embodiment of the unruly sea while also triumphing over Mott and Lotan. These triumphs suggest a rich tradition that perceives the creation of the world through the lens of divine conflict. Moreover, echoes of older Canaanite traditions reverberate through the conquest of Rahab and Leviathan 
enigmatic sea dragons within biblical texts. The battles between Yahweh and Rahab in Job 9 verse 13, as well as Yahweh and Leviathan, bear the markings of a bygone mythical cosmogony, a glimpse into a time when the origin of the world was envisioned as a theomachy, a clash between gods. What unites these battles of cosmic significance is a recurring motif an embattled deity, a conqueror facing off against a sea creature that embodies the forces of watery chaos. The battle between God and Rahab alludes to us in various biblical texts, most notably in Psalms and Job, yet curiously, the cosmic battle motif remains absent from the renowned Genesis 1-1 to 2-3 account. It seems the author consciously chose to strip it of its mythical potential, leaving us to ponder the significance of this omission. Thus, as we delve into these ancient mysteries, we encounter a big mosaic woven with divine conflicts and primordial chaos, the battles between Marduk and Tiamat, Baal and Yam and the biblical God and Rahab or Leviathan offer us glimpses into the human fascination and imagination with cosmic struggles. In these monumental clashes, the conqueror faces off against the chaotic forces of the sea, shaping the very fabric of existence. While the battle between God and Rahab is alluded to in biblical texts, the cosmic battle motif remains concealed within the Genesis account, leaving us to contemplate its significance, a captivating enigma that invites further exploration. However, the lack of this mythical theomachy in Genesis 1-1-2-4 should have us ask whether Barosis and Plato's creation accounts have something to offer us. Palatial World Myths In this type of mythical cosmogony, the world as a whole was envisioned in architectural imagery as a palace or temple laid out and constructed by a god pictured as a king who ruled the cosmos. Such cosmogonies typically featured mythical geography on a world scale that mapped features of the visible and invisible world to architecture features of a royal construction. In the book of Job, the portrait of God as divine designer and architect of the world, plumb line literally in his hand, is explicit. The foundations of the world palace were laid deep in the invisible underworld. The earth itself was the interior of the palace its roof of sealing the sky above. The heavens might be conceived as a solid surface constructed out of beaten brass or iron or as a tent-like fabric spread out across the skies, depending on the form of the construction envisioned. The pillars that held up the sky were usually conceived as distant mountains located at the ends of the earth. As ruler of the universe, the king of the gods was usually pictured as dwelling in a throne room in the heavens. Consequently, the heavens were sometimes pictured as the floor of the celestial throne room constructed of jeweled crystals. As was typical of royal palaces, the divine palace or temple contained numerous storerooms for its treasures. In both the Hebrew Bible, and in one Enoch, these divine treasures were pictured as storehouses containing the elements such as rain, snow, and hell. In this mythical conception of the physical world, various windows were opened in the sky to allow servants of the divine ruler to allow in rain, snow, hell, or winds. Gates in the east were opened to allow the entry of the sun, moon, and stars, which were transported across the heavens by the angels to whom they were entrusted. 
and other gates in the west allowed their departure from the sky. Other gates or stairways allowed passage between the heavenly realm and earth. In the palatial world myth, the ruler of the universe was often pictured as presiding over a divine bureaucracy of lesser gods or angels who acted as royal servants, scribes, and bureaucrats. Divine royal servants were pictured as having been charged with supervising the natural elements and ensuring the orderly operation of the cosmos according to the king's directions. Such cosmological speculations assumed an earlier mythical cosmogony in which the world palace was constructed and its bureaucracy put in place, even when the antecedent story of the architectural design and building of the cosmos has not been preserved. Yet, Genesis is none of these types of Mesopotamian or Greek creation myths, as we covered all three. Instead, as many biblical scholars note, Genesis 1 is largely demythologized, brief, concise, with a minimum of story and many scientific explanations, like the cosmologies of the Greek natural philosophers from Thales to Plato. Indeed, as Gamirkin notes, Genesis 1 is strikingly reminiscent of Plato's Timaeus, a partly mythical, mostly scientific account of the fashioning of the cosmos by the supreme, eternal, monotheistic god of creation that Plato calls the Demiurge or Craftsman. This craftsman or creator god who dwelled outside the material universe, took the original primordial chaos postulated by all Greek philosophers and transformed it into a beautiful, orderly universe, good and perfect in all respects. The craftsmen started by separating out the elements of earth, water, air, and fire or light from the primordial chaos rendering the universe visible. He assigned solid land, water, and air to their proper regions with the fiery sky up above in the dome of the firmament, setting the sky spinning above the earth in a new sequence of day and night, thereby creating time. He then fashioned the sun and moon and set them in their proper places in the sky. He created the various orders of life, the creeping and four-footed animals of the earth, the birds of the sky, and the fish of the deep, the exact same categories found in Genesis 1. And he rejoiced over his creation, declaring, it's supremely good like himself. Finally, he rested from the work of creation, happy to oversee the beautiful world he created from his distant, eternal dwelling beyond the heavens. Gamirkin notes the systematic parallels between Timaeus by Plato and the creation account of Genesis 1. Let's take a look. I want you to pay attention to the similarities and comparisons between Plato's Timaeus and Genesis here. Both have beginnings in chaos and darkness, introduction of light, Introduction of day and night, separation of earth and skies, dome of firmament, separation of earth and seas, creation of plants, days, months, and years, creation of celestial bodies, creation of sea creatures and birds, creation of land animals, creation of humankind, completion of the cosmos and the creator at rest, creation of mortal life by the gods, which leads into another chapter in Genesis. He makes the case that the god Elohim of Genesis 1 was modeled directly on Plato's supreme, eternal, monotheistic god of creation, the Demiurge, or craftsman. And indeed, that the later monotheism of the Jews and Christians originated with Plato's 
Timaeus. But what of the second creation account of Genesis 2 through 3, the story of Yahweh and Adam and Eve? Gamirkin's new book points out that Plato's Timaeus actually had two creation accounts. You see, Plato had a problem, a big problem. His monotheistic philosopher's God was perfect and eternal and everything he created was also perfect and eternal. But humans are profoundly not perfect, flawed, and tragically mortal. How could a perfect eternal God create mortal man? And wouldn't this make God responsible for human wickedness? Plato's solution was brilliant. First, Plato made the supreme monotheistic god of creation, the ancestor of all the traditional gods and goddesses of Greek myth. In doing so, he endorsed Hesiod's Theogony that traced the genealogies of the Greek gods, starting with chaos, heaven and earth, except that now the original ancestor was the demiurge or craftsman of creation. Second, Plato had the eternal God of creation delegate the task of creating life, including humanity, to all his sons and daughters. In a scene that introduces a strong element of the story of myth, Plato had the craftsman gather his sons and daughters around him and instructed them on how to make humans out of the material elements and plant a soul in them, making them a mixture of the material and the divine. After creating humans and other living creatures, the gods were then put in charge of the earth and of humankind, while the monotheistic god of creation retired from the scene, leaving the world to be ruled by his sons and daughters. According to Russell Gamirkin, this is exactly what we see in Genesis 2 through 3, where Yahweh, a local terrestrial god, one of many of the sons of God mentioned in early Genesis, ruling his little corner of the world, the land of Eden. Already in Genesis 1:26, we see the gods plural making humans in their image, male and female. The gods of Genesis, it seems, also included goddesses among their distinguished ranks. Why would it say made in their image, male and female, if both were not creating on the scene? We later also see multiple gods mentioned in Genesis 2 and 3 in the sons of God who married the daughters of men in Genesis 6 and in the story of the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. We thus see an endorsement of benevolent polytheism in Genesis 1 through 11 where multiple sons of God are living across the entire face of the earth, all of them good, but none of them the equal of the supreme eternal God of creation. Under this new model for understanding Genesis, Yahweh is not to be identified with the creator God Elohim of Genesis 1, but is one of the many minor terrestrial gods dwelling on earth something also seen in the Exodus story, which acknowledges other gods ruling Egypt, Moab, and other nations, but claims Yahweh as the special God appointed over the Israelites. But there are no Israelites in the pre-flood world, and Yahweh is instead portrayed as the God of Eden, the ruler of the descendants of Adam and Eve. 
Yahweh was the Son of the Most High appointed over Jacob. Later, in my Genesis 10-11 through video, we will mention the 70 nations of Genesis 10 and the 70 angels over the nations in the Book of Enoch, one angel, or God, per nation. When El Yon gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated humanity, he fixed the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. For Yahweh's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. Deuteronomy 32, 8-9 Fun fact, the Greek god Prometheus reminds us in many ways of Yahweh in Genesis 2-3, through and that both are pictured creating mankind out of clay. Prometheus was the titan god of forethought and crafty counsel, who was given the task of molding mankind out of clay. Some accounts have Prometheus and Athena molding images out of clay and ordered the winds to breathe into them and to quicken them. Sounds like the breathing into the clay in Genesis 2 through 3. The attempts by Prometheus to better the lives of his creation brought him into conflict with Zeus. Firstly, he tricked the gods out of the best portion of the sacrificial feast, acquiring the meat for the feasting of man. Then when Zeus withheld fire, he stole it from heaven and delivered it to mortal kind hidden inside a fennel stalk. As punishment for these rebellious acts, Zeus ordered the creation of Pandora, the first woman as a means to deliver misfortune into the house of man, or as a way to cheat mankind of the company of the good spirits. Sounds kind of like Adam blaming Yahweh for making woman once they ate the fruit. Prometheus, meanwhile, was arrested and bound to a stake on Mount Caucasus, where an eagle was set to feed upon his ever-regenerating liver, or some say heart. Generations later, the hero, that great one, Heracles, came along and released the old titan from his torture. Prometheus was loosely identified in cult and myth with the fire god Hephaestus and the giant Titius. The Book of the Generations of Heaven and Earth Yahweh, one of the many sons of the Creator Elohim, but not Elohim himself. This picture is totally in line with Greek mythology, with Hesiod tracing the theogony or genealogy of the gods, starting with the primordial god Chaos and his offspring, the heavens and earth. Uranus and Gaia, and their various descendants. Plato endorsed this same traditional Greek family tree, starting with Uranus and Gaia, except that he made them the offspring of the creator of craftsmen. Therefore, let the generation of these gods be stated by us, following their account, in this wise of Gay and Aranos were born the children Oceanos and Titius, and of these Phorcus and Cronos, Rhea and all that go with them, and of Cronos and Rhea were born Zeus and Hera, and all those who are, as we know, called their brethren, and of these again other descendants, Timaeus 40e through 41a. In truth, at first chaos came to be, but next wide-bosomed earth, the ever-sure foundation of all the deathless ones who hold the peaks of snowy Olympus and dim Tartarus in the depth of the wide-pathed earth. And earth first bore starry heaven, equal to herself, to cover her on every side and to be an ever-sure abiding place for the blessed gods. Hesiod, Theogony, 116-128 and as Gamirkin points out, Genesis 2-4 also has its own theogony, or genealogy of the gods. Genesis 2-4, Masoretic text. 
These are the generations of heaven and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Genesis 2-4 Septuagint This is the book of the origin of heaven and earth, literally the book of the Genesis of Aronos and Gaia when it originated in the day God made the heaven and the earth. Here we have the title of a new section in Genesis, The Generations of the Heavens and the Earth, Masoretic Text, or The Book of the Genesis of Oranos and Gay, Septuagint. Similar to later sections in Genesis, with titles such as The Generations of Adam or Noah or Shem or Isaac, but in this case, we have The Generations of the Heavens and Earth, just like in Hesiod and Plato's Timaeus, a family history of the gods. It may be significant that in various ancient extra-biblical traditions, El Elyon, the Canaanite Most High God, was also the ancestor of the heavens and earth. The interpretation of heaven and earth as gods may be supported by the Sapphire Treaty which lists as witnesses El and El Yon, heaven and earth, abyss and sources, day and night. In fragment of the Phoenician history of Philo of Byblos was quoted at Eusebius, preparation for the Gospels, 110.15. El Yon, that is El Yon, was said to have been the father of Oranos and Gay who in turn had many other offspring. Gamirkin, Plato's Timaeus, in the Biblical Creation Accounts, 164. Yahweh then is not the creator, but one of the many lesser sons of God. Gamirkin points out that in the story of Genesis 2 through 3, Yahweh appears in a very limited role, not as cosmic creator, but as a terrestrial God who fashions animals, plants, and humans like the sons and daughters of God in Timaeus. And exactly like Plato's Timaeus, Genesis 2-3 through 3 is profoundly concerned with the questions of human wickedness and mortality. According to Gamirkin, it seems evident that the Yahweh in the story of the Garden of Eden is a lesser order of God. Yahweh lives not in the eternal realm, beyond the heavens, but in the earthly land of Eden. He dwells in this earthly paradise among the humans he created, much like the Greek gods dwelled on earth in various Greek mythical accounts. He strolls in the garden planted for his enjoyment, smelling the fragrant breezes in the cool of the day, an almost human picture of pleasure and contentment and far from omnipotent. He is surprised to find that Adam and Eve are hiding from him. He calls to them, Where are you? And finds they were suddenly embarrassed at their nakedness. Who told you that you were naked? He asks. And after a lengthy interrogation, Yahweh learns about the serpent and that Adam and Eve have eaten from the forbidden tree of knowledge of good and evil. One sees virtually the same scene repeated later on, when Cain has murdered Abel. Yahweh grills Cain, peppering him with questions. Where is Abel? What have you done to him? Yahweh is neither an all-knowing nor all-powerful cosmic God. In fact, Yahweh is only one step above being a poor, fallible human himself, different in only one respect his immortality. Thus, Yahweh tells his fellow gods they must evict Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. For behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Yahweh decides the man must be driven from the garden and guards posted to keep him forever outside. This same theme, the jealousy of the gods, is found in Timaeus 41c, where the Creator says he cannot create humans himself. For if by 
my doing these creatures came into existence and partook of life, they would be made equal unto gods, in order therefore that they may be mortal. His sons and daughters were charged with fashioning these living creatures. Gamirkin points out many other parallels between Genesis 2 through 3 and Plato's various writings. According to Plato's statesman, the first humans had no need of clothes and were able to converse with animals. In this same Platonic text, the earth spontaneously produced food for the first humans, allowing them to lead idyllic lives free from toil, pain, or disease until God later became displeased with them. In Timaeus, Plato likened sex to the fruit of a tree, which humans have an insatiable appetite for. And in Protagoras, Plato said that humans, even though they possessed a full knowledge of good and evil, Plato's exact words could still be tempted to bad deeds by their appetites, passions, and the enticement of the senses, just like in Genesis. These and other Platonic themes appear throughout Genesis 2 through 3. For Gamirkin, this points to the late date and long ignored Greek influence on the biblical text. Plato's Timaeus, his famous dialogue on the origins of the universe and human life, provides the key to finally unlocking the mysteries of the biblical stories of creation. Sons of God and Mortal Women Get ready, my intrepid explorers, for the next exhilarating chapter in our grand odyssey through the captivating convergence of Plato's ideas and the enigmatic tales of Genesis. As we continue our journey, we shall adventure deeper into the mystical realm of gods entwined with mortals where desire and consequence intertwine like the threads of fate. Prepare to be enthralled as we unravel the enigmatic narratives of Genesis 6, where gods surrender to temptation and mortal women, ultimately setting the stage for the cataclysmic flood of Noah. Oh, but the connections do not end there. Brace yourselves for a mind-bending exploration of how these profound events resonate with the legends of Atlantis and other Greek myths. For a deeper dive into the topics discussed, don't forget to secure a copy of Russell Gamirkin's illuminating book, A Treasure Trove of Knowledge. Subscribe to MythVision to ensure you never miss a moment of this extraordinary series. Welcome, fellow seekers of truth, to our latest intellectual expedition. Today, we are diving deep into the ancient, dusty, and often misunderstood pages of Genesis. But hold on to your hats, because this isn't your Sunday school's Genesis. Amen! No, we are about to embark on a journey that will challenge everything you thought you knew about this seminal text. You see, Genesis isn't just a standalone story. It's a melting pot of ideas, a cultural crossroads where the Mesopotamian and Greek worlds collide. And it's in this collision where things get really interesting. Ever heard of Cain and Abel? Of course you have. But what if I told you their story echoes the Greek tales of murderous siblings and those sons of God running around ruling territories and taking beautiful wives to create a race of giants? Sounds suspiciously like the Greek pantheon, doesn't it? And then there's the Garden of Eden, a paradise lost, bearing a striking resemblance to Plato's Atlantis, 
let's not forget the flood, a cataclysmic event that's suspiciously universal across ancient cultures. But wait, there's more. Genesis 1.26 throws us a curveball with the gods and possibly goddesses declaring, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. And again, in Genesis 3.22, Yahweh tells the gods, Behold, the man has become like one of us. So what's going on here? Is Genesis about one god or many gods? And where does Yahweh fit into this divine jigsaw puzzle? Well, buckle up, because we are about to find out. This is just the beginning of our deep dive into the origins of the Bible. So grab your archaeologist hat, your detective's magnifying glass, and your philosopher's curiosity, because we are about to embark on a journey that will change the way you see Genesis forever. Are you ready? I hope so, because the truth is often stranger than fiction, and in the case of Genesis, it's also a whole lot more fascinating. Let's get started. Today we are taking a detour from the well-worn path of Mesopotamian influences and venturing into the sun-drenched landscapes of ancient Greece. And who's our guide for this journey? None other than Russell Gamirkin, the author of a recent book that's been causing quite the stir in biblical circles. Now, Gamirkin isn't your average scholar. He's a bit of a maverick a trailblazer who isn't afraid to challenge the status quo. And his latest theory? Well, it's a doozy. He argues that Genesis 1-11 through isn't just a rehash of ancient Mesopotamian traditions like the flood story from the Epic of Gilgamesh. No, he's convinced that Genesis is also heavily influenced by Greek myths and traditions. And when I say Greek traditions, I'm not talking about olives and togas. I'm talking about the big guns, the heavy hitters of Greek philosophy and mythology. I'm talking about Plato. You see, Plato had a lot to say about the creation of the world and humankind. He spun tales of gods living among men, ruling over earthly kingdoms, taking wives and fathering lines of noble kings. That is, until Zeus, the king of the gods, decided to hit the reset button with a few well-placed earthquakes and a flood. Sound familiar? But Gamirkin doesn't stop at the flood. He goes on to argue that the sons of God mentioned in early Genesis are best understood in light of Plato's accounts of mythical times. According to Gamirkin, the twin creation accounts of Genesis 1 and 2 through 3 Both draw extensively on the two-part story of creation in Plato's Timaeus. In this text, Plato first described the creation of a perfect world by an eternal supreme god he called the Demiurge or Craftsman. This account, Gamirkin argues, closely resembles the creation story of Genesis 1. But here's the kicker. Everything the Craftsman created was immortal and perfect, just like himself. So Plato had to come up with a second creation story to explain the existence of mortal, flawed humans. In this second story, the craftsman delegates the task of creating mortal life to his offspring, the traditional gods and goddesses of Greek myth. The earth is then divided up among these divine beings who create humans in various lands they rule over. But how can a god have a son or daughter? How can a new god come into existence? These lesser gods, these sons and daughters of the craftsmen, are walking paradoxes. They have a birth or a generation at a specific point in the past, 
yet they possess eternal life, stretching forever into the future. This paradox, Gamirkin argues, is true not only of the Greek gods of Hesiod and Plato, but also of the biblical sons of God. And where does Yahweh fit into all of this? Well, according to Gamirkin, Yahweh was just one of these earthbound lesser gods, ruling over the land of Eden. He points out in Deuteronomy 32, 8-9, where Yahweh is but one of the many sons of the Most High God, assigned to rule over the children of Israel. When El Yon gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated humanity, he fixed the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of sons of God. For Yahweh's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. Deuteronomy 32, 8-9 Now this might be a bit of a shock to those of us who've grown up with the idea of a single, all-powerful, monotheistic God. But Gamirkin argues that this is much later, almost modern religious idea that we are imposing on the biblical text. In the stories of Genesis, Yahweh is anything but grandiose. He resides not in eternal realms beyond the heavens, but in the earthly land of Eden, presumably in a temple or palace where he takes strolls in the garden in the coolness of the day to take in the pleasant fragrances. When Adam and Eve hide from him, he calls out, Where are you? And when they explain they were ashamed of their nakedness, Yahweh asks, Who told you you were naked? When interrogated, they blame it all on the serpent and confess to eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Clearly, Yahweh is anything but omniscient or omnipresent. So there you have it, folks. Genesis, the Greek edition. It's a theory that's sure to ruffle a few feathers, but that's what makes it so fun, right? It challenges us to look at Genesis in a new light, to question our assumptions, and to engage with the text in a deeper and more meaningful way. Let's get started. There's a lot more to explore in this Greek-infused version of Genesis, and I can't wait to see where this journey takes us. Cain and Abel. One sees virtually the same scene is repeated later on, after the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the garden. When Cain murders Abel, Yahweh questions Cain at the crime scene like a primordial policeman interrogating a suspect. Where is Abel? What have you done to him? His spilled blood cries out to me from the ground. Cain finally breaks and confesses, but why was an interrogation necessary? And then what happens? Yahweh condemns Cain to wander the earth as a fugitive and vagabond. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. What? Yahweh's presence only extends as far as the borders of the land of Eden? Later in the Bible, Jonah hopped a freighter and fled to distant Tarshish, at the ends of the earth, but was unable to escape the presence of God in Jonah 1 verse 3. But in Genesis, Yahweh was anything but omniscient or omnipresent. He ruled only one tiny land where his subjects could occasionally meet him face to face. But the rest of the world was apparently the domain of other peoples ruled by other gods. Clearly, Adam and Eve and their murderous son Cain were not the only humans on earth at that time. For when Cain learns of his fate, he is desperately afraid of the people he will encounter. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond upon the earth, and whoever finds me will slay me. How is that possible? If Cain was the only human residing beyond the boundaries of Eden, Yahweh calms Cain's fears by placing a sign on him, a mark of divine protection to prevent his murder in the course of his wanderings. 
And what is Cain's subsequent history in the lands of his exile? He takes a wife, has a son called Enoch, and builds a city that he names after his firstborn. Where did he find a wife? Who lived in the city of Enoch? Why did Cain need to establish a city for himself, his wife, and his only son Enoch? Why not just build a house? Biblical theologians and many scholars, assuming that Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel were the only humans on earth at that time, struggle mightily with these questions. Cain must have married one of Adam and Eve's daughters, his own sister, who hadn't been born yet, according to the biblical narrative? Seriously? Adam and Eve sent their daughter to the murderer Cain so he could commit incest with her? This is ridiculous, and it offends the moral sensibilities, and is certainly not mentioned in the biblical narrative. Yet Cain marrying his own sister is thought to be the only logical possibility. Theologians and scholars also proposed that Cain feared his own family would chase him into exile and murder him, although the biblical text says no such thing. Which family members? Adam murdering his own son? An unborn younger brother or sister tracking him down in exile with vengeance on their mind? And yet the text says Cain feared immediate vengeance would follow wherever he traveled from those dwelling in the lands of his exile. These are some of the links scholars and theologians go to on the assumption that Adam and Eve were the first and only humans. But it is perfectly clear the earth is already well populated in the time of Adam and Eve and Cain and poor Abel, during the 130 years before the birth of Abel's replacement, Seth and the other sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. Outside Eden was a vast and scary world where cursed Cain would find a new life among strangers. The Greek Origins of Cain and Abel the first hint of Greek influence in the story of Cain and Abel is God's outburst. The voice of your brother, Abel's blood cries out to me from the earth. In the Greek world, unlike the ancient Near East, spilled blood placed a curse on the land until the homicide was avenged. The murderer was fair game to be slain by anyone who could find him, and so the killer typically fled into voluntary exile to escape the reach of vengeful kinsmen. The spilled blood calling out for vengeance and Cain's flight from the land of Eden were story elements that would have been well understood in the Greek world. So too the presence of people in the lands to which Cain fled. According to Greek myths, the early world was divided up among the gods, each god given his own territory to rule, and typically creating the humans who dwelled there. Hephaestus and Athena created a race of humans at Athens, Poseidon another race in his island realm of Atlantis, the Spartans yet another race of earthborn people, warriors spring up from serpents' teeth and so forth. The world of early Genesis, especially as seen in the story of Cain and Abel, is very Greek, with different peoples scattered in different lands across the earth. Nor are these the only Greek elements in the story of Cain and Abel. The Bible has a multitude of stories about sibling rivalries, the stories of Cain and Abel, of Jacob and Esau, of sisters Leah and Rachel, of Joseph and his twelve brothers. But this was also a common plot element in Greek stories in several of which a brother murders a brother, as in the story of Cain and Abel. One such story is that of Romulus and Remus, the twins who founded the city of Rome, sons of Mars, the war god, and a human woman, a princess, the current king considered potential rivals who posed a threat to his rule, so he had them abandoned in the wilderness. But they were found and raised by wild wolves. 
and on adulthood, determined to found a new city and kingdom. In an argument over the location of their new capital, Romulus slew his brother Remus. The city they founded was none other than Rome, which Romulus populated with exiles from other cities. Sibling rivalry, fratricide, the founding of a city, exiles, all motifs found in the story of Cain and Abel, with which it is frequently compared. But in this story, Romulus, the murderer, was a hero, and Remus, the villain. And Romulus did not go into exile, but harbored exiles from other lands. Another such story is that of Polynices and Eteocles, the sons of Oedipus. When it is revealed that Oedipus has killed his own father and married his own mother, he resigns as the king of Thebes and his twin sons appointed to jointly rule the kingdom, taking turns in alternate years. Eteocles takes the first turn, while Polynices withdrew to Argos, where he married the daughter of the king. But when it was his turn to rule, Eteocles refused to turn over the rule. In the subsequent fight over the throne, both sons kill each other, putting an end to the cursed line. The most striking parallel, however, is that of Atreus and Thyestes of the cursed line of King Pelops of Mycenae in the days before the Trojan War. Tantalus, the father of Pelops, had tried to serve his son for dinner to the gods to see if they were as all-knowing as they claimed. The gods detected the ruse, reassembled Pelops, and brought him back to life and cursed both Tantalus and his descendants for this act of impiety. Pelops later became king of Mycenae. Atreus and Thyestes were his sons by one wife and half-brother to Chrysippus, son to a second wife and the favorite son of Pelops. Hippodamia, the mother of Atreus and Thyestes, conspired with the two to murder Chrysippus. Blamed for his murder, the two were both forced into exile like Cain. The story had many subsequent twists and turns. Thyestes briefly returned to Mycenae and became king. Atreus went mad in exile, murdered the sons of Thyestes, and served them to him at dinner, like their grandfather Tantalus. Atreus became king, and now Thyestes went into exile. Incest, rape, the murder of Atreus and Thyestes ruled a third time in Mycenae, yet ultimately he wound up in exile a third time as well, dying on the island of Synthera. Here there are parallels galore. There is sibling rivalry, with brother murdering brother. There is the gods placing a curse of the line of Pelops, much as they had earlier cursed the line of Oedipus, like God cursing Cain and his wicked line of descendants. There is exile, which was a common Greek punishment for murder, wandering from one land to another. There are the hints that Cain is an exiled prince, establishing a city and kingdom in his land of exile, like the characters in virtually all of the Greek stories we have considered as parallels. The Primordial World According to Gamirkin, it is clear that Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, were by no means the only people on earth, not Yahweh the only God. The Primordial World in the period before Noah's flood was instead exactly as described in Genesis 6, 1-4, with humans scattered far and wide across the face of the earth, and the sons of God living among them taking wives from among the beautiful maidens dwelling in their various lands. This picture may offend our modern sensibilities. It certainly offended the authors of the Book of Enoch, who were reluctant to acknowledge the existence of any but the one supreme God. First, Enoch consequently demoted the sons of God to the status of lustful angels fallen from heaven cohabiting with wicked and adulterous women to whom they revealed all the forbidden arts, including those regarding makeup and jewelry. And Azazel showed their chosen ones bracelets, decorations, 
shadowing the eye. With antimony, ornamentation, the beautifying of the eyelids, all kinds of precious stones, and all coloring tinctures and alchemy. And there were many wicked ones, and they committed adultery and erred, and all their conduct became corrupt. 1 Enoch 8, 1 through 2. Their offspring, likewise, were condemned as an evil race of giants. But Genesis 6 clearly states that these were the sons of God, not angels, fallen or otherwise. They are not condemned for taking human wives. The wives are described as beautiful or good, the same word in both Hebrew and Greek as used repeatedly throughout Genesis 1 to describe the beautiful, good creation. Nor are the Nephilim, or giants, condemned in Genesis 6-4. Instead, they are called mighty, men of name, or men of renown, a race of heroes, the same sort of half-human, half-divine beings the Greeks called demigods. Far from being condemned, Genesis 6 appears to view favorably the sons of God, their beautiful, goodly wives, and their heroic offspring. According to Gamirkin, we must see Genesis through new eyes, not conditioned by traditional interpretations. Whence the sons of God? Where did these stories of the sons of God, of beautiful women, of heroic races of demigods come from? Not from the ancient Near East, according to Gamirkin, but from Plato, and specifically from Plato's story of Atlantis, which contains many striking thematic parallels to the stories in early Genesis. Plato told his story of Atlantis in two dialogues, in Timaeus, which the biblical author appear to have directly drawn on in the twin creation accounts of Genesis 1-3, through and in Critias, a companion piece that described the wonderful realm of Atlantis in fantastic detail. It is thus natural that the biblical authors would have been familiar with both of these Platonic texts. The Garden of Eden and Mesopotamian Parallels According to Gamirkin, one already sees echoes of Plato's Atlantis in the biblical description of the Garden of Eden. Biblical scholars have long struggled to find a convincing prototype for the Garden of Eden in the ancient Near East. But to no avail, Gamirkin discusses the four major theories on the Mesopotamian origins of the Garden of Eden and the reasons why scholars reject them all. Number one, temple gardens of the ancient Near East existed primarily for economic purposes to support the temple, its offerings, and its personnel. Temple gardens were not known for their variety of plants, nor for their animals. Such gardens did not possess a cosmic or mythic dimension and were not associated with primordial times. Two, royal parks attached to palaces such as those created by Ashurbanipal, Esar Hadan, Merodach Baladan II, Nebuchadnezzar, and various Persian kings are an attractive possibility in terms of their profusion of exotic plants. Ancient Near Eastern kings such as Tiglath Pileser III, Ashurbanipal, and Sennacherib were also known for their collecting exotic wild animals placed in hunting parks where kings most famously hunted and slew lions. But such royal parks have properly been discounted as convincing parallels due to their strictly historical character without any mythical dimension. And why would a king's hunting park become the model or paradigm of the garden of the gods in the primordial world? Three. 
The search for Mesopotamian mythical stories featuring gardens in primordial times often centers on the Gilgamesh epic, which is set after the flood of Utnapishtim. Gilgamesh and Enkidu had one adventure in the cedar forest located according to various traditions either in the Zagros Mountains or Mount Lebanon, where they slew the monster Huwawa and felled seven sacred cedar trees. But rivers do not feature in this story, nor did the cedar forest contain a profusion of plants or animals, nor was it a divine abode. Gilgamesh, in his quest for immortality, later traveled through a jeweled garden, a mythical location at the edge of the world, approaching the dwelling of the flood hero Utnapishtim, but there are no hints of a divine presence in the jeweled garden, nor indeed earthly plants or animals. The story of Utnapishtim itself, though part of a quest for immortality, featured no plants or garden. Number four. Another myth, the Sumerian story of Inki and Ninhursag, has been compared to the story of the Garden of Eden, but the setting better corresponds to Genesis 2, 4 through 5, at the creation of the heavens and the earth, when the land was arid and before the appearance of the first humans. The tell is populated exclusively by the gods and centers on Inki bringing up subterranean waters sexually fructifying the land so it produces the first plants and the origin of sex among the gods. The parallels with Genesis are slight, if any. In summary, the various attempts to find Mesopotamian parallels to the Garden of Eden itself have all proved highly problematic on close inspection. The search for comparative examples from ancient Mesopotamia to the exclusion of Greek comparative materials was largely premised on the assumed antiquity of the Garden of Eden story. The recognition that this story may have dated as late as the early Hellenistic era, along with the rest of the Pentateuch, opens up new possibilities for comparative study. The pervasive Platonic influences in Genesis 1-3 through suggest Plato's writings might provide the literary background of the description of the Garden of Eden. Gamirkin suggests that instead of the ancient Near East, Greek literature might provide a more convincing literary prototype for the Garden of Eden. In specific, he points out the extensive parallels between the Garden of Eden and Plato's utopian imaginary continent of Atlantis. The Garden of Eden and Greek Parallels to Plato's Timaeus and Critias Let's peek into Plato's Critias to see how it compares with Genesis. And keep in mind, everything we discuss about Atlantis is sourced in Critias. However, I recommend you get Russell Gamirkin's book, which spells out everything with extensive footnotes to argue his case. One may first point to a similar temporal and mythological setting, with the terrestrial deity Poseidon, one of the generated gods who were offspring of the Demiurge, Crafter, dwelling in his allotted land with the first generation of earthborn humans. Poseidon's allotment was the island of Atlantis, located beyond the pillars of Hercules, that is, the Straits of Gibraltar, together with the Libyan or African coast as far as Egypt and the European lands as far as Tuscany. But within this vast western realm, Poseidon chose Atlantis as the fairest locale. It was there that he situated his palace and temple. Plato, in the person of Critias, gave an extensive detailed geographical description of the region, of the island of Atlantis, and of the dwelling place of Poseidon. Poseidon dwelled with his mortal wife Clado in a temple constructed on a low mountain that gave rise to two springs, one hot, one cold. Streams came down from the mountains and circled the plains. And the outflowing water they conducted to the sacred grove of Poseidon, which contained trees of all kinds that were of marvelous beauty and height because of the richness of the soil. 
Critias 117b. This description directly compares with Genesis 2.10. And a river goes forth from out of Eden to water the paradise. The exotic realm of Atlantis was a fair and fertile land for a god to dwell at ease. It was filled with gardens and plantations of trees. Producing out of the earth all kinds of food in plenty. Critias 113. Atlantis had forests full of timber and animals, both tame and wild. The ground held all sorts of metals to be mined, including... Or a calcum, which sparked life like fire. The most precious metal other than gold. Critias 114e. The fertile land of Atlantis had two harvest seasons a year, receiving rains from heaven. From the mention of cultivated plants and orchards and domesticated animals, it is apparent that the inhabitants of the land included agriculturalists and herders. Prominent in Atlantis were the gardens, with every type of fragrant tree, good for food and beautiful in appearance, as Plato eloquently described at Critias 115a to 117b. In addition to all of this, it produced and brought to perfection all those sweet-scented stuffs which the earth produces now, whether made of roots or herbs or trees, or of liquid gums derived from flowers or fruits, the cultivated fruit also, and the dry which serves us for nutriment, and all the other kinds that we use for our mills, the various species of which are comprehended under the name vegetables, and in all the produce of the trees which affords liquid and solid food and unguents and the fruit of the orchard trees so hard to store which is grown for the sake of amusement and pleasure and all the after dinner fruits that we serve up as welcome remedies for the sufferer for repletion all these that hallowed island as it lay then beneath the sun produced in marvelous beauty and endless abundance and the outflowing water they conducted to the sacred grove of Poseidon, which contained trees of all kinds that were of marvelous beauty and height because of the richness of the soil. In this settlement of Poseidon, the Atlanteans also constructed over time magnificent temples for sacrifices at periodic gatherings of the divine kings descended from the god and a city laid out with royal palaces, docks, and quarters for soldiers, built up over time until Atlantean arrogance brought on cataclysmic destruction by rain and flood and earthquake. Plato's extensive description of the primordial flood when the terrestrial gods dwelled among humans set the stage for his main story, the war between Athens and Atlantis, and the destruction of the world by flood. From the above survey, it should now be apparent that the beautiful Garden of Eden in Genesis 2 drew extensively on Plato's description of Atlantis and Critias, the sequel to Plato's Timaeus. The general mythological setting in a garden of the terrestrial gods in primordial times resonates with Plato's extensive description of Poseidon's earthly realm. Atlantis and Genesis. The parallels become even more striking when we come to the story of the sons of God in Genesis 6. In Critias, Plato claims that when the earth was divided up among the gods, the land of Atlantis fell to Poseidon, the god of seas and storms and earthquakes. Poseidon dwelt in a magnificent temple on a low mountain in Atlantis surrounded by streams and gardens. Also living in Atlantis was a fair maiden of marriageable age named Clato, whom Poseidon took to wife, fathering ten sons, five pairs of twins, the first human rulers of Atlantis. The eldest was Atlas, portrayed as a giant in Greek myth, who gave his name to Atlantis. 
as well as the Atlantic Ocean and Atlas Mountains in Northwest Africa. Hercules was also another well-known Greek hero of gigantic stature, owing to having a human for a mother and a god for a father, Zeus. The Ten Kings of Atlantis at first ruled peaceably over their respective territories in divine wisdom and justice, as befitted their nature. But generation by generation, as they took on human wives, the divine element was diluted over time, and the human element began to dominate with all its unruly passions, ambitions, and violence. The kings of Atlantis finally conceived a thoroughly greedy and wicked scheme to assemble their fleets in an unprovoked naval assault on the countries inside the Gibraltar Straits, putting the entire Mediterranean world under their unjust rule. The noble Athenians themselves, descendants of the gods, heroically led the battle against them. Finally, Zeus himself intervened, sending earthquakes, rain, and flood, just like in the biblical flood story, that sank Atlantis beneath the waves and incidentally destroyed Athens and many other lands as well, so that civilization could have a new start. Some of these themes were seen in earlier Greek literature, notably Hesiod's Catalogue of Women, around 700 BCE that spoke of marriages between the Greek gods and human women, as several prominent biblical scholars have noted. But Catalogue of the Women didn't speak of the offspring of these marriages as giants, nor did the world end in a cataclysmic flood, as in Plato's story of Atlantis. Plato's story of Atlantis contains much better parallels, like the story in Genesis, Plato's described a noble line of demigods, the descendants of Poseidon, who became corrupt through time, ending in such violence and injustice that the gods sent a world flood as punishment. Throughout the many flood stories of the ancient Near East and Greek worlds, not a single tale claimed the deluge was sent to punish human wickedness other than Noah's flood in Genesis 6-9, and Plato's story of Atlantis. Over 300 years later, a flood story by the Roman poet Ovid's Metamorphosis had similar ethical elements, but this was centuries too late to have influenced the biblical text. According to Gamirkin, the only viable candidate for a moralizing flood story featuring gods and beautiful women, demigods that descend into violence, and judgment in an earthquake, rain, and flood is Plato's Atlantis. Barosis and Gilgamesh that is not to say that Gamirkin says the sources behind the Genesis flood story are 100% Greek. In an earlier book, Barosis and Genesis, he argued that a large part of the story came from Mesopotamian sources, in line with scholars of the past. For instance, it has long been recognized that the ten long-lived generations before the flood in Genesis 4-5 through appears to be based on the Sumerian king list which had 10 kings lasting 430,000 years before the flood of Atrahasis. Similarly, many details of Noah's flood correspond with the flood of Atrahasis, as described in the Gilgamesh epic, Tablet 11. But where did the biblical authors read about these ancient Mesopotamian traditions? Did they learn to read cuneiform? the curious script in which these tales were written in ancient Akkadian and Sumerian? Did they have access to the great library of Ashurbanipal in Nineveh, where Gilgamesh epic was to be found in the Akkadian language? Did the authors of Genesis learn ancient Sumerian, a dead language known in later centuries only to a few scribes in Assyria and Babylonia, so that they could read and copy the Sumerian king list? Did they have access to the temples and palace libraries of ancient Mesopotamia, where these texts were housed? Highly unlikely, says Gamirkin. Improbable, 
bordering on the ridiculous. Instead, they found all the relevant Mesopotamian sources conveniently collected together in one single literary text, written in Greek and easily available to the Jews of the early Hellenistic era. The Babylonica of Barossus, written around 280 BCE, of which at least one copy was certainly found in the Great Library of Alexandria, which historical tradition says was frequented by Jewish scholars not long afterwards. Barossus, a priest of the temple of Marduk in Babylon, had access to vast collections of ancient cuneiform texts, including creation accounts, flood accounts, and king's lists, from the dawn of time down to his own day, which he personally translated into Greek for the convenience of readers around the world who were curious about the glories of ancient Babylonia and its literature. What's more, his translations of these ancient texts are often closer to the biblical text than any surviving cuneiform text uncovered by archaeologists. For instance, various ancient copies of the Sumerian king list have either seven, eight, or nine kings before the flood, but the version found in Barossus has ten kings, exactly like the biblical account. The flood story in Barossus also has all the main features found in the Gilgamesh epic and in the biblical account, including the release of birds after the flood landed in the mountains of Armenia. Kronos appeared to Kisithros in a dream and revealed that on the 15th of the month, Decius, humankind, would be destroyed by a great flood. He was to build a boat and board it with his family and best friends. He was to provision it with food and also to take on board wild animals and birds and all four-footed animals. Then, when all was prepared, he was to make ready to sail. He did not stop working until the ship was built. Its length was five stades, and its breadth two stades. He boarded the finished ship, equipped for everything as he had been commanded with his wife, children, and closest friends. After the waters of the Great Flood had come and quickly left, Kisithros freed several birds. They found neither food nor a place to rest, and they returned to the ship. After a few days, he set free some of the other birds, and they too came back to the ship, but they returned with claws covered with mud. Then later, for a third time, he set free some other birds, but they did not return to the ship. Barossus Babylonica Fragment F4b And then there's Gilgamesh himself. Ancient Mesopotamian sources described Gilgamesh as a giant, two-thirds god and one-third human. In that way, he is reminiscent of the gigantic offspring of the gods in Genesis 6, 1-4. Barossus is also known to have talked about Gilgamesh in the third generation after the flood, describing him as an early post-flood king of Babylon. Scholars have connected the fabled adventures of Gilgamesh with those of his Greek counterpart, Hercules, who was the gigantic offspring of Zeus and a mortal wife, and whose world travels were recounted in the legendary Twelve Labors of Hercules. It is thought Hercules was influenced in part by the Gilgamesh epic. So there are various points of connections between early Genesis and Mesopotamian traditions, all by way of Barossus, writing in the convenient Greek in a single book that the biblical authors appear to have read. First and foremost are the ten long-lived generations before the flood, from the version of the Sumerian king list known only from Barossus. Second, there's the flood story from the Gilgamesh epic, which Barossus conveniently translates into Greek. And then there's a gigantic half-divine Gilgamesh. The Bible locates heroic races of giants on both sides of the flood and singles out Nimrod of Babylon in the third generation after the flood as one such hero. Barossus situated Gilgamesh at Babylon in the third after the flood so an influence of the Gilgamesh legend on Nimrod appears possible. 
so much for the parallels, but Gamirkin also noted differences. And none of the Mesopotamian tales have entire races of gigantic heroes arising through the intermarriages between gods and humans before the flood, or their corruption and descent into violence and wickedness, causing the gods to punish them with a flood. In none of the Mesopotamian flood stories is there an ethical reason for extinguishing humankind in a flood. In fact, most versions say that the gods simply became irritated with humans because they were too noisy and kept the gods awake. These two motifs of the rise of a race of demigods before the flood and their corruption and punishment by the gods in earthquake and flood are exclusively Greek. Indeed, they are found in a single source, Plato's story of Atlantis. Yahweh and Genesis. The result of all this new research is that the earliest traditions in Genesis was steeped in polytheism. A supreme eternal monotheistic God only appears in the creation story of Genesis 1. Much as Plato's eternal philosopher's God creates the heavens and earth and then disappears from history, letting his sons and daughters create mortal life and rule the earth on his behalf. Starting with Genesis 2, the Creator disappears from Genesis, replaced by the terrestrial sons of God, each in their own allotted land. Yahweh is thus a minor God, one of the many sons of God, dwelling in his land of Eden, and much later given a temple in Jerusalem. Starting in the book of Exodus, the biblical text tries to promote Yahweh to a more cosmic stature but in Genesis, Yahweh is almost human, apparently being immortal only by the virtue of access to the tree of life. As Gamirkin points out, similar picture of Yahweh as an earthbound deity is seen throughout Genesis. This is especially well illustrated in the story in Genesis 18, when Yahweh and three angels walking through the wilderness of Mamre and the heat of the day stop by Abraham's tent for lunch and conversation. Water is fetched to wash Yahweh's feet, and he is encouraged to rest under a nearby shady tree. Sarah fixes bread, a calf is slaughtered and cooked, butter and milk is fetched, and Yahweh and Abraham amicably discuss how many righteous citizens would save nearby Sodom and Gomorrah from divine destruction. Yahweh was not the supreme god of creation, but just another weary desert hiker with sore feet and a growling stomach. Such was the original biblical conception of the sons of God. mysterious mighty hunter named Nimrod gets a brief mention after the flood in Genesis 6 through 9 as a great grandson of Noah, grandson of Ham, and whose uncle's names look coincidentally like nations rather than literal individuals seen in Genesis 10 verse 6. The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. His mention as the first builder of the major centers in the known world from 2 millennia BC all the way down into the Hellenistic period. Genesis 10, 10 through 12. The first centers of his kingdom were Babylon, Baruch, Akkad, and Kalme, in Shinar. From that land he went to Assyria where he built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Palah, and Rezin which is between Nineveh and Kalah, 
which is the great city. This section in Israel's prehistory looks awfully similar to something reminiscent of the Sumerian King's List that was written around the Old Babylonian period, 2000 to 1600 BCE. As both are lists of post-flood rulers of cities, and as we've seen in this series, Mesopotamia played an enormous role in the development of the Genesis creation stories, Adam and Eve, the Flood, and now the post-flood Table of Nations, which includes the Tower of Babel, resembling a Babylonian ziggurat. Our purpose, as usual, is to hunt down mythical, legendary, or historical antecedents to biblical characters. In this case, with Nimrod, we have leading experts in the world wrestling over what his sources really are. If leading experts can't pin this guy down with certainty, we should take a humble pill and be cautious to do the same. When one thinks of Nimrod, one might think of a foolish or inept person in today's world. This derogatory usage most likely stems from the negative reputation given to this post-flood hero. As Professor David M. Carr notes in his Genesis 1-11 through exegetical commentary, This famed hunter helps him function well as a primeval figure that might originate a Mesopotamian ideal of kingship that prominently featured boasts about kings hunting prowess. To be sure, many have interpreted Nimrod's name as meaning we will rebel and seen that as an indicator that Nimrod is viewed negatively here. Nevertheless, the text itself, especially the part building on an audience's prior knowledge of the figure status as warrior of the hunt before Yahweh, does not seem to presuppose such a negative judgment. Instead, Nimrod stands as a warrior successor in Genesis 10.8 to the warriors of old mentioned in Genesis 6.4. While his famed status is a warrior of hunt before Yahweh makes him contrast with Cain who went from before Yahweh, Genesis 4.16. Here, meant to function as a positive superlative and contrast to Cain. It appears Nimrod has gone down in the hall of shame, when in fact he may have been understood by the Genesis authors to be a hero figure, contrasting Cain. Cain was the first person to build a city, but was obviously understood to be a murderer. Was he denigrated because he was a giant or titan in this mythical prehistory? This Sumerian king list documents insane lifetimes by ancient kings similar to the genealogies in Genesis 4, 5, and later 10. Adapa gets a shout out in that Sumerian king list, reminding anyone reading of Enoch ascending to heaven or has watched our previous episode on Enoch. Then Damuzid or Tammuz, later known as Ishtar, the consort of Inanna, gets a blurb for being a fisherman, which reminds me of the Oannes coming up from the sea, giving divination, etc. This Tammuz literally gets a month in the Hebrew calendar, which is derived from the Akkadian and Babylonian calendar. Continuing in this king's list, we get Gilgamesh soon after Demuzid. And we shouldn't be shocked if these god kings play a role in influencing much later biblical traditions such as that of Nimrod. <music> Professor Peter McKinnist and the Anchor Bible Dictionary Starting with the famous publication of the Anchor Bible Dictionary under Gilgamesh, we have a rather excellent summary of this biblical character by a Harvard expert, Peter McKinnist, Hancock Professor of Hebrew and Other Oriental Languages Emeritus. He states, Nimrod, the enigmatic figure mentioned briefly in Genesis 10 as a descendant of Noah, holds a compelling place in ancient texts. Described as a mighty hunter before the Lord and considered the original king of Babylon, 
Nimrod's inclusion in the genealogical list bears a striking resemblance to the Sumerian king's list from the Old Babylonian period. Unraveling the identity of Nimrod has been a topic of much debate. Three main approaches have been explored. The first posits Nimrod as a god, such as the Mesopotamian Ninurta or Marduk. The second suggests Nimrod as a legendary Mesopotamian hero, potentially Gilgamesh or Lugalbanda, or even an eponym parallel to the Greek traditions of Ninos. The third approach seeks to identify Nimrod with the historical figures including Sargon of Agade, Tukulti Ninurta I of Assyria, or even Nazim Muratash, an Egyptian pharaoh or an Aramean ruler named Ben Hadad. Deciphering among these various possibilities proves challenging. However, considering the Mesopotamian context of the Genesis text, it's more likely that Nimrod represents a legendary hero, eponym, or historical figure from Mesopotamia rather than a god. The Hebrew rendering of Nimrod may stem from a Hebrew corruption and denigrative reinterpretation of divine names like Ninurta or Marduk. One possible suggestion is that Nimrod is an abbreviation of a name formed with Ninurta or Marduk, similar to Tukulti Ninurta I. Upon closer examination, it becomes apparent that the biblical portrayal of Nimrod draws upon multiple Mesopotamian traditions, references to Babylon, Erech, Uruk, and Akkad, Agade, suggest ties to Babylonia. Nimrod's rule over Assyria reflects the long-standing cultural superiority of Babylonia over Assyria. This connection likely points to a period before 2000 BC, under the Agade or Ur, three dynasties, or around 610 to 539 BC during the Neo-Babylonian Chaldean rule. Moreover, the association of Cush, Nimrod's father, with the Kassites, and the mention of Shinar, possibly reflecting Shanhara, a designation of Kassite Babylonia, indicates the utilization of Babylonian traditions originating in the later 2nd millennium BC. Assyria also plays a role in the biblical depiction of Nimrod, particularly the Neo-Assyrian period from the 9th to 7th centuries BC, when Assyria dominated Babylonia. This connection is evident in Micah's identification of the land of Nimrod with Assyria. The hunting motif associated with Nimrod aligns with well-known royal themes in Mesopotamian literature and art which gained prominence during the reigns of the Neo-Assyrian kings. The reference to Nineveh, Kalan, Rehoboth, and Resen in Genesis 10 can also be explained within a Neo-Assyrian context. While the diverse traditions surrounding Nimrod make it difficult to pinpoint one specific individual that he represents, it is clear that he functions as a legendary and composite eponym of Mesopotamia. Precision and historical references should not be expected. Similar to the Greek traditions Minos, Nimrod becomes an eponymous hero founder of Assyria and its empire, drawing from composite backgrounds. Notably, in antiquity, Minos was already equated with Nimrod. In post-biblical sources, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim, Nimrod remained a notable figure his name became attached to various ancient Mesopotamian ruins, particularly Kala, as part of efforts to remember and elaborate on his hunting and military prowess. This depiction, however, often portrayed Nimrod negatively, depicting him as the greatest sinner since the Flood, claiming divinity and sponsoring the Tower of Babel. Some sources, however, offer a more positive view highlighting his opposition to the construction of the tower. The complexity surrounding Nimrod and his depiction in various ancient texts challenge us to explore the multifaceted nature of this legendary figure. Through the lens of history, mythology, and cultural interplay, we gain a deeper understanding of the profound influence and enduring legacy of Nimrod within Mesopotamian and biblical traditions.
Ninurta and Nimrod, a tale of ancient gods. Let's explore the fascinating connection between Ninurta and Nimrod. Ninurta was a revered deity in ancient Mesopotamia, was associated with diverse domains such as farming, healing, hunting, law, scribes, and war. Initially worshipped as an agricultural and healing god, he later took on a warrior persona as Mesopotamia became more militarized, while still retaining his agricultural attributes. As the son of Enlil, the chief god, Ninurta held great significance, and his main temple, Eshemiza in Nippur, was a revered center of worship. King Gudea of Lagash even rebuilt Ninurta's temple in Lagash, demonstrating his devotion. The Assyrians also held Ninurta in high regard, particularly as a formidable warrior. King Ashurnasirpal II built a grand temple for Ninurta in Kalhu, which became the deity's primary cult center. Many scholars believe that Ninurta served as the inspiration for the biblical figure Nimrod, mentioned in Genesis 10, 8 through 12, as a mighty hunter, while the exact transformation of the name Ninurta into Nimrod in Hebrew remains somewhat elusive, the two figures share similar functions and attributes, making Ninurta the most plausible etymology for Nimrod. Interestingly, the ruins of Kalhu eventually came to be known in Arabic as Namrud, due to their association with Ninurta. In later Old Testament accounts, specifically in 2 Kings 19.37 and Isaiah 37.38, King Sennacherib of Assyria is said to have been assassinated by his sons Adremelech and Sherezer in the temple of Nisroch, which is likely a scribal error for Nimrod. This presumed error arose from a spelling mistake during transcription, as the visual similarities between the letters could have led to confusion, as no Assyrian deity by the name of Nisruk has been attested. Scholars consider this explanation the most likely. If Nisruk indeed refers to Ninurta, then Sennacherib's murder likely occurred in Ninurta's temple in Kalhu. Although the book of Genesis portrays Nimrod favorably as the first post-flood king and builder of cities, the Greek Septuagint translation of the Hebrew Bible presents him as a giant and mistranslates the Hebrew phrase meaning before Yahweh as in opposition against God. Consequently, Nimrod became associated with idolatry, embodying the archetypal idolater. Could this be the origin of his demise as an infamous enemy of God in history? Early Jewish Midrash works, as described by the philosopher Philo in his Questiones, depict Nimrod as the instigator of the Tower of Babel and persecutor of the Jewish patriarch Abraham for his refusal to participate in the project. St. Augustine of Hippo refers to Nimrod as a deceiver, oppressor, and destroyer of earthborn creatures in his book, The City of God. Imagine having your record tainted by a spelling mistake and simply being associated with Babylon, so forever in the historical record you are cast in a negative light. The parallels between the Mesopotamian god Ninurta and Nimrod in Genesis are somewhat speculative, but several scholars think the connection is strong enough. Both are mighty warriors. Ninurta and Nimrod are associated with warrior-like qualities and prowess in battle. Ninurta is a powerful god of war and hunting in Mesopotamian mythology, while Nimrod is described as a mighty hunter in Genesis. Founder of Cities Ninurta is credited with the founding of several cities, including Nippur, while Nimrod is associated with the founding of cities like Babylon and Erek, Uruk, in the biblical narrative. Divine Lineage Ninurta is often considered the son of Enlil, one of the chief gods in the Mesopotamian pantheon, 
Similarly, Nimrod is described as a descendant of Ham, one of Noah's sons in Genesis. Post-Flood Era Both Ninurta and Nimrod are connected to the post-flood world. Ninurta's presence and worship continue in later periods, even after the destruction caused by the flood in Mesopotamian mythology. Nimrod too is depicted as a prominent figure in the post-flood generation in Genesis. Ninus in History Ninus, the legendary founder of Nineveh, the ancient capital of Assyria, remains an enigmatic figure. Greek historians of the Hellenistic period and beyond associate him with the city, but his exact identity in Assyrian records remains uncertain. Some propose a link to the revered deity Ninurta. As we explore this historical puzzle, Ninus becomes a symbol of the enduring spirit that built civilizations and fueled our quest for knowledge. In the shadows of time, his story intertwines with myth and history, leaving us captivated by the mysteries of the past. Seems that Greek tradition as well as biblical tradition both have mythical figures who are kings that founded and built the great Mesopotamian cities, temples, towers, etc. Many early Accomplishments are attributed to Ninus, such as training the first hunting dogs and taming horses for riding. Could this overlap with the mighty hunter Nimrod? The decipherment of a vast quantity of cuneiform texts has allowed modern Assyriologists to piece together a more accurate history of Sumer, Akkad, Babylonia, Assyria, and Chaldea. Ninus is not attested in any of the extensive king lists compiled by the Mesopotamians themselves, nor mentioned in any Mesopotamian literature. And it is possible that this Hellenic creation was inspired by the deeds of one or more real kings of Assyria or Assyro-Babylonian mythology, just like Nimrod. Similarly, the biblical character of Nimrod is not attested anywhere in Assyrian Babylonian, Akkadian, or Sumerian literature or king's lists, but is believed by many scholars to have been inspired by one or more real kings. What is the truth? Russell Gamirkin is an independent researcher and scholar who has published books and articles and lectured at academic conferences for 20 years. Currently, he is mostly known for his innovative work on the late date and Greek sources of the Hebrew Bible and on the Dead Sea Scrolls. In what follows, you're going to find Nimrod parallels, but also a case made by Russell suggesting that Genesis authors made use of Barosis putting its final composition in the Hellenistic period. Ninus and Nimrod, Valid Parallels In his thought-provoking book on Barosis and Genesis, Russell Gamirkin delves into the fascinating character of Nimrod and sheds light on the topic of Genesis's composition. Gamirkin's insights are worth considering, and here's a summary of his points, which I find quite enlightening. According to E.A. Spicer's theory, there are indeed noteworthy similarities between Ninus and Nimrod. Despite the flaws in Spicer's argument, it becomes evident that the Nimrod story in Genesis incorporates elements from the Ninus legend, as documented by Theseus in his Persica. Theseus, a Greek physician to the Achaemenid King Artaxerxes II, lived in the 5th century BC and wrote extensively with one of his notable works dating around 400 BCE. In these legends, Ninus and Nimrod were both ancient kings of Mesopotamia, ruling over Assyria and Babylonia, and linked to the establishment of Nineveh. Theseus' account described them as hunters. While there are significant similarities, important distinctions exist between the two narratives. In Theseus' version, Ninus is an Assyrian conqueror, and it is Semiramis 
an Assyrian queen who founds Babylon. In contrast, Genesis portrays Nimrod as a Babylonian king who holds authority over both Babylon and Assyria. The Genesis accounts reflect a Babylonian tradition that rejects the Ninus legend and emphasizes Babylon's preeminence. The source of the Nimrod story can be traced to Berossus, who challenged Theseus' depiction of Mesopotamian history. Berossus criticized the notion that the Assyrians founded Babylon and aimed to rectify misconceptions surrounding Semiramis' reign. Interestingly, the Genesis narrative echoes Berossus' perspective by presenting Nimrod as the founder of Babylon before establishing Nineveh. Berossus' work, The Babylonica, aligns closely with the Nimrod story and its pro-Babylonian standpoint. The accurate depiction of Babylonian and Assyrian cities in the Nimrod accounts aligns with Barossus's expertise in Mesopotamian geography. Consequently, it is plausible that Barossus serves as the source for the Nimrod story in Genesis, which reflects his polemics against the Ninus legend and Theseus' account. To sum it up, Ninus and Nimrod represent competing traditions, aiming to establish the pedigree of Assyria and Babylon. While Ninus is a legendary figure asserting the primacy of Assyria with Nineveh as its initial stronghold, the Genesis account aligns entirely with Barossus by attributing Babylon as the first established city. Barossus, at that time, stood as the lone author supporting this viewpoint. Gamirkin's argument raises the question of whether Genesis directly used Barossus or if they drew from a shared tradition. Who was Gilgamesh? Gilgamesh was a legendary hero in ancient Mesopotamian mythology and the central character of the Epic of Gilgamesh, the epic poem written in Akkadian during the late 2nd millennium BCE, tells the story of his adventures. While Gilgamesh may have been a historical king of Uruk, his status as a deity emerged after his death. He likely ruled in the early dynastic period around 29 to 2350 BCE, but his fame as a legendary figure grew during the third dynasty of Ur. Nimrod and Gilgamesh Gamirkin continues to tackle Nimrod with another clear connection. Nimrod's reputation as a badass hunter in Genesis can't be explained away by dissing Ninus, whose hunting skills are overshadowed by Semiramis. The real inspiration for Nimrod's godlike hunting prowess seems to come from the one and only Gilgamesh, the rock star of Mesopotamian mythology. Like Nimrod, Gilgamesh was a superhero born out of a divine human hookup, just like those giant guys in Genesis 6-4. Gilgamesh's hunting adventures involved taking down wild beasts like the Bull of Heaven and lions, proving he was no pushover. What's intriguing is that Nimrod's kingdom kicked off in Babylon and Erech, the very city ruled by Gilgamesh. Another juicy tidbit in the Nimrod story is its close link to the post-flood world. Nimrod, the grandson of Ham in Genesis 10, shares a family tree with Gilgamesh, the king of Uruk in the Gilgamesh epic. According to the Sumerian king list, Gilgamesh takes the throne as the third king of post-flood Uruk, but hold on a minute. There were actually 27 kings of Kish before the kings of Uruk, which makes Gilgamesh the 28th generation after the flood. However, the Uruk Apkalu list suggests a local tradition where Uruk was the first city to rule over Babylonia after the flood, placing Gilgamesh in the third generation. Now, in Barossus' version of the story, Gilgamesh struts his stuff as the third ruler of the post-flood world. But here's the twist. 
He reigns over Babylon, not Aruk. The flood's over, and the first two rulers according to Barosis were Euxius and Komosbolus, both sitting on the throne in Babylon. A little fragment from Barosis, tucked away in Elians on animals, spills the beans that Gilgamesh's granddaddy was Sukorus, the king of Babylon. So Gilgamesh, the son of Komos Bolus, snags the title of the third post-flood king of Babylon. The Barosis tale dances pretty close to the Nimrod story, unlike that earlier Sumerian king list. If we embrace Gilgamesh as the blueprint for Nimrod, it seems that Barosis's take on the Gilgamesh saga in Babylon played a starring role in Genesis. While other versions of the story praise Gilgamesh as the ruler of Aruk, Genesis 10.10 puts Aruk on the back burner, giving Babylon the spotlight. It's only in Barosis's version of the Gilgamesh epic that Gilgamesh grabs the title of Babylon's ruler. This means that the Nimrod character in Genesis found his groove from Barosis's account of Gilgamesh's tale, set in the third generation of post-flood Babylon, giving those older cuneiform sources a run for their money. Several parallels between Gilgamesh and Nimrod. Mighty heroes. Both Gilgamesh and Nimrod are depicted as mighty heroes or warriors. Gilgamesh is described as a powerful and fearless warrior in the Epic of Gilgamesh, while Nimrod is portrayed as a mighty hunter in Genesis. Divine Lineage Gilgamesh and Nimrod share a similar divine lineage. Gilgamesh is said to be the product of a union between gods and mortal woman, just like the giants mentioned in Genesis. Nimrod, too, is associated with the giants and is described as a descendant of Ham, one of Noah's sons. Fun fact, Genesis 10.8, in the Septuagint, Nimrod was a titan. Gilgamesh, too, was of surpassing stature. Hunting Abilities Both figures are known for their hunting prowess. Gilgamesh is depicted as a skilled hunter who can track down and slay dangerous creatures, like the Bull of Heaven. Similarly, Nimrod is renowned for his hunting skills and is celebrated as a mighty hunter in Genesis. Founder of Great Cities Gilgamesh is credited with the foundation of the city of Uruk, which becomes a prominent and influential city in Mesopotamia. Nimrod, on the other hand, is associated with the founding of important cities like Babylon and Erech, Uruk. Post-Flood Era Both Gilgamesh and Nimrod are connected to the post-flood world. Gilgamesh is depicted as a king ruling in the aftermath of the flood, and Nimrod is portrayed as a prominent figure in the generation following the deluge. While the answer floats out there somewhere on Nimrod's origins, I personally gravitate towards Gilgamesh as the best antecedent argued by experts in the field. This is not to suggest that parallels between Nimrod and Ninurta or Ninus are not clearly there. It seems obvious that a similar competing narrative in the Greek world with Ninus was floating around, and whether Gamirkin is correct that Genesis is literarily dependent on Barosis is really interesting. One thing is for certain, scholars aren't 100% on the same page about which ancient character best explains Nimrod's origins. They are all unanimous that Nimrod is fictive in the biblical narrative. If Dr. David M. Carr is correct, does this mean that the Genesis authors were trying to use Nimrod as their distant ancestor giving them pedigree while in exile or post-exile? I mean, if one can point to a narrative where you claim it was your ancestor who was the original creator of the world's famous cities, does this give them self-gratification as a reaction to the Babylonian myths of old they imitated? Why did Nimrod go down in the halls of shame? Was it a misreading from later authors? 
Keep in mind, not everyone in history read Nimrod as bad. Here are some other plausible antecedents to the Nimrod stories which have been proposed by scholars throughout history. In Markar, a legendary figure from Sumerian mythology presents intriguing parallels that make him a plausible antecedent to Nimrod in the Nimrod story. Both Inmarkar and Nimrod are depicted as powerful rulers associated with the city of Uruk, known for their ambitious construction projects and their role as builders of cities and temples. Inmarkar, like Nimrod, exemplifies the archetype of a great leader and the founder of civilization, attributed with establishing the foundations of a prosperous society. The similarities in their roles as influential kings and builders, along with their association with the city of Uruk, suggest a potential connection between Inmarkar and Nimrod. Asher, the eponymous founder of the Assyrian Empire, presents a compelling case as a potential antecedent to Nimrod in the Nimrod story. Both Asher and Nimrod are associated with the region of Mesopotamia and hold prominent roles in the establishment of powerful kingdoms. Asher is revered as the progenitor of the Assyrian people and is often depicted as a mighty warrior and conqueror. Similarly, Nimrod is portrayed as a powerful ruler who establishes dominion over Babylon and Assyria. The link between Asher and Nimrod is further strengthened by their shared association with Nineveh, as both figures are connected to the founding or developing of this significant city. Hercules the legendary hero of Greek mythology presents an interesting possibility as an antecedent to the character of Nimrod, especially if you factor in Russell Gamirkin's later dating of the composition of the Pentateuch, the Hebrew Bible. Both Hercules and Nimrod are renowned for their exceptional strength and prowess as mighty warriors and hunters. They are celebrated for their feats of heroism battling formidable creatures and undertaking perilous quests. Additionally, both figures enjoy a significant degree of divine ancestry, with Hercules being the son of Zeus, the king of the gods, and Nimrod being associated with the gods as a mighty hunter. The parallel between Hercules and Nimrod extends to their roles as founders of influential cities or civilizations. Hercules is attributed with the establishment of numerous cities, while Nimrod is connected with the founding of Babylon and Nineveh. The presence of these shared characteristics suggests the possibility of cross-cultural influences or archetypal elements being passed down through different mythological traditions. Sargon of Akkad the legendary ruler of Akkadian Empire in ancient Mesopotamia presents a compelling case as a potential antecedent to the figure of Nimrod. Both Sargon and Nimrod are depicted as powerful and influential leaders who played significant roles in the foundation and expansion of their respective kingdoms. Sargon is renowned for his military conquest and the establishment of the first empire in history while Nimrod is associated with the founding of Babylon and Nineveh, two prominent cities in ancient Mesopotamia. Both figures are depicted as powerful warriors and skilled hunters, highlighting their prowess in combat and their close connection to the natural world. Additionally, Sargon and Nimrod both possess narratives that blur the lines between historical and mythical elements. With legends and embellishments surrounding their lives and accomplishments, the parallels between Sargon and Nimrod suggest the possibility of shared cultural influences or archetypal motifs in the ancient Near East, where stories and legends could be adapted and reimagined over time. 
And let's not leave out the historical rulers of Mesopotamia, such as the Sumerian kings, Assyrian monarchs, and Babylonian leaders, present intriguing possibilities as antecedents to the legendary figure of Nimrod. These rulers, known for their political power and influence, left a significant mark on the region's history and collective memory. Their accomplishments and conquests, as well as their roles in the foundation and expansion of cities and empires, bear resemblances to the legendary attributes associated with Nimrod. The narratives surrounding these historical rulers often include elements of historic feats, divine connections, and the establishment of prominent cities. It is plausible that over time the historical accounts of these rulers became intertwined with mythical and legendary elements leading to the creation of larger-than-life figures like Nimrod. Other potential connections may lurk in the shadows of the ancient world, and I'm just not aware of those direct antecedents. Please comment if you know any others which make a ton of sense that weren't mentioned in this video. Imagine, if you will, a world that's less little house on the prairie and more keeping up with the Olympians. It's a divine soap opera where gods are not just living among mortals, but swiping right on them as well. Their offspring, known as Nephilim, giants or heroes of renown, at least the original influencers, are considered demigods while later Jewish and Christian literature, like Enoch, give these figures a thumbs down. Genesis doesn't bat an eyelid. If we follow Russell Gamirkin's theory that Genesis is not just playing footsie with Plato, but full-on flirting, then we see a plot twist. The divine DNA of these demigods is diluted by human vices, desires, and wickedness, triggering a flood. In other words, the problem wasn't the sons of God, but the mortal humans who couldn't keep their wicked passions in check. This is akin to the pride of the Atlanteans causing Zeus to flood them. Meanwhile, the Mesopotamian gods, in a fit of celestial nimbyism, flood the world because humans were too noisy. Talk about a divine noise complaint. We've been untangling this peculiar genealogy in Genesis 2-4, where the generations of heaven and earth, or Oranos and Gaia, mirror the Greek myths where heaven and earth are actual gods of the ultimate demiurge. This theme of divine genealogies is a recurring motif in Genesis, including the table of nations in Genesis 10. But how does one trace the lineage of heaven and earth? If we look at Hesiod's Theogony or Plato's works, it's clear these were actual gods who reproduced to create other gods. Genesis presents a curious blend of human lineage and divine beings, or gods, who intermingle their seed with humans. After the flood wipes out all but eight people, we see a list of Noah's descendants. And who do we find in this list? In the Septuagint version of Genesis 10, we encounter a character named Nimrod. Now there's a name that's begging for a backstory. And just begetting abroad, 
He began to be a giant upon the earth. He was a giant hunter before the Lord God. Therefore, they say, as Nebrod, the giant hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babylon, Borek, and Arkad, and Chalon, and the land of Sinar. Picture this. Nimrod, a giant, a titan of sorts in the Greek version of Genesis. Quite the spectacle, isn't it? Contrary to the bad rap he gets in Enoch and other biblical texts, Genesis paints him as a pretty decent chap. He's before the Lord, which is a far cry from Cain, who's more of a run-from-the-Lord kind of guy. It seems these semi-divine figures didn't just vanish post-flood. They're right there in Genesis, hanging out with the rest of us mortals. Genesis 10 presents us with a list of 70 nations, a mythological census of sorts, explaining the divisions of peoples, languages, and beliefs. Each nation was under the jurisdiction of a god, and Genesis doesn't seem to have a problem with this divine delegation. It's only in later books like Exodus that Yahweh starts picking fights with the gods of other nations, like the deities of Egypt. But in Genesis, it's all peace and love among the gods. It's as if they're all chilling at a celestial cocktail party. Why didn't Abraham's god pick a fight with the Egyptian deities? Maybe he didn't want to spill his divine martini. Russell Gamirkin suggests a similar scenario in Greek narratives, but what happened to the sons of God from Genesis 6? Did they retire to a divine villa on Mount Olympus? Here's a thought. Genesis 10 mentions 70 nations. Enoch talks about 70 angels ruling 70 nations with 70 different tongues. This brings to mind Paul's letters about speaking in tongues of angels. But let's be clear, an angel is a god. Only those clinging to the cliff of absolute monotheism would argue otherwise. The phrase, let us make man in our image, should give pause to any apologists. It's polytheism, plain and simple. Some try to rebrand Genesis as henotheism, which is fine, but it doesn't erase the existence of other gods in this narrative. The 70 nations, tongues, angels, or gods, if we're being honest, correlate to the 70 sons of the supreme deity El in Ugaritic Canaanite mythology. Is Genesis painting a picture of a polytheistic world where gods rule over various nations, tribes, tongues, and regions? Would the Son of God, Yahweh, also ruling over one land, people, tongue? It seems so. And Deuteronomy 32, 8-9 spills the beans. When the Most High, El Yon, gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. But the Lord's, Yahweh's, portion is his people, Jacob his allotted heritage. In the grand pantheon of Genesis, Yahweh is the head honcho, the big cheese, the top dog among the gods. But let's not get carried away here. He's not the ultimate creator god, the demiurge, the divine craftsman. It's a bit like Zeus, who while being the CEO of terrestrial gods, didn't actually build the place. Now if you're still with me, let's take a detour to Psalms 82. Here we find the chief deity, El, not just presiding over a board meeting of gods, but actually passing judgment on them. It's a divine courtroom drama, a celestial Judge Judy episode, if you will. The admission of this polytheistic world is as clear as a supernova in a night sky. So let's dive into the divine council of Psalms 82.
god has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked, Sila? Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I say, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, you shall die like men and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for to thee belong all the nations. Without a solid grasp of this celestial soap opera, I fear we'll be left floundering in the cosmic dust when it comes to the Table of Nations and Tower of Babel narrative. So buckle up, dear viewer, as we embark on a journey to the Tower of Babel, potentially a creative spinoff from the ruins of a Babylonian ziggurat and a mythology fan fiction of the highest order. We'll delve into the Table of Nations and the Tower of Babel, which might just be the late bloomers of biblical narratives. And by late, I don't mean they missed the bus by a few minutes. We're talking Hellenistic period late. Some scholars might coyly suggest a post-exile Persian period, but do they have the audacity to venture into the Hellenistic era? Interstage right, Russell Gamirkin, who isn't afraid to push the chronological envelope. Stay tuned to find out why. Ascending to heaven. Picture this. A city named Babel. A name that echoes through the corridors of biblical history. This isn't just any city, though. It's a city that was stopped dead in its tracks by a divine holdup. Now, this story, often dubbed the Tower of Babel saga, isn't just about a tower, which could have been a fortress or more likely a temple. No, it's about an entire city. The plot thickens when humanity, all speaking the same language, decide to huddle up in one place, Shinar. Here they roll up their sleeves and embark on a project of epic proportions. Building a city that would etch their names into the annals of time and keep them from scattering. But plot twists. Their grand plans are foiled by Yahweh and his divine squad, who taken aback by their audacity, throw a linguistic wrench in their plans and scatter them across the globe. This divine mic drop gives birth to the name Babel, which sounds suspiciously like the Hebrew word for confuse. Now, the origins and inspiration of this story have sparked some heated scholarly debates. While there's a general agreement that the story is part of the Yahwist, J source, the consensus ends there. Some scholars suggest that the Yahwist inherited a unified tradition, or at least one that had been blended from multiple sources during oral transmission. Others, however, argue that the Yahwist was the master chef who cooked up this narrative stew. Who was this Yahwist, you ask? Well, in Jay's writings, Yahweh is portrayed as an anthropomorphic figure both physically and mentally. For example, when Abraham haggles with Yahweh over the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah, or when Yahweh, ticked off by the Israelites' lack of faith, threatens to wipe them out and start fresh with Moses' descendants. But when Moses steps in, Yahweh changes his mind. The dating of Jay's writings has been a hot topic among scholars. Julius Wellhausen, a 19th century German scholar didn't try to date Jay more precisely than the monarchical period of Israel's history. In 1938, Gerhard von Rad placed Jay at the court of Solomon around 950 BCE, 
arguing that his purpose in writing was to justify the unified state created by Solomon's father, David. This was generally accepted until a crucial 1976 study by H. H. Schmid, the so-called Yahwist, argued that Jay knew the prophetic books of the 8th and 7th centuries BCE. While the prophets did not know the traditions of the Torah, meaning Jay could not be earlier than the 7th century, a minority of scholars placed Jay even later in the exilic and or post-exilic period, 6th to 5th centuries BCE. Then there are those who really like pushing the boundaries into the Hellenistic period, like Russell Gamirkin. Those who advocate for the amalgamation of discrete traditions point to the separate motifs of dispersion, the construction of a tower to storm the heavens, and the confusion of tongues found in extra-biblical sources. These motifs, in their original form, either underscored a significant ideology, such as why humanity speaks more than one language, or conveyed a profound religious teaching such as the peril of encroaching upon the divine realm. Some scholars suggest that the inspiration of the Babel story was drawn from actual temple ruins in Mesopotamia. They propose that the tower refers to the ziggurat architectural form, a pyramid-like structure with each successive layer smaller than the one below it, and possibly to the Intimanaki, the grand ziggurat temple of Babylon, Intimanaki in Sumerian is the temple of the foundation of heaven and earth, a ziggurat dedicated to the Mesopotamian god Marduk in the ancient city of Babylon. It now exists only in ruins, located about 56 miles south of Baghdad, Iraq. However, given the story's overtly anti-Babylonian stance, a Mesopotamian origin seems unlikely unless it was pinned by a citizen of a Mesopotamian city rivaling Babylon. Finally, within the Christian canon, the account of Pentecost in Acts 2, 5-13 may be understood as a New Testament version of God's gracious reversal of the Babel condition. At Babel, God transformed a single language into many, creating confusion. At Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit made it possible for many languages to be understood as one, creating unity. At Babel, language was used to promote a human agenda. At Jerusalem, the new language was used to announce the mighty works of God. At Babel, God scattered the people in judgment. At Jerusalem, God scattered the people to spread the news, which would eventually result in worldwide unity. Mythical Origins The Tower of Babel, a scholarly tale unraveled by Russell Gamirkin. Let's hit the pause button on our usual understanding of the Babylonian structures as depicted in Genesis 11, 1 through 9. And instead, let's dive into the complex backstory of the Tower of Babel narrative. Genesis 11, 1 through 5 paints a picture of the birth of Babylon and the construction of its tower by the survivors of the flood. The narrative suggests that the remnants of humanity journeyed east to Shinar, laying the foundation for the first post-flood city, Babylon. The focus in Genesis 11 is on the city's construction as a whole, not merely the tower. Thus, Genesis 11, 1-4 primarily narrates the birth of Babylon with the erection of a temple tower as a sanctuary facet. This tradition of Babylon being the first city post-flood could hardly have originated anywhere but Babylon itself. However, the narrative is not purely Babylonian. It's important to first identify which story elements originated from the underlying Babylonian source and which were innovative additions by the author of Genesis 11, 1 through 9. The confusion of languages and the scattering of humanity post-flood from Babylon are themes absent in Mesopotamian sources. The biblical claim that the city was named Babel 
since Yahweh confused the languages of the earth, contains a pun that only works in Hebrew. This pun, with its anti-Babylonian bias, may have been a polemical response to Mesopotamian traditions linking Babel to Babilu, gate of God, or associating Babel with Bel, that is Marduk. Yahweh's objection to the godlike aspirations of Babylon's builders also had anti-Babylonian overtones and continued a non-Mesopotamian theme against hubris found elsewhere in early Genesis. The division of humanity resulting from their scattering from Babylon reflected the interests of the final author, as illustrated by the Table of Nations in Genesis 10, and must also be considered a secondary addition. For these reasons, the theme regarding the confusion of languages and the resulting scattering of humanity must be seen as an innovation of the author of Genesis 11, 1-9, not derived from a Mesopotamian source. Subtracting these elements from the account at Genesis 11, 5-9, The remaining material recounts the founding of Babylon by the survivors of the flood and the scattering of post-flood Babylonians, which halted the city's construction. The story appears to have originally described a local cataclysm that befell Babylon, its residents, and its buildings after the first catastrophe of the flood. This likely began as a local legend relating to the site of Babylon and may represent an etiology on ruins at Babylon in later times. The precise nature of this second catastrophe cannot be ascertained from Genesis 11 alone. The Mesopotamian source of the Tower of Babel story appears to have been the Poem of Era, which described both the flood and a later destruction of Babylon in a second catastrophe of comparable severity. The Poem of Era was a popular work enjoying even wider circulation in the first millennium BCE than the Gilgamesh epic. The poem must have been central to Babylonian culture. At least 36 copies have been recovered from five first millennium sites, Asher, Babylon, Nineveh, Sultan Tepe, and Ur, more even as the Assyriologist and historian of religions Luigi Giovanni Cagni points out, than had been recovered of the Epic of Gilgamesh according to this poem. The flood occurred when Marduk, lord of the gods, was angered at humankind and rose from his royal throne. A cosmic catastrophe ensued, affecting both heaven and earth, and floodwaters destroyed most of humankind as well as the city of Babylon. Marduk himself was drenched and his royal attire darkened and ruined. Marduk rebuilt his house, his temple at Babylon, and returned to his temple throne. But his government was inadequate due to the condition of his royal garments. The Apkalu sages, who alone were competent to create a new splendid idol of Marduk for the temple, had been sent to the underworld. Marduk therefore planned to leave his throne again to descend to the underworld to have his royal attire restored, despite the second catastrophe that would inevitably ensue. In his absence, the world would be ruled by Era, the Mesopotamian god of destruction. Waters again would rise, a storm would blot out the sky, and an evil wind would blow. The remnant of humankind who survived the first flood would be threatened with extinction. Cities would be destroyed and temples laid waste. Babylon would fall, as well as other Babylonian cities, even Sippar, which alone had been spared from the earlier deluge. The ziggurat of the sanctuary of Babylon, the city walls, and towers would all be destroyed. But finally the wrath of Era would be placated. Marduk would be allowed to return to his temple, which however Era still presided over, the gods would be reconciled and returned to their proper places and order would be restored. Babylonia would rise again and Babylon would be rebuilt, although at the direction of a curiously benevolent Era, god of destruction, not Marduk as one would expect. 
The ruined temples would again raise their heads as high as the flaming sun. The Poem of Error provides the closest Mesopotamian parallel to the biblical story of the Tower of Babel. It had Babylon repopulated by the remnant of humankind who survived the flood. It described a second catastrophe that befell the residents of Babylon in the post-flood era. It contained an explicit image of the ziggurat in the city walls and fortifications of Babylon in ruins. The Poem of Era indeed contained the first cuneiform reference to the ziggurat into Menachi at Babylon. Can you see the comparison to what's happening here in this poem and what we see in the Tower of Babel story? Most scholars don't know or can't find a mythical or legendary antecedent to the story. But Russell Gamirkin, I think, has found it. Seeking the Source It may be independently established that Barossus drew on the poem of Era as a source, or a tradition very similar to it. Among cuneiform sources, the poem of Era uniquely alluded to a tradition that the ancient city of Sippar survived the first deluge. In Barossus, Kisithros buried tablets containing ancient lore, notably astrological records, at Sippor prior to the flood, and the flood survivors retrieved the tablets afterwards. This suggests that Barossus was familiar with the literary traditions related to the poem of Era. Evidence that Barossus recorded the Mesopotamian version of the Tower of Babel story is indirectly provided by pseudo Eupolemus, which drew on Barossus. pseudo Eupolemus was a Samaritan Jewish author of circa 250 BCE who wrote a history of the world down to the time of Abraham loosely based on Genesis, but with an emphasis on the transmission of astrological lore. The writings of pseudo Eupolemus, like those of Barossus, were preserved in excerpt by Alexander Polyhistor and subsequently passed on by Eusebius. In one fragment, pseudo Eupolemus wrote, In anonymous works, we find that Abraham traced his ancestry to the giants. These dwelt in the land of Babylonia. Because of their impiety, they were destroyed by the gods. One of them, Belos, escaped death and settled in Babylon. He built a tower and lived in it. The tower was called Belos, after its builder. A second text recorded a slightly different or rather complementary account. Eupolemus, in his work On the Jews, states that the Assyrian city of Babylon was first founded by those who escaped the flood. When the tower was destroyed by God's power, these giants were scattered over the whole earth. These two fragments combine to tell the following story. The giants, including Belus, which is Bel Marduk, originally lived in Babylonia. Due to their impiety, the gods destroyed them presumably by the flood. Belos survived the flood and founded Babylon and its tower. The Tower of Babel was named after Belos. After a second act of impiety, the gods destroyed the tower and the giants were scattered across the whole earth. A passage in the Sibylline Oracle, widely recognized as dependent on pseudo Eupolemus, adds another detail. The tower was cast down by a great wind sent from heaven. This account has many features in common with Barossus and with Genesis 11, 1 through 9. All three describe Babylon as founded or refounded by survivors of the flood. Additionally, Pseudo Eupolemus contained an account of the destruction of the Tower of Babel and the scattering of the giants across the earth linking up more directly with Genesis. Several aspects of the story in pseudo Eupolemus point to a Mesopotamian source, independent of Genesis. 
The description of Belos as a giant may have been based in part on the enormous representations of Bel Marduk at Babylon. Enuma Elish, which described Marduk's gigantic stature, provides another parallel. Several Mesopotamian sources portrayed Bel as the founder of Babylon, notably Enuma Elish, Barosus, and the poem of Era. Bel as the king ruling Babylon from his temple throne was another common Mesopotamian conception. Bel Marduk was the protagonist in several Mesopotamian literary works. In the Marduk prophecy, the abduction of the statue of Marduk by the Hittites was transformed into a tell in which Marduk, king of Babylon, took a journey to the west and returned. In the Marduk ordeal, the capture of Marduk's statue by Sennacherib was transformed into a tale of Marduk's imprisonment and interrogation for suspicion of rebellion against Asur, a Syrian lord of the gods. The poem of Era, in close analogy to pseudo Eupolemus, recounted misfortunes befalling Bel Marduk. The mortality of the gods, giants, in pseudo Eupolemus has parallels in Mesopotamian literature such as Enuma Elish in which the gods Apsu and Tiamat and a number of primordial monsters were slain, and in which humans were created from the blood of a beheaded god. These are all indications of an authentic Mesopotamian source behind pseudo eupolemus Although pseudo eupolemus incorporated a flood story, it was not the familiar deluge of the Atrahasis epic. Gilgamesh and Utnapishtim did not appear in pseudo eupolemus nor was the survival of a remnant of humankind a matter of significance. The Ark did not even merit mention. In pseudo eupolemus the protagonists were the gods, and the survival of Bel Marduk, not humanity, was the notable event. The Flood was not the exclusive focus of pseudo eupolemus The story continued through a second cataclysm that destroyed Babylon's tower. These details point to a source other than the standard Mesopotamian Flood stories. Parallels between the poem of Era and the Tower of Babel story in Genesis have already been discussed. Numerous parallels also exist between the poem of Era and pseudo eupolemus pointing to a genetic relationship between the two. As in pseudo eupolemus Babylon was the main setting of the poem of Era, and the god Bel Marduk was the main protagonist. Both the poem of Era and pseudo eupolemus presented Bel Marduk as building the temple at Babylon. This structure served as the palace from which he ruled the city after the flood. Both associated the departure of Bel Marduk from Babylon with a catastrophe that struck the city. In the poem of Era, human impiety was the reason for Bel Marduk's departure from Babylon and all the cosmic disorder that ensued, and specifically for the flood. Pseudo Eupolemus also cited impiety of the residents of Babylonia as the cause of the flood. This detail, present in both the Poem of Era and pseudo eupolemus was absent both in Genesis and in the Gogamesh epic. Most significantly, in both of the Poem of Era and the pseudo eupolemus Bel Marduk was himself a survivor of the Flood. In pseudo eupolemus as in the Poem of Era, Bel Marduk was pictured as driven from Babylon, his home, by other powerful gods who destroyed the Tower of Babel. In the poem of Era, Bel Marduk was the similar victim of a conspiracy led by Era, god of destruction, who tricked him into leaving Babylon and in his absence staged a coup, took over the government of the universe and destroyed Babylon, its fortifications, and its ziggurat. Only in the poem of Era do we have a cuneiform example of Bel Marduk's exile and Babylon's fall resulting from a rivalry of the gods. 
Another parallel relates to the destruction of the Tower of Babel by a wind from the gods, as attested in Sibylline Oracles 397 through 109, which is widely acknowledged as having drawn on Pseudo Eupolemus. The Poem of Era also listed an evil wind as one of the agents of destruction in the catastrophe that followed Marduk's second departure from the throne. Finally, both Pseudo Eupolemus and the Poem of Era mentioned the fall of Babylon's ziggurat. Genesis omitted any mention of the fall of the Tower of Babel, stating only that the construction in Babylon ceased after its residents were scattered. All these pointed parallels demonstrate that Pseudo Eupolemus was specifically indebted to the Poem of Era. However, it seems incredible that Pseudo Eupolemus, a Samaritan author of the 3rd or 2nd century BCE, would have had direct knowledge of the Poem of Era in cuneiform. Rather, Pseudo Eupolemus appears to have obtained his knowledge of the Poem of Era by means of an intermediate source presumably writing in Greek, since pseudo Eupolemus himself wrote in Greek and utilized the Septuagint and other Greek sources. Barosus is the most obvious and indeed the only known Greek source on Babylonian cuneiform traditions. Barosus. Opinion is divided over whether Pseudo Eupolemus was dependent on Barosus's Babylonica. Wachholder, Walter, and Schneibel originally held that Pseudo Eupolemus directly drew on Barosus. Schneibel later modified his views, concluding that Pseudo Eupolemus drew on an oral tradition of Mesopotamian origin. Wachholder effectively rebutted this view, pointing out that such phrases as some say, the Babylonians say, and called by the Greeks demonstrated that the author made use of literary sources. Further, Wachholder pointed out the direct literary dependence of Pseudo Eupolemus' tradition on Abraham as the Babylonian sage in the 10th generation after the flood, with a virtually identical tradition in Barosis as quoted by Josephus. Hence, it appears certain that Pseudo Eupolemus utilized Barosis, at least in part. Quanvig acknowledged that Pseudo Eupolemus drew on Barosis. However, Quanvig pointed out that the flood story in Pseudo Eupolemus had significant differences from the familiar version found in Barosis. In Pseudo Eupolemus, the flood struck the giants, not humankind. The protagonist was the god Belos, not Kisithros. The reason for the catastrophe was impiety, whereas in Barosis, no reason was given. And Pseudo Eupolemus connected the flood story with the Tower of Babel. Convig commented, A Babylonian could hardly make Belos the supreme god of Babylon, the hero of the flood. Convid concluded that the account in Pseudo Eupolemus drew on a Mesopotamian tradition distinct from Barosis. Convig did not suggest what that Mesopotamian source might be, maybe the Poem of Era, or how Pseudo Eupolemus might have obtained knowledge of it. Convig's arguments fail to find their mark insofar as they only demonstrate that the flood tradition in Pseudo Eupolemus differs from that of the Gilgamesh epic Tablet 11 and the parallel account in Barosis. Convig failed to note the possibility that Barosis may have drawn on a different cuneiform tradition for the post-flood period. We have already seen that Barosis was aware of the tradition that Sippar survived the flood uniquely paralleled among cuneiform sources in the Poem of Era. It is possible that just as Barosis combined Enuma Elish, the Sumerian king list, and the Gilgamesh epic Tablet 11 to present a connected narrative of the world down to the flood, he likewise drew on the Poem of Era to extend his account to the post-flood generations. In Barosis, the Ark was of gigantic dimensions, suggesting that the flood survivors were 
giants, in Barosis, as in Pseudo-Eupolemus. Convig's objections are thus satisfied by the observation that Barosis supplemented the Gilgamesh epic flood story with the poem of Era, in which the focus was Bel Marduk and the rivalry of the gods, not Kisithros and humanity. Important affinities exist between the poem of Era and the story of the Tower of Babel as found in Genesis and pseudo Eupolemus. The account of the Tower of Babel in pseudo Eupolemus appears to derive from the poem of Era by way of Barosis according to all available evidence. This supports the conclusion that the story of the Tower of Babel in Genesis, which also has strong parallels with the poem of Era, likewise derived from Barosis, that the Tower of Babel story derived from the Poem of Era already causes difficulties for the documentary hypothesis, given the Poem of Era's late date, 680 to 669 BCE. It is worth noting that the Poem of Era displayed no special interest or pride in Babylonian architecture, wonders, and construction techniques. It was only in Barosis that we encounter in a single document allusions to Babylon as the first post-flood city, to the burnt brick and bitumen, architecture of Babylon, and to the poem of Era's account of the fall of Babylon. This unique blend of themes points to Barosis as the Mesopotamian source behind the Tower of Babylon story in Genesis. Table of Nations and Hellenistic Roots Finally, we come to the enigmatic world of Genesis 10, also known as the Table of Nations. This biblical tableau sketches a fascinating family tree, tracing the roots of various nations in the eastern Mediterranean back to Noah's three sons. But here's the catch. The table isn't an exhaustive list. And the principles guiding the categorization of descendants remain shrouded in mystery. The temporal placement of the table is another hotbed of scholarly contention. Another detail stretches credibility. Was every nation on earth really descended from a single ancestor? This last odd fact is probably the easiest to explain. As biblical scholars such as John Van Cedars have long known. The biblical authors got this directly from the Greeks, who gave virtually every nation known to them an eponymous ancestor. Herodotus is chock full of examples. For instance, the Hellenes or Greeks were all descended from Hellas, the Lydians from Lydus, the Persians from Persis, and so on. In one very striking parallel to the Table of Nations, the three main divisions of the Greeks, namely the Dorians, Aeolians, and Archaeans, were descended from the three sons of Hellas named Doris, Aeolus, and Suthus, the Shimham and Japhet of the Greek world. Hellas, meanwhile, was the son of the flood hero Deucalion, the Greek version of Noah. But when, how, and why did the biblical authors come up with a Greek-style genealogy for the Table of Nations? According to Russell Gamirkin, clues can be found in the Table of Nations itself, which exactly mirrors the geopolitical contours of the Eastern Mediterranean around 273 to 272 BCE. First, let's take a look at Shem. Noah's oldest son. His sons are Elam, ancestor of the Elamites, and Asher, ancestor of the Assyrians, and Aram, ancestor of Arameans, all well-known peoples of the ancient Mesopotamia, and Lud, the ancestor of the Lydians of Asia Minor? What? When was Lydia ever united with Mesopotamia? 
certainly at no time before the conquest of Alexander the Great in 335 to 325 BCE. But afterwards, in the Hellenistic era, when the Jews would have known all about the Greeks and their genealogies of nations, bingo. As it so happens, after 278 BCE, Lydia was a key territory within the Seleucid Empire, ruled from Babylon. Shem corresponds neatly with the Seleucids, one of the two major regional powers after the time of Alexander the Great. Let's take a look at Ham, Noah's second son. Ham was a common name for Egypt. Ham's sons included Mizraim, another name for Egypt, and Cush, or Ethiopia, and Put, or Libya, and Canaan, which was under Egyptian control during the various periods of history. The descendants of Cush in the Table of Nations included locations along both Arabian and African coasts of the Red Sea. These coasts were explored and charted by the fleets of Ptolemy II Philadelphus in 278 BCE, and Ptolemy officially laid claim to the entire list of nations in 273 to 270 BCE. So Ham corresponds neatly with the Ptolemies, the other major regional power. Finally, we come to Japhet, the third son of Noah apparently named after the Greek titan Lepidus, one of those pesky giants who survived the flood. The territories assigned to Japhet, bordering Mesopotamia and Lydia to the north, correspond strikingly well with the territories of the former Persian Empire that Alexander failed to conquer. Also included was Javan, a reference to the Ionian Greeks. In other words, all the familiar nations known to the Jews of that time, not found in the warring Seleucid and Ptolemaic empires. Our exploration suggests that the Table of Nations could be a reflection of the geopolitical realities of the Eastern Mediterranean around 273 to 272 BCE. Conclusion. Well, folks, there you have it. We've scaled the Tower of Babel, navigated the polytheistic labyrinth, and dined at the table of nations, all while keeping our scholarly hats firmly on our heads. And let's not forget our late night rendezvous with the biblical author, who according to the ever punctual Russell Gamirkin, probably wrote during the times Greeks took over the party. We have found a document about the Spartans and the Jews, indicating that we are related and that both of our nations are descended from Abraham. 1 Maccabees 12, 21. Dare we ask, did Abraham really exist? The mysterious figure, Abraham, embedded deep within the biblical narrative, conjures fascinating queries. Might there be echoes of other myths that connect to the Abraham narrative? Yes, echoes, and dare I say, myths. If we're being audacious here, let's also claim that Abraham's tale might not be etched in the stone of history, but instead in the parchment of allegory. We're on a quest for truth, and not just any truth but one that doesn't sugarcoat our sensibilities. Consider Peter J. Lightheart, a figure I may not always nod in agreement with, but who serves a cogent point as a voice of faith. He notes, Evangelicals are debating the historicity of Adam, but they are too timid. It is time to reject fundamentalist distortions 
of the Abrahamic narrative just as decisively as we have abandoned literalistic readings of Genesis 1 through 3. Clinging to discredited biblical accounts of Abraham as if these events actually happened makes us look like Neanderthals, undermines the plausibility of our witness, and ultimately overturns the gospel. To defend the gospel and uphold the authority of the Bible, we need to reckon with the myth of Abraham. Lightheart's clarity is akin to a refreshing splash of cold water, especially for someone like me, who navigates ancient texts with a secular compass, regardless of their cultural origins. Yet, despite his insights, Lightheart still seems to hold the Bible as a divine artifact rather than a human creation. The conundrum remains. The tangible evidence for Abraham, let alone the events in Genesis, is as elusive as a desert mirage. Take, for instance, Abraham's sojourn in Egypt in Genesis 12. Uncannily reminiscent of Israel's Egyptian saga, which too seems more allegorical than actual. Whether these narratives stem from shared literary motifs or direct modeling, the debate remains. As scholars passionately debate these tells origins, positing multiple authors across epochs or perhaps a single Hellenic-influenced scribe, we must ponder, if Abraham is less man and more motif, what message lies encrypted in his story? Our journey might find its compass pointing towards Greece. While the influence of cultures like the Mesopotamians, Canaanites, and Egyptians on biblical texts is almost universally acknowledged, the Grecian whisper in the scriptural tapestry remains understated. Yet, I remain convinced of this Hellenic echo. The vast Greek Septuagint, intertwined with biblical tradition, offers tantalizing clues. People imagine the Greeks as full-on pagan polytheistic peoples. However, the elite philosophers like Thales, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle were the original gangsters of monism, with an ultimate divine power that rules over the divine lesser beings. The later Christians and Jews are in many ways indebted to these thinkers. And yes, for those who followed our previous explorations into Russell Gamirkin's insights, brace yourselves for another scholarly expedition into Abraham's possible Grecian roots. Join us as we wade into this confluence of biblical Greek connections. Let the Odyssey commence. Abraham's story in a nutshell. Born around 2170 BCE in the prominent city of Ur, Abram, later named Abraham, was a central figure in biblical history. Moving to Haran after the death of his brother Haran, he married his half-sister Sarai at 75, and he heeded a divine call to relocate to Canaan. Accompanied by Sarai and his nephew Lot, his story opens up with the immediate promise of a land that God will show him, and that he will be a great nation. Facing famine, they took refuge in Egypt, where, fearing for their lives, Abraham presented Sarai as his sister, afraid the Egyptians would kill him for her beauty. Mind you, Sarai is ten years younger than Abraham, according to these texts. So here's a 65-year-old woman who must have been smoking like a 20-year-old Playboy model. Odd detail. Their deception was uncovered, leading to their expulsion. Back in Canaan, tensions between Abram and Lot's household forced them to part ways. After Lot's capture in a regional war, Abraham heroically rescued him and he bumped into Melchizedek, king of Salem who was a high priest of the Most High God. Many questions abound for this figure. Anyways, around this period, Abraham lamented his lack of an heir, though God reassured him. Sarai offered her maid, Hagar, to bear a child. Hagar bore Ishmael, but tensions arose. 
leading to her exile. Can anyone say Jerry Springer any faster? Later, God renewed his covenant, renaming Abram to Abraham and Sarai to Sarah, foretelling the birth of Isaac and introducing circumcision. Three divine visitors confirmed Isaac's upcoming birth and also warned of Sodom's impending destruction. Despite Abraham's intercessions, Sodom was destroyed, though Lot escaped, albeit the tragic consequences of his wife turning into a pillar of salt. Oh, and his two daughters drugging their father with wine to sleep with him to carry on a seed. In Gerar, Abraham, fearing for Sarah's safety again, called her his sister. King Abimelech took Sarah, but returned her upon realizing the deceit. Shortly thereafter, Isaac was born. Now who's the real baby's daddy here? Abimelech or Abraham? Anyways, following more disputes involving Hagar and Ishmael, Abraham banished them but they were divinely protected. In a supreme test of faith, God commanded Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. As Abraham obeyed, an angel intervened, providing a ram as a substitute. Sarah passed away at the age of 137 years, and Abraham secured a burial site in Machpelah. Abraham then arranged for Isaac's marriage and had more children with his second wife, Keturah. Ensuring Isaac was his sole heir, Abraham passed away at 175 years of age and was buried beside Sarah by Isaac and Ishmael. Eventually, his son Isaac would have children named Jacob and Esau. Then Jacob would get the promise and be renamed to Israel. Israel's favorite son was Joseph, who would get them into Egypt, you gotta read the story, and eventually they would become slaves for 430 years, all to have Moses take them on an exodus to the promised land with Joshua leading victorious battles to get what God promised Abraham at the outset. The Quest for the Historical Abraham Searching for Abe From the hollowed echoes of the Dead Sea Scrolls, biblical authors have painted vivid portraits of iconic figures, treating them as historical luminaries, regardless of some of the rather eyebrow-raising assertions. Abraham's age of 175? A walk in the park compared to Adam's whopping 930-year tenure. Through the annals of history, historians and ecclesiastical scholars, with fervor akin to investigative detectives, have endeavored to tether these biblical tales to the realm of historical accuracy. Their tools? Intricate genealogies and comparative historiography, striving to lend the patriarchal chronicles an air of authenticity befitting the second millennium BCE. Yet, as time's relentless march continues, our academic arsenal has evolved, providing sharper instruments for dissecting the veracity of these age-old tales. The unquestioned existence of these biblical heavyweights was the modus operandi, even for the most discerning scholars, until, that is, the 20th century's latter half bestowed upon us a plot twist. Upon uncovering the intricate tapestry of sources that constitute the Genesis and patriarchal narratives, theories abounded. The documentary hypothesis, the supplementary hypothesis, and their scholarly siblings arose, all questing to reconcile the improbability of Moses single-handedly pinning this voluminous work. By the 19th century, that notion had all but retired to the annals of antiquated thought. As we embark on this documentary, we'll be dancing on the shoulders of academic titans, luminaries like Thomas L. Thompson, John Van Cedars, Russell Gamirkin, Philip Wagenbaum, 
Philip R. Davies and dare I say Neil Godfrey have not just entered the field of Old Testament studies, they've rocked its very foundations. Thompson and Cedars in the 1970s in particular have swayed scholarly consensus from assured affirmation of the patriarch's existence to an enlightened skepticism, suggesting the upbeat nature of an archaeological quest for their remains. Thompson's magnum opus, The Historicity of the Patriarchal Narratives, fittingly culminates this sentiment. So fasten your intellectual seatbelts, dear viewers. This is going to be a cerebral ride. We have seen in the foregoing chapter of the received tradition about Abraham's journey from Ur of the Chaldees to Canaan by the way of Haran is not an originally independent tradition about Abraham. Rather, it is a historiographical reconstruction which is based on several originally independent and conflicting traditions, if not only must be understood as unhistorical, but any attempt to find movements analogous to Abraham's in the history of the Near East are essentially misdirected for the purposes of biblical interpretation. The intentions of the biblical traditions about the patriarchs are not comparable to those of the modern historian. They are rather sociological, political, and religious. Those attempts at interpretation of these traditions which willfully neglect the implications of their formations and structure can justly be dismissed as historicism. Moreover, we have seen that the biblical chronologies are not grounded on historical memory, but are rather based on a very late theological schema that presupposes a very unhistorical worldview. Those efforts to use the biblical narratives for a reconstruction of the history of the Near East in a manner comparable to the use of the archives of Mari and similar finds can justly be dismissed as fundamentalist. Though we have argued that the quest for the historical Abraham is basically fruitless occupation both for the historian and the student of the Bible, the question about the historical background of the patriarchal narratives is a question to which the historical criticism, with the help of the ancient Near Eastern history and archaeology, can give very concrete answers. In 1974, this piece of writing was so scandalous when it emerged that its author, Thompson, found himself facing a decade-long involuntary vacation from employment. By 1992, his academic antics led to an unceremonious exit from Marquette University's hallowed halls. From the disco-infused 70s to the grunge era of the 90s, he, alongside the likes of Philip R. Davies, Niels Peter Lemsky, and Keith W. Whitelam, was knee-deep in decoding the enigma dubbed Ancient Israel. Their work wasn't just groundbreaking, it was earth-shattering, especially in the world of Old Testament studies. Much of his brilliant banter, most of his argumentation, was centered around names of the patriarchs, as Thompson says in his 1974 book. It will be my contention throughout this process of historicizing Genesis is a serious error in biblical interpretation and to the extent that it depends upon the evidence we have from Near Eastern nomenclature. Totally unfounded. Some questions which must be asked of our evidence are, do the names really demonstrate or make more probable the historicity of the patriarchs? Do they help to date the period in which the patriarchs belong? Do they support the thesis that the narratives of Genesis mirror the history of the second millennium, specifically the movements of the Amorites? Ultimately, Thompson broke the consensus on Abraham's historicity. Most critical scholars these days have forsaken the attempt to finding Abe. If there ever was a guy, 
He's lost to us, as is his sons, all the way to Moses. If there ever was an exodus, it is absolutely nothing like the Bible describes it. The same can be said about the united monarchy with King David and Solomon. The more we dig, the more scandalous it seems that the Bible is not historically accurate. But is that the author's goal? Are they trying to convince their readers and hearers of a fake history as Plato recommended in his writings? Russell Gamirkin has spoken several times about Plato's noble lies and how to create a great nation. In the historical pursuit of the biblical patriarchs, many scholars equipped with both archaeological tools and scripture sought empirical confirmation of these iconic figures. In Egypt, one is presented with names from first immediate period, circa 2181 to 2055 BCE, associated with Abraham and believed to be Amorites. This association arises because of the phonetic resemblance to the Amuru from South Mesopotamia emerging around the same epoch. Parallelly, the Hyksos, linked to Jacob and Joseph, are perceived as invaders with Amorite affiliations. Curiously, it's the nomenclature of these patriarchs that seemingly connect these historical dots, allowing scholars to interpret these tales as condensed history of the Near East during the second millennium. Thompson's scholarship underscores that these patriarchal names weren't exclusive to the second millennium BCE, but echoed into the fourth century BCE across diverse locales, including Mesopotamia. The existence of Abraham has often been posited on the corroborative elements like the geographic references in Genesis. However, it's essential to note that these places endured well into the Hellenistic era. Thompson delves deeply into the significance of Abraham's name in this context. I proffer a contention. When drafting foundational stories of a nation, it's likely that authors might retroject their primeval figures into antiquated settings, lending a veneer of authenticity. Take, for instance, the esteemed archaeologist Israel Finkelstein. He views the biblical narration of Canaan's conquest in Joshua as less of an authentic historical account and more as a late 7th century BCE ideological blueprint depicting an inspirational conquest under King Josiah of Judah. Finkelstein hypothesizes that this conquest narrative possibly originated in Israel's northern kingdom around the early 8th century BCE, inspired by the remnants of past disturbances. This perspective gains weight considering the lack of archaeological traces for many cited cities or their emergence only in the 8th and 7th centuries BCE. How can one validate a 12th century BCE conquest of cities that archaeologically appear half a millennium later. By this logic, the absence of evidence for Moses' mass exodus from Egypt could whimsically be attributed to celestial beings equipped with dustbusters. Such narratives likely embellished retellings of pure literary creations often weave in contemporaneous nuances inadvertently revealing their true temporal origins. To draw a playful analogy, discovering a gospel where Peter cruises in a Honda Civic would unmistakably hint at a narrative crafted in a more modern milieu. Similarly, Genesis contains anachronisms that point to its later historical genesis, pun intended. In our preceding video explorations, we've journeyed through the tapestries of myth and lore underpinning Genesis 1-11. through Now, as we delve into the tales of Abraham, there's a prevailing sentiment that we've anchored ourselves in the firm ground of historical narrative. Numerous commentaries underscore this demarcation, suggesting a transition from myth to reality right between Genesis 11 and 12. 
For some scholars, this transformation commences even earlier, with Genesis 11.10 enveloping Terah and his kin's expedition from Ur to Haran in the cloak of history. Over time, I've developed a certain affinity for those discerning minds who interpret these passages as masterful narratives rather than concrete history. This naturally begets the query, when was Genesis scribed? A significant portion of the scholarly community posits its creation during the exile or perhaps the post-exile era, with a handful placing bets on the Persian period. It's paramount to note that their perspective primarily hinges on the priestly source, though not all contend that Genesis, in its entirety, emerged during these times. Today, I aim to illuminate the Hellenistic shades painted on Genesis, post the epoch when Alexander the Great inferred the essence of the Greek world upon the vast expanse known biblically. Neil Godfrey curates a thought-provoking blog, the link to which is available in the description below with all the sources. His writings delve deep into concepts that sometimes take a while to permeate American scholarly circles. Of particular note is his discourse on Nils Peter Lemke, which I found to be intellectually stimulating. Here are some points in favor of a Hellenistic date after 300 BCE for the Old Testament. Number one, it is a fact that the history of Israel as told by the Old Testament has little, if anything, to do with the real historical developments in Palestine until at least the later part of the Hebrew monarchy. 2. An extensive part of this literature should be considered the creation of the Jewish diaspora. First and foremost, the patriarchal narratives, the story of the Exodus about the Israelites in Egypt and their escape from Egypt, but also the conquest narratives in Joshua. All of these aim at one and the same issue, at the more or less utopian idea that a major Jewish kingdom, even empire, should be established or re-established in Palestine, an idea that emerged in spite of the fact that it had no background in ancient Israelite empire. Number three, the writers who invented the history of Israel seem to have modeled their history on a Greek pattern. Herodotus being the earliest point of comparison, there are a number of similarities between the histories of Herodotus and the Old Testament. Both histories have as their beginning a perspective that encompasses the whole world as such, and this perspective narrows down to single nations only at a later point, respectively the Greek and the Hebrew. The biblical historians display a knowledge of Greek tradition and this could hardly have been the case before Greek historians were to become known and read in the Near East. Number four, the Persian period does not seem to fit the requirements of being the time when the historical books of the Old Testament were written down. First of all, it would have to be proved that Greek authors were known and extensively read in the Persian Empire, and I very much doubt that this was the case. Lemke goes into far more responses to this issue of a later dating of the Old Testament, but consider it as we dive deeper into this documentary. Philip R. Davies, an esteemed professor of biblical studies at the University of Sheffield, delves deeply into these matters. His assertions have sparked fervent debates within academic corridors. Davies contends, based on archaeological evidence and rigorous analysis of the biblical narrative, that the biblical Israel is more myth than reality. He posits that figures such as Abraham and Moses are not historical entities, and kingdoms attributed to David and Solomon did not exist as described. According to Davies, The biblical depiction of Israel might have been crafted as late as the Persian era, challenging traditional chronologies. Problems with dating the Old Testament to the Persian era. We have very little information about the Jewish population in the Persian era. We have almost nothing apart from the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, 
and the historicity of these books has also come under scrutiny. Some doubt there was ever even a mission by Ezra. The autobiography of Nehemiah may be no more historical than many other similar examples of autobiographical genre in the Greek world. Biblical historians have traditionally written of the period of Persian rule as time of peace and prosperity. Judah was allowed administrative independence. Jerusalem was organized as a prosperous temple burger society. But the evidence we have could just as easily be interpreted otherwise. That Judah's independence may be more comparable to modern crumbling societies left on their own and with a great deal of administrative independence to provide a sad picture of local incompetence. Maybe they did not interfere in local affairs because they did not care. The Templeburger Society has nothing more than hypotheses to support it, and the account of a band of Greek mercenaries being able to waltz through the empire, kill a Persian governor, and walk out again in Xenophon's Anabasis is evidence of Persian administrative incompetence. The archaeological evidence we need for the Persian period is not likely to come to light. Israeli archaeologists have demonstrated a contempt for the Persian period and removed its remains to rubbish dumps in order to get down to the real Israelite layers. Lemke cites A. Mazar's Archaeology of the Land of the Bible, 586 BCE, as illustrative to this attitude. As for the Hellenistic period, it should never be forgotten that the revitalization of the ancient Near East only became a fact after the Greek takeover. It is an established fact that city life vastly expanded after the conquest of Alexander. Here we must realize what happened in Jerusalem and in Palestine. Innovations that were comparable, although on a smaller scale, to the cultural developments in Syria, Mesopotamia, and Egypt. Scholars may nurse very romantic ideas about what may have happened in the nooks and crannies of pre-Hellenistic Palestine, in a society considerably poorer than the one found there, for example, during the Late Bronze Age. A more worldly and realistic assessment of facts suggests that the Persian period was not the time when the Old Testament could have been written down. Hardly any parallel exists to such a development, but a lot of evidence that says the Hellenistic Age was the formative period of early Jewish thought and literature as witnessed by the Old Testament itself. I would refer everyone to Jonathan Adler, the archaeologist who is confirming much of these statements. In Plato and the Creation of the Hebrew Bible, Russell Gamirkin delves into an intriguing premise. He postulates that a myriad of laws within the Hebrew Bible draw parallels more closely to the works of Plato rather than the traditions of the ancient Near East. Both Gamirkin and Philip Wagenbaum theorize that Plato's philosophical treaties were seminal influences, shaping the biblical author's formulation of idealistic national laws. Russell Gamirkin on Foundation Stories When we look at Greek literature, we can see that the biblical tells of the Israelites' exodus under Moses and their conquest under Joshua are quite similar to the Greek foundation stories. Even though this kind of storytelling wasn't common in the ancient Near East, it was very popular among the Greeks during the Hellenistic period. This section delves into the common themes in Greek foundation stories and how they compare to Moses leading the Israelites to the promised land. Greek foundation stories can be set in different eras. There are mythical times that's when gods and humans lived together before major floods, like that of Deucalion or Noah. There's legendary times marked by heroes and ending around the Trojan War. And the more factual, archaic, and historical periods, direct interactions between gods and humans were limited to the mythical and legendary periods. In later times, people would seek advice or guidance from the gods at temples or sacred sites. 
While some stories were entirely set in legendary times, most foundation tales started with the promises of land made during this era. But the actual settlement happened in the more factual, archaic, or historical periods. Promises of ancestral lands are a recurring theme in many Greek foundation tales. They serve as a foundational myth that supports later conquests and settlements of specific territories. Often these promises were made to renowned heroes like Heracles, Aeneas, or members of the Argonaut expedition. As these heroes journeyed, they would pass through territories that their descendants would eventually settle. Often, gods like Apollo would grant these lands to the heroes during their travels. Even if the hero settled elsewhere or even passed away in a different land, their divine claim to these lands would be handed down to their descendants. It might take several generations before the descendants actually settled these promised lands. A famous example of this narrative theme is Heraclius' Adventures where he received divine rights to various places during his Mediterranean travels. This narrative style was also used to justify the Spartans' colonization efforts, citing Heracles' journeys. Another example is the story of Cyrene in North Africa. As per the accounts of poets Pindar and Apollonius of Rhodes, when the Argonauts arrived at the Libyan coast, Poseidon's son gave Euphemus a symbolic chunk of Libyan soil, marking it as a territory under his rule. This token of rulership was passed down until Batis, a descendant, founded Cyrene in Libya. Another special case is Aeneas, who after the Trojan War journeyed the Mediterranean but never visited Latium's promised land. However, he was prophesied at Troy that his descendants would create a city, Rome, destined for greatness. Drawing parallels, Winefield highlighted the similarities between the land promises given to the biblical figures like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and those given to heroes like Heracles and Aeneas. The stories of these patriarchs served as a prelude to the foundation of the Israelite nation by Moses and Joshua. Similarly, Greek tales about ancient heroes and foundational ancestors provided a historical context for subsequent movements and conquests. The Israelites' journey and settlement into the Promised Land mirrors Greek myths like the return of the Heraclids, usually foundation stories, which explain how a group settled in a new territory, begin by detailing the problems that made them leave their original home. These issues could be overpopulation, famine, disease outbreaks, natural disasters, economic problems, internal conflicts, forced exile, military defeats, or escaping potential conquest and enslavement. In one ancient Jewish story written by Hecateus of Abdera around 315 BCE, it's said that Egypt became overpopulated, leading the Egyptians to send settlers to places including Babylon and Judea. Another tale from Manetho, written around 285 BCE, claims that Jerusalem and Judea were first inhabited by the Hyksos, foreign rulers who took over Egypt, but were later forced out by the Egyptians due to a disease outbreak linked to the Hyksos' ungodly practices. In contrast, the biblical Exodus story, written around 270 BCE, presents a different viewpoint. The Egyptians faced plagues as punishment for enslaving the Israelites, and only after suffering these calamities did the Pharaoh let them go. This narrative of escaping from bondage fits the pattern of Hellenistic foundation stories and is a consistent theme in biblical tales. 
The well-known practice of the Egyptians using slave labor for grand projects such as building pyramids reinforces this narrative. While the miraculous rescue of the Israelites is unique to the biblical account, their quest for freedom aligns well with Greek tales. A pivotal moment in the Exodus story is when God chooses Moses to be the liberator and guide for the Jewish people. This revelation occurs when Moses, in exile from Egypt, discovers a holy site in the Sinai Desert. God informs him that he has been chosen to lead the Israelites out of Egypt to a new homeland with Aaron's assistance. Although hesitant and unsure, Moses accepts this significant responsibility. In the biblical story, Moses' divine selection to lead mirrored a common trend seen in Greek foundation tales. Typically in these tales, an oracle, usually at the famed Delphi sanctuary dedicated to Apollo, would choose the leader, termed oikist, for a colonization mission. This oikist held various roles, expedition head, military leader, spiritual guide, and law enforcer. It was a reoccurring theme for these leaders to be unexpectedly chosen. Guidance for their journey, including specific landmarks and signs to determine settlement areas, often came from the Delphi Oracle. On some journeys, a prophet or spiritual guide accompanied the leader, aiding in establishing the new settlement. The biblical account showcases the Israelites as an organized, armed group, constantly prepared for battle as they journeyed from Egypt. Moses was their military strategist, but their triumphs, whether in battle against various tribes or major exodus from Egypt, were attributed to the divine intervention of Yahweh. This description of the exodus sets the stage for the next phase, the conquest where Joshua takes over Moses' military role. Throughout these narratives, the main emphasis is on the armed men. Women, children, and livestock are seen as under their protection, while the fighters are the focus of accounts and are explicitly numbered. The portrayal of this migration, then, is of an armed group transitioning from one territory to conquer another. This depiction aligns with Greek tales where colonization parties often journeyed as armed contingents. It's at Delphi that Apollo recognized as the god guiding migrations and settlements was consulted. In the Bible, Mount Sinai serves as the pivotal spot where God communicates with Moses. This return to Sinai in the Exodus narrative is the backdrop for the profound moment where Moses climbs the mountain and receives God's commandments. In Greek tales, the leader often revisits the Delphi Oracle for advice on pressing issues. This trip back to the Oracle sometimes left the expedition group alone for extended times, akin to Moses' 40-day stay on the mountain. Moses, as the lawgiver, fits seamlessly within the Greek narrative structure. In Greek tales, the oikist typically established laws for the new settlement. Historical accounts and legends often credit ancient law codes to singular prominent figures, such as Lycurgus or Solon, who sometimes were believed to have received these laws directly from deities. Established processes even allowed for proposed law codes to be presented at an oracle. Like Delphi, to gain divine approval. While Greek narratives often depict lawgivers getting divine laws via specific ceremonial methods, the Bible portrays Moses directly meeting God at Sinai amid an awe-inspiring natural display. At Mount Sinai, Moses supervised the creation of a special tent and its items. This tent wasn't just a place of worship, but was believed to be the dwelling place of God. As the Israelites traveled through the wilderness, God was thought to accompany them within this tent. Moses was the main spiritual leader for the Israelites during their journey, much like the oikist in Greek stories. 
The Oikist was also a religious leader, representing the god Apollo during their colonization missions. When the Greeks ventured into new territories, they believed they were also relocating their gods. A sacred fire symbolized this move, which they used for religious rituals during the journey. Apollo's famous sanctuary in Delphi often gave them guidance on where to settle and build their new sanctuaries. In the Bible, before entering their desired land, the Israelites sent scouts to check it out. However, they were disheartened by the challenges they'd face in conquering it. As a result, they spent 40 years wandering, during which the entire soldier generation died. Similarly, in some Greek tales, explorers were sent first to assess new lands. These colonization efforts, whether in myth or real history, often faced challenges. They might take much longer than expected, sometimes spanning several generations. There were times when the settlers even thought of going back to their original homeland due to homesickness or settlement challenges. Both the biblical account and Greek tales emphasized the importance of establishing foundational laws and systems for their new societies. For Israelites, after their 40-year journey, there was a renewed emphasis on the laws, particularly in the book of Deuteronomy. This highlighted how they should live once they settled. All these guidelines were officially approved by the community and were meant to be publicly displayed in their new homeland. Similarly, when Joshua took the people across the Jordan, he quickly set up an altar and inscribed these laws, ensuring they were practiced. Like in the Bible, Greek colonization stories also focused on establishing foundational laws for their new territories. The leader, or oikist, who was similar to Moses, set these laws. The oikist laid down rules about political, religious, and military structures. The society's class system, land distribution, and citizens' rights. Just as in the biblical narrative, these laws were approved by the community, usually with rituals and oaths. Often these guidelines were inscribed on stone tablets for everyone to see. When the Israelites reached the Promised Land, they were coming back to the original home of their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This story reminds us of the return of the Heraclids in Greek tales. In both stories, a divine command encouraged the takeover of the local people. Similarly, the journey of Joshua in conquering part of the Promised Land matches Greek stories about the founding of new colonies. In both the Bible and Greek tales, the deity presents the land as a gift. The conquering colonizers believed they were not just allowed, but obligated to take over. Most of the time, the native people were either defeated and enslaved or forced to move. Sometimes the takeover was explained with a moral reason, adding it to the legend. The oikist or colony leader often became a revered hero due to his military leadership, but starting a colony wasn't always smooth. The newcomers often faced challenges from locals, which sometimes made the Greeks rethink or give up their plans just like how the Greeks felt shame for not taking over the lands given by their god Apollo's oracle. The Israelites were also criticized in the book of Judges for not fully conquering their promised land. The Oikist had various responsibilities, including picking up the main city's spot, creating religious areas and structures, organizing festivals, and dividing the land among the settlers. The actions of Joshua during the conquest phase bear a lot of similarities to Greek colonization accounts, as detailed by Weinfeld. Once the colony was fully established, its completion was marked by the death of its founding figure. The later generations would remember this founder and would often dedicate a special cult to honor them, usually at their burial site. For colonies set up in the historical times, these burial sites were typically in the city's central area. In legendary tales, the exact location of the burial might be lost to time. While Moses' burial place remains a mystery, 
The burial sites of Joshua and the chief priest Eleazar were highlighted, suggesting these founders were deeply respected. The tradition of the Oikist often involved a yearly celebration that remembered the founding of the colony under the Oikist's leadership. One of the most famous such celebrations was the Dorian's Carnea Festival, honoring the establishments of Sparta, Thera, and Cyrene. The Carnea was initially a festival that celebrated farming, paying tribute to Carnus, an old ram god. Later, this god was associated with Apollo. Apollo Carneus signifies Apollo as the guide of migrations, much like how a ram leads its flock. Its particular aspect of Apollo is credited with guiding the Dorian movement to Sparta and other colonization efforts. The nine-day Carnea festival had various activities like the sacrifice of a ram and a recreation of a military journey, which includes dances with weapons and parades with miniature ships. Interestingly, aspects of the Carnea have similarities with the biblical Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. Both started as agricultural festivals, spotlighting the sacrifice of sheep. Over time, these festivals became significant national events, reenacting migration tales. The Passover, in its evolution, portrayed the story of Israelite beginnings, similar to how Carnea portrayed Spartan beginnings. This suggests that the Passover might have been influenced by Greek foundation narratives and festivals that Jews encountered in the early Hellenistic period. The biblical tales about patriarchs and the events like the Exodus and the Conquest fit the mold of the Greek theses or foundation stories. But every story has its unique elements. For example, while some Greek colonization tales spoke of escape from slavery or lawgivers being divinely inspired, the biblical Exodus and the laws given at Sinai are described with divine miracles not commonly seen in Greek stories. The writers of Deuteronomy recognize these special aspects of Israel's foundation narrative. In Deuteronomy 4, 32 through 34, highlighted the exceptional nature of Israel's origin story, especially the direct involvement of Yahweh as the savior and provider of laws, setting it apart from other foundation tells known primarily in the Greek contexts. National Foundation Myths, Greeks and Jews In a discerningly pinned blog post, Neil Godfrey delves into the intriguing parallels between Phrixus and Isaac. Such a comparison, he asserts, is indispensable when examining Abraham's narrative. One cannot sidestep the intertwined tales of Isaac or Jacob. Abraham stands as the proverbial patriarch of the Jews, celebrated not only for the inaugural covenant of circumcision, but also for his heart-wrenched act of near sacrifice of his beloved son, Isaac. Godfrey's insights are underpinned by Philip Wajibam's seminal work, Argonauts of the Desert. Through rigorous contemplation, Godfrey offers an astute interpretation of Wajimbaum's contentions, showcasing his commendable grasp on the subject matter. Godfrey expresses it this way. Philip Wajimbaum in 2008 defended his anthropology doctoral thesis, Argonauts of the Desert, Structural Analysis of the Hebrew Bible. He applies the structural analysis of myths as developed by Claude Levi-Strauss to the Bible, something Levi-Strauss himself never got around to doing, although he did eventually encourage biblical scholars to do so. In Wajimbaum's words, for Levi-Strauss, a version of a myth is always derived from an existing adaptation, originating most of the time from a different culture and language. A myth must always be analyzed in comparison to its variants within the same cultural area where contacts between populations are proven. 
Wagenbaum is analyzing the Bible narratives as myths, though he concedes they may contain some historical elements, and comparing the accounts with narratives and laws from Greek literature. While ancient Near Eastern literature offers many laws similar to those in the Bible, he thinks the Greek literature has not been explored in this context to its full potential. I am already wondering about the gospel narratives and the relationship between Jewish and Greek mythical and literary culture in this context, Godfrey says. For Levi Strauss, similarities between myth that may appear as coincidental at first look must be investigated more deeply. This investigation may ultimately reveal that the analyzed narratives are actually variants of the same myth. Levi Strauss builds a very strong case for his arguments in his analysis of Native American myths. The story of the bird nester can be found in hundreds of different variants in every part of both South and North America, proving that the same initial story spread itself through millennia of oral diffusion. Levi Strauss describes how that the order of the episodes of a myth can be reversed from one variant to another and that many motifs can be inverted. Levi Strauss sought to discover universal rules of transformation in all myths, similar to the discovery of universal principles in structural linguistics and phonology. The aim of Levi Strauss was to show that mankind thinks everywhere the same, that there is no objective distinction between so-called primitive and civilized thoughts. Parallelism is not a dirty word, like the proverbial hammer that cares not whether it is used to build a house or bash the skull of a prisoner. Analyzing parallels can serve valid and good and invalid and bad functions. Parallelisms must not be analyzed in an isolated way, but one must try to find out the possible narrative structure that links the similarities together. In other words, the similarity is not sufficient by itself to speculate about any possible borrowing. We must examine the place and role of these in their own contexts. Phrixus and Isaac under the microscope. Godfrey continues. So with the context of the methods of Levi Strauss in mind, no one will jump to the conclusion that the well-known parallelism between the Greek myth of Phrixus and the binding of Isaac indicates a source derivative relationship. What will be needed after examining the parallels is an examination of the place and role of these stories in their own contexts. That step will probably have to wait for the next post, Godfrey says. Here is the Phrixus myth in hopefully a quick, easy to read ladder with a crucial key noted in step 10. 1. Athamas, king of Boeotia, married Nephili, a cloud goddess created in the image of Hera by Zeus. 2. Athamas and Nephili had twin children, a son, Phrixus, and a daughter, Heli. 3. Athamos afterwards rejected Nephili and married Eno. 4. Eno hated her stepchildren, Phrixus and Heli, so plotted to have them killed by their own father. Number five, Eno bribed messengers who told King Athamas that the Oracle of Delphi, speaking for the god Apollo, required the sacrifice of Phrixus on Mount Lephishian in order to end a famine in Boeotia. Number six, just as Athamas was about to sacrifice his son Phrixus, Zeus, or Nephili in other versions, sent a golden-winged ram to rescue Phrixus and Heli by flying away with them. Number seven, Heli fell off, hence the Hell's Pont, Heli's Sea. Number eight, the ram brought Phrixus safely to Colchis, Georgia. Number nine, in gratitude, Phrixus sacrificed to Zeus the golden ram that saved him and hung its golden fleece on an oak tree. Number 10, now while it may seem quite 
inconsequential, probably the most important ingredient of this myth is that it is the prologue of the epic of the Argonauts, who will come to Colchis years later to bring the famous Golden Fleece back to Greece. The significance of this will become apparent in my next post, where I begin to compare the structured context of this myth and the binding of Isaac. We can recognize the resemblance to the binding of Isaac in Genesis 22. To test the faith of Abraham, God orders him to sacrifice his only beloved son on Mount Moriah. Abraham submits to the command and binds his son. At the last moment, God sends an angel and interrupts the sacrifice. Abraham sees a ram stuck in a bush and sacrifices that ram instead of his son. But note the inversion of one small detail. In the Greek version, the ram is killed first. Then its fleece is hung in a tree. Whereas in the biblical version, the ram is first stuck in a bush and sacrificed afterwards. This inversion of detail can lead us to wonder whether these stories could both derive from a common source. One could derive from the other, or that the resemblance is only due to coincidence. Therefore, we must examine the place and role of these stories in their own contexts, respectively the Epic of the Argonauts and the Biblical Narrative. Godfrey continues in another blog with his astute observations. See Godfrey's comparisons here. One, you've got this divine command to sacrifice one's son. It's real in the case of Isaac, a lie in another in the case of Phrixus. Phrixus' stepmother bribed messengers to tell the father that God required the sacrifice. One, you, the father's pious, unquestioning submission to the command. Two, the last-minute deliverance of the human victim by a divinely sent ram. Direct command to the father in the case of Isaac. Direct command to the sacrificial victim in the case of Phrixus. Three, the fastening of the ram in a tree or bush. Before the sacrifice of the ram in the case of Isaac. After the sacrifice of the ram in the case of Phrixus. Four, the sacrifice of the ram as a substitute for Isaac, as a thanksgiving for Phrixus. What is significant is that these narrative units in common to both stories exist at a level independent of the particular stories. They can be inverted, reordered to create different stories. The question to ask is, are these units similar by coincidence or has one set been borrowed from the other? That particular detail about the ram in the tree or thicket is certainly distinctive enough to justify this question in relation to the whole set. Firstly, given that it is no longer considered quote-unquote fringe, except maybe among a large portion of American biblical scholars, where the influence of conservative and even evangelical religion is relatively strong, to consider the Bible's quote-unquote, Old Testament books being written as late as the Persian or even Hellenistic eras. And given the proximity of Jewish and Greek cultures, the possibility of direct borrowing cannot be rejected out of hand. Secondly, the chances of the Jewish story of the binding of Isaac being influenced by Greek myth is increased if both stories are located in a similar structural position within parallel narratives. Both near-human sacrifice narratives serve as the prologues to larger tales of, one, divine promises of a land to be inherited by a hero's descendants, two, a special divinely chosen people, three, a prearranged time schedule of four generations before the land would be inherited, four, Deliverance through a leader who initially protests because he stutters. Five, an additional delay because of human failure to hold fast to a divine promise. Six, a wandering through desert with a sacred vessel. Seven, guiding divine revelations along the way. 
Not only are both tells of escape from human sacrifice prologues to these larger comparative narratives, but they also serve as a reference point in both. They hold the respective larger stories together by serving as the origin point of the divine promises that guide the subsequent narratives of journeying to a promised land. And that origin point is referenced by way of reminder throughout the subsequent narratives. The biblical narrative is about much more than the way the children of Abraham inherited the land of Canaan. And here is where Philip Wachebaum in his 2008 doctoral thesis, Argonauts of the Desert, Structural Analysis of the Hebrew Bible, draws attention to the extensive similarities between Plato's writings and the Bible's narratives. Both contain a general flood being the beginning of a new era in civilization, with a patriarchal age following, the rise of cities and kingship, and the development of laws, and a description of an ideal state. The laws in the Pentateuch are often remarkably alike the laws proposed by Plato. You've got laws that require a central religious authority. You have laws of a need of, for pure bloodlines, especially for priests. Laws that condemn homosexuality, witchcraft, magic. Laws of inheritance, boundary stones. Laws of allowing slaves to be taken from foreign peoples only. Laws against the need for a king. Laws governing involuntary homicide. Laws regarding rebellious children. Laws against usury, against taking too much fruit from one's fields. And quite a few more, and often found listed in the same order between the Greek and Hebrew texts. The ideal state, moreover, is divided into 12 lots of land given to 12 tribes. The king, it is warned, is subject to the vices of love, and this will lead to oppressive tyranny. One might think here of the sins of David and Solomon. Wagenbaum applies the structural analysis of myths as developed by Claude Levi Strauss to the Bible, and one can see his coverage is much more extensive than can be covered in a few blog posts. Here is where Godfrey is focusing only on structural place of the Phrixus Isaac sacrifices in their respective wider narratives. The Phrixus episode serves as an introduction to the adventures of Jason and the Argonauts. And this set of adventures functions as an explanation of the founding of the Greek colony of Cyrene in North Africa, Libya. The Argonaut Epic and the Bible Narrative Neil Godfrey earlier written a series of six posts on the resonances between the Argonautica as told by Apollonius of Rhodes. They are found by starting at the bottom of this Argonautica archive, but this post is addressing Wagenbaum's thesis. The full Argonaut Epic is found in Pindar's fourth Pythian ode. It had earlier been referenced in Homer's Odyssey, Book 12, 69 to 72, in Hesiod's Theogony, 990 to 1005, and in Herodotus, the foundation of Cyrene and the interrupted sacrifice of Phrixus. Euripides wrote two plays titled Phrixus, now lost to us. And of course, Apollonius of Rhodes wrote the epic poem in imitation of Homer, the Argonautica. The main sources for this epic relate it to the founding of Cyrene. Pindar's ode is even dedicated to the king of Cyrene. This compares with the early Bible narrative from Abraham to Moses, relating to the settling of Canaan. Jason, leader of the Argonauts, belonged to the same extended family as Phrixus, all being descended from Aeolus. Zeus was angry with the descendants of Aeolus over the attempted sacrifice of Phrixus by his father. And to appease his divine wrath, Jason embarked in the Argo with a band of followers, the Argonauts, to retrieve the golden fleece. This was the fleece of the ram that had saved Phrixus at the last moment from being sacrificed. Triton, son of the sea god Poseidon, appeared in human form and gave one of the Argonauts, Euphemus, a gift of a handful of Libyan soil. 
as a token of a promise that his descendants would return and colonize the land. Had Euphemus succeeded in keeping the soil to plant appropriately in his own home area, his descendants would have returned to colonize only four generations later. But since the soil was washed overboard and its particles landed on the island of Thera instead, 17 generations would have to pass and Cyrene would have to be colonized by the descendants of the Argonauts after first settling in Thera. This is the reverse of the order in which we read of the sacrifice and the promise in the biblical narrative. There Abraham is promised a land and afterward prepares to sacrifice Isaac. The Argonauts seek to appease Zeus's anger of the attempted sacrifice of Phrixus by retrieving the fleece of the ram that saved him, and the promise of the land of Cyrene for the descendants of the Argonauts is made afterwards. Generations later, after the descendants of the Argonauts had settled on Thera, a direct descendant of Euphemus was commanded through the Delphic Oracle to lead his people to settle and establish Cyrene in fulfillment of the promise made at the time of the Argonauts were retrieving the fleece of the ram that had saved Phrixus. This descendant was known as Batus, a name that means stutterer. He argued against the divine command on the ground that he was not a great warrior and that he had a speech impediment. But the Delphic Oracle refused to listen to reason and made him do as he was told anyway. This sounds like Moses. Herodotus tells us that Battus ruled Cyrene for the familiar 40 years. Hmm, that doesn't sound familiar. We are reminded of the promise to Abraham that his descendants would settle in Canaan after 400 years of slavery in Egypt. Egypt serves as a delaying detour on their way to their destiny, as Thera was in the Greek myth. God commands Moses to lead his people to Canaan by invoking his promise to give it to the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses at first refuses by pleading that he stutters. If Battus ruled the Argonauts for 40 years, Moses, also once called a king and known as a king in Philo, led his people for 40 years also. This narrative structure joining Abraham to Moses echoes with accuracy the promise made to Euphemus and its fulfillment by descendant Battus. Both Moses and Battus invoked their trouble speaking in order to avoid their divine mission and both ruled over their people during 40 years. Therefore, the similarities between the interrupted sacrifice of Isaac and that of Phrixus appear as part of a similar narrative structure. It seems as though Abraham plays two different characters from the Greek epic. King Athamas, who almost sacrificed his son Phrixus, an episode from the beginning of the epic, and the Argonaut Euphemus, who received the promise of land for his descendants, an episode from the ending of the epic. The order of the episodes has been reversed in the same way the detail of the ram hung on the tree after the sacrifice in the Greek version appears inverted to the account of the ram stuck in the bush before the sacrifice in Genesis. To repeat a few lines I quoted in my earlier post, this is Neil Godfrey speaking, but this time without the omissions. Parallelisms must not be analyzed in an isolated way, but one must try to find out the possible narrative structure that links the similarities together. In other words, the similarity between Phrixus and Isaac is not sufficient by itself to speculate about any possible borrowing, but when placed in the wider framework of the Epic of the Argonauts and the foundation of the colony of Cyrene, it allows us to question a likely influence of the Greek mythical tradition on the writings of the Old Testament. Philip Wagenbaum notes that his thesis supports the one advanced by Jan Wim Wesselius. In the origin of the history of Israel, Herodotus's histories as the blueprint for the first books of the Bible, that the narratives in Herodotus have influenced the biblical narrative. 
but there is one significant clue thus far missing. Wagenbaum's remarks. What might the founding of a colony in Cyrene and Herodotus have to do with the settlement and kingdom established in Canaan by Israel? Wagenbaum points to an answer. We must investigate the writings of another famous Greek writer to find the description of a state meant to be a colony, a state that would be divided into 12 tribes and ruled by perfect God-given laws, the ideal state imagined by Plato in his laws. How late was the Bible and who really wrote it? Neil Godfrey again comes through, as has Russell Gamirkin and several of the scholars we've brought up so far. But I'm impressed with what Neil puts here. Here's what he has to say. It has become a truism that the Bible, or let's be specific and acknowledge, we are discussing the Old Testament or Jewish Hebrew Bible, is a collection of various books composed by multiple authors over many years. All of these authors are said to have coincidentally testified to the one and only true God of the Jewish people. The mere fact that multiple authors spanning generations wrote complementary works all directed at the reality of this God working in human affairs is considered proof that we are dealing with a cultural and religious heritage, a common tradition belonging to a single people over time. A few scholars have challenged that thesis, and the most recently published of these is Philip Wagenbaum. He writes, to have a single writer for Genesis through Kings and possibly for other biblical books contradicts the idea of the transmission of the divine word and of a tradition proper to a people. The idea of a single author does not conflict with the understanding that the sources of the Bible were drawn from archives of Israelite and Judahite kings, as well as Mesopotamian and Canaanite and other sources. Wachenbaum claims that the traditional scholarly hypotheses of authorship and origins of the Bible are in fact secular rationalizations of cultural myths about the Bible. Let us imagine that Judea has now been conquered for a century and its sacerdotal class is now fully Hellenized. A man educated in the Greek fashion, perhaps in Alexandria, has grown up learning all the Greek classics, Homer, Hesiod, Herodotus, the great tragic playwrights, Plato, and that which he may have read in the Alexandrian canon established by Aristophanes of Byzantium and Aristarchus of Samothrace. He wants to create a literary work that can compete with those he has read, one that will give birth to his political and religious utopia, Israel. On the one hand, theories about the origins of the Bible tend to admit that the same writer wrote some books. On the other hand, several books and articles compare Greek myths with the Bible. It is the absence of a synthesis of all these data that is questioned here. Could it be the other way around? Philip Wagenbaum rejects the alternative suggestion that it may have been the Greeks who were influenced by the Bible or related stories from cultures neighboring the Jews. Essentially, the reasons for resisting this idea are, one, Greek authors were generally identifiable personally, and they quite openly referred to their predecessors and contemporaries whom they emulated and imitated. They had no need to copy the Bible and leave no evidence that they had any awareness of it. Two, the Greeks portrayed their myths through painting and sculpture. And here, there is no suggestion of borrowing from Jewish myths. The only contemporary images from Palestine are Canaanite relics. Three, Wagenbaum argues that almost every chapter of the Bible corresponds to a Greek myth whereas the opposite is not true. Four, 
Greek myths are linked together in a logical narrative progression from the birth of the gods themselves down to the Trojan War and the beginnings of the historical era. This rich and complex intertextuality has allowed the biblical writer to create an original epic on a fantastic level of sophistication. We will see how the Greek mythical genealogies have been dismantled and reconstructed through a specific filter. I hope that everybody watching this goes and subscribes to Neil Godfrey's blog. He is doing fantastic work mining scholars that are not well known, and we're highlighting them today. Please show him your appreciation. Show Russell Gamirkin much of his work was shown in this documentary, and I want more people to show support to the good scholars we bring forward here on Myth Vision. Today, we delve into the multifaceted character of Jacob, the biblical patriarch, who stands not only as a pivotal individual, but also symbolizes the entirety of the nation of Israel. His narratives intriguingly resonate with those of King David and even bear thematic parallels to Greek tales, a connection we shall elucidate in this video. The cultural milieu from which the biblical authors drew inspiration is deeply rooted in the Canaanite mythos, with discernible imprints from both Mesopotamian and Egyptian civilizations. As we navigate the book of Genesis, it becomes evident that we are not merely traversing historical accounts, but rather engaging with a rich tapestry of storytelling. Our previous documentary on Abraham highlighted the mythological undertones present not just in the initial chapters of Genesis 1 through 11, but throughout. The narratives of Abraham and Isaac, for instance, strikingly mirror the tales of Athamas and Phrixus, where divine interventions replace potential child sacrifices with rams. In our exploration of the tables of nations, as showcased in our documentary on Noah's curse, we discerned literary parallels between Noah and Lot. Both figures emerge from cataclysms, one aquatic and the other infernal. Their subsequent actions, influenced by wine, have profound implications for their descendants and the nations they represent. It's noteworthy that post-flood genealogies and Greek myths stand unique, diverging from Mesopotamian counterparts. Unlike the Bible, it does not get its stuff from the Mesopotamia pertaining to the genealogies. But the Greeks? There you have it. As we now turn our focus to Jacob, we find his narrative interwoven with elements reminiscent of Greek myths. Before we delve deeper, it's imperative to provide a succinct overview of Jacob's life. Join us on this enlightening journey. A Summary of Jacob's Life Jacob, Isaac's son and Abraham's grandson, was born alongside his twin Esau. Their sibling rivalry began in the womb and would shape Jacob's life. Jacob, a homebody, was his mother Rebekah's favorite. Unlike his outdoorsy brother, he was more strategic and cunning. He cleverly traded a mill for Esau's birthright and with Rebekah's guidance, deceived his nearly blind father to steal Esau's blessing. This deceit forced Jacob to flee to Padan Aram to escape Esau's wrath. En route to Haran, Jacob dreamt of a heavenly ladder and made a vow to God at Bethel. In Haran, he fell for his cousin Rachel and agreed to work seven years for her hand in marriage. However, his uncle Laban tricked him into marrying Rachel's elder sister, Leah. Jacob then worked another seven years to marry Rachel. Jacob's family grew rapidly, with his wives and their maids bearing him many children. However, tensions arose with Laban, leading Jacob to return to Palestine. On his journey, he wrestled with a mysterious man, or dare I say God, earning the name Israel. Back in Palestine, Jacob faced challenges from reconciling with Esau to dealing with the fallout of his daughter Dina's violation. Yet, he remained devout, building altars and seeking God's guidance. Tragedy struck when Rachel died giving birth to Benjamin. Later, Jacob's sons, envious of his favoritism toward Joseph, sold Joseph into slavery and deceived Jacob out of his fate. 
Years later, during a famine, Jacob's sons traveled to Egypt for grain, only to discover Joseph was a now powerful Egyptian ruler. At 130, Jacob relocated his family to Egypt's Goshen region. As death approached, Jacob ensured he'd be buried in Canaan and prophesied his son's futures. He passed away at 147 years of age, leaving a legacy that spanned generations. Jacob, Esau, and Echoes from Greek Mythology Philip Vajenbaum's Microscope I will be covering a series of examples from Dr. Philip Vajenbaum's book, Argonauts of the Desert. You should seriously look into this book as well. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. One shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. Lankius reigned over Argos after Danaeus and begat a son Abbas by Hypermenstra, and Abbas had two twin sons, Acrisius and Proteus by Aglaia daughter of Mantineus. These two quarreled with each other while they were still in the womb, and when they were grown up they waged war for the kingdom, and in the course of the war they were the first to invent shields, and Acrisius gained the mastery and drove Proteus from Argos, and Proteus went to Lycia to the court of Labatus, or as some say, Amphianix, and married his daughter, whom Homer calls Antia. The tragic poets call her Snetheboya. His father-in-law restored him to his own land with the army of Lycians who occupied Tyrans, which the Cyclopes had fortified for him. They divided the whole of the Argive territory between them and settled it. Acrisius reigned over Argos and Proteus over Tyrans. James George Fraser, in his work on Apollodorus's library, highlighted the striking similarities between these stories. Just as Acrisius and Proteus had their differences, biblical twins, Jacob and Esau, were adversaries. Yet destiny brought Jacob and Esau back together to divide their inherited land in Genesis 33. While Esau became the forefather of Edom, Jacob's lineage led to Israel in Genesis 36. The character of Proteus also finds mention in Homer's Iliad, Homer narrates an episode where Proteus, after initially welcoming the hero Bellerophon, deceitfully sends him to his father-in-law with a sealed letter, which secretly orders Bellerophon's execution. You'll remember this later. I want you to look at the comparisons between Proteus and Jacob, or Israel. Here are some parallels. Number one. In both cases, they're born twins and fought in the womb before they're born. Jacob and Israel, if you will, from the Bible with Esau, born as twins and fought with twin in the womb. Acrisius, which is the brother of Proteus, the twin brother, born as twins and fought with twin Proteus in the womb. Two, fought over territory with the twin both in the Jacob Esau and the Acrisius and Proteus. They both fought over territory. Three, settled different lands at peace with, with the twin. Both cases, you have the Edomites with e Esau and you have Israel with Jacob. And in the Acrisius and Proteus one, settled different lands and was at peace with Proteus, ruled over Argos while Proteus ruled Tyrenes. Number four had a daughter, Dina or Danae. Both sound very similar. Number five, daughter abused against their will. Once you get to number five, you kind of have to ask yourself, 
born as twins, fought in the womb, fought over territory, finally made peace, and both ruled different lands. They both have a daughter that sounds similar. Then you get to number five, and you find out that they both had daughters who were raped by people who claimed they loved her in both narratives. Huh. Kawinkadink? I think not. And you're going to see that as this entire video unravels more and more. Again, another parallel graph for you to look at. All of these are checked off. Now enters Heracles. Drawing parallels, Martin L. West observed similarities between the biblical story of Esau being deprived of his blessing and the Greek tale of the births of Heracles and Eurystheus. In the Bible, Genesis 27, an aging and visually impaired Isaac intends to bless his elder son Esau. He sends Esau hunting, promising a blessing upon his return. However, Rebecca, favoring Jacob, devises a plan. Given the stark difference in their physical appearance, Jacob's smooth skin versus Esau's hairiness, Rebecca uses goat hair to disguise Jacob. Fooled by this ruse, Isaac mistakenly blesses Jacob, foreseeing his dominance over his siblings. In Genesis 27-29, after Jacob received Isaac's blessings, Esau returned from his hunt. Upon realizing the deception, he was heartbroken and pleaded with Isaac for a blessing of his own. Isaac, bound by his words, gave Esau a lesser blessing, stating that he would serve his younger brother, Jacob. This scenario mirrors an earlier biblical account where Noah blesses his sons, Shem and Japheth, and declares Canaan will serve them. Isaac's words foreshadow the destinies of their descendants, the nations of Israel and Edom, which we further explore in the books of Samuel and Kings in Argonauts of the Desert by Philip Wagenbaum. Angry and feeling betrayed, Esau contemplates killing Jacob. To protect their favored son, Rebekah advises Jacob to flee to her brother Laban and consider marrying one of his daughters. Scholar M. L. West draws a parallel between the biblical narrative and a tale from the Iliad. In the Iliad, Zeus is deceived by Hera, leading to the birth of Heracles and Eurystheus. Zeus and fate, an Erinus that walks in the darkness struck me mad when we were assembled on the day that I took from Achilles the me that had been awarded to him. What could I do? All things are in the hand of heaven and folly eldest of Zeus's daughters, shuts men's eyes to their destruction. She walks delicately, not on solid earth, but hovers over the heads of men to make them stumble or to ensnare them. Time was when she fooled Zeus himself, who they say is the greatest whether of gods or men. For Hera, woman though she was, beguiled him on the day when Alcmena was to bring forth mighty Heracles in the fair city of Thebes. He told it among the gods, saying, Hear me, all gods and goddesses, that I may speak even as I am minded. This day shall Elithua, helper of women who are in labor, bring a man-child into the world who shall be lord over all that dwell about, him who are my, of my blood and lineage. Then said Hera, all crafty and full of guile, you will play false and will not hold to your word. Swear me, O Olympian, swear me, O great oath that he who shall this day fall between the feet of a woman shall be lord over all that dwell about him who are of your blood and lineage. Thus she spoke, and Zeus suspected her not, but swore the great oath to his much ruing thereafter. For Hera darted down from the high summit of Olympus, and went to haste to the Achaean Argos, where she knew that the noble wife Astellanus, son of Perseus, then was. She being with child, and in her seventh month, Hera brought the child to birth, though there was a month still wanting. But she stayed the offspring of Alcama and kept back to Elithuae. Then she went to tell Zeus, the son of Kronos, and said, Father Zeus, Lord of Lightning, I have a word for your ear. There is a fine child this day, Eresthius, son of Thelinus, the son of Perseus. He is of your lineage. 
it is well, therefore, that he should reign over the Argives on this day. On this, Zeus was stung to the very quick, and in his rage he caught Folly by the hair and swore a great oath that never should she again invade starry heaven and Olympus, for she was the bane of all. Then he whirled her around with the twist of his hands and flung her down from heaven, so that she fell on the fields of mortal men, and he was ever angry with her when he saw his son groaning under the cruel labors that Aristheus laid upon him. West points out a fascinating parallel. Just as a father is about to favor one son, a mother's intervention changes the course of events. This is evident in the story of Hera's jealousy in Greek mythology, which led to Heracles serving Eurystheus and undertaking the famous 12 labors. This mirrors Rebekah's scheme in the Bible, where Jacob deceives Isaac to receive Esau's blessing and have 12 tribes descend from him. West may have missed a connection, though. Both the tales of Acrisius and Proteus, and that of Heracles and Eurystheus, seem to be intertwined. Delving into Apollodorus's library, we find that Acrisius is the grandfather of the famed hero Perseus. Perseus, in turn, has descendants, including Heracles and Eurystheus. This shared lineage suggests that the biblical narrative of Jacob and Esau might have been influenced by these Greek myths. Interestingly, the stories of Jacob and David in the Bible seem to echo each other. Both faced deceit from a father-in-law, had wives who practiced idolatry, and dealt with family scandals involving their children. Look at this graph with me. You have parallels between Jacob and King David. One, the treacheries of a father-in-law. Jacob faced treachery from his father-in-law Laban, who tricked him over and over. King David faced treachery from his father-in-law Saul. Two, wives committing idolatry. Jacob's wife Rachel committing idol idolatry, worshiping the teraphim and took her father's idols, which he chased them out into the wilderness for. King David, David's wife Michael, committed idolatry, worshiping teraphim. Number three, daughters defiled and avenged. Jacob's daughter Dina was defiled and avenged by Simeon. David's daughter Thamar was defiled and avenged by Absalom. Number four, sons commit incest. Jacob's son Reuben committed incest. David's son Absalom committed incest. David will commit murder by sending Uriah the Hittite to Joab, bearing a sealed letter instructing Joab to have him killed on the battlefield. This theme is found as well in the story of Proteus, as we talked about above. This is one of the first pieces of evidence that both stories of Jacob and David being parallel were modeled after the same sources and written by the same single author. In a nutshell, this shows whoever the author is in Genesis knows the story of David and they're working off of the same narrative, probably because this is the same author according to Vajenbaum, but at the very least, they are looking at the other narrative to construct the other narrative. Vajabam thinks it's simple, Occam's razor, and this is the same author. But this also tells you something about the source from which the Bible author is getting their material. And that Proteus story where he sends Bellerophon, that where he sends him and he doesn't even know he's carrying the letter to his own self-destruction, is found in the Greek source. In the beginning of our discussion, we talked about how the order of stories from Greek sources was mixed up and changed by the author. But interestingly, in both the Greek stories and in Genesis 25 through 27 from the Bible, we see similar characters and events. Think of it like this. Jacob is like the character Eurystheus and Esau is like Heracles. It's interesting to note that Esau, who's a tough hunter, trades his special family rights just for a simple bowl of soup. Now, Pseudo Apollodorus didn't influence the Bible because it came much later, but many believe that the works of Homer, especially the Iliad, did. In fact, the Iliad seems to have inspired many stories about David in the book of Samuel, and the stories about Jacob 
seem to set the stage for those about David. When we don't have all the pieces of the puzzle from older sources, we use Apollodorus to help fill in the blanks. The stories about Heracles, for instance, are best understood through the writings by Apollodorus and Diodorus Siculus. It's essential to remember that amidst all these Greek tales, the Bible's main message is about the dangers of too much power, especially in kingship, and how it doesn't match the ideal vision of a perfect state. Jacob, as the father of the 12 tribes, is like the first version of Israel, and David is like a do-over or a second version. But David, with his misuse of power, ends up breaking this perfect vision. As we dive deeper into Jacob's stories, we will see even more similarities with the tales of Hercules. Jacob, Laban, Heracles, and Thespius. Simplified Comparison Jacob, seeking refuge from his brother's anger, journeyed to his uncle Laban's home. He desired to marry Rachel, Laban's younger daughter, and agreed to work for seven years as her bride price. Yet Laban deceived him. On their wedding night, Laban secretly sent Leah, his elder daughter, to Jacob. It was only the next morning that Jacob realized the switch. Laban justified his actions by explaining that it was customary for the elder daughter to marry first. He then offered Rachel's hand in marriage if Jacob agreed to work another seven years. This tale of deception mirrors another from Greek mythology. Now this Thespius was king of Thespiae, and Hercules went to him when he wished to catch the lion. The king entertained him for fifty days and each night as Hercules went forth to the hunt. Thespius bedded one of his daughters with him, fifty daughters having been born to him by Mega, Mede, daughter of Arnius for he was anxious that all of them should have children by Hercules. Thus Hercules, though he thought that his bedfellow was always the same, had intercourse with them all, and having vanquished the lion, he dressed himself in the skin and wore the scalp as a helmet. Thespius wanted grandchildren from the strong and famous Heracles because he didn't have any sons. So he tricked Heracles into spending the night with each of his 50 daughters, one at a time. The catch? Heracles thought he was with the same woman every time. This story is similar to when Jacob ended up with Leah, thinking she was Rachel. From these relationships, Jacob had 12 sons, and Heracles' family later became rulers in Sardinia. There's another story about Jacob being constantly tricked by Laban, never getting what he worked hard for. This story reminds us of Laomedon, an ancient king of Troy. Laomedon once cheated two gods, Apollo and Poseidon, after they helped him build Troy's walls. As punishment, the gods wanted his daughter, Hesione, to be offered to a sea monster. Laomedon promised Heracles some fine horses if he'd save Hesione. But after Heracles did the job, Laomedon went back on his word. Angry, Heracles attacked and destroyed Troy. This story was later retold by Laomedon's son, Depoilemos, during a big battle in Troy, just before he met his end. Far other was Heracles, my own brave and lion-hearted father, who came here for the horses of Laomedon, and though he had six ships only, and few men to follow him, sacked the city of Ilias, and made a wilderness of her highways. You are a coward, and your people are falling from you, for all your strength and all your coming from Lycia, you will be no help to the Trojans, but will pass the gates of Hades vanquished by my hand." This narrative underscores another instance where Heracles faced deceit and broken promises. Look at this graph on the parallels. Just a couple to point out between Jacob and Heracles. Number one, slept with the wrong woman. Jacob was tricked by Laban into sleeping with Leah. Heracles was tricked by Thespis into thinking he was sleeping with the same girl for 50 nights, but it was 50 different women. Number two, deceived and given broken promises. Jacob was deceived by Laban with broken promises. Heracles was promised horses by Laomedon, the first king of Troy, who didn't keep his promises. Mm -hmm. 
Then Jacob took fresh rods of poplar and almond and plain and peeled white streaks in them, exposing the white of the rods. He set the rods that he had peeled in front of the flocks, in the troughs, that is, the watering places, where the flocks came to drink. And since they bred when they came to drink, the flocks bred in front of the rods, and so the flocks produced young that were striped, speckled, and spotted. Jacob separated the lambs and set the faces of the flocks toward the striped and completely black animals in front in the flock of Laban, and he put his own droves apart and did not put them with Laban's flock. Whenever the stronger of the flock were breeding, Jacob laid in the rods in the troughs before the eyes of the flock that they might breed among the rods, but for the feebler of the flock, he did not lay them there. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. Thus, the man grew exceedingly rich and had large flocks and male and female slaves and camels and donkeys. Mercury gave to Autolycus, who he begat by Keon, the gift of being such a skillful thief that he could not be caught, making him able to change whatever he stole into some other form, from white to black, or from black to white, from a hornless animal to a horned one, from a horned one to a hornless, when he kept continually stealing from the herds of Sisyphus and couldn't be caught, Sisyphus was convinced he was stealing because Autolycus' number was increasing while his growing smaller. In order to catch him, he put a mark on the hooves of his cattle. When Autolycus had stolen in his usual way, Sisyphus came to him and identified the cattle he had stolen by their hooves and took them away. While he was delaying there, he seduced Anticla, the daughter of Autolycus, she was later given in marriage to Laertes and bore Ulysses. Some writers accordingly called him Sisyphean because of his parentage, he was shrewd. Both Apollodorus' library and Aegynos' fables served as essential guides for young Romans, offering them a foundational understanding of Greek mythology. These texts preserved the essence of various myths and tragedies, including tales like Euripides' Phrixos, Jacob's method of increasing his livestock, which involved a seemingly magical process, mirrors the story of Autolycus and Sisyphus's cattle. This Greek tale was influenced by the Homeric hymn to Hermes, where the young god Hermes is depicted stealing Apollo's cattle. Hermes, interestingly, is Autolycus's father. The biblical writer used several Greek sources that involved a treacherous father-in-law, such as Thespios, who made Heracles sleep with 50 different sisters, Laomedon, who refused to pay horses to Heracles for his work, and Autolycus, who stole the cattle of Sisyphus. Though Laban is a deceiver, Jacob will retaliate and prove that he is an even greater trickster than his father-in-law. Let's look at this graph of parallels between Jacob and Autolycus. One, used magic with animals. Jacob used a magical practice to change the animals' colors and stripes, growing more livestock than Laban. Autolycus magically changed the animals stealing from the herds of Sisyphus. And you know, his dad was Hermes, so he's the greatest trickster of all. And of course, two is that they're both tricksters. Jacob is known for his cunning and trickery in various stories as he tricked, you know, his father and Esau is over and over being a trickster, similar to how Her Hermes was. And then Autolycus is renowned as a master thief and trickster as well. I do want to highlight just to make a point about this that is absolutely necessary. And if you look carefully at both of those stories that we told you from Hyginus fable and the Genesis account. Jacob is talking about striped, speckled animals. These are animals of black and white, different types of colors that they're trying to show that he's increasing his fold while Laban's is decreasing. It's so similar to what we're seeing here with Autolycus and how he is taking Sisyphus's uh, animals. Literally, both are so close, it's hard to think that this is really a coincidence. More likely that the biblical author is using the Greek tale to kind of craft their narrative as these other scholars like Russell Gamirkin and others have been pointing out. This story was probably written or crafted later using ancient sources, but 
the idea of the narrative structure is got to be after Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey. After enduring two decades under Laban's manipulative tactics, Jacob decides to depart with his family and possessions. In a twist, Rachel discreetly takes Laban's teraphim, which are likely small household idols. When Laban pursues them, demanding his idols back, Jacob, unaware of Rachel's actions, challenges Laban to find them. Rachel clearly conceals the idols, ensuring their escape. This narrative finds a parallel in the story of David and Michael where Michael uses similar tactics to deceive her father, Saul, and protect David. Such interconnected tales in the Bible highlight the importance of a reader's patience and memory to fully grasp the intricate web of stories. Jacob's subsequent encounter with Esau after a long separation of 20 years is filled with tension. One night, Jacob wrestles with an angel, managing to overcome the celestial being, but sustaining a permanent limp in the process. When he finally meets Esau, they reconcile and divide their inheritance. Notably, Jacob's limp and Esau's red hair are motifs that will be echoed in the narrative of David. Again, Vajenbaum's point. Your memory, if it serves you well and you can see the literary connectiveness of these stories, likely highlights a single mind. They crafted compiling and connecting these narratives. Unless one wants to posit in some way, a later author looks back or is looking forward when they compile this literature to connecting these stories. They're crafting narratives. I can understand why he thinks single author. Violated Dina and Helen. In Genesis 34, we encounter a troubling episode where Dina, Jacob's daughter, is violated by Prince Shechem of the city bearing his name. In a bid for reconciliation, Jacob agrees to marry Dina to Shechem and form an alliance with the Shechemites, but only if they undergo circumcision. However, in a twist of events, Dina's brothers, Simeon and Levi, seeking vengeance for their sister, exploit the vulnerability of the Shechemites post-circumcision and execute a massacre. This biblical narrative finds a parallel in Greek mythology, particularly in the story of Helen's abduction. And when Helen grew into a lovely woman, Theseus carried her off and brought her to Athene. But when Theseus was in Hades, Pollux and Castor, marched against Aphidne, took the city, got possession of Helen, and led Aethra, the mother of Theseus, away captive. Further elaborating on this tale, Theseus, in collaboration with Pyrithous, had previously made a pact to wed daughters of Zeus. In line with this agreement, Theseus abducts a young Helen for himself. His ambitions don't stop there. He later descends into Hades, attempting to win Persephone for Pyrithous. In his absence, the Dioscori, with the aid of the Lacedaemonians and Arcadians, seize Athens. They not only rescue Helen, but also take Ethra as a captive. Meanwhile, Menestheus is reinstated as the ruler of Athens by the Dioscori. I want you to check out this graph again, another comparative graph paralleling Dina, daughter of Jacob, and Helen of Sparta. Number one, both were defiled by a prince, specifically a prince. Two, both were taken back by brothers, and specifically two brothers in both accounts. Three, Israel versus the Canaanites or the Shechemites, Sparta versus Athens. So you have Israel versus the Canaanites at Shechem, which are like the pre-Canaanites, and Sparta versus Athens. Number four, Jacob and Ulysses' re reluctance. You have Jacob did not want his sons to attack the Shechemites. Ulysses did not want his men to attack either. And in both cases, they did against their parent, their leader, telling them what to do. They did the opposite. Number five, attack and capture. 
Jacob's sons attacked, killing men and taking women and children captive. In the story, it specifically says they took men and women captive and attacked. Ulysses' men attacked, killing men and taking women and children captive. Cupid's noticed that Jacob bought a piece of land in Shechem for a hundred casita. He links this word with the Lydian currency Sistaphorus, in short, kist. That would have given the Hebrew word casita. This would be an obvious anachronism since that currency did not appear before the late 3rd century BCE. Cupid's also notices how Simon and Levi used a weapon in Hebrew called makera. That sounds exactly like the Homeric Greek machera, both meaning a sword, and so did the Rabbi Rashi notice this similarity. In Vashenbaum's analysis, a textual parallel appears with Homer's Odyssey. And the other sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered city because their sister had been defiled. They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys, and whatever was in the city and in the field, all their wealth, all their little ones, and their wives that was in the houses. They captured and made their prey. There I stationed my ships in the river, bidding by men stay by them and keep guard over them, while I sent out scouts to reconnoiter from every point of the vantage. But the men disobeyed my orders, took their own devices, and ravaged the land of the Egyptians, killing the men and taking their wives and children captive. Reuben, Hippolytus, and Absalom, a comparative analysis. In the biblical narrative, while living in the land of Israel, Reuben had an affair with Bilhah, his father's concubine. This act was not hidden. Israel became aware of it. However, it was only at the end of his life that Jacob addressed this transgression, reprimanding Reuben and stripping him of his birthright. Jacob's words to Reuben were both a recognition of his status and a rebuke for his actions. Reuben, as my eldest son, you were the symbol of my strength and the first sign of my vitality. You had the highest status and the most power, but you acted impulsively. And because you violated my bed, you've lost your prominence. Drawing a parallel from Greek mythology, in Euripides' Hippolytus, Phaedra wrongfully accuses Hippolytus, Theasis' son, of violating her. This accusation is believed by Theasis, especially after Phaedra's suicide and the note she left behind. The tragic twist is that Phaedra was actually in love with Hippolytus, and her despair over her unrequited feelings led to her drastic actions. In his anguish and anger, Desus calls upon his father, the god Poseidon, to take revenge on Hippolytus. He says, I can't stay silent about this heinous act, even though it shames me to speak of it. Hippolytus has disrespected the sanctity of my bed and even the watchful eyes of the gods. Poseidon, you once promised to grant me three wishes. I invoke one now, and my son's life. While Hippolytus is portrayed as innocent in Euripides' narrative, Reuben's guilt is clear in the biblical account. Both stories sharing a striking similarity. A son is accused of violating his father's marital bed. In Hippolytus' case, he faces a tragic end in a chariot accident, reminiscent of Absalom's fate in the Bible. Absalom, after violating his father David's concubines, meets his end when his hair gets entangled in a tree branch during a chariot ride, leading to his death at the hands of Joab. This incident comes after Absalom avenges his sister Tamar, who was violated by their half-brother Abnon. You can see how Jacob's story and David are connected. Well, this Greek mythology plays the underlying influence to these biblical ones. Both the Jacob and David narratives in the Bible contain reoccurring themes, a daughter's violation, her subsequent avengement by her brothers, and a son's incestual relationship with his father's concubines. In Jacob's final blessings in Genesis, Reuben, the eldest son, is stripped of his birthright due to his transgression. Similarly, Simeon and Levi, Jacob's next sons, face disqualification for their violent retaliation against the men of Shechem. 
Ultimately, it's Judah who is prophesied by Jacob to inherit the leadership mantle of Israel. David, a direct fulfillment of this prophecy, ironically experiences events mirroring those of his forefather, Jacob. This cyclical narrative pattern suggests a single authorial vision behind these biblical tales. They can be interpreted as theorized by Levi Strauss in both a linear, diachronic, and a layered, synchronic manner. Genesis, in its essence, seems to be forward-looking, anticipating the future monarchy of Israel. This forward-looking perspective is further emphasized when Genesis lists the lineage of Edom's descendants and its kings, noting that these kings ruled before any king reigned over the Israelites. I hope you enjoyed the comparisons of Vajambaum's parallels in the Greek stories. Now we'll move to Bruce Loudon. Homer, Argonauts, and the Old Testament. Bruce Loudon. Dr. Bruce Loudon wrote a great book called Homer's Odyssey in the Near East, which echoes much of what Dr. Philip Vajenbaum says about Greek connections to the Bible. He highlights the significance of the three occurrences of women at the well being betrothed and how this has parallel significance to Homer's Odyssey, but how there is a clear influence of the Argonautic myth on Homer as well. This will bring Jason and Medea into the picture. Odysseus's interactions with Nasikia, the Phaeacian athletes, and her father Alkinos, intriguingly mirrors what Alter describes as the betrothal type scene from the Old Testament. Let's first unpack three prominent Old Testament examples of this narrative pattern, and then delve into its parallels with Odysseus and the Nasikia story. In the Old Testament, Abraham sends a loyal servant on a mission to find a wife for his son Isaac. The servant stops at a well in Nahor, a common gathering spot for women. He prays to Yahweh for guidance, asking for a sign. The woman who offers him water and also waters his camels would be the chosen one. Enter Rebecca, who fits this description perfectly. After a series of exchanges, it's revealed that Rebecca is related to Abraham, and she eventually agrees to marry Isaac. Fast forward and we find Jacob escaping his brother Esau's anger. On a similar quest in Nahor, at a well he meets Rachel, and after a series of events, their relationship blossoms. Another parallel is seen in Moses' story. Fleeing Egypt, Moses stops by a well in Midian, he helps the seven daughters of the priest Ruel, leading to his eventual marriage of one of them, Zipporah. Now let's look at Odysseus. His meeting with Nasikia by the river echoes these Old Testament well encounters. Athena, in a dream, nudges Nasikia to the river, where she's bound to meet Odysseus. While the Old Testament stories often center on the male perspective, the Odyssey offers a refreshing change by focusing on Nasikia's viewpoint, the divine intervention, the emphasis on marriage, and the portrayal of Nasikia's beauty are reminiscent of the Old Testament tales. In the Odyssey, water locations, be it rivers or wells, serve as meeting points. While Alter suggests wells might symbolize femininity, both the Odyssey and Old Testament use these water sources as places where foreign men meet local women. The tasks these women perform, like fetching water or washing, highlight their domestic virtues. Nasikia's actions the next day, asking her father for a wagon to wash clothes, hint at her marriage preparations. This mirrors Rebecca's story where her father allows her to decide her departure. As Nasikia heads to the river, it's reminiscent of Rachel and Zipporah's tales where they tend to their father's animals by the water. The narrative then shifts to Odysseus, who wakes up startled and naked by the river. As he approaches Nasikia, he is in a vulnerable state, unlike the men in the Old Testament stories. His eloquent plea to Nasikia 
praising her beauty and hinting at her future marriage is unique to the Odyssey, but touches on themes present in the Old Testament. Odysseus's interactions with Nasikia and her people echo a reoccurring pattern, a narrative pattern seen in the Old Testament. Often termed the quote unquote betrothal type scene, end quote. Let's break down these parallels for clarity. In the Old Testament, when Abraham's servants seek a wife for Isaac, he stops at a well in Nahor. There, Rebekah offers him water, a gesture of hospitality and kindness. Similarly, Nasikia offers Odysseus a bath, a subset of chores women typically perform by the water. This act of kindness is mirrored in the Old Testament stories, like when Moses helps Zipporah and her sisters at the well in Midian. Nausicaa's perception of Odysseus evolves after he bathed and dressed. She begins to see him as a potential husband, expressing a wish that he might stay and become her spouse. This sentiment of attraction or connection at first meeting is a hallmark of the betrothal type scene. As the story progresses, Nausicaa guides Odysseus towards the city. Along the way, he prays to Athena, much like Abraham's servant prayed to Yahweh in his quest. Athena then appears as a young girl with a water pitcher, reminiscent of the Old Testament scenes where young women are encountered at wells. Odysseus' interactions with the Phaeacians, especially the sudden marriage proposal from Alkinos, mirrors Jacob's experiences with Laban in the Old Testament. Just as Alkinos quickly proposes a union between Odysseus and Nausicaa, similar swift proposals are seen in the Old Testament. Interestingly, while Alkinos' hasty offer draws criticism, Old Testament characters making similar offers are not judged as harshly. In essence, Odysseus' journey and encounters with Nausicaa and her people are steeped in narrative patterns reminiscent of the Old Testament's betrothal-type scenes. Jacob and Jason's narratives are enriched by the presence of influential female mentors. For Jacob, this guiding figure is his mother, Rebecca. She played a pivotal role in shaping his destiny, especially in counteracting Isaac's preference for Esau. Rebecca masterminds Jacob's deception of Isaac and Esau and orchestrates his escape from Esau's wrath. Her reassuring words only obey my voice echo the protective interventions of Hera for Jason. Just as Hera aids Jason, often in disguise, Rebecca's actions for Jacob are sometimes attributed to divine intervention, as when Jacob credits Yahweh for the quick procurement for venison. Rebecca's role has striking parallels with Hera, especially when considering another mythological narrative, that of Heracles in the Iliad Book 19. In this tale, Zeus intends to bestow blessings upon his favored son, Heracles. However, Hera cunningly diverts these blessings to her preferred choice, Eurystheus. The parallels between the two stories are evident. Both fathers, Isaac and Zeus, inadvertently misdirect their blessings due to the machinations of their wives, Rebekah and Hera. The intended recipients, Esau and Heracles, share several characteristics. Both are portrayed as heroic figures, hunters, and are notably her suit. Esau's description in particularly aligns with the characteristics often associated with Heracles. Despite their prowess and their father's favor, both end up subservient to the chosen ones of their mothers or stepmothers. My personal note is I think maybe both of these narratives were influenced by the earlier Gilgamesh hero, but that's a side note. Laban and Aetes are both tricky dads in old stories. They make the main characters Jacob and Jason jump through hoops before they can marry their daughters. Here's the scoop. Rebecca, Jacob's mom, wanted him to stay with Laban, her brother, for just a short while. 
But between trying to avoid his angry brother, Esau, and wanting to marry Laban's daughter, Rachel, Jacob ends up staying much longer. Why? Because Laban keeps changing the rules. First, he makes Jacob work for seven years to marry Rachel. But after these years, Laban tricks Jacob and gives him his older daughter, Leah, instead. This sneaky move is a bit like what Laomedon, a king from another story, did when he didn't pay two gods after they did a job for him. Aetes, from the Jason story, is also a tricky dad. He sets terms for Jason, but then doesn't stick to them. When Jason first meets Aetes, he talks about another sneaky guy, Peleus. Jason basically went from dealing with one difficult person, Peleus, to another, Aetes. Both Jacob and Jason had problems at home and then faced more problems with the fathers of the women they wanted to marry. To sum it up, both these dads, Laban and Aetes, remind us of a description of Peleus from an old poem. They're both pretty sly and challenging. For I give over to you the sheep, the tawny herds of cattle, and all the fields which you stole from my parents and administered to fatten your wealth. I do not mind if these overly enrich your house. Kind of summarizing a lot of chapter six from Dr. Bruce Loudon's work. Number one, Laban and Aetes. Laban and Aetes are portrayed as devious fathers of the protagonists' love interest. Their characters are characterized by deceit and manipulation. Laban's pursuit of Jacob is aggressive and threatening. His sons who accompany him express a hostile attitude towards Jacob. This mirrors Absurto's pursuit on behalf of Aetes in the Argonautica. Absurto, Aetes' son, is depicted as holding the reins of Helios' chariot, emphasizing his ability to pursue. He leads a group of Colchians to chase after Jason, who has taken Aetes' fleece. Similarly, Laban pursues Jacob, who has taken his household gods. Laban's treatment of Jacob is reminiscent of Aetes' behavior towards Jason. Both protagonists face challenges imposed by these father figures. For instance, Jacob has to work for several years due to Laban's cunning, just as Jason has to undertake labors specified by Aetes. 2. Absurto and Laban's Pursuit Absurto, representing Aetes, pursues the protagonist as they flee with valuable items. His ability to chase is hinted at in scenes where he controls Helios' chariot. Laban, on the other hand, overtakes Jacob in a landlocked parallel. This pursuit is intensified by the aggressive stance of Laban's sons. Absurto, leading a group of Colchians, outmaneuvers Jason, trapping him where the river Easter separates around a group of islands. In a similar vein, Laban overtakes Jacob, camping opposite him in Gilead. The chapter also touches upon the aggressive nature of Rachel, who steals Laban's household gods. This act is paralleled with Medea's role in the Argonautica, where she plays a significant part in the theft of the Golden Fleece. Three. Jason's confrontation with Esau. Jason's confrontation in the Argonautica are paralleled with Jacob's anticipated violent encounter with his brother Esau. However, while Jason faces multiple confrontations, Jacob's narrative culminates in reconciliation. Number four, Medea's magic and Rachel's desire for offspring. Medea's use of Prometheon or Prometheus drug is a significant aspect of the Argonautica. The plant's root, which resembles, quote, newly cut flesh, end quote, plays a pivotal role in the narrative. In the Old Testament, Rachel's desire for offspring from Jacob mirrors Medea's magical endeavors, though the methods differ. But she said to her, wasn't it enough that you took away my husband? Will you take my son's mandrakes too? Very well, Rachel said. He can sleep with you tonight and return for your son's mandrakes. Though Rachel is not a witch, as is Medea, magic is present, even prominent in her myth. Unable to bear children, when she learns that Leah's first son, Reuben, has found some mandrakes, Rachel asks if she may use them, presumably as an aphrodisiac. In Apollonius's account, 
a love charm in the form of Eros's agency, is the central means of assuring Medea will unite with Jason. In Jacob's myth, Rachel, already married to Jacob, seizes upon a similar agent to obtain offspring from him. Apollonius's key depiction of Medea's magic describes her use of the Promethean drug. Ah, the tale of Joseph from the good book. It's the creme de la creme of biblical narratives for me. While tales of King David, Elijah, Elisha, and others have their charm, there's something about the dreamer, Joseph, that resonates. Perhaps it's personal. After all, I bear Joseph as one of my middle names. Or perhaps it's the sheer emotional depth of his story that tugs at one's heartstrings. Now, any scholar worth their salt knows that the Genesis account tips its hat to ancient Near Eastern myths, drawing threads from Egyptian, Ugaritic, Akkadian, Mesopotamian, and Canaanite Phoenician lore. That's old news in academia. But here's where it gets spicy. The idea that Genesis might have been sipping from the same cultural cocktail as Homer's Odyssey and Iliad or that it was influenced by Greek myths alongside these ancient Near Eastern tales? Well, that's a harder sell in scholarly circles. Enters Bruce Loudon and his intriguing tome, Homer's Odyssey and the Near East. Inspired by his insights, I aim to shed light on his perspective regarding the Joseph narrative. And to just set the record straight, based on feedback from my previous videos. I'm not suggesting that the authors of Genesis were simply cribbing notes from the Greeks. Quite the opposite. Loudon posits that the Greeks were taking cues from the Near East long before the ink dried on Genesis. Quite the plot twist, isn't it? As Loudon expresses it, quote, My study demonstrates that the genres of myth that comprise the Odyssey are also extant in Near Eastern cultures, often in Gilgamesh, but most frequently in Old Testament myth. Why do commentators usually omit consideration of the substantial parallels between Homeric and Old Testament myth? Modern audiences may even, without realizing it, project their beliefs onto how to read the ancient texts, given the long dominance of Christianity and Judaism in the West. A majority of modern Western audiences whether consciously or unconsciously, may, on the basis of their faith, regard biblical and Homeric narratives as opposites, seeing the former as, quote, true or real, but the latter as false, unreal, or fiction. Intentionally or unintentionally, faith has erected a wall between the study of the two narrative traditions I ask readers, therefore, to consider the parallels I adduce and the arguments proposed concerning them as objectively as possible. And in case you're curious what is meant by myth, Loudon continues, I define myth as a sacred tradition narrative that depicts the interrelations of mortals and gods, is especially concerned with defining what is moral or ethical behavior for a given culture and passes on key information about that culture's traditions and institutions. My definition should be thought of as applying best to ancient Near Eastern texts, including Gilgamesh, the Enuma Elish, and other Mesopotamian narratives, the Ugaritic Kurta, and the Akkat, the Bible, especially the Old Testament, European epics, including the Odyssey, Iliad, Argonautica, and Aeneid, Hesiod, Greek tragedy, the Mahabharata, and the Ramayana, and some later epics such as Beowulf and Paradise Lost. As Loudon expresses in the opening of his book, the Odyssey's larger plot 
is composed of a number of distinct genres of myth, all of which are extant in various Near Eastern cultures, Mesopotamian, West Semitic, Egyptian. Unexpectedly, the Near Eastern culture with which the Odyssey has the most parallels is the Old Testament. Consideration of how much of the Odyssey focuses on non-heroic episodes, host receiving guest, a king disguised as a beggar, recognition scenes between long separated family members, reaffirms the Odyssey's parallels with the Bible. In particular, his book argues that the Odyssey is in a dialogic relationship with Genesis, which features the same three types of myth that comprise the majority of the Odyssey, Deoxony, Romance, Joseph in Egypt, and Argonautic myth, Jacob winning Rachel from Laban. The Odyssey also offers intriguing parallels to the book of Jonah, and Odysseus's treatment by the suitors offers close parallels to the gospel's depiction of Christ in Jerusalem. Let's now take a brief look at the life of Joseph. The life of Joseph in Genesis. Joseph, one of the 12 sons of Jacob, also known as Israel, is a central figure in the latter part of the book of Genesis. Born to Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel, Joseph was deeply loved by his father, which stirred jealousy among his brothers. This favoritism was further exacerbated when Jacob gifted Joseph a multicolored coat, a symbol of distinction. As a young man, Joseph had two significant dreams that predicted his future rise to power. In these dreams, his brother's sheaves of wheat bowed to his sheaf, and the sun, moon, and eleven stars bowed to him. These visions suggested that his family would one day bow to him, further fueling his brother's resentment. Seizing an opportunity, his brothers plotted against him, initially planning to kill him. However, they eventually decided to sell him into Egyptian slavery and deceive their father by dipping Joseph's coat in goat's blood, leading Jacob to believe that a wild animal had killed his beloved son. In Egypt, Joseph faced both prosperity and adversity. He was initially sold to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, and quickly rose to a position of trust due to his integrity and God-given ability to interpret dreams. However, after rejecting the advances of Potiphar's wife and being falsely accused of impropriety, Joseph was imprisoned. While incarcerated, Joseph accurately interpreted the dreams of two fellow prisoners, which eventually led to his introduction to Pharaoh. When Pharaoh experienced troubling dreams, Joseph was summoned. He interpreted them as seven years of abundance, followed by seven years of famine, and advised Pharaoh to store grain during the prosperous years. Impressed, Pharaoh elevated Joseph to the position of vizier, second only to himself in the Egyptian hierarchy. The predicted famine affected not only Egypt, but also Canaan, where Joseph's family resided. His brothers traveled to Egypt in search of food, unknowingly encountering Joseph. After a series of tests and trials, Joseph revealed his identity to his brothers. The family was reunited, and Jacob, along with his entire household, settled in Egypt's Goshen region. The story of Joseph concludes with his death in Egypt, but not before he made the Israelites promise to carry his bones back to Canaan. When they eventually left Egypt, Joseph's narrative is a tale of betrayal and redemption, showcasing God's providence and the idea that what humans intend for evil, God can use for good. Joseph Romance Myth The epic poem, The Odyssey, by Homer, and the biblical story of Joseph share a common narrative structure known as romance. In both tales, the protagonist embarks on a journey physically and emotionally that eventually leads them back home. This narrative arc, in the Odyssey, the overarching theme is Odysseus's return from Troy, which serves as a framework for various subgenres of myths, including theoxony and romance. Theoxony deals with the divine hospitality and is concluded when Odysseus defeats the suitors. Romance, on the other hand, is a narrative that focuses on a virtuous protagonist who, due to some mistake or circumstance, is separated from his family and ends up in a foreign, often magical land. The gods assist in reuniting him with his family 
and his return is often seen as a triumph over death. This structure of romance is not unique to the Odyssey. It also finds resonance in the biblical story of Joseph, who is separated from his family and ends up in Egypt. Like Odysseus, Joseph is a virtuous man favored by a higher power, God in this case, and his eventual return to his family is miraculous and laden with emotional recognition scenes. Both narratives also share an idealistic, almost unrealistic, moral structure. Characters are either good or evil, and the virtuous are rewarded while the immoral are punished. This moral dichotomy is not just a feature of ancient myths, but can be seen in modern storytelling as well, such as in the classical film, It's a Wonderful Life. Romance narratives and myths share a common theme, the miraculous return. This theme is evident in stories of heroes like Heracles and Theseus, who come back from the land of the dead. The idea of returning from apparent death is a foundational aspect of myths. Defining romance in the Odyssey. In the context of the Odyssey, romance can be described as a story where the main character is morally upright and favored by the gods. Due to a mistake, the protagonist is separated from their family or an extended period, often trapped in a foreign magical land. This separation often draws parallels with being in the underworld. With the god's assistance, the protagonist reunites with their family, who believe them to be dead. The protagonist return, laden with treasures, symbolizes triumph over death. The climax often involves a touching reunion with a loved one. The narrative world rewards the good and punishes the wicked per divine will. The story depicts a full circle ending in a reunion that signifies healing and restoration for the protagonist. The global influence of romance in ancient narratives from Greece to Egypt. Greek literature is often considered the richest source of romantic narratives with the Odyssey being one of the earliest examples. However, the concept of romance is not confined to Greek culture alone. Ancient Indian literature, for example, features the classical Sanskrit drama Shakuntala, which even includes a Greek character suggesting cultural ties between the two civilizations. The term Yavani in Shakuntala is akin to the Old Testament's term for Greeks, Yavan. Both terms trace back to Ion or Ionic. Romance as a narrative structure has remained remarkably consistent over time, appearing in works from Euripides to Shakespeare. This consistency allows us to draw parallels between different cultures and time periods, helping us understand how the same motifs are employed in various narratives, including the Odyssey and the biblical story of Joseph. The Egyptian Connection the Near East, particularly the narratives from this region, offers a rich backdrop for understanding romance. One of the most parallel stories to the Odyssey from this region is the tale of Joseph from Genesis. But before diving into the similarities, it's worth noting the thematic links both Greek and Israelite romances share with Egypt. Egypt is not only the central setting for Joseph's story, but also features prominently in the Odyssey, especially in Menelaus' adventures. Later Greek romances like Euripides' Helen and Heliodorus, an Ethiopian story, further strengthen this connection with Egypt. Romance often thrives on exotic settings, and Egypt has historically been that default backdrop. However, the relationship between romance and Egypt might be more profound. Some ancient Egyptian tales predating the Joseph narrative hint that romance elements might have Egyptian roots. The Tale of Senuhe This story revolves around Senuhe, a royal attendant who, fearing political unrest, flees Egypt for Byblos eventually settling among the Hyksos in Asia. Over time, he rises to prominence, even defeating a renowned warrior. However, after a generation away from home, nostalgia grips him. 
He wishes to return to Egypt, and with the Pharaoh's blessing, does so, leaving his family behind in Asia. This tale introduces motifs familiar in romance, a prolonged absence, prosperity after hardship, and an emotional homecoming. Yet it misses out on some classic romance elements, like the emotional family reunion. The shipwrecked sailor in this narrative, a court attendant, recounts his past adventures to uplift his disheartened superior. He speaks of a voyage where a sudden storm wrecks his ship, sparing only him. He finds himself on a paradisiacal island, abundant with food as if magically cultivated. The island he discovers is governed by prophetic serpent. The serpent assures him of a four-month stay on the island and advises him not to fret. Quote, If you are brave and control your heart, you shall embrace your children. You shall kiss your wife. You shall see your home. It is better than everything else. The shipwrecked sailor lines 133 to 35 in quote the shipwrecked sailor and the odyssey in the tale of the shipwrecked sailor the protagonist promises to honor the serpent god with sacrifices upon his return home specifically by offering oxen however the wise serpent dismisses the need for such gestures as foretold by the serpent after four months a ship arrives to take the sailor back to his homeland. Gratefully, before his departure, the serpent bestows upon him a wealth of treasures. While the narrative style and main characters of the shipwrecked sailor differ from the Homeric epics, there are undeniable similarities with the Odyssey, especially in the realm of romance. The story's central theme of shipwreck and survival mirrors Odysseus's own trials in the Odyssey particularly in the episodes where he is the lone survivor among his crew. Both tales depict the protagonist finding refuge on idyllic islands overseen by powerful deities. The serpent god in the shipwrecked sailor is kind and generous, drawing parallels with Calypso from the Odyssey. Moreover, the prophetic role of the serpent mirrors that of Tiresias in the Odyssey. Given the concise nature of the shipwrecked sailor, it's intriguing to see one character embody roles that in the Odyssey are distributed among multiple characters. One of the most striking parallels between the shipwrecked sailor and the Odyssey lies in the prophetic words of the serpent god. These prophecies encapsulate the essence of romance, the journey home and the reunion with loved ones. The serpent's emphasis on self-control encapsulates in the phrase if you control your heart, you shall see your home, resonates deeply with a core theme of the Odyssey. This sentiment mirrors Tiresias' prophecy to Odysseus, where the seer emphasizes importance of restraint, especially during the episode on Thrinakia. Here, Odysseus must resist the temptation to consume Helios's sacred cattle. Tiresias' prophecy not only speaks of Odysseus' challenges, but also of his eventual return, flourishing life, and peaceful death in an old age. Similarly, the serpent god's prophecy concludes with a promise of a reunion with the family and a prosperous life, ending with a line, you will embrace your children, you will flourish at home, you will be buried. The protagonist's return in the shipwrecked sailor, laden with treasures gifted by the serpent god, draws parallels with the Phaeacians in the Odyssey, who also aid Odysseus' return journey, bestowing him with gifts. Additionally, the role of the attendant in the shipwrecked sailor is reminiscent of Eumaeus in the Odyssey. Both characters share personal tales within the larger narrative, providing a deeper context and connection to the main story. Egyptian narratives and their links to the Odyssey. Another interesting Egyptian tale is the tale of the two brothers. This story predates and shares motifs with the biblical account of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. In this narrative, an older brother's wife makes advances toward the younger brother. When he rebuffs her, she falsely accuses him of assault. While the story diverges into different themes and might not fit the traditional mold of romance like the tale of Sinuhi and the shipwrecked sailor, 
it does resonate with the Joseph narrative, especially in the theme of brotherly conflict and separation. Both the tale of Sinuhi and the Joseph story delve into the blending of Egyptian and West Semitic cultures. In the tale of Sinuhi, the protagonist initially perceives a clear distinction between himself and the Asiatics he encounters. This term, Asiatics, likely refers to the West Semitic cultures, which would later encompass the Israelites and what the Greeks termed as Phoenicians. The story even mentions fortifications meant to protect Egypt from these Asiatics. However, as the narrative unfolds, Sinuhi integrates into their culture, and upon his return to Egypt, he's even labeled as an Asiatic. This theme of cultural distinction an eventual assimilation is mirrored in the Odyssey. The epic frequently references the Phoenicians or Sidonians, indicating the Greeks' sense of differentiation from the West Semitic cultures, much like the Egyptians in the tale of Sunuhi. The myth of Joseph and its connection to the Odyssey. An often overlooked parallel to the Odyssey's romantic elements is found in the biblical story of Joseph. While some scholars have touched upon the romantic undertones of Joseph's tale, a comprehensive comparison with the Odyssey's romantic narrative has been largely absent. The story of Joseph can be seen as a romance, albeit without the heroic flair that the Odyssey bestows upon its main character, Odysseus. Instead of heroic adventures, Joseph's story delves into the historical reasons for the Israelites' stay in Egypt and intertwines with the Old Testament tales of patriarchs. Yet, when we set aside the lack of heroism, the similarities between the two narratives become strikingly clear. Both stories encompass the core elements that define romance. Both Odysseus from the Odyssey and Joseph from the Bible are portrayed as virtuous individuals who enjoy the favor of the highest deity. In the Odyssey, Zeus himself acknowledges the sacrifices made by Odysseus during the Trojan War. While Zeus doesn't directly interact with Odysseus in the narrative, it's evident that he supports him in trusting Athena to guide and assist the hero. Odysseus is well aware of his divine backing, even playfully questioning his son Telemachus about whether the combined support of Athena and Zeus would suffice against their adversaries. By the end of the Odyssey, Zeus continues to steer Odysseus' destiny. Similarly, in the biblical story of Joseph, God's favor is a reoccurring theme. From Joseph's early prophetic dreams to his time in Egypt, the narrative consistently highlights God's presence and blessings in his life. Phrases like, Joseph prospered, for the Lord was with him, and the Lord blessed the household through Joseph, underscore this divine endorsement. Odysseus, the hero of the Odyssey, finds himself separated from his family for an extended period, often spanning a generation. While the Odyssey doesn't delve into his time at Troy, it's clear that his journey back home is fraught with challenges. These challenges arise primarily from two significant mistakes made by Odysseus. Firstly, after leaving Troy, Odysseus and his crew sacked the city of Ismaros. This act of aggression is met with a violent storm hinting at divine displeasure. However, it's the second error that proves more consequential. While escaping from the Cyclops, Polyphemus, Odysseus taunts him, revealing his true identity. In doing so, he incurs the wrath of Poseidon, the sea god and father of Polyphemus. Odysseus' boastful declaration that even Poseidon couldn't heal the now blinded Cyclops seals his fate. This act of hubris ensures Poseidon's enmity throughout most of the Odyssey. The narrative cleverly alludes to this event early on, ensuring the audience is aware of its significance. Poseidon's anger not only hinders Odysseus' journey home, but also has lasting implications as foretold by the seer, Tiresias. In the Odyssey, divine intervention and wrath play significant roles in shaping the hero's journey. One such instance 
is the violent storm that Odysseus and his crew encounter after sacking the city of Ismaros. This storm, described in Odyssey 9, 79-81, pushes them off course. And now I would have come to the land of my fathers unharmed, but a wave and the current and the north wind beat me off course as I was rounding the Cape of Malaya and drove me on past Kathira. The term used to describe being driven off course is a compound of the word plazo, which in the Odyssey often signifies a god's anger towards a mortal. In this context, it particularly alludes to Poseidon's wrath against Odysseus. However, since this storm occurs before the episode with the Cyclops, Polyphemus, it suggests that another deity, not Poseidon, is expressing their anger. It's posited that the divine displeasure is directed at Odysseus's crew rather than Odysseus himself. The crew's insubordination at Ismaros, where they disobey orders, is seen as the cause of this divine retribution. This act of defiance foreshadows a more severe act of disobedience later in the story at Thrinakia, which results in a storm sent by Zeus that kills all the remaining crew members. Thus, the storm after Ismaros indirectly sets the stage for the encounter with Polyphemus and the subsequent wrath of Poseidon. The two episodes, though distinct, are interconnected in the tapestry of divine interventions that shape Odysseus's journey home. Joseph's mistakes and their consequences. Joseph's journey in the book of Genesis is marked by a series of events that stem from his own actions and the reactions of those around him. Two primary mistakes, or sets of mistakes, shape his narrative. Tensions with his brothers. Joseph's relationship with his brothers is strained from the outset. He is described as bringing negative reports about them to their father, Jacob. This behavior paints him as a tattletale, further alienating him from his siblings. His status as Jacob's favorite son exacerbates the tension. Joseph's dreams in which his brothers bow down to him and his decision to share these dreams with them come across as tactless and arrogant. This series of incidents culminates in his brother's decisions to sell him into slavery, a motif that also appears in the Odyssey. Potiphar's house in Egypt. Upon arriving in Egypt and serving in Potiphar's house, Joseph's physical attractiveness is emphasized. This trait combined with his earlier vanity sets the stage for the subsequent events. Potiphar's wife is attracted to Joseph. When he rejects her advances, she falsely accuses him of rape. This accusation leads to Joseph's imprisonment. Hugel's analysis, who's a scholar, highlights the recurring theme of Joseph's vanity and its consequences. His physical appearance and his pride in it play a significant role in the challenges he faces. The narrative draws parallels between Joseph's behavior with his brothers and his actions in Egypt, suggesting a pattern of behavior that consistently brings about adversity. The narrative of Joseph in the book of Genesis and the story of Odysseus in the Odyssey both incorporate a significant element of romance, which is characterized by a prolonged absence of the protagonist from their home or family. This absence, often spanning a generation, serves as a central motif in romance narratives. Let's look at the duration of absence. In the case of Joseph, there's a clear timeline provided. Joseph is 17 years old when he's sold into slavery. He's 30 when he starts serving Pharaoh. The reunion with his brothers happens in the second year of drought, after seven years of abundant harvests. This timeline, indicates an absence of about 21 to 22 years from his family, which is strikingly similar to the 20-year absence of Odysseus from Ithaca in the Odyssey. Significance of the gap. The generational gap in romances often allows for the protagonist's offspring to grow up and play a significant role in the narrative. This evident in the Odyssey, where Telemachus, Odysseus's son, has a crucial role. In the myth of Joseph, this motif is slightly altered. Instead of focusing on Joseph's offspring, the narrative emphasizes his youngest brother, Benjamin. Benjamin becomes central to the story, especially when Joseph tests his brothers to see if they would treat Benjamin, who is similar to Joseph, in being the youngest and a favorite in the same way they treated him. Romance within a larger context. 
Just as the Odyssey incorporates elements of romance within the broader epic narrative, the myth of Joseph embeds the romance within the larger patriarchal narrative of Genesis. While the Odyssey's broader narrative deals with the hero's journey and the challenges he faces, the myth of Joseph is intertwined with the history and etiologies of the 12 tribes of Israel. This overarching narrative sometimes influences and modifies the traditional motifs of romance. Both the Odyssey and the myth of Joseph utilize the romance motif of a prolonged absence, adapting and molding it to fit their respective larger narratives and thematic concerns. Odysseus finds himself ensnared in unfamiliar and wondrous territories for a significant duration. The idea of being involuntary lost in foreign places, which many might confuse with intentional exploration, is a hallmark of romantic tales. Such stories often depict the main character being unintentionally separated from their homeland. In a large portion of his journey, specifically books 5 through 12, Odysseus, in these unfamiliar territories, places not even on the map, struggling to find his way back home. There's a notable incident, his encounter with Polyphemus, where he chooses to explore a shore even when it wasn't necessary. However, this is a rare deviation. Powerful storms, as described in the epilogue, push Odysseus into these situations against his wishes. This isn't a journey by choice. In fact, for most of his time away, seven out of 10 years, he's held captive by goddess Calypso on the island of Ogygia. Despite her affection for him, she detains him against his desires, a sentiment echoed multiple times in the narrative, drawing a parallel in the story of Joseph, his time in Egypt, a land synonymous with mystery and allure, serves a similar narrative purpose. While Joseph isn't lost in an uncharted territory like Odysseus, he spends a considerable amount of time, even longer than Odysseus, amidst a foreign culture separated from his family. Both Odysseus and Joseph find themselves the object of affection from powerful women, Calypso and Potiphar's wife, respectively. Their allure to these women results in their confinement. Calypso shares similarities with other goddesses from myths who engage in romantic relationships with mortals. In Greek mythology, goddesses like Eos and Demeter come to mind and Calypso hints at connections with them. In Near Eastern tales, Ishtar stands out as a notable example. Book five of the Odyssey emphasizes these parallels, starting with the scene of Eos parting from her mortal lover, Tithonus. Hainsworth notes that Tithonus, often cited for his beauty, might have an Asian origin to his name. It's common in these tales for a goddess to be captivated by a mortal's beauty. For instance, the Odyssey describes Eos' attraction to another lover, Cletius, highlighting his beauty as the reason she took him to live among the gods. Eos's romantic pursuits in the Odyssey also involve Tithonus, Cletus, and Orion. Calypso recounts Orion's tale, emphasizing the envy of the gods when Eos chose him leading to his tragic end at the hands of Artemis. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, the goddess Ishtar is captivated by the hero's appearance after he defeats Humbaba and freshens up. She can't help but admire Gilgamesh's beauty. This admiration is reminiscent of how the Odyssey portrays Eos. The Gilgamesh narrative also lists Ishtar's past mortal lovers, a list that Gilgamesh himself reminds her of when she expresses her interest in him. These past lovers met unfortunate fates, making Gilgamesh wary of her advances. This theme seems to influence later myths, including the stories of Odysseus with Calypso and Joseph with Potiphar's wife. While many draw parallels between Ishtar and Circe, Due to Circe's association with animals and her ability to transform men into them, the Odyssey doesn't depict Circe as having the same kind of romantic longing as Calypso, Eos, Demeter, or Ishtar. Unlike Calypso, Circe doesn't try to keep Odysseus against his will. In fact, she only seems to be intimate with him once, following Hermes' guidance. Calypso's desire for Odysseus is so intense, she forces herself on him. Though he was reluctant, he had to spend nights with her in the cave. She wanted it, he didn't. This conflicting dynamic highlights the stark differences in the relationships between Odysseus, Gilgamesh, and Joseph when compared to Calypso, 
Ishtar, and Potiphar's wife. Often interpretations of Calypso and Circe are romanticized, attributing to them the characteristics not explicitly mentioned in the text. This has led to overlooking some of the more negative aspects of Calypso's character. Potiphar's wife, though not immediately similar to Calypso of, or Ishtar, shares certain traits with them. Like Ishtar's attraction to Gilgamesh and Eos's to Kletos, Potiphar's wife is drawn to Joseph primarily because of his striking appearance. Now Joseph was handsome in both face and figure, and after a time, his master's wife became infatuated with him. Ephraim Avigdor Spicer, also known as E.A. Spicer, was a Polish-born American world-class Assyriologist who points out an intriguing similarity between the stories of Potiphar's wife and Ishtar. The phrase describing Potiphar's wife's initial attraction to Joseph, which can be translated as, quote, fix her eye on, end quote, mirrors the same expression used when Ishtar first notices Gilgamesh. This identity phrase is also present in Akkadian when describing Ishtar's interest in Gilgamesh. Potiphar's wife's advances towards Joseph are immediate and direct, reminiscent of Ishtar's approach to Gilgamesh. She doesn't just express her interest once, she's persistent. This persistence mirrors the assertiveness shown by Eos and Calypso in their respective myths. The text states, quote, even though she persisted daily, Joseph resisted her advances, end quote. In a particularly aggressive move, she even grabs Joseph's garment, holding it so firmly that he leaves it behind as he escapes. This forceful act is akin to how the Odyssey portrays Calypso's intense desire for Odysseus. The theme of imprisonment often draws parallels with the concept of the underworld. While Calypso's island, Agigia, has elements of paradise, it also embodies characteristics of the underworld. This idea isn't new. It's hinted at when Ishtar offers herself to Gilgamesh. Abush suggests, and that's a scholar, that Ishtar's proposal to Gilgamesh isn't just about marriage. She's inviting him to rule the realm of the dead. Even though Gilgamesh declines, the narrative still ties him to themes of death, as seen in the subsequent events leading to Enkidu's demise and Gilgamesh's quest to overcome mortality. Calypso's character and her island seem to be inspired by these older narratives. Many aspects of Agigia align with traditional depictions of the underworld. For instance, Hermes' visit to Agigia hints at his usual role associated with guiding souls to the afterlife further emphasizing the island's connection to the underworld. Additionally, Odysseus' refusal to eat the unique food offered by Calypso mirrors themes from the underworld. As professor of classical studies Gregory Crane points out, this act is reminiscent of Persephone's story and other folklore tales where consuming food from another realm has consequences. The frequent mention of Calypso's dwelling being a cave a motif often symbolizing the underworld, as seen in Odysseus' escape from Polyphemus' cave, is another clue. It's also worth noting that many characters like Eos' lover Orion and Demeter's lover Lasiona, who are mentioned in relation to Calypso's relationship with Odysseus, meet untimely ends. This further strengthens the idea that Odysseus' involuntary stay on Agigia is akin to being trapped in the underworld. Joseph's extended time in prison, a consequence of Potiphar's wife's desires, plays a pivotal role in his story. Wrongly accused of trying to assault her, Joseph faces years of imprisonment for resisting her advances. We can identify two major missteps in Joseph's journey, conflicts with his brothers and issues in Potiphar's household. While disputes with his brothers lead to his broader confinement in Egypt, his issues with Potiphar's wife result in his imprisonment. These two events share similarities. Initially, his brothers strip him of his attire and cast him into a pit before selling him off. Later, Potiphar's wife takes away his garment and levels accusations that land him in the pit really gel. The act of his brothers throwing him into a pit foreshadows his subsequent imprisonment. This also briefly invokes the idea of descending into the underworld, a theme often present in romantic tales. Scholar Fry highlights this reoccurring motif. Quote, Romances often start with a significant drop in social standing, transitioning from wealth to destitution, from entitlement to a fight for existence, or even enslavement. Families 
make it torn apart, end quote. Quote, the overarching theme of dissent is characterized by a blurring of identity and limitations on actions. There's an initial disruption in awareness akin to drifting into sleep, followed by a downward journey to a realm below. This realm can be a place of harshness and confinement or a prophetic cave. Heroes often find themselves ensnared in mazes or locked away." End quote. In The Winter's Tale, Shakespeare employs a similar narrative device with Hermione's imprisonment. Much like Joseph, Hermione is incarcerated due to a baseless accusation of infidelity. Her time behind bars serves as a prelude to her supposed demise, which spans 16 years. This time lapse mirrors the duration seen in the tales of Joseph and Odysseus. During this period, her newborn daughter, Perdita, matures into a young woman. Odysseus's devoutness earns him the favor of the gods, aiding in his reunion with his loved ones. Zeus acknowledges Odysseus's sacrifices at Troy, painting him as a virtuous individual. In a subsequent divine assembly, Zeus decrees that Hermes will journey to Agigia to instruct Calypso to release Odysseus. With Athena participating in both these divine discussions, a total of three deities play a role in liberating Odysseus from Calypso's grasp. However, in true epic fashion, while Odysseus gains his freedom, he faces the challenge of navigating the sea solo on a self-made raft. He must also showcase his heroism to reach Scaria, a location that serves as a transitional point between Agigia and Ithaca. Much like Odysseus, Joseph finds his way out of confinement with divine assistance. His unique talent for dream interpretation, which we'll dive into later, catches Pharaoh's eye. This skill not only changes his fate, but also catapults him to a position of prominence. Joseph credits his dream interpretation prowess entirely to divine intervention. In his story, dreams serve as the primary channel through which the divine communicates. Recognizing his abilities, Pharaoh elevates Joseph, even arranging a marriage for him with Asenath, the daughter of the revered priest. This narrative element of a hero marrying a high-born woman is a recurring theme in romantic tales. For instance, Apollonius, in a similar juncture in his story, weds the daughter of King Archistrates. Shakespeare's Pericles, inspired by the Apollonius narrative, mirrors this by having Pericles marry Thasia, King Simonides' daughter. Both Apollonius and Pericles wed their royal brides after facing shipwrecks and losing everything. Drawing parallels to Joseph's life, trajectory, before his encounter with Pharaoh. The Odyssey also touches upon this theme with the character of Nausicaa. Though Odysseus doesn't end up marrying her, the typical protagonist in these romantic tales, like Joseph, Apollonius, and Pericles are young unmarried men. Odysseus, being older and more seasoned than Joseph, allows the Odyssey to hint at this theme without fully embracing it. Odysseus upon his return is laden with incredible treasures. The Phaeacians honoring Zeus's earlier proclamation bestow upon Odysseus wealth that surpasses even the grand loot he would have acquired from Troy, which he unfortunately lost. The Odyssey emphasizes the generosity of the Phaeacians' gift in three distinct passages. When Odysseus awakens, disoriented and unaware he's in Ithaca, he worries that the Phaeacians might have taken some of these treasures while he slept. Similarly, Joseph experiences remarkable prosperity while serving Pharaoh. As highlighted earlier, this theme is recurrent in his story, with blessings flowing through Joseph to the entire household, and success accompanying him in all his endeavors. This theme is encapsulated in the name Joseph gives to his second son, Ephraim, meaning, quote, God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering, end quote. This newfound wealth and status also serves as a disguise when Joseph's brothers come to seek his help during the famine. In Joseph's tale, his homecoming is reimagined to explain the origins of the Israelites' settlement in Egypt. Instead of Joseph's returning to his homeland, his family, represented by his brothers, comes to him. However, the traditional narrative finds its way back when Joseph eventually reunites with his father. Both the Odyssey 
and Joseph's story cultivate in heartfelt reunions with their fathers, following earlier recognition scenes with other family members. Joseph and Odysseus triumph over death. The prolonged absence of both protagonists is perceived as a symbolic victory over death. Throughout their tales, both believed to be dead, a recurring theme in many romantic narratives. In the Odyssey, even those closest to Odysseus, like Telemachus and Eumaeus, resign themselves to the belief that he's no longer alive. Others, like the suitors, frequently assert his death. Only a few, like Halitharsis, hold on to the hope of his return. Similarly, in Joseph's story, when his brothers visit Egypt and encounter Joseph, unaware of his identity, they speak of one brother being quote-unquote lost. This mirrors the irony often found in the Odyssey, where characters reminisce about Odysseus while he's right in front of them in disguise. As Joseph continues to question his brothers, they're reminded of their past actions and express remorse. Quote, We're surely being punished for what we did to our brother. We ignored his pleas and now we face the consequences. End quote. Reuben added, I warned you against harming him, but you didn't listen. Now we bear the weight of his blood and must face the repercussions." End quote. Spicer encapsulates the brothers' belief, noting that as far as they're concerned, Joseph met his end in the wilderness near Dothan years ago. Both the Odyssey and Joseph's story crescendo into poignant moments of recognition where the protagonist emotionally reunites with the family after a long separation. While such climatic reunions are common in romantic tales, the parallels between the Odyssey and Joseph's story are particularly striking. In both narratives, the protagonist initially hides his identity, putting family members through rigorous tests. These encounters are charged with emotion, often leading to tears. Yet there's also an element of seemingly unnecessary harshness from the protagonist. This similarity provides a backdrop to delve into the more debated aspects of Odysseus's reunion with Laertes, which mirrors Joseph's interactions with his brothers in Egypt. By recognition scenes, I refer to the moments when the protagonist, after two decades of absence, reunites with his family. Given that he's believed to be dead, the changed circumstances over the years act as a disguise. These scenes are pivotal marking the protagonist's reconnection with his family identity. Lost since his departure, they symbolize the heart of the happy ending in romantic tales, signifying the restoration of identity. There are various forms of these recognition scenes, depending on certain factors. For instance, is the identity unknown to both parties or just one? How long does the revelation take? Does the reunion occur before or after the protagonist's identity is restored? Which family member is involved? By examining these factors, we can categorize these scenes, identifying which ones share the most similarities and can thus shed light on each other's dynamics. Some of these factors align the Odyssey and Joseph's story with other romances, while others distinguish them. Meanwhile, one factor is unique to the Odyssey. When we look at romance from a wider lens, considering works from Euripides to Kalidasa's Shakuntala, the Greek novels, and even Shakespeare, a key distinction emerges, the character's awareness of each other's identities during their reunions. This distinction splits recognition scenes into two main categories. In most ancient romances like Euripides' Ion, Helen, and Iphigenia in Taurus, the story of Apollonius, King of Tyre, and Shakespeare's The Winter's Tale and Pericles, neither character knows the other's true identity during their reunion. However, both the Odyssey and Joseph's story take a different approach. In these tales, the protagonist knows the family member's identity, but hides his own during their initial meetings. This approach is rare. The only other ancient romances that come close are Euripides' Eclistus and Kalidasa's Shakuntala, but they offer twists on this theme. In Eclistus, while Admetos doesn't recognize his wife, it's not her doing the concealing. Instead, Heracles, an outsider, plays a role in the mystery. In Shakuntala, the protagonist knows her husband, but he doesn't recognize her due to a curse, not because she's hiding her identity. 
Another key difference in these romances is the relationship between the main character and the family member they were united with. These reunions can be between a parent and a child, as seen in Euripides' Ion, between a mother and a son, or in Apollonius and Shakespeare's Pericles, between a father and a daughter. They can also be between spouses, like Odysseus and Penelope. Apollonius and his queen, Dushyanta, and Shakuntala. In Shakuntala, Menelaus and Helen in Euripides' Helen, or Leontes and Hermione in The Winter's Tale. Another variation is the reunion between siblings, as seen between Joseph and his brothers, or Iphigenia and Orestes in Euripides' Iphigenia in Taurus. Out of these, the reunion between husband and wife often stands out as the most emotionally charged. This is evident in the climatic moments of the Odyssey, Shakuntala, and The Winter's Tale. In fact, Shakespeare's faced criticism for not emphasizing the reunion between Leontes and his daughter Perdita in The Winter's Tale. However, focusing on the reunion between spouses, in my opinion, was a wise choice due to its profound emotional depth. The time taken for a protagonist to reveal their identity to family members varies. In the Odyssey, Athena's initial disguised encounter with Odysseus sets the standard for later recognition scenes. Knowing Odysseus' identity, she teases him, hinting at his past and delaying the revelation of his location. Once she unveils her true identity, Athena highlights her role in assisting Odysseus with strategies and labels him as someone who tests others, a theme prevalent throughout the epic. This testing characterizes the recognition scenes in both the Odyssey and Joseph's story. Interestingly, while Odysseus's behavior often faces scrutiny, Joseph's similar actions are seldom criticized. In the Odyssey, most recognition scenes involving Odysseus are delayed, with the exceptions being Athena's and Argos's immediate recognitions in books 13 and 17. There are instances where Odysseus doesn't reveal his identity immediately, instead testing the loyalty of family members or servants. These are termed as postponed recognition scenes. A similar pattern is observed in the myth of Joseph, where he tests his relatives before revealing his identity. Such scenes are characteristic of both Odysseus and Joseph, serving as a form of self-identification for the audience. The Odyssey uses three types of recognition scenes. One, immediate recognition. Odysseus is recognized at the start of the encounter. Two, delayed recognition. Odysseus' identity is revealed by the end of the scene. And three, postponed recognition. Odysseus' identity is disclosed in a subsequent scene. Reversed recognitions, in certain scenes, it's Odysseus who is tested by the other party. Examples include his interactions with Athena in Book 13 and Penelope in Book 23. Timing of recognition relative to the suitor's slaying. Before slaying the suitors, Recognition scenes that happen before the defeat of the suitors are preparatory in nature. They involve characters who will assist Odysseus in his confrontation with the suitors. For instance, Athena, Telemachus, Philodius, and Eumaeus all play roles in the suitors' downfall, while Eurycleia helps by locking the doors to trap everyone inside. After slaying the suitors, recognition scenes that take place after the suitors have been defeated, such as those with Penelope and Laertes, signify the conclusion of the Odyssey's romance narrative. The Odyssey strategically uses recognition scenes in alignment with broader structural elements of the narrative. These scenes are often paired or mirrored to emphasize thematic or narrative parallels. Athena and Penelope, both scenes in Book 13, and 23 are reversed recognitions. Where Odysseus is tested, both scenes also feature Odysseus bestowing a kiss. Additionally, Athena's scene has parallels with Argos's scene as they are both immediate recognitions. Eumaeus and Telemachus. The episodes with Eumaeus in books 14 and 15 are intricately linked with the recognition scene with Telemachus in book 16. Eurycleia and Penelope. The recognition with Eurycleia in Book 19 is related to the postponed recognition with Penelope, framing the scenes in Books 17 and 18 where the suitors mistreat Odysseus. 
Penelope and Laertes, the final recognition scenes with Penelope in Book 23 and Laertes in Book 24 complement each other, forming a cohesive unit post the suitor's defeat. Athena's unique recognition in the Odyssey, Book 13. When Odysseus encounters Athena in Book 13 of the Odyssey, it's a unique twist on the typical recognition scenes found throughout the poem. Unlike other scenes, Athena instantly knows who Odysseus is. Given that she's a goddess and his guide, this immediate recognition might seem expected. However, this isn't the norm for other recognition moments in the story. In this particular scene, it's Athena who wears an unbreakable disguise, not Odysseus. This is a stark contrast to other scenes. She even tests Odysseus, which is a reversal of roles in most other recognition moments. While Odysseus doesn't wear a physical disguise here, he does use words to mask his identity. He starts the conversation with a made-up story presenting a fictional version of himself. After a bit of playful banner and listening to Odysseus's lengthy fabricated story, Athena finally reveals her true form. She transforms into a tall, beautiful woman known for her excellent skills. This scene sets the stage, introducing the various elements and behaviors that will be seen in subsequent recognition scenes in the Odyssey. Eumaeus and the Delayed Discovery In the Odyssey's books 14 and 15, we witness a classic recognition scene orchestrated by Athena. Here, Odysseus takes on the appearance of an older, bald man in tattered clothing. This transformation ensures he remains incognito, allowing him the freedom to gauge Eumaeus' loyalty and present himself as a beggar. Odysseus, known for his mastery and deception, has used disguises before, such as when he posed as an old beggar to spy on Troy, and most notably, when he conceived the Trojan horse strategy. Despite Odysseus' disguise, Eumaeus frequently speaks of the supposedly missing king. Through their interactions, Odysseus gets to witness firsthand Eumaeus' unwavering loyalty and dedication. Eumaeus even expresses a deep longing for Odysseus' return, valuing it over reuniting with his own family. But why doesn't Odysseus reveal his true identity to Eumaeus? There's a recurring theme in the Odyssey about the dangers of revealing Odysseus' identity prematurely. For instance, during the Trojan horse incident, Anticlos almost exposes their plan when he almost responds to Helen imitating the voices of the Greeks' wives. This theme is echoed when Eurycleia nearly reveals Odysseus' identity to Penelope, only to be stopped by Athena's timely intervention. Given Eumaeus' close ties with Penelope and his role as her confidant, Odysseus fears that Eumaeus might unintentionally spill the beans. This concern is further highlighted when after Odysseus discloses his identity to Telemachus, Athena expresses worry that Eumaeus might inadvertently reveal the secret to Penelope if he sees Odysseus without his beggar disguise. Eumaeus' backstory as presented in the Odyssey is a captivating narrative within the larger epic, drawing striking parallels with the biblical tale of Joseph. A central theme in both stories is the tragic fate of being sold into slavery. Surprisingly, Eumaeus isn't just an ordinary swineherd, he's the son of a king. This royal lineage mirrors Joseph's unique position as a favored son in his family. The betrayal in Eumaeus' story comes from a trusted Phoenician nurse in his father's household. She deceives young Eumaeus, handing him over to Phoenician traders in exchange for her passage back to her family. This act of betrayal by someone close is reminiscent of Joseph's own brother selling him into slavery. Interestingly, the Phoenician nurse herself had once been a victim, having been abducted and sold into slavery by the Taphians. This adds another layer of complexity to the narrative, similar to the multiple instances of trading in Joseph's story. While Eumaeus' journey into slavery begins with the Phoenicians, it ends when they sell him to Laertes. And just like many romantic tales, Eumaeus' story promises a hopeful resolution. However, at this juncture in the Odyssey, both his personal tale and the overarching recognition scene with Odysseus remain unfinished. Telemachus's Delayed Recognition Upon Telemachus' return from his meeting with Nestor and Menelaus, he makes his way to Eumaeus' hut. This setting links Telemachus' recognition scene with Eumaeus' earlier delayed recognition of Odysseus. The narrative is intricately woven, with Eumaeus playing a pivotal role in both scenes. 
Odysseus, with his keen observation, notices someone approaching Eumaeus's hut. The dog's silence gives away the visitor's familiarity. This moment, where Odysseus deduces the identity of the newcomer, adds a layer of pre-recognition, hinting at the multifaceted recognitions about to unfold. Upon entering, Telemachus is warmly greeted by Eumaeus. The swineherd's emotional reception, likened to a reunion between a father and a son, evokes the intense feelings typically reserved for the peak of a recognition scene. This sentiment is further emphasized when Telemachus addresses Eumaeus as father. After a brief exchange and update about the disguised Odysseus, Telemachus instructs Eumaeus to inform Penelope of his safe return, underscoring Eumaeus' trusted position in the palace. With Eumaeus away, Athena makes her appearance, described in a manner reminiscent of her earlier revelation to Odysseus in Book 13. This consistent description hints at the formulaic nature of recognition scenes in the Odyssey. Athena then restores Odysseus to his usual appearance before making her exit. Upon Odysseus' return into Eumaeus' hut, he unveils his true identity to Telemachus. However, the sudden transformation leaves Telemachus startled, leading him to suspect the figure before him might be a deity. The dialogue between them emphasizes this confusion. I am not some god, but I am your father. This exchange not only highlights Telemachus' initial disbelief, but also underscores Odysseus's godlike appearance. Telemachus's uncertainty is a common feature in the Odyssey's recognition scenes. Typically, a tangible sign such as Odysseus's thigh scar, the marital bed, or the trees he planted with Laertes would serve as proof of identity. However, Telemachus lacks such a reference point since he was merely a baby when Odysseus left. Drawing a parallel with Eumaeus' scene, Telemachus's skepticism mirrors the swineherd's earlier disbelief in Odysseus's promised return. It's only when Odysseus attributes his transformation to Athena's intervention that Telemachus is convinced. This recognition scene with Telemachus is significant, as it ties in with later scenes involving Penelope in Book 23 and Laertes. Notably, these three characters are the only ones who recognize Odysseus outside of his beggar disguise. Tears and the act of crying play a significant role in the Odyssey, especially during moments of recognition. This emotional response is first evident when Odysseus reveals his identity to Lemachus. Surprisingly, Odysseus, often portrayed as the epitome of Stoicism, sheds tears. This raw display of emotion underscores the profound feelings stirred during these reunions, yet Telemachus remains skeptical, even in the face of his father's tears. This initial hesitance from Telemachus foreshadows Penelope's even more guarded reaction in Book 23. Once Telemachus becomes convinced of Odysseus' identity, thanks to the mention of Athena's involvement, he too is overcome with emotion. The father and son embrace, both shedding tears. However, their shared grief becomes so intense that it threatens to consume their time and focus. The narrator emphasizes this potential pitfall with a series of what-if scenarios. Quote, And now the light of the sun would have set while they were mourning, had not Telemachus at once addressed his father. Quote, And now the light of the sun would have set while they were mourning, had not Odysseus himself restrained them and spoke. Quote, and now the rosy-fingered dawn would have appeared while they were mourning, had not Athena, the gray-eyed goddess, thought about other things." End quote. These passages serve as a poignant reminder of the deep emotional resonance of recognition scenes in the Odyssey. They highlight the balance between the joy of reunion and the need to remain focused on the challenges ahead. Argos's heartfelt recognition of Odysseus. Among all the mortals in the Odyssey, Argos stands out. The loyal dog instantly identifies his master Odysseus, drawing a parallel with Athena's immediate recognition in Book 13. These two instances are unique in their immediate acknowledgement. The narrative cleverly sets the stage for this touching reunion. Before meeting Telemachus, Odysseus observes that Eumaeus' dogs don't bark at an approaching figure, indicating their familiarity with the person. Later, when Athena approaches, only Odysseus and the dogs sense her presence, while Telemachus remains oblivious. 
These moments emphasize the dog's keen perception and ability to recognize. As Odysseus and Eumaeus draw near, Argos perks up his ears, reminiscent of Odysseus's earlier attentive listening. But before the reunion unfolds, the narrative delves into Argos's backstory and current state. This technique of building suspense by interspersing background details is also employed during Eurycleus' recognition scene, where Odysseus's scar and name are elaborated upon. Once the background is set, Argos's recognition is immediate and heartfelt. He wags his tail and drops his ears in sheer excitement, embodying the profound emotions stirred by such reunions. This reaction mirrors earlier descriptions of Odysseus's interactions with Eumaeus's dogs. As Odysseus acknowledges Argos, he's moved to tears, discreetly hiding them from Eumaeus. This subtle display of emotion foreshadows his initial interaction with Penelope. However, the reunion is bittersweet. Weakened by age and neglect, Argos passes away right after recognizing Odysseus. While some might find this confluence of recognition and death overly dramatic, it's a classic trope in ancient recognition tales, echoing sentiments found even in the biblical story of Joseph. Odysseus and Penelope, a delayed reunion. In Homer's Odyssey Book 19 presents a poignant scene between Odysseus and his wife, Penelope, where recognition is intentionally delayed. This scene mirrors an earlier one with Eumaeus, Odysseus's loyal swineherd. Eumaeus plays a connecting role, passing messages between the estranged couple, setting the stage for their eventual meeting. In both scenes, Odysseus interacts at length with someone close to him without revealing his true identity. Penelope showcases her unwavering loyalty, while Eumaeus displays his dedication, even though Odysseus remains incognito. Interestingly, both encounters are preceded by confrontations. Eumaeus's dogs threaten Odysseus and Melantho, a disloyal maid, verbally attacks him. In both instances, the host intervenes, preventing any harm to Odysseus. The narrative draws parallels between these confrontations. While Eumaeus's dogs are real, Melantho's aggressive behavior likens her to a dog, especially when Penelope refers to her as a bitch. This canine imagery is consistent emphasizing the hostility Odysseus faces. Another striking similarity is how both Penelope and Eumaeus, while speaking to Odysseus in disguise, think of him as he were absent and even allude to his presumed death. Clothing also plays a significant role in both scenes, highlighting the importance of appearances and disguises in the narrative. However, Odysseus faces challenges in both interactions. With Eumaeus, he struggles to gain complete trust as the swineherd remains skeptical about Odysseus Odysseus's return. Penelope, on the other hand, seeks concrete evidence that the stranger before her has truly encountered her husband. Despite these parallels, the emotional intensity varies. While Odysseus remains composed with Eumaeus, his interaction with Penelope is charged with emotion. He struggles to hold back tears, reminiscent of his earlier encounter with his old dog, Argos. This difference underscores the deep bond between Odysseus and Penelope, setting the stage for their eventual reunion. In the Odyssey, Odysseus chooses not to reveal his identity to Penelope for various reasons. One significant factor is the portrayal of woman's fidelity, or lack thereof. Thereof. In the narrative, the story suggests that women, even those considered moral, can be led astray by romantic or sexual encounters. This perspective is evident in the tale of a maidservant who betrays Eumaeus after becoming involved with a Phoenician trader. The narrative comments on the power of, quote, lovely lovemaking, end quote, to divert even the most virtuous woman's thoughts as seen in Odyssey 15. This theme of woman's fidelity is further explored through the characters of of Clymenestra and Helen. Both are repeatedly mentioned in the Odyssey and serve as potential contrasts or comparisons to Penelope. Each of these women represents varying levels of marital loyalty. Clymenestra, she represents the most severe form of marital betrayal. Not only does she take a lover, but she also either assists in her husband's murder or fails to prevent it. Her actions epitomize the most extreme form of infidelity from a husband's viewpoint. Helen, her story offers a more nuanced perspective on fidelity. While she leaves her husband for another man, 
she eventually returns to him. This places her in a middle ground between absolute loyalty and complete betrayal. Penelope. She stands as the paragon of marital fidelity in the Odyssey. Despite being surrounded by suitors during Odysseus' absence, she remains unwaveringly loyal to her husband. Throughout the Odyssey, Penelope's character is explored in relation to these varying degrees of fidelity. The narrative toys with the idea that she could potentially fit into any of these categories emphasizing the complexity of her character and the challenges she faces in maintaining her loyalty. The Odyssey often draws parallels between the fates of Agamemnon's family and that of Odysseus's. These parallels serve as cautionary tales and potential outcomes for the central characters of the poem. For instance, Odysseus and Agamemnon, just as Agamemnon was murdered upon his return home, there's a looming threat that Odysseus might meet a similar fate. Penelope and Clymenestra. Clymenestra the treacherous betrayal of her husband Agamemnon serves as a dark reflection of what Penelope might become. The narrative toys with the idea that Penelope could betray Odysseus in his absence. Telemachus and Orestes Telemachus, like Orestes, might find himself in a position where he has to avenge his father's death. However, as the story progresses, especially after Odysseus' return, Penelope's character is liking more to Helen, particularly the version of Helen in Menelaus' recounting of the Trojan horse incident. In that tale, Helen, recognizing the warriors hidden inside the Trojan horse, circles it, mimicking the voices of their wives. This act of Helen's mirrors the Odyssey's underlying concern that Penelope, upon recognizing Odysseus, might unintentionally expose his disguise. In terms of jeopardizing Odysseus's identity, Penelope Penelope is seen as the least likely to do so, with Clymenestra being the most probable, and Helen occupying a middle ground. Interestingly, the narrative does introduce a moment where a woman almost reveals Odysseus's identity, but this role is given to Eurycleia, the loyal nurse. Her recognition of Odysseus is intricately tied to Penelope's own realization of her husband's return. Towards the conclusion of a recognition scene, Penelope herself draws a comparison to Helen, highlighting the interconnected fates and choices of the women in the Odyssey. In the Odyssey, several characters, including the Phoenician servant, Clymenestra and Helen have romantic encounters outside of wedlock. In contrast, Penelope remains loyal to her husband. However, the narrative cleverly plays with the idea of her potential infidelity, especially given the uncertainty of Odysseus's fate. While Penelope never opens showing interest in any of the suitors, the poem subtly touches upon the possibility. A notable instance is when Athena nudges Telemachus to depart from Sparta, hinting that Penelope might soon wed Eurymachus. Quote, Understand the nature of a woman's heart. She often seeks to build a new life with a new partner, forgetting her past children and the memories of her departed husband." End quote. Penelope seems more influenced by external pressures, especially from her family, rather than genuine desire. The narrative here primarily warns Telemachus about the risks to his inheritance if Penelope remarries. Both Eumaeus and Penelope, characters with many similarities in the story, are depicted as steadfastly loyal. However, their loyalty is tested, making their eventual reunions all the more poignant. At its core, the structure of romantic tales dictates that Odysseus cannot reveal his true identity to Penelope too soon. In such narratives, the moment of recognition serves as a reward for the hero. It comes after the protagonist has not only endured hardships, but has also reclaimed his prosperity. This narrative structure ensures that Penelope's moment of realization about Odysseus' identity occurs near the epic's conclusion specifically after Odysseus has defeated the suitors, since the suitors are primarily associated with the divine hospitality theme in the Odyssey. The recognition scenes involving characters linked to their downfall happen earlier in the story. When Penelope hears the stranger, Odysseus in disguise, speak of an encounter with her husband, she is moved to tears, sensing the truth in his words. This emotional response is beautifully captured in a five-line simile. Odysseus, too, is moved to tears, but he hides his emotions. This moment mirrors an earlier scene with Argos, further emphasizing the theme of concealed recognition. While Penelope is deeply affected by the stranger's story, she seeks evidence, putting Odysseus to the test. This moment mirrors Athena's unique recognition scene in Book 13, where she, 
unlike Odysseus, fully understands the situation and knows who he is. I strongly disagree with some interpretations suggesting that Penelope recognizes her husband at this point. They also neglect the striking similarities this scene has with Eumaios' encounter in Book 14. To assume Penelope recognizes Odysseus here is to project a modern perspective onto the text, which goes against the grain of ancient myth and the romantic narrative structure. Why would the Odyssey lessen the anticipation of the pivotal scene in Book 23? Instead, the epic cleverly plays with its own established conventions of recognition. It blurs, but doesn't erase the distinction between immediate and delayed recognitions. Penelope gets tantalizingly close to the truth, much like Eurycleia's emotional outburst. Her interaction with the disguised Odysseus is reminiscent of Athena's playful encounter in Book 13, but she doesn't possess the same level of insight as the goddess. Penelope's inquiry centers on the attire Odysseus had on during his supposed meeting with the stranger. This scene also draws parallels with Odysseus' conversation with Queen Arita of Sharia, where their initial rapport is built on a discussion about clothing. Even though Arita seems convinced by his story, she doesn't truly recognize him until much later. Mirroring Penelope's eventual realization in Book 23, this thematic link with Arita further supports the idea that Penelope doesn't truly recognize Odysseus during their initial meeting, but will do so in their subsequent encounter in Book 23. Odysseus effortlessly meets Penelope's challenge regarding his attire, recalling the brooch she once gifted him. Interestingly, his answer draws a parallel with Eumaios' backstory. He mentions how the brooch which caught the attention of many women, reminiscent of the admiration the jewelry of Phoenician traders received in Eumaios' father's house. It's often overlooked by many that it's Odysseus' portrayal of the herald Eurbates rather than the clothing details that serves as the ultimate proof moving Penelope to further tears. But why is this significant? In his depiction of Eurbates, Odysseus underscores a crucial aspect of his personal connections as highlighted by scholars. Odysseus values a harmony of mind in his close relationships. This shared mindset between Odysseus and Athena is what endears him to the goddess and explains her unwavering support. Furthermore, Odysseus' remarks about Eurybates not only draw a parallel with his bond with Athena, but also shed light on the essence of the recognition scenes in the narrative. True recognition, it seems, is achieved when two characters attain a mutual understanding or a harmony of mind. Eurycleia's delayed recognition. Eurycleia's moment of recognizing Odysseus is intricately woven into the tapestry of the Odyssey. It complements Telemachus' own realization and is interlaced with Penelope's initial encounter with Odysseus. Just as Telemachus' early recognition contrasts with Eumaios' delayed recognition, Eurycleia's scene mirrors Penelope's postponed acknowledgement. The Odyssey foreshadows Eurycleia's connection with Telemachus early on. Telemachus entrusts her with the secret of his journey to see Nestor and Menelaus, making her swear not to inform Penelope. This dynamic sets the stage for later scenes. Penelope remains unaware of Telemachus' travels, hinting at her delayed recognition, while Eurycleia is consistently in the know. Eurycleia's recognition, much like Eumaeus, is rooted in the customs of hospitality. She offers to wash Odysseus' feet, a jester deeply embedded in ancient hospitality traditions. However, her act of washing and the subsequent recognition are postponed by a series of unique narrative techniques. Among these is her heartfelt address to her seemingly absent master, masterfully blurring the lines of Odysseus' role in the story. As she discovers the scar on his thigh, the narrative pauses to delve into the backstory of how Odysseus acquired it. This exceptional narrative shift, reminiscent of the stream of consciousness style popularized in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, allows readers to immerse themselves in Eurycleia's thoughts, experiencing the rush of memories associated with the scar. At a certain juncture, the recognition scenes of Eurycleia and Penelope seem to intertwine. Much like the near merging of Telemachus and Eumaeus, their recognitions in Book 16. In a moment of overwhelming emotion, Eurycleia exclaims Odysseus's true identity. The very revelation Odysseus feared might come from Penelope. 
This could have prematurely unveiled his identity to Penelope, but Athena intervenes just in time. Interestingly, the Odyssey doesn't use a hypothetical scenario to illustrate Athena's timely action, a narrative choice that might seem unusual. Athena's intervention is reminiscent of another scene where she guides Helen away from the Trojan horse after Odysseus silences Anticlos. In this instance, Athena ensures Penelope remains oblivious to Eurycleia's outburst, while Odysseus swiftly silences his servant. Pledging her allegiance, Eurycleia recalls the oath she took for Telemachus. Her remark, my child, what sort of word has escaped the barrier of your teeth? Drips with irony given her own slip of the tongue. The narrative then gracefully transitions back to Penelope's prolonged recognition scene, referring to him as guest. Penelope continues their deep conversation, echoing the exchanges between Odysseus and Eumaeus in books 14 and 15. A profound connection forms, similar to the bond between Eumaeus and Odysseus. Penelope even shares a personal dream with him. She finds their discussion so captivating that she mentions she could converse all night long with him, mirroring Eumaeus' sentiments. Eumaeus and Philodius Recognition Scenes Among the recognition scenes in the Odyssey, the episode involving Eumaeus and Philodius is relatively straightforward. This scene, along with those of Telemachus and Athena, is directly tied to the impending confrontation with the suitors. After securing a vow of loyalty from both men, Odysseus unveils his true identity. However, unlike the dramatic visual transformation Athena bestows upon him before his reunion with Telemachus, here Odysseus relies on showing his distinctive scar as proof, drawing a parallel to Eurycleia's recognition scene. Following this revelation, and in a manner reminiscent of his interaction with Eurycleia, Odysseus provides the men with a set of instructions. This moment of shared emotion and guidance is punctuated by a series of hypothetical scenarios. These scenarios serve as narrative links connecting the recognition scenes of Telemachus, Eumaeus, and Philodius and ultimately Penelope. Penelope's Recognition Scene Penelope's and Laertes' moments of recognizing Odysseus stand out from the rest, as they occur after the suitors have been defeated. These scenes epitomize the culmination of a romantic narrative. While other recognition scenes in the Odyssey can be viewed as a blend of romance with elements of divine hospitality narratives, Penelope's recognition scene is particularly reminiscent of Athena's in Book 13. In a twist, Penelope tests Odysseus, reversing the typical roles seen in such narratives. This is somewhat echoed in Eumaeus's unexpected skepticism towards Odysseus's intentions. When Eurycleia excitedly rushes to inform a skeptical Penelope of Odysseus's return, Penelope's hesitance becomes the central theme of the scene. This reluctance builds upon a motif introduced earlier with Telemachus. Eurycleia urges Penelope to see for herself that Odysseus has indeed returned, drawing a parallel to the biblical story of Joseph. She also references the scar, tying the scene back to her own earlier recognition. However, Penelope's dismissal of this visual proof indicates that her test for Odysseus will demand a unique form of verification. In the aftermath of this fierce confrontation with the suitors, Odysseus's blood-streaked appearance acts as a barrier to immediate recognition based on looks alone. This grisly state aligns perfectly with Athena's prior expectations of how her favored hero would deal with the suitors. Eurycleia, assuming Penelope would want to witness this moment of victory, describes Odysseus as resembling a lion drenched in blood and gore. This imagery echoes Athena's earlier anticipation, envisioning your vast hall splattered with the blood and brains of the suitors. Such graphic depictions of violence are reminiscent of the imagery associated with the goddess Anat. Some scholars, like Bruce Loudon, have suggested that traditions surrounding Anat might have influenced the portrayal of the Homeric Athena. In this unique recognition scene, it's Penelope who takes on the role of the tester, much like Athena 
does in Book 13. Telemachus, in his criticism of Penelope's distant demeanor, inadvertently critiques her assumption of this testing role, while Odysseus understands and accepts her need to test him. He mistakenly believes her reservations stem from his disheveled appearance. After being bathed, dressed, and groomed by Eurycleia, he sits across from Penelope. Despite his efforts, her reservations persist. It's Odysseus who broaches the subject of their shared bed, suggesting Eurycleia prepare one for him. Seizing on this, Penelope crafts her test around the intricately designed bed he built, a test explicitly acknowledged by the narrator known for his composer as emphasized by Athena. Odysseus, perhaps frustrated by Penelope's challenge, passionately recounts the story of their bed. Beyond serving as a symbol of recognition, the bed carries deeper connotations, including erotic undertones. The Odyssey's narrative spread across three islands, showcasing Odysseus navigating relationships with dominant females. With Circe, their intimate relationship becomes a pathway to understanding and trust. On Sharia, Odysseus's interactions with Arete mirror his current negotiations with Penelope. The erotic element given Arete's marital status is instead channeled through her daughter, Nasikia. Ayaya, their shared bed, symbolizes their mutual understanding. After their intimate encounter, Circe's threat diminishes and she restores his crew. Back on Ithaca, Penelope's use of their marital bed as a token of recognition mirrors Circe's reconciliation with Odysseus. On Aiaia, Odysseus ensures Circe swears an oath before their intimate moment. Similarly, in this reversed recognition scene, Penelope ensures Odysseus verifies his identity before they reunite. The bed's connection to love and intimacy is emphasized by its descriptor. The bed made from a tree is symbolic of life and vitality. This olive tree, untouched by the suitors and beyond their influence, represents the essence of Ithaca that remains unscathed and vibrant. This tree, which verifies Odysseus's identity, is also linked to Athena, emphasizing the deep connection between her and Odysseus. The bed showcases Odysseus's craftsmanship, highlighting his ability to create from trees. For instance, to defeat Troy, he came up with the idea of the wooden Trojan horse. He used an olive beam to blind the Cyclops. Polyphemus, and crafted his own raft to depart from Calypso. In the Iliad, during his wrestling match with Aeus, their intertwined arms are likened to crossbeams, expertly joined by a skilled carpenter. Odysseus's pinnacle demonstration of his woodworking prowess in the Homeric epics is the crafting of Penelope's marital bed. The Odyssey strategically delays mentioning this bed, and its special construction until this pivotal moment, using it as a climatic point of recognition. As Odysseus emerges from his bath, a simile likens his head and shoulders to the masterpiece of a talented artisan blessed by Hephaestus or Athena. Penelope underscores that it was Odysseus himself who crafted the bed. This detailed description of the bed includes elements reminiscent of when the he constructed the raft. Adding a touch of elegance, he adorned the bed with gold, silver, and ivory, echoing the earlier simile that compared him to a craftsman creation, seamlessly weaving Odysseus's artistry into the narrative. This recognition scene, while unique in its use of the bed as evidence, contains elements seen in other episodes. Before descending the stairs, Penelope voices her belief to Eurycleia that Odysseus must have perished far from home. A sentiment shared by Eumaios and Penelope herself in a previous scene, Eurycleia's mention of the scar as proof suggests a self-aware, almost theoretical, almost theatrical use of recognition symbols in this episode. Emotion runs deep throughout, with tears and sobbing taking center stage, mirroring other recognition scenes. Their embrace parallels Odysseus's affectionate gesture towards Ithaca during his acknowledgement by Athena. This scene is the last of three crucial moments, as Dawn's pink fingers would have risen during their lament. Athena, the gray-eyed deity, had other plans in mind. Yet the most profound emotional moment is when Penelope truly sees him. 
She's overwhelmed, her heart and knees giving way, foreshadowing the intensity of the upcoming scene with Laertes. Laertes, delayed recognition. The Odyssey's final recognition scene between Odysseus and his father, Laertes, has faced criticism, particularly for Odysseus's perceived cruelty. However, this scene is not only rooted in tradition, but also aligns traditionally with the sequence of recognition scene, as seen when compared to the myth of Joseph. The behavior that draws the most criticism, where Odysseus chooses to taunt his father with derisive words, mirrors Joseph's interaction with his brothers during their moment of recognition. This scene with Laertes shares structural similarities with Penelope's recognition in Book 23. Both scenes unfold after the demise of the suitors. In describing how he crafted the bed, Odysseus speaks of clearing the olive tree's foliage and branches and shaping its trunk. When he encounters Laertes, his father is engrossed in gardening, tending to a plant with a spade. The act of Odysseus shaping the trunk in Penelope's scene foreshadows Laertes' gardening when they meet, drawing a thematic connection between father and son, both engrossed in nurturing plants. Both moments underscore the bond with nature, the orchards symbolizing the father-son relationship, and the olive tree representing the marital bond. In the tale Odysseus weaves for Laertes, he asserts a bond with Odysseus through shared hospitality. This ties back to Penelope's initial recognition scene. Drawing on this supposed link between the stranger and Odysseus, Laertes addresses Odysseus as Xenos, much like Penelope does in various instances. Other elements are more universally present across multiple recognition scenes in the Odyssey. Laertes believes Odysseus to be deceased, evoking a sorrow similar to Priam's for his believed to be lost son, expressing his grief through tears. In the tale he spins for Laertes, Odysseus employs a phrase deeply embedded in the Odyssey structure, acting almost as a recognition token. While providing a fabricated name, origin, and lineage, Odysseus conveys to Laertes that he arrived there unintentionally, but a god drove me away from Sicania so I arrived here against my wishes. The verb drove used by Odysseus is distinctively utilized in the Odyssey. It typically appears at the start of a line, often refers to Odysseus, generally depicts divine intervention or wrath, and encapsulates Odysseus's challenges in returning home. Even within this fabricated story, the verb serves as a condensed reflection of Odysseus's decade-long journey. This usage acts as a subtle recognition token signaling his true identity more to the readers than to Laertes. The incorporation of this verb underscores that the scene with Laertes is an integral, traditional component of the Odyssey, masterfully weaving in central themes and dynamics of the epic. When Odysseus repeatedly asserts that he has met and hosted Odysseus, Laertes is overcome with grief, symbolically pouring dirt over his face. This portrayal aligns Laertes with iconic figures of sorrow, like Priam from the Iliad and Job from the Bible. Each exhibits profound gestures of grief. Priam covers himself in dung, while Job rips his garments and shaves his head. Laertes' reaction? also mirrors Penelope's in invoking a potent emotional response from Odysseus. This intense emotional momentary disrupts Odysseus's control over the situation, evident when he feels a sharp pain in his nostrils. Similar to his interaction with Penelope, this emotional surge propels Odysseus to reveal his true identity, announcing to Laertes that he is the very man in question. However, Unlike Penelope, who deliberately pushes Odysseus towards this revelation, Laertes remains oblivious to his role in the disclosure. Upon this revelation, Laertes seeks evidence. Odysseus offers his scar as proof, reminiscent of Eurycleia's recognition, and then recalls the day Laertes named and enumerated all the trees for him. The recurring themes of wood, carpentry, and trees seamlessly connect the recognition scenes of Laertes and Penelope. As Odysseus anticipates the potential fallout from his actions against the suitors, he quickly tries to curb the emotional outpouring. Sparked by their reunion, this response aligns with the traditional reactions observed throughout the Odyssey's recognition scenes. In his reunions with Telemachus, 
Philodius and Eumaeus, and the subsequent scene with Penelope, there's a looming threat of uncontrollable grief that could potentially last until daybreak. In each instance, someone intervenes to prevent this overwhelming sorrow. Telemachus in Book 16, Odysseus in Book 21, and Athena in Book 23. They each use pivotal counterfactuals to redirect the emotional trajectory. The scene with Laertes culminates in another intense emotional display. Once Laertes is fully convinced of Odysseus's identity, he embraces his son, becoming so overwhelmed that he nearly collapses. The myth of Joseph, much like the Odyssey and other romantic tales, reaches its zenith through a series of emotionally charged recognition scenes. Remarkably, almost every element in these scenes finds a parallel. In the Odyssey, the recognition scenes unfold against the backdrop of the suitors exploiting Odysseus's household. Similarly, in Joseph's story, the backdrop is the severe drought and famine. These oppressive situations interact in the Odyssey when the suitors are frequently depicted as consuming Telemachus's resources, similar to how Joseph and his family are running out of resources. Looking at the broader typology of recognition scenes in the romantic tales, Joseph's story mirrors the general type seen in the Odyssey. The protagonist, despite recognizing his kin, hides his identity. The relatives, on the other hand, remain oblivious to his true identity until they undergo various tests of loyalty or morality. This fundamental narrative structure aligns the Odyssey and Joseph's myth, distinguishing them from many other ancient romances, including the works like Euripides' Ion, Helen, Iphigenia in Taurus, the Greek novels, Kalidasa's Shakuntala, the Apollonius romance, and even later works like Shakespeare's romances. This structure introduces motifs like the protagonist struggling to hide his tears, a theme both Genesis and the Odyssey extensively explore. In terms of the Odyssey's three subtypes of recognition scenes, Joseph's story aligns with the specific form of the postponed recognition, akin to the scenes with Eumaeus and Penelope in the Odyssey. This is evident in his initial interactions with his brothers. When Joseph's brothers arrived, they prostrated themselves before him. Upon seeing them, Joseph recognized them. However, he feigned ignorance and addressed them with sternness. While Joseph knew them instantly, his brothers remained unaware of his true identity. Genesis delves deeper into the concept of postponed recognition than the Odyssey does. Joseph's tactics of deception and testing surpass those of Odysseus. He keeps his brothers in suspense for more extended period, subjecting them to heightened distress. While Odysseus crafts fictitious tales about himself, Joseph levels false allegations against his brothers, branding them as spies. He further intensifies their ordeal by imprisoning them for three days. While releasing the majority, he detains Simeon for an intermediate duration. After their grain purchases with silver, Joseph ensures their silver is secretly returned to their sacks. The discovery of this silver instills fear of being labeled as thieves. My money has been returned. It's right here in my sack. Confused and fearful, they pondered what God has done to us. We've been brought here because of the silver incident. He aims to accuse us, punish us, confiscate our donkeys, and enslave us. In a repeated ruse, Joseph instructs his steward to hide his silver cup in Benjamin's sack. The anguish and distress he inflicts on his brothers surpasses any emotional turmoil Odysseus causes Penelope or Laertes. Joseph's deceptions are more intricate and deceptive than any of Odysseus's actions in the Odyssey. There's an intriguing double standard in cultural interpretations. Odysseus often faces criticism for his actions, while Joseph's more extreme behaviors are seldom highlighted or critiqued. These parallels hint that the actions of both Odysseus and Joseph are not only anticipated, but also accepted within the framework of ancient romance. The reunion of Joseph and his brothers unfolds within the context of a hospitality scene, mirroring many recognition scenes in the Odyssey. Observing his brother's compliance and bringing Benjamin as instructed, Joseph commands a feast to be prepared. The steward offers them water to cleanse their feet, a gesture not only emblematic of hospitality in ancient narratives, but also crucial 
in Odysseus's recognition scene with Eurycleia, she washed his feet, just like the woman washed Jesus' feet in the Gospels. Similar to the Odyssey, where Odysseus' kin and servants ponder about him while he's in their midst, Joseph's brothers reflect on him, even as they stand before him, oblivious to his true identity. In both tales, the protagonist's families presume them to be deceased. For Joseph, various instances in the Odyssey for Odysseus, various places in Genesis for Joseph, various instances in the Odyssey for Odysseus. Both Joseph and Odysseus grapple with their emotions during these recognition scenes, striving to mask their tears, just as Odysseus must hide his emotional response upon seeing Argos. And later with Penelope, Joseph too battles to conceal his tears when confronting his brothers after two decades of separation. Joseph's decision to disclose his identity comes after a series of tests that his brothers, especially Judah, must pass. This mirrors not only Odysseus's general approach, but also the challenges Penelope sets for him. With Joseph believed to be dead, Benjamin, his only other sibling by the same mother, becomes the apple of Jacob's eye. By forcing them to present Jacob and then planting his silver cup in Benjamin's sack, Joseph sets a trap. He offers his brothers a chance to betray Benjamin as they did him. As a scholar Spicer aptly puts it, the brothers have transformed. They've successfully navigated the ultimate test, giving Joseph the clarity he sought. With his brothers proving their loyalty, Joseph unveils his true identity. The brothers' stunned reaction upon this revelation is reminiscent of Telemachus' shock when he sees Odysseus in his true form. They were so taken aback to see Joseph that they were rendered speechless. His son Telemachus was taken aback and fearing he might be a deity averted his gaze. Drawing a parallel with Telemachus' response to Odysseus, as highlighted by many scholars, the brothers implicitly equate Joseph with a divine being. Joseph's subsequent words to them echo Odysseus' reassurance to Laertes when faced with disbelief. I am the one you inquired about. I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. In both the Odyssey and the story of Joseph, the climatic recognition scenes involve the protagonists' returns or reunions with their fathers. These elderly fathers are depicted in strikingly similar ways. As grief-stricken old men deeply mourning their presumed lost sons, the main characters of the narratives. Joseph, as part of his elaborate test for his brothers, repeatedly subjects Jacob to profound distress by demanding that Benjamin be brought to him. You have deprived me of my children. Joseph is gone. Simeon is gone. And now you want to take Benjamin? Everything is against me. But Jacob protested. I cannot let my son go with you. His brother is dead and he is the only one left. If anything were to happen to him on his journey, you would bring my old age down to the grave in sorrow. If you were to take this one from me too, and something were to happen to him, you would send this old man to his grave in utter misery. In both tales, the anguish the protagonists inflict upon their fathers appears excessive, if not unwarranted. For Laertes, some argue that since the suitors are already defeated, there's no justification for further deceit. Similarly, in Joseph's story, his chosen method of testing his brothers seems to inflict more pain on his father than on the brothers themselves. Both the Odyssey and Joseph's story depict the overwhelming emotions experienced by the fathers during the climatic moment of recognition. These emotions are so intense that both narratives subtly suggest the possibility of the father's death upon recognizing their sons. In the Odyssey, Laertes is deeply affected by the revelation. He is moved to tears, rebukes himself in his grief, and eventually faints from the emotional weight. Joseph's reunion with Jacob employs a motif reminiscent of the scene between Odysseus and Argos. Argos, having waited long enough to recognize Odysseus, passes away immediately after the recognition. Similarly, upon recognizing Joseph, Jacob expresses a sentiment that mirrors this motif declaring, now that I have seen, you are still alive. I am ready to die. This emotional intensity is further emphasized in the Odyssey when Eumaios and Philodius are integrated into Odysseus's family. Odysseus promises them, I will ensure you both have wives, grant you property and homes built close to mine. In my eyes, you will be akin to brothers and companions 
to Telemachus. Considering Eumaios' backstory of being sold into slavery and his postponed recognition, his inclusion into Odysseus's family mirrors Jacob's assimilation into Joseph's new Egyptian family. This parallel underscores a profound connection between the Odyssey and Joseph's tale. Joseph's actions throughout his recognition scenes mirror Athena's portrayal of Odysseus's approach to testing his kin. If we adjust the reference from Penelope to Joseph's father and brothers, the parallels become evident. The disparity between the audience's knowledge of Penelope's loyalty and Odysseus's inclination to test her, even if it causes her pain, mirrors Joseph's treatment of both Jacob and his siblings. The dynamics in Odysseus's conversation with Penelope in Book 19 closely resemble Joseph's initial interaction with his brothers in Egypt, particularly in terms of causing emotional distress and employing deception. Both myths exhibit innovation in their placement and execution of recognition scenes. The Odyssey structures its recognition scenes around its theme of negative theoxony divine hospitality. Except for the scenes with Laertes in the latter part of Penelope's recognition, all recognition scenes in the Odyssey occur before Odysseus confronts the suitors. These scenes serve to rally allies for the impending confrontation. On the other hand, Joseph's recognition scenes present a unique twist. Instead of the protagonist returning home, his family comes to him. This deviation from the traditional romance narrative serves Genesis's broader objective of explaining the Israelites' initial settlement in Egypt. In the Odyssey, Odysseus has distinct recognition scenes with various family members. In contrast, in Joseph's story, these separate recognitions are manifested as individual rivals of his brothers and the father in Egypt. Dreams in the Odyssey and Joseph's Myth Dreams as a motif are prevalent in romance narratives, from ancient tales like the Iphigenia in Taurus to Shakespearean plays like Cymbeline. These dreams often serve as divine messages or omens. Both Greek and Old Testament myths regard dreams as manifestations of divine intent. Gods frequently communicate with mortals through dreams or dispatch dreams to specific individuals. Given that dreams are perceived as divine signals, an individual capable of interpreting them is often equated with a prophet in both mythological traditions. This association between prophecy and dream interpretation is evident in the Homeric epics, as illustrated by Achilles' words in the Iliad. Let's seek insights from a prophet, priest, or even a dream interpreter, for dreams too are from Zeus. The Odyssey frequently incorporates dreams. However, dreams hold even more significance in Joseph's story. As Spicer notes, dreams in Joseph's narrative act as divine guideposts to the future. But what sets the Odyssey and Joseph's myth apart from other tales is the central role dreams play. In both stories, the protagonist, be it Odysseus or Joseph, is tasked with interpreting dreams. Joseph's ability to decipher dreams is a recurring theme, yet in line with the Old Testament's narrative style, Joseph perceives himself as merely an instrument, emphasizing that the true source of interpretation is God. All interpretation belongs to God. It's not me, but God, who will provide Pharaoh with a reassuring answer. In Joseph's most pivotal dream interpretation, he foresees and subsequently helps Egypt navigate a seven-year drought. In the Odyssey, Odysseus's prowess in interpreting dreams is revealed late in the narrative, specifically during the night preceding the suitor's downfall. In the context of Penelope's delayed recognition, Penelope shares a dream with the incognito Odysseus, where an eagle kills 20 geese and she's left distraught. The eagle before departing proclaims that the dream's events will come to fruition and identifies itself as Odysseus. However, Penelope remains skeptical about the dream's prophetic nature. Given the mythological association between dream interpretation and prophecy, Odysseus's interpretation of the dream, which foretells the suitor's demise, aligns him with the prophetic figure of Theoclymenus. The latter's prophecies, however, are presented in a more cataclysmic manner. Drawing a parallel with Joseph's myth, the suitor's exploitation of Ithaca, depicted as them feasting on Odysseus's wealth and likened to a parasitic tix, mirrors the devastating effects of the severe 
severe drought in Egypt. Thus, just as Joseph's dream interpretations help mitigate the drought's impact on Egypt, Odysseus' ability to decipher the dream signals the impending end of the suitor's tyranny. Odysseus and Joseph, the trickster lineage of Attilicus and Jacob. Odysseus from Homer's Odyssey and Joseph from the Bible have more in common than just being central figures in their respective tales. Both are linked through their family histories and are associated with a particular type of myth, the sacking of a city. Odysseus is the grandson of Attilicus, who was renowned for his unmatched skills in theft and making deceptive promises. This talent was a gift from the god Hermes. There's a reference in the Iliad where Odysseus wears a helmet that Attilicus had stolen. The Iliad also provides insight into what's being skilled in making oaths in tales. In the story within the Iliad, the god Zeus declares declares that his soon-to-be-born descendant will be a ruler. However, the goddess Hera manipulates the situation, ensuring that Eurystheus, also a descendant of Zeus, but not the one intended by Zeus, becomes the ruler instead. She cleverly uses Zeus's vaguely worded oath against him, much like how a trickster would exploit ambiguities. Attilicus, with his knack for using words to his advantage, might have operated in a similar way. When he named his grandson Odysseus, it was a nod to the anger and strong reactions his own cunning ways often evoked in others. The name Odysseus is derived from the word adusaminos, which means to incite wrath. In essence, Odysseus carries the legacy of his grandfather's ability to provoke strong emotions in others. Jacob, Joseph's father, is renowned in biblical lore as a master of deception. His cunning is reminiscent of certain myths from other cultures. One such tell involves Jacob's manipulation to secure his brother Esau's birthright. When Isaac, their father, decides to bless Esau, Rebekah, their mother, intervenes. Preferring Jacob, she devises a plan to deceive her blind husband. She prepares a meal, mimicking the one Isaac had requested from Esau. To further the ruse, she dresses Jacob in Esau's clothes and covers him with animal skins, ensuring that if Jacob were to touch him, he'd be convinced he was touching the hairy Esau. When Jacob serves the mill and claims to be Esau, Isaac is deceived by the scent of Esau's clothes and the feel of the animal skins. Consequently, he blesses Jacob instead of Esau. This biblical episode has striking similarities with the myth of Hera's deception of Zeus. In both tales, a wife deceives her husband to prevent him from favoring a particular son. Esau, described as a hunter with rough, hairy skin and his father's favorite, can be likened to Heracles from the Iliad. Both stories emphasize the irreversible nature of a blessing or oath once given. While Isaac is a more vulnerable figure compared to the mighty Zeus, the essence of the deception remains consistent. The parallels extend further. Both Jacob and Eurystheus from the Iliad benefit from the deceptive acts, gaining power and status they arguably didn't earn. The term dolos for trick or deceit in the Septuagint, referring to Jacob's deception, mirrors the term Dolo for Sunni, which means craft or craftiness or deceitfulness, used for Hera's cunning in the Iliad. Another similar tell is found in the Metamorphosis, where Semele wishes to see Zeus in his true form, with Hera manipulating the situation. In these narratives, figures like Jacob, Hera, and Attilicus exploit others by manipulating oaths to their advantage. Jacob's actions, especially towards his family, underscore a recurring theme of familial deception in his story. While Homer's Odyssey doesn't directly show Attilicus in act of theft, the other stories outside of the Odyssey frequently link him with stealing livestock. One such tale recounts how Attilicus, cunningly took mares from Eurystheus, it's said that after stealing them, Attilicus handed the mares over to the hero Heracles. However, when the time came, Heracles declined to return them. Further accounts about Attilicus describe him as a master thief, specializing in stealing horses, cattle, and sheep. His signature trick was altering the animal's brands, making it difficult for their rightful owners to identify them. This trait is subtly echoed in the Odyssey when a young Odysseus is tasked with retrieving sheep that were stolen from Ithaca by men from Messene. This narrative aligns with the story of Attilicus's theft of Eurystheus's mares. During his mission in Messene, Odysseus encounters Eurystheus's son, Iphitos. Iphitos is on a quest of his own, trying to find the mares his father lost to Attilicus. Their 
meeting proves fruitful for Odysseus as Ephitos gifts him a bow. This very bow later plays a pivotal role when Odysseus uses it to defeat the suitors. However, Ephitos' journey doesn't end as favorably after his kind jester to Odysseus. Ephitos meets a tragic fate when he confronts Heracles in an attempt to retrieve the stolen mares. Attilicus, even outside of the Odyssey, is renowned for his unique ability to deceive. As early accounts like Ahoya suggest, he possessed the skill to render things invisible, change their color, or modify their markings. This talent allowed him to steal numerous herds and flocks from others. In other tales, like those of Pherecydes, Ovid, and Aegynos, Attilicus could transform animals into different shapes, changing their colors or even add or remove horns. A scholar by Grant named Grants, classicist Timothy Grants provides further insight, referencing various sources and even artwork. He mentions that Attilicus, despite his cunning, was once caught by Sisyphus. Sisyphus, to counteract Attilicus's thievery, began marking his animals as hoofs with a unique monogram. A 2nd century Megarian bull even depicts scenes where Attilicus seems to be stealing cattle from a protesting Sisyphus. The Homeric Hymn to Hermes offers a glimpse into the possible tactics Attilicus might have employed. At birth, Hermes is labeled both a thief and a cattle herder. In Cunning Act, Hermes separates 50 of Apollo's cattle, making them walk backwards to mislead anyone following their tracks. He further disguises his theft by creating sandals from brushwood and twigs, ensuring his footprints remain hidden. After stealing the cattle, Hermes uses innovative methods like starting fires by rubbing twigs to further his deception. Even when confronted, Hermes' cunning doesn't wane. Apollo, attempting to bind Hermes, finds that the bonds magically grow around and hide the stolen cattle. The tale concludes with a reconciliation between Apollo and Hermes, with Hermes gifting Apollo a lyre in exchange for the cattle. This exchange cements Hermes' reputation not just as a thief, but also as a protector and benefactor of livestock. Jacob, much like Attilicus, is associated with cunning strategies related to livestock, even if he isn't directly shown stealing. Laban, his father-in-law, and Laban's sons perceive Jacob as a thief, which is reminiscent of how Attilicus was viewed in other tales. The methods Jacob employs to amass livestock from Laban have parallels with the descriptions of Attilicus and the tactics detailed in Homeric Hymn to Hermes. For instance, Attilicus' ability to change the appearance of livestock, as described by Gantz, mirrors Jacob's actions with Laban's animals. Attilicus could transform the young of herds into any shape he desired, and even alter their colors from black to white, and vice versa. In the Genesis account, Jacob's care leads to the prosperity of Laban's flocks, drawing a parallel with Hermes, who is seen as a protector of pastures. When Jacob seeks his due wages from Laban, he requests newborn lambs and goats with specific markings and colors. Any animal found in his possession without these characteristics would be considered stolen, further linking Jacob with the theme of livestock theft. However, Laban, perhaps sensing Jacob's intentions, quickly segregates the livestock with the desired markings to prevent Jacob from breeding them. Undeterred, Jacob employs a clever tactic. He places freshly cut rods from poplar, almond, and plane trees near the mating animals. This results in the birth of offspring with the desired markings. By selectively breeding the stronger goats, Jacob ensures that he acquired the most robust offspring. Finally, without informing Laban, Jacob departs with his now sizable collection of livestock. This secretive exit further cements the comparison between Jacob and figures like Attilicus and Hermes, who were known for their cunning and resourcefulness. Jacob, Hermes, and Attilicus are all characters from different myths, yet they share striking similarities. Each one uses what might be termed as magic to acquire livestock, altering their appearance and color. A recurring motif in these tales is the use of cut branches, which play a pivotal role in the magical and deceptive transfer of livestock. For instance, livestock is transferred from Apollo to Hermes, from Laban to Jacob, and from Eurystos, Sisyphus, to Attilicus using these methods. Jacob's story, in particular, embeds his cunning acquisition of livestock within a broader narrative of conflict between him and his brother Esau. This mirrors the Homeric hymn to Hermes, where Hermes's theft of Apollo's cattle is set against a backdrop 
of a disagreement between the two godly siblings. Another shared trait amongst these figures is their prowess in wrestling. Apollodorus mentions that Attilicus taught the hero Heracles to wrestle, a skill that Odysseus also possesses, as depicted in the Iliad and the Odyssey. Jacob's narrative showcases his wrestling abilities on two occasions. First, even before born, Jacob is described as grasping his twin brother Esau's hill. Later, in a more profound episode, Jacob wrestles with a divine being. Interestingly, Attilicus' sole dialogue in Homer's works involves naming Odysseus, which parallels a blessing scene. This is reminiscent of Jacob's interaction with Isaac, though the roles are reversed. Instead of receiving a blessing, the trickster figure, like Jacob, is the one bestowing it. These characters, with their trickster lineage, possess a unique blend of deceptive skills and verbal dexterity. The physical manifestation of these traits is wrestling. It's these very qualities that empower both Odysseus and Joseph to masterfully handle the delayed recognition scenes they orchestrate with their kin. Joseph in Genesis 34 and Odysseus in the Trojan War. Before their main adventures begin, both Joseph and Odysseus play roles in the conquest of cities. While the Trojan War is on a grander scale compared to the events at Shechem in Genesis 34, the core themes are strikingly similar. The story of Dina's violation and the subsequent takeover of Hamor's city by Jacob's sons mirrors the central events of the Trojan War. Shechem, a Hivite, is captivated by Jacob's daughter, Dina. He wrongs her, but then wishes to marry her. To discuss this marriage, Shechem's father, Hamor, meets with Jacob. However, Jacob's sons are furious about what happened to Dina. Hamor suggests a union between the two communities, allowing intermarriages. Wanting to right his wrong, Shechem offers a generous dowry. Jacob's sons cunningly demand that all the men of Shechem city undergo circumcision. Shechem and Hamor agree, convincing every man in their city to follow suit. But as these men recover from the procedure, two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, ambush the city, killing all the men and rescuing Dina. The rest of Jacob's sons, including Joseph, then loot the city. The Shechem story draws many parallels with key themes and figures from the Trojan War. Shechem and Paris both have a strong desire for sensual pleasures, but Shechem seems more accountable for his actions. He goes beyond Paris's attempts at reconciliation in the Iliad, where Paris only proposes to return the items he took from Menelaus's home. The fathers of these two characters, Hamor for Shechem and Priam for Paris, share striking resemblances. Hamor's generous nature, noble spirit, and courteous behavior mirror the best attributes of Priam. However, just as the Trojans were deceived by the Trojan horse, Hamor too is overly trusting thinking everything is in order. Dina's brothers, Simeon and Levi, mirror the actions of the Greek siblings, Agamemnon and Menelaus, especially in their response to perceived wrongs. Just as Menelaus con contemplates showing mercy to the Trojan Adrestus, Agamemnon convinces him otherwise, emphasizing that no Trojan should be spared. In your home, did the Trojans treat you kindly? Let's ensure none of them escape our wrath. Not even an unborn child. Every Trojan should face total annihilation. Similarly, Nestor reminds the Greek soldiers of the reason for their quest, Helen's abduction. Let no one think of home until he has avenged Helen's sorrow by being with a Trojan's wife. Jacob's sons echo these intense feelings when they question the dishonor done to their sister. Should our sister be treated as if she were nothing? Their strategy of deceiving the Hivites by having them circumcised, thereby weakening them, can be likened to the Greeks' cunning use of the Trojan horse to infiltrate Troy. While the Greeks relied on the elements of surprise, Jacob's sons had the added advantage of their enemies being already weakened. Dina's allure can be compared, albeit on a smaller scale, to Helen's. However, unlike the detailed depiction of Helen in the Homeric epics, the stories don't delve into Dina's personal feelings. One of the most notable contrasts in Shechem's story is the portrayal of Jacob's son. They are depicted unfavorably, emphasizing their deceit and treachery. This perspective is reminiscent of Euripides' style, where events are shown through a more grounded, less heroic lens. Shechem, in contrast to Paris, appears more reasonable. His willingness to be circumcised evokes more empathy than the actions of Jacob's sons. 
This mirrors the Iliad's approach of highlighting the compassionate aspects of the Trojans like Adramache, Hector, and Priam, while showcasing the cold-heartedness of some Greeks. Although Joseph's specific role isn't detailed, he is among Jacob's sons, involved in the city's looting. Jacob now an older man seeking peace, disapproves of his son's actions, realizing it will tarnish their reputation in the region. While Genesis doesn't elaborate on Joseph's involvement, contrasting it with the Trojan War, where Odysseus is a key player, the parallel is still evident. Both Odysseus and Joseph's overarching stories share similar narrative arcs. They both inherit trickster qualities, participate in city conquests, and eventually become central figures in romantic tales. After the city's plunder, Joseph's romantic narrative unfolds, swiftly mirroring Odysseus's journey. The connection between the Joseph story, Aesop's life and ancient narratives. The life story of Aesop, often referred to as the Aesop Romance or Vita Aesopi, is a cornerstone when exploring the roots of Greek and Latin novels. This tale about Aesop, a renowned cultural icon, storyteller, and wise figure, was familiar to both medieval and modern European society. The manuscripts we know of today, as studied by B. E. Perry, trace back to the 2nd or 3rd century CE. However, Perry suggests that the original versions of these texts might date back to between the 1st century BCE and the 2nd century CE. He believes that the earliest known biography of Aesop might have evolved from writings as old as the 5th century BCE. Scholars have theorized that tales about Aesop and the Seven Sages were popular in Greece around that time, marking the inception of Greek biographies. Some even hypothesize that a Greek Aesop story similar to the Oriental tale of Ahikar might have been crafted in the 6th century BCE. It's widely recognized that the heart of the Aesop romance, especially the sections set in Babylonia and Egypt, mirrors the famous Near Eastern tale of Sage Ahikar. Both stories portray their protagonist, Aesop and Ahikar, as wise advisors to kings in Mesopotamia and Egypt. The narratives are strikingly similar, with the main distinction being the characters involved. For instance, in the Near Eastern version, Ahikar is a wise royal advisor while in the Aesop romance, it's Aesop. Similarly, the kings of Assyria in Ahikar's story are replaced by Lycaros, the Babylonian in Aesop's tale. The characters of Inos and Nectanabo in the Aesop romance have counterparts in Ahikar's story as well. The Ahikar story has been preserved in multiple languages, including Syriac, Arabic, Ethiopian, and Slavonic. While these versions were meticulously compiled and translated into English in the late 19th century, an ancient Aramaic rendition from the 5th century BCE was discovered in Egypt in 1907. It's believed that the origin of the Ahikar story might have even been older, possibly tracing back to the 7th century. The intricate relationship between the Aesop romance and the story of Ahikar is a topic I won't delve into here, drawing from a rich tapestry of narratives. What's particularly noteworthy for our current discussion is the presence of narrative elements familiar in the Near East, not just in the sections of the Aesop romance that align with the Ahikar tales, but also in parts that feel distinctly Greek. For example, as Christiani says, in my prior essay, I highlighted a motif where a sacred cup is sneakily placed among Aesop's possessions by the antagonist Delphians. This motif mirrors the biblical account in Genesis 44. Here, Joseph discreetly places his divination cup in his younger brother Benjamin's belongings. Later, he orchestrates its discovery, accusing Benjamin of theft. While the core motif remains consistent between the two stories, its application and significance diverge. In the Aesop romance, Aesop is the unfortunate victim of this deceit. The Delphians, having taken offense to Aesop's criticisms, frame him with the cup, leading to his arrest and eventual execution. Conversely, in the biblical tale, Joseph is the orchestrator, not the victim, of this ruse. He uses it as a strategy to retain his beloved younger brother Benjamin 
and to exert influence over and reprimand his other brothers who had wronged him. This variation in the utilization of a shared motif is not merely a matter of different narrative choices. It represents a deliberate structural inversion. The creators of these stories have taken a conventional element and applied it in diametrically opposite ways. This mirrored structure suggests a linkage between the two tales, even if it's not a direct one. It prompts us to analyze and appreciate the narrative in tandem. The comparison between the biblical Joseph story and the oriental section of the Aesop romance reveals striking similarities and thematic parallels, suggesting shared cultural motifs and narrative structures. Here's a breakdown of the comparisons. Shared themes. Foreigner and slave. Both Joseph and Aesop are portrayed as foreigners and slaves, emphasizing their outsider status and the challenges they face in foreign lands. Wisdom and promotion. Both protagonists are recognized for their wisdom and knowledge, leading to their promotion by kings. Their lowly status juxtaposed with their wisdom creates a narrative tension. Unjust accusations. Both heroes face unjust accusations, imprisonment, and near-death experiences. However, they are eventually sought out by kings, whom they assist, leading to their exaltation. Shintod motif. Both narratives incorporate the theme of apparent death. Joseph is presumed dead early in his story, while Aesop is condemned to death but secretly survives. Differences and variations of a theme. Riddles versus dreams. Aesop solves riddles for the Egyptian king, while Joseph interprets dreams for Pharaoh. Both actions showcase their wisdom and unique abilities. Imprisonment locations. Aesop is hidden in an empty tomb, while Joseph is thrown into a dry cistern and later imprisoned in a dungeon. Both scenarios emphasize confinement and isolation, bridging differences with Ahikar. The Aramaic narrative about Ahikar provides a bridge between some differences in the Joseph story and the Aesop romance. For instance, while Jacob believes Joseph is dead due to the bloody dress, Ahikar's execution is simulated by killing a eunuch slave, not an animal as in the Joseph story. This presents a reversal in narrative dynamics. Reversal of motifs. In the Joseph story, the simulated death is a source of grief for Jacob. In contrast, Ahikar's simulated death is a ruse to satisfy a king's demand for his execution. This reversal highlights the flexibility and adaptability of shared narrative motifs across different cultural stories. The story of Joseph in the Bible has some striking similarities to the Aesop romance. Recently, scholars have been taking a closer look at the Joseph story. One of them, D.B. Redford, believes that the story has strong Egyptian influences and might have been written between the 7th to 5th centuries BCE, while another scholar, A. Kitchen, disagrees with some of Redford's points. The idea that the Joseph story was written later than traditionally believed is gaining traction. Some argue that the story fits seamlessly into a larger narrative of Genesis, but even then, Recent studies suggest that these stories might have been written no earlier than the 6th century BCE. This means that the Joseph story, the story of Ahikar, and the earliest versions of the Aesop romance might all have been crafted around the same time, between the 7th to 5th centuries BCE, in the eastern Mediterranean region. Even if the Joseph story was written later, it still has roots in ancient tales. It seems to draw from older stories, like the Egyptian tale of the two brothers from the 19th dynasty. In this Egyptian story, two gods, Anpu and Bata, are portrayed as regular people, a married farmer and his single younger brother. This technique of turning godly myths into human stories isn't new. It's something we also see in the Hellenistic novels. The Joseph story is a perfect example of this, where age-old mythical themes are given a fresh down-to-earth twist. The story of Ahikar the Aesop romance, and the story of Joseph in the Bible all share narrative elements that can be traced back to ancient Near Eastern tales, especially those from Egypt. This means that the similarities between these three stories aren't just about the content or the time they were written, they all draw from a deep well of ancient storytelling traditions. Considering this intricate connection, it's fascinating to note that both Joseph and Aesop were seen as cultural icons. They had famous burial sites located in significant cultural centers like Delphi and Shechem. Even their names hint at shared history. While Joseph's name fits well within Semitic traditions, Aesop's name stands out as unusual in Greek stories. This raises questions about their shared origins, but that's a topic for another discussion. 
For now, it's intriguing to see the close relationship between the Aesop romance, which holds a special place in Greek storytelling, and the origins of the Hellenistic novel in the biblical tale of Joseph, the theme of the stolen cup. Continuing in this section, we will highlight the work of Cristiano Grotanelli called Kings and Prophets, Monarchic Power, Inspired Leadership, Sacred Text in Biblical Narrative. This stolen cup theme is also echoed by Philip Wagenbaum in his work Argonauts of the Desert. When we dive deeper into the story of Joseph in the Bible, we see that its connections to Hellenistic and Roman narratives are just the tip of the iceberg. There are many elements in the Joseph story that can also be found in stories from these later periods. For instance, several Hellenistic and subsequent stories share Share motifs or themes with the biblical tale. I'll highlight just a few examples to give you an idea, but these should be enough to show that there's a broad tapestry of shared narratives and to set the stage for some broader observations. Let's delve into the stolen cup theme, which appears in both the story of Joseph and the Aesop romance, but with roles reversed. In the Bible, in Genesis 44, the story goes like this. Quote, Joseph instructed his house steward to fill the men's grain sacks and secretly place his silver cup in the youngest brother's sack. The next morning, as the brothers left the city, Joseph sent his steward to confront them about the stolen cup. When the steward caught up with them, he accused them of theft. The brothers, confident of their innocence, declared that if the cup was found with any one of them, that person should die and the rest would become slaves. A search began, starting from the oldest brother's sack to the youngest. To their shock, the cup was discovered in Benjamin's sack. Distraught, they all returned to the city. In the Greek version, the Septuagint, the cup is referred to as kavdi. It also is worth noting the detail of donkeys carrying grain sacks. In the Aesop romance, the story is a bit different. Aesop is found with a cup that the people of Delphi had sneakily placed among his things. He's then arrested and condemned to death for this act of sacred theft. The incident of the hidden cup is narrated in strikingly similar ways in the two primary versions of the Aesop romance, known as Perry G and W texts. However, the G text includes a detail absent in the W version, but present in the biblical account of Joseph. When accused of theft, Aesop, much like Joseph's brothers in Genesis 44, proclaims his willingness to face death if the golden cup is found among his belongings. This declaration is a powerful testament to his innocence. Such a motif can be found in other Greek narratives and also in the Bible. For instance, in Genesis 32, Laban accuses Jacob of stealing his sacred idols, unaware that his wife Rachel has taken them. Jacob declares that whoever possesses the idols should not live. This, cur this curse might be the reason Rachel later dies during childbirth. In the Aesop romance, only Aesop's belongings are mentioned, with no reference to the sack of grain that conceals the sacred item, as in the Joseph story. This sack might be an Egyptian element, as a similar sack appears in the Middle Kingdom folktale from the Westcar Papyrus. In this tale, the priestess Regidet gives birth to three children fathered by the god Re. Assisting her are divine figures, including the potter god Kanum and goddesses like Isis and Nephthys. These divine midwives name the children based on their birth circumstances and their destinies as future kings are set. As a token of gratitude, Regidet offers the deities a sack of barley instead of taking it with them. The deities hide three royal crowns inside and leave it with Regidet's servants. This sack is stored in a sealed room. Two weeks later, when barley is needed for brewing beer, the room is filled with majestic sounds, revealing the sack's miraculous contents. The motif of the stolen cup in the Aesop romance, regardless of whether one agrees with its origin dating back to the 5th or 6th century BCE, is likely ancient. Herodotus briefly mentions Aesop's unjust death at the hands of the Delphians without elaborating. However, Heracleides of Pontus, a student of Aristotle from the 4th century, specifically notes the placement of a golden cup in Aesop's belongings 
leading to his execution as a sacrilegious thief. An annotation to Aristophanes's Wasp describes how the Delphians, after facing Aesop's criticism, concealed a sacred cup in his possessions, apprehending him en route to Phacus. Plutarch, in his De Sera Numinis Vindicta, vaguely mentions Aesop being accused of a sacrilegious act. Similarly, the quote, stolen cup, in quote, episode in the Joseph narrative has its roots. The biblical account of Benjamin's framing is echoed by numerous subsequent Jewish authors. These writers, both from Palestine and the Hellenistic diaspora, either provide commentary on the Joseph story in a midrashic style or introduced it to Greek-speaking audiences, many of whom were still Jewish. Flavius Josephus, in his Jewish Antiquities, elaborates on the biblical tale, introducing new elements. After dining with Joseph, the brothers were sent off with their grain. Joseph's steward was instructed to hide the payment in their sacks and to place Joseph's cherished drinking cup in Benjamin's sack. This was a test to see if the brothers would stand by Benjamin when accused of theft or abandon him, confident of their innocence as they departed joyfully with Simeon. They were suddenly ambushed by horsemen, accompanied by the servant who had planted the cup. The brothers, shocked by this sudden assault, questioned the reason for such aggression after recently experiencing Joseph's hospitality. The horsemen accused them of ingratitude, alleging they stole the cup Joseph used to toast their health. The brothers vehemently denied the accusation, but the cup was discovered in Benjamin's sack, leading to their collective despair. Benjamin was detained and brought to Joseph with his brothers trailing behind. In Joseph's rendition, certain details differ from the biblical account. For instance, the term used for Benjamin's sack suggests it was typically used by pack animals. Joseph's cup, used for both drinking and divination in the Bible, is described as a loving cup for toasting. Joseph's motive for the ruse is to gauge his brother's loyalty. Additionally, the sudden appearance of horsemen, not mentioned in the Bible, adds drama to the narrative. Josephus' inclusion of horsemen in the Joseph narrative, which is not present in the original biblical account, demonstrates the flexibility with which even sacred text could be expanded upon. This adaptability is less surprising when we recognize that biblical texts themselves evolve through gradual additions, glosses, and segments. What's more intriguing is the appearance of similar horsemen in two renowned Hellenistic novels, both likely written less than a century after Josephus' account. In the Greek ass novel, often credited to Lucian of Samosata, the protagonist Lucian, transformed into an ass through magic, is acquired by a band of eunuch devotees of the Syrian goddess. These devotees wandering the countryside perform peculiar religious acts. In one village, they insist that their goddess should reside in the temple of the most revered local deity. The villagers agree. After several days, the devotees decide to depart for a neighboring city. Before leaving, they retrieve their goddess from the temple. However, they also stealthily steal a golden bowl, a votive offering, hiding it within the statue of the goddess. The villagers, upon discovering the theft, chase the devotees, catching up to them. They find the stolen bowl concealed within the goddess's statue. The culprits are imprisoned. The goddess is relocated to another temple and the golden vessels return to the village's deity. A parallel episode is found in Apuleius's Golden Ass. Here, the local goddess from the Greek text is replaced by the Phrygian Mater Deum, another Eastern deity. The sacred vessel is described as an Orium Canthorum, the Gali, like Joseph's brothers in both the Bible and Josephus' version, depart at dawn, likely to evade detection. The narrative is crafted with enhanced finesse. The sudden appearance of the horsemen, unexplained until their intervention, heightens the drama. The stolen golden cup is discovered, ipso deo gremio, the very lap of the goddess. The culprits, while downplaying their wrongdoing, are captured, returned to the village, and incarcerated. The divine statue and the vessel are then reconsecrated and placed in the local temple. These episodes, while rooted in the stolen cup motif, showcase the adaptability of ancient narratives. 
allowing authors to infuse their unique perspectives and cultural context into familiar tales. The presence of the stolen cup motif in various narratives from the biblical tale of Joseph to the Greek ass stories and the Aesop romance underscores its adaptability and enduring appeal. However, pinpointing the exact origins and chronology of these tales, especially in relation to each other, is challenging. For instance, while there were likely multiple Greek ass narratives, one closely resembling Lucian's text, it's hard to determine the exact timeline of these stories, especially in relation to Josephus' expanded account of Benjamin's framing. Similarly, establishing a direct link between the ass tale episode and Aesop's unfortunate incident in Delphi is complex. Despite these challenges in tracing the motif's history, we can engage in a comparative analysis of this function and meaning and specific details across different narratives. In terms of function and meaning, the Joseph and Aesop stories can be grouped together. Both depict the motif as the, a means to ensnare and punish the innocent individual. Furthermore, Benjamin's unique position in the Joseph narrative, being both the favored son and the scapegoat, might be linked to the motif's suggested Egyptian origins. In the Westcar Papyrus, this motif symbolizes divine selection and royal authority. It's worth noting that just before the silver cup incident in the biblical account, Benjamin receives a portion from Joseph's ta table that's five times larger than his brother's, symbolizing royal favor. This is further emphasized in other biblical passages related to the Benjamite king, Saul. Conversely, in two versions of the ass tale, the motif serves to expose and punish a band of blasphemous rogues. Their reactions upon being caught starkly contrast with the genuine responses of Joseph's brothers or Aesop. This highlights that while the Joseph and Aesop stories share similarities in the use of the motif, they also exhibit significant differences, which can be seen as a structural inversion. In essence, the stolen cup motif, while consistent in its core elements, is employed in diverse ways across narratives, reflecting the unique themes and messages of each story. The stolen cup motif, while consistent in its essence, exhibits a myriad of intricate details that vary across different narratives. These details, while seemingly minor, forge connections between the stories, transcending their broader themes and functions. For instance, the stolen vessel in the Joseph story is a silver cup, while in other narratives, it's golden. Its significance also varies. In the biblical account, it's a dual-purpose cup for drinking and divination, owned by the influential Joseph. In Josephus' version, it's solely for drinking, while in other tales, it's a sacred cup tied to a sanctuary. The presence of donkeys, essential in the biblical story and implicitly in Josephus, is absent in Aesop's traditions but re-emerges in the ass tale. Aesop's proclamation of innocence in one version of his story mirrors the brothers in Genesis. The motif of pursuers depicted as horsemen is consistent in Josephus and the ass tales. These intricate overlaps and deviations suggest a vast backdrop of shared narrative traditions, both Oriental and Greek. These stories aren't isolated but are interconnected fragments of a larger tapestry of tales that have evolved over time and across cultures. One intriguing connection is the association of the stolen vessel with grain. In the biblical Joseph story, donkeys carry sacks of grain, a detail still present in Josephus' account. This grain-carrying motif might have Egyptian roots, as seen in a tale where a sack holds barley and three royal crowns. In the ass tale, the stolen cup isn't concealed in a sack, but within a statue's tunic. However, the grain motif persists. In the Greek version, the religious beggars receive various cereals, including barley for their ass and wheat for themselves. Apuleius, in his rendition, elaborates that the beggars receive different grains, which they place in sacks on the ass's back. Thus, the ass becomes both a mobile temple and granary. While the stolen cup's position shifts across tales, the association of the sacred vessel with cereal remains constant. The story of Joseph in the Bible contains many parallels to ancient myths and narratives from the ancient Near East and Greece. As we've seen, the themes of separation journey and eventual reunion in Joseph's tale resonate with the nostos structure found in Homer's Odyssey. Both Joseph and Odysseus exemplify the romance genre through their extended absences, divine favor, and poignant recognition scenes. Dreams, trickery, 
and mastery of language links these two legendary figures. The stolen cup motif bridges Eastern and Western traditions, appearing in Egyptian folklore, the Bible, accounts of Aesop, and Greek novels. While the Bible's authors adapted these shared narrative elements to their own purposes, the influences reveal an interconnected cultural palette. Joseph's story continues to captivate us today with its blend of universal motifs and distinctive perspectives. I hope you've enjoyed this exploration of the mythic roots and connections woven into the biblical tapestry. Please subscribe to MythVision for more comparative mythology content. I appreciate your likes, comments, and support on Patreon as we unravel the threads linking humanity's treasures of tales. Join me next time as we sample another flavor from this diverse banquet of world myths and sacred stories. And never forget, we are MythVision.